The AAB by Edward W. Ludwig. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The AAB by Edward W. Ludwig. The cool Martian wind crept across the rust-red expanse of desert. Occasionally its soft touch stirred the thorny leaves of devil's eggs, the squat black plants which peppered the silent monotony. Here and there a wisp of sand spiraled upward into the bright, thin morning. The wind felt clean and new on Monk O'Hara's coarse, blonde stubbled face. He chuckled as noisily as a man buried neck deep in sand can chuckle. <sighs> Nothing to worry about, he muttered. <sighs> Not a goddamn thing. It was uncomfortable, of course. No man would relish being beaten by hysterical Martian tribesmen, spat on, and buried to roast in the 100-degree Martian noon, or freeze in the 50-below-zero night. Yet the summer wind from the melting polar ice cap would ensure an endurable temperature through the day. Monk's lungs, enlarged and sensitized after two years of prospecting for devil's egg seed, were accustomed to the plant's scant atmosphere. Destruction of his oxygen mask presented no menace. Idiots, he mumbled. The full Martians made off with the sand car like kids with ice cream, and left enough egg seed to buy a thousand cars. He was able to turn his head just enough to glimpse the heavy, fat sacks that the tribesmen had dumped out of the sand car. The sacks bulged with the fine black seed that, properly processed, made the deadliest, costliest, and most habit-forming narcotic in the system. The sacks were symbols of a shining future for Monk O'Hara, symbols of fine clothes, beauteous women, choice whiskey, and most important of all, a return to Earth. Of course, it was too bad about the old man. The white-bearded, toothpick-slim Martian trader and his black-haired daughter had pitched their tent next to his camp last night. The girl had been amazingly full-bodied for a Martian. Her round, firm body and sensual lips made him suspect that she was a half-breed, a delightful combination of Martian grace and earthly sultriness. Monk smiled as he saw her again in his mind's eye. She slid off her antelope-like Lozelle and came to him slowly with her small, naked feet swishing through the sand. Is it all right for us to camp by you? She asked, her eyes wide. We will not bother you. Not at all, Monk answered, his heart pounding. After all, it had been six months since he'd even seen a woman, any kind of woman. What is your name? The girl asked. Monk, they call me. Monk O'Hara. He could feel the blood pulsing through his temples. I am Thule, she curtsied. You like me? Yeah, Monk breathed. I like you a lot. Later, through the ports of his sand car, he watched her lithe movements as she and her father set up their tent. Throughout the night, his sleep was thin and restless, his mind on fire with the vision of the dark, lovely face. So early this morning, he'd gone to her again. How about some coffee, kid? Got plenty in the sand car. She crinkled her nose teasingly. Yes, I like earth coffee. My buckle can come? No, just you, kid. Your old man's busy taking down the tent. She nodded eagerly, smiling. Yes, I come. I like you. What greater invitation did a man need? But in the sand car, the little fool screamed. The old Martian darted into the car, yanked Monk away from Thule, and descended on him like an enraged beast. Monk hadn't meant to kill the old Martian. He had meant only to silence his shrill screams and stop the frenzied flailing of his fists. How could he have known that the thin neck would snap like a rotten stick under his first blow? Monk's smile faded. No, he thought, he hadn't acted too wisely. He'd expected the frightened girl to leap out of the sand car and race away on her Lozelle, and she had. But he hadn't expected her to return an hour later with a dozen revenge-hungry tribesmen. His mistake had been in letting her escape. He cursed silently. Then he spat. After all, it was over and done. The Martians had trussed him, buried him, and left him to die. But he'd at least been wise enough not to reveal his ace in the hole. His partner, old Stardust Luke, had left yesterday in the auxiliary sand car to get fresh supplies from Chandler Field. Old Stardust was as honest as a baby and methodical as a clock. He had returned today, late in the afternoon, just as he'd done a dozen times. There was no doubt about the punctual arrival of Stardust, and Stardust would save him before the freezing descent of the Martian night. Monk thought for a moment, then chuckled again. His glee more than overshadowed the inconvenience of his neck-deep burial for the rescue would be the last good deed of Stardust Luke's life. 
In fact, it would be his last deed, period. The old space rat had outlived his usefulness. If he persisted in wandering over unexplored Martian terrain, he'd probably end up in a freezing or sweltering grave anyway. So it wouldn't be murder. Not exactly. It would only be giving a bit of impetus to what already seemed inevitable. Monk strained his neck muscles to gaze at the sacks of seed. They would all be his soon, not half as now, but all. He sucked the cool air deep into his lungs. Everything is going to be okay, he murmured. No, not okay, but perfect. He closed his eyes at peace with the universe. He could forget the pressure of sand on his chest, forget the heat that was beginning to shower down on his thick, sweat-matted mop of hair. He could imagine himself in a cool, dark bar on Earth, surrounded by smiling women, sipping ice drinks. Ah, he breathed, opening his eyes. Then he saw the Aab. It squatted on a small, irregular-shaped dune some three feet from him in the jagged, sharp-edged shadow of a devil's egg. Its eyes, like shiny pinheads of obsidian, were on level with his. It was a red-scaled creature about three inches long, combining the most significant characteristics of an earth crab and an earth ant. Its claws were tiny, razor-edged traps on the ends of wire-thin appendages. Even at this distance, Monk saw that its mouth was open. Whether in awe or in anticipation of a meal, he did not know. The Aab rose on its six rear legs as if trying to stretch its dark red body into a position of better vision. It rubbed its foreclaws together. Sharpening them, perhaps? Monk shivered. For the first time since his arrival on Mars twelve years ago, Monk felt fear. Till now, he'd met no adversary that his strong, bull-necked body could not subdue. Ordinarily, he'd dispose of an Aab by a squishing stomp of his boot, and he'd flower the naked grave with a squirt of tobacco juice. But now it was as if he were bodiless. His broad shoulders, sinewy arms, and barrel chest seemed buried a thousand miles deep in the very bowels of the planet. He was a helpless freak, a living, sliced-off head on an endless platter of red sand. Fear was an icy bobble in his mind, rising, swelling, forcing out all other thought. Go away! he yelled. The Aout's claws fell to the sand. Monk saw the menacing glint of the needle-like tongue in the creature's black, open mouth. Eight abs were carnivorous, he knew. They especially relished the soft, tender places of the human body, the lips, eyes, tongue. Ten minutes of attack by a hundred eight abs would transform a man into a white, clean skeleton. About the bones, the eight abs would lie prostrate, too suffered to move, their bodies swollen to thrice their normal size. Get out of here, he screamed. The Aab retreated a few inches, backing into the shadow of the devil's egg. Go on and keep going! The Aab turned and began to creep away. It responded readily to Monk's commands, for Aabs were gifted with a rudimentary, if unpredictable, type of telepathy. No interplanetary circus was complete without its complement of the deadly creatures controlled by an expert human telepath. The Aab continued to needle a path through the sand. It passed through the shadow of the devil's egg. It was now some six feet from Monk, a tiny red ball half buried in the desert. Suddenly a thought echoed in Monk's mind, ever so faintly, like the barely distinguishable sound of trickling water far away. I will come back. Many of us will come. Monk paled. Damn, he'd forgotten. The Aabs, according to biological reports, sent out scouts in search of food. The Aab before him was a scout. The fear welled up within him stronger than ever. His body was held motionless in his tight prison, yet inside him he was trembling. No, don't go, come back. He repeated the words over and over in his mind, knowing that the Aab would respond only to the mental impulse, not the sound of words. Aabs were deaf to the human voice. The Aab paused. Don't go, don't, don't. Slowly, like a revolving wheel, the Aab turned. Its black, pinhead eyes seemed to bore into monks. I'm going. You cannot stop me. The thoughts, not words, filtered into Monk's consciousness. You are not going, Monk telepathed. He gritted his teeth, funneling all his strength into the mental command. The Aab was struggling to break away from the hypnotic chain. Its body was grotesquely twisted, its claws digging into the sand, its head bobbing absurdly. Let me go. Let me go. You can't go. I've got you. Let me go. Let me go. The Aab struggled furiously. Damn you, I won't let you go, Monk hurled the thought at the creature in a fire of desperate fury. The Aab fell, exhausted. 
Five, ten, fifteen minutes passed. The wind blew. The hot Martian sun transformed the desert into a sea of glittering scarlet. A mist of sand settled on the inert body of the Aab, camouflaging it. How many minutes more till the arrival of Stardust Luke? It must be close to noon. There'd be perhaps five more hours. Sixty minutes in an hour, and five hours. The Aab stirred. It began to rise. Monk concentrated on the thought. You can't move. I've got you. You can't rise. The Aab stopped rising. Monk licked the perspiration from his upper lip in a futile effort to quench his thirst. But there was nothing to worry about, nothing at all. His head jerked back. The Aab was rising again. It was defying his last command. Monk bit his lip. Of course, his mind was tiring just as muscles tire. He couldn't hope to hold the Aab here all afternoon. The Aab somehow must be disposed of. But how? Out of the heat, out of his fear and desperation came a plan. It was simple and direct. It gave Monk his only chance for survival. He quickly pressed it into the depths of his unconscious mind so that the Aab would not detect it. Come here, he said. I won't hurt you. You will hurt me. You will dispose of me. Monk cursed. Aabs weren't intelligent, but they possessed some reasoning power. No, I won't hurt you, he telepathed. Come here, let me see what you look like. I am afraid you have a plan. This time, Monk relaxed. He tried to emanate only thoughts of love and friendliness. I won't hurt you, I promise. The Aab hesitated. I command you to come here. You will not be hurt. Slowly, the Aab crawled forward. One inch, two, three, six, a dozen. It was only five feet from him now and in the shadow of the devil's egg again. That's it. Come on. Closer. I am afraid of you. Let me go. Let me go get the others. The Aab suddenly braked its advance by digging its foreclaws into the sand. But you don't want to go back to the others. Monk's lips quivered as he spoke. His words to human ears would have been unintelligible. You want to stay here. You want to come closer to me. His attempt at telepathic hypnotism brought a small, silent reply. I must call the others. It is my duty to call the others. The others are hungry. A shudder passed through Monk's hot, tight body. A few minutes ago, he had delighted in the coolness of the desert. Now the heat seemed to be pressing down upon him like the fiery hand of Satan. You're a scout, aren't you? he asked. You find food for the others. You go back and tell the others what you found? I tell the others. The others are hungry. But you're hungry, too. Why share what you found? Why not take it all for yourself? No reply appeared in Monk's mind. He continued, Come closer. Look at me. You're hungry. You're too hungry to waste time calling the others. The Aab came closer. It passed out of the shadow of the devil's egg. It came within two feet of Monk. It crossed a small dune. Slowly, slowly its legs labored through the thin sand. At last it stopped some six inches from Monk's face. It appeared immense, like a lumbering, scaly giant from the planet's billion-year-ago past. It rubbed its claws together threateningly. Its black mouth opened, closed, opened, closed. Its needle tongue twisted like a silver snake. I am hungry, came the thought. So very hungry. But I should call the others. Combined fear and hope hung over Monk like an omnipresent shower of fire and ice. Sweat dripped into his hot eyes, obscuring his vision. He opened his mouth. Look, he said, you are hungry. He wriggled his tongue as a fisherman would cast out bait. Hungry, 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 came the tiny voice. An eternity passed. Monk's heart was a monstrous hammer pounding in the depths of his body and in the depths of the planet. The egg owl was motionless save for the restless, uncertain moving and blinking of its eyes. Then its four legs lifted. It drew itself forward. One inch, two, three, four, five, six. Monk beckoned the creature on with his wriggling, twisting tongue. That's it, he telepathed. Closer, closer. The Aab entered Monk's open mouth. Crunch. Monk chewed and spat and chewed and spat. He grimaced hideously. He coughed and choked. The Aab tasted like a combination of paprika and oil. He thought he was going to retch, but did not. And it was over. Monk breathed the cool air. His weary mind thought of the stupid white-bearded Martian and of his lovely daughter. He thought of what he was going to do to that idiot space rat Stardust Luke. His gaze traveled to the empty red desert where, in about four hours, Stardust's sand car would appear. It shifted to the sacks of priceless devil's egg seed and he began to chuckle. 
and last his gaze turned to the black pinpoint eyes and the moving foreclaws of the two Aabs which squatted some three feet away from him in the jagged, sharp-edged shadow of a devil's egg. End of the Aab by Edward W. Ludwig Read by Elsie Selwyn The Aggravation of Elmer by Robert Arthur This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Gerges The Aggravation of Elmer by Robert Arthur The world would beat a path to Elmer's door, but he had to go carry the door along with him. It was the darndest traffic jam I'd ever seen in White Plains. For two blocks ahead of me, Main Street was gutter to gutter with stalled cars, trucks, and buses. If I hadn't been in such a hurry to get back to the shop, I might have paid more attention. I might have noticed nobody was leaning on his horn, or that at least a quarter of the drivers were out peering under their hoods. But at the time it didn't register. I gave the tie-up a passing glance and was turning up the side street toward Biltom Electronics, Bill Tom, get it, when I saw Marge threading her way to the curb. She was leading a small blonde girl of about eight who clutched a child-size hat box in her hand. Marge was hot and exasperated, but Small Fry was as cool and composed as a vanilla cone. I waited. Even flushed and disheveled, Marge is a treat to look at. She is tall and slender, with brown eyes that match her hair, a smile that first crinkles around her eyes, then sneaks down and becomes a full-fledged grin. But I'm getting off the subject. Honestly, Bill, Marge said as she saw me, the traffic nowadays. We've been tied up for fifteen minutes. I finally decided to get off the bus and walk, even though it is about a hundred in the shade. Come along to the shop, I suggested. The reception room is air-conditioned, and you can watch the world's first baseball game telecast in color. The Giants versus the Dodgers. Carl Erskine pitching. Marge brightened. That'll be more fun than shopping, won't it, Doreen? She asked, looking down at the kid. Bill, this is Doreen. She lives across the street from me. Her mother's at the dentist, and I said I'd look after her for the day. Hello, Doreen, I said. What have you in the hat box? Doll clothes? Doreen gave me a look of faint disgust. No, she piped in a high treble. An unhappy genie. An unhappy... I did a double take. Oh, an unhappy genie. Maybe he's unhappy because you won't let him out. <laughs> Even to myself, I sounded idiotic. Doreen looked at me pityingly. It's not a he. It's a thing. Elmer made it. I knew when I was losing, so I quit. I hurried Marge and Doreen along toward our little two-story building. Once we got into the air-conditioned reception room, Marge sank down gratefully onto the settee and I switched on the television set with the big 24-inch tube Tom had built. Biltom Electronics makes TV components, computer parts, things like that. Tom Kennedy is the brains. Me, Bill Rollins, I do the legwork and tend to the business details. It's uncanny the way all those cars suddenly stopped when our bus broke down, Marge said as we waited for the picture to come on. Any day now, this civilization of ours will get so complicated, a bus breaking down someplace will bring the whole thing to a halt. Then where will we be? Elmer says civilization is doomed, Doreen put in happily. The way she rolled the word out made me stare at her. Marge only nodded. That's what Elmer says, all right, she agreed, a trifle grim. Why does Elmer say civilization is doomed? I asked Doreen. Because it's getting hotter. The kid gave it to me straight. All the ice at the North Pole is going to melt. The ocean is going to rise 200 feet. Then everybody who doesn't live on a hill is going to be drowned. That's what Elmer says, and Elmer isn't ever wrong. 
Doreen, they call her. Why not Cassandra? The stuff kids spout these days. I gave her a foolish grin. I wanted Marge to get the idea I was really a family man at heart. That's very interesting, Doreen. Now look, there's the baseball game. Let's watch, shall we? We weren't very late, after all. It was the top half of the second inning, the score one to one, Erskine in trouble with two men on and only one down. The colors were beautiful. Marge and I were just settling back to watch when Doreen wrinkled her nose. I saw that game yesterday, she announced. You couldn't have, sweetheart, I told her, because it's only being played today. The world's first ball game ever broadcast in color. There was a game on Elmer's TV, Doreen insisted. The picture was bigger and the colors prettier, too. Absolutely impossible. I was a little sore. I hate kids who tell fibs. There never was a game broadcast in color before, and anyway, you won't find a color tube this big any place outside of a laboratory. But it's true, Bill. Marge looked at me, wide-eyed. Elmer only has a little seven-inch black-and-white set his uncle gave him, but he's rigged up some kind of lens in front of it, and it projects a big color picture on a white screen. I saw that she was serious. My eyes bugged slightly. Listen, I said, who is this Elmer character? I want to meet him. He's my cousin from South America, Doreen answered. He thinks grown-ups are stupid. She turned to Marge. I have to go to the bathroom, she said primly. Through that door, Marge pointed. Doreen trotted out, clutching her hat box. Elmer thinks grown-ups are stupid, I howled. Listen, how old is this character who says sillization is doomed and can convert a black-and-white broadcast into color? He's thirteen, Marge told me. I goggled at her. Thirteen, she repeated. His father is some South American scientist. His mother died ten years ago. I sat down beside her. I lit a cigarette. My hands were shaking. Tell me about him. All about him. Why, I don't know very much, Marge said. Last year Elmer was sick, some tropic disease. His father sent him up here to recuperate. Now Alice, that's his aunt, Doreen's mother, is at her wit's end. He makes her so nervous. I lit another cigarette before I realized I already had one. And he invents things? A boy genius? Young Tom Edison and all that? Marge frowned. I suppose you could say that, she conceded. He has the garage full of stuff he's made or bought with the allowance his father sends him. And if you come within ten feet of it without permission, you get an electric shock right out of thin air. But that's only part of it. It... She gave a helpless gesture. It's Elmer's effect on everybody. Everybody over fifteen, that is. He sits there a little, dark, squinched-up kid wearing thick glasses and talking about how climatic changes inside fifty years will flood half the world, cause the collapse of civilization. Wait a minute, I cut in. Scientists seem to think that's possible in a few thousand years, not fifty. Elmer says fifty, Marge stated flatly. From the way he talks, I suspect he's figured out a way to speed things up and is going to try it some day just to see if it works. Meanwhile, he fools around out there in the garage, sneering about the billions of dollars spent to develop color TV. He says his lens will turn any ordinary broadcast into color for about $25. He says it's typical of the muddled thinking of our so-called scientists. I'm quoting now to do everything backward and overlook fundamental principles. Brother, I said. Doreen came trotting back in then with her hat box. I'm tired of that game, she said, giving the TV set a bored glance. And as she said it, the tube went dark. The sound cut off. Damn, I swore. Must be a power failure. I grabbed the phone and jiggled the hook. No dice. The phone was dead, too. You're funny, Doreen giggled. 
It's just the unhappy genie. See? She flicked over the catch on the hat box, and the picture came back on. The sound started up. Swings and misses for strike two. The air conditioner began to hum. Marge and I stared. Mouths open. Wide. You did that, Doreen? I asked it very carefully. You made the television stop and start again? The unhappy genie did, Doreen told me. Like this. She flicked the catch back. The TV picture blacked out. The sound stopped in the middle of a word. The air conditioner whispered into silence. Then she flipped the catch the other way. Fouls the second ball into the screen, the announcer said. Picture okay, air conditioner operating. Everything normal except my pulse and respiration. Doreen, sweetheart, I took a step toward her. What's in that box? What is an unhappy genie? Not unhappy. You know how scornful an eight-year-old can be? Well, she was. Unhappen. It makes things unhappen. Anything that works by electricity, it stops. Elmer calls it his unhappen genie, just for fun. Oh, now I get it, I said brightly. It makes electricity not work. Unhappen, like television sets and air conditioners and automobiles and bus engines. Doreen giggled. Marge sat bolt upright. Doreen, you caused that traffic jam? You and that, that gadget of Elmer's? Doreen nodded. It made all the automobile engines stop, just like Elmer said. Elmer's never wrong. Marge looked at me. I looked at Marge. A field of some kind, I said. A field that prevents an electric current from flowing, meaning no combustion motor using an electric spark can operate. No electric motors, no telephones, no radio or TV. Is that important? Marge asked. Important, I yelled. Think of the possibilities just as a weapon. You could blank out a whole nation's transportation, its communications, its industry. I got hold of myself. I smiled my best I love children smile. Doreen, I said, let me look at Elmer's unhappen genie. The kid clutched the box. Elmer told me not to let anybody look at it. He said he'd statuefy me if I did. He said nobody would understand it anyway. He said he might show it to Mr. Einstein, but not anybody else. That's Elmer, all right, Marge muttered. I found myself breathing hard. I edged toward Doreen and put my hand on the hat box. Just one quick look, Doreen, I said. No one will ever know. She didn't answer. Just pulled the box away. I pulled it back. She pulled. I pulled. Bill, Marge called warningly. Too late. The lid of the hat box came off in my hands. There was a bright flash, the smell of insulation burning, and the unhappen genie fell out and scattered all over the floor. Doreen looked smug. Now Elmer will be angry at you. Maybe he'll disintegrate you or paralyze you and statuefy you forever. He might at that, Bill, Marge shuddered. I wouldn't put anything past him. I wasn't listening. I was scrambling after the mess of tubes, condensers, and power packs scattered over the rug. Some of them were still wired together, but most of them had broken loose. Elmer was certainly one heck of a sloppy workman. Hadn't even soldered the connections, just twisted the wires together. I looked at the stuff in my hands. It made as much sense as a radio run over by a truck. We'll take it back to Elmer. I told Doreen, speaking very carefully. I'll give him lots of money to build another. He can come down here and use our shop. 
We have lots of nice equipment he'd like. Doreen tossed her head. I don't think he'll wanna. He'll be mad at you. Anyway, Elmer is busy working on aggravation now. That's for sure, Marge said in heartfelt tones. Aggravation, eh? I grinned like an idiot. Well, well, I'll bet he's good at it. But let's go see him right away. Bill, Marge signaled me to one side. Maybe you'd better not try to see Elmer, she whispered. I mean, if he can build a thing like this in his garage, maybe he can build a disintegrator or a paralysis ray or something. There's no use taking chances. You read too many comics, I laughed it off. He's only a kid, isn't he? What do you think he is, a superman? Yes, Marge said flatly. Look, Marge, I said in feverish excitement, I've got to talk to Elmer. I've got to get the rights to that TV color lens and this electricity interrupter and anything else he may have developed. Marge kept trying to protest, but I simply grabbed her and Doreen and hustled them out to my car. Doreen lived in a wooded, hilly section a little north of White Plains. I made it in ten minutes. Marge had said Elmer worked in the garage. I kept going up the driveway, swung sharp around the big house, and slammed on the brakes. Marge screamed. We skidded to a stop with our front end hanging over what looked like a bomb crater in the middle of the driveway. I swallowed my heart down again while I backed away fast. We had almost plunged into a hole forty feet across and twenty feet deep in the middle. The hole was perfectly round, like a half-section of a grapefruit. "'What's this?' I asked. "'Where's the garage?' "'That's where the garage should be,' Marge looked dazed. "'But it's gone!' I took another look at that hole scooped out with geometrical precision and turned to Doreen. What did you say Elmer was working on? Ag, she sobbed. Ag, ag, aggravation. She began to bawl in earnest. Now he's gone. He's mad. He won't ever come back, I betcha. That's a fact, I muttered. He may not have been mad, but he certainly was aggravated. Marge, listen. This is a mystery. We've just got to let it stay a mystery. We don't know anything, understand? The cops will finally decide Elmer blew himself up, and we'll leave it at that. One thing I'm pretty sure about. He's not coming back. So that's how it was. Tom Kennedy keeps trying and trying to put Elmer's unhappen genie back together again, and every time he fails, he takes it out on me because I didn't get to Elmer sooner. But you can see perfectly well he's way off base, trying to make out I could have done a thing to prevent what happened. Is it my fault if the dumb kid didn't know enough to take the proper precautions when he decided to develop anti-gravitation? and got shot off, garage and all, someplace into outer space? What do they teach kids nowadays, anyway? End of The Aggravation of Elmer by Robert Arthur Recording by Peter Gerges The Battle of the Bells by Jerome Bixby This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Battle of the Bells by Jerome Bixby It would happen maybe once or twice a week, never much more, because things had to be just right. For example, it had to be daytime for it to work. At night, nobody was likely to notice the chain hanging down with the handle on the end of it. And naturally, the victims had to be city folk. Had to be used to just reaching up and grabbing and pulling without a thought. Because when you stop to think about it, a chain like that, in a place like that, is about the most unlikely thing in the world. But it worked. 
It worked often enough to bring grins to the faces of any men who were around at the time, and enough to make the town women sometimes a little cool toward Charlie Mason when they went in to buy things at his store, because it was strictly a man's joke, and he was the man. Owensville is a small town in western Pennsylvania. It sits low in one end of a green-sided valley, just a few frame houses and stores strung along a main street. And that main street is on the one and only road that leads through the valley. A road that all the maps show to be a convenient and dependable connection between the Penn Turnpike and several other major routes, should you be heading south. So a lot of people drive through Owensville every week upwards of 200 or so. And there's always one or two of them in the mood to spend a little time in a restroom. The last Howard Johnson's is 20 miles back along the turnpike, and the road down into the valley is a bumpy one besides, and you know what that does to your innards. So they come driving around the bend under the trees, and their car wheels thump across the old wooden bridge across Miller's Creek. And once in a while, one of them would pull off the road into the yard beside Charlie Mason's general store because they'd spot his crescent-doored outhouse standing there. Charlie always kept it painted up so it'd be easier to see. Clean white with a red roof. And over the door he'd lettered, big enough to see from the bridge, public restroom. Then somebody'd get out of the car and go in, and a few minutes later, the chain that came up through the roof would yank down as whoever was inside reached up and pulled the handle. And then the big old cowbell on the roof, the biggest and noisiest Charlie had been able to find, would dance around in the mounting he'd made out of an angle iron and go, Blungle, blungle, block. After a minute, the door would open and the city folk would come out looking puzzled and kind of sneaky. They'd give a glance up at the roof and see the cowbell mounted there. Some of them might grin at the way they'd been had, but mostly they'd get in their car and drive off maybe a little faster than they would have ordinarily. If it was a woman, it was five times as funny, because some of the older men were always sitting around on the porch of Charlie's store playing pinochle, or lounging down by the bridge just talking. And when the woman would come out, they'd all grin at her, and those who had mustaches might twiddle them a bit, and she'd get redder than a bushel of tomatoes. Women drove off faster than anybody, usually. Some townspeople said it wasn't a very good way to advertise Owensville to passerby. But Charlie said that a town of 32 people didn't have to worry about advertising one way or the other. It just needed diversion. And since it was on his property, the cowbell stayed up. It was just a gag. It never really hurt anybody. Charlie, who can incline to philosophy when it suited him, said that the only person it could hurt was somebody who was plain ashamed of being human. And on the personal side, he admitted he got a kick out of seeing them all flustered up that way. Probably the outhouse and the bell would still be there and Charlie would still be getting his laughs if the fat lady in the green convertible hadn't decided to do some praying. It was a late July afternoon and plenty hot. The sun was reflecting like yellow-green fire off the hills around and everybody was sitting in the shade. Charlie Mason and Sam Nudson were sitting on the store porch playing gin and Luke Yates was just coming up the steps when they heard a car approaching. Charlie and Sam paused in their game, and Luke turned his gray head to look. Maybe this time, Charlie said. Luke Yates studied the dust cloud moving toward town above the tops of the trees. Coming pretty fast, he said. Bet they drive right on through. A dollar, said Charlie. You bounce harder when you drive fast. It's on, said Luke. Waiting, Charlie Mason leaned back in his chair and half closed his eyes. A lean, bald man in shirt sleeves, the hand holding his cards relaxed in his lap. They could hear the murmur of the creek carrying away the runoff from last night's rain, and the air was sweet with the breath of the fields off down the valley. Rich man, said Charlie, looking across the yard at his outhouse. 
Poor man, beggar man, thief. In there you're all alike in the eyes of God, I guess. Sam Nudson nodded thoughtfully. In the eyes of something, at any rate. All alike, said Luke Yates. Can't see your wallet from there, Charlie said. Your brains either, said Luke. After a moment, Charlie said, Some people's brains, maybe. They all nodded. A green convertible driven by a fat woman came around the bend, trailing dust, and rattled across the bridge. New York license plates, Luke said, squinting. Yup said Charlie. Maybe she'll bite. If she stops, Charlie said, maybe she will. The green convertible swerved off the road and pulled to a halt beside the store. The fat lady got out and looked around for a moment, blinking in the sun. She saw the three old men up on the porch and seemed to hesitate. Then she went around the back of the car and headed for the outhouse, walking a little defiantly, head up, her step steady and deliberate. The men exchanged glances. Luke handed Charlie a dollar bill. Do her some good, maybe, Charlie said. Shy type. Like we didn't know how it was, Sam said, shaking his head. Or maybe, Charlie said, because we do. <laughs> Funny. Luke sat down on the bottommost step and scuffed the dirt of the yard with a toe. They watched the cowbell atop the outhouse and listened to the murmur of the creek and heard a bird sing in the big elm out back of the store and waited. The chain that came up through the outhouse yanked down. The cowbell went blongle, blongle, block. Charlie puffed his pipe in satisfaction. Luke and Sam grinned. They waited for the fat lady to emerge. When she did, a moment later, it was looking puzzled as usual. But there was a difference. She stalked ten feet away from the outhouse, about-faced, and stared up at the cowbell. The men saw the back of her neck get red and redder still. Then she turned and came toward the porch. Her eyes were narrowed. Her hands were clenched into fists. Her mouth was a determined slash. She marched across the yard and stood facing the three men on the porch. She put her fists on her hips and glared. Luke and Sam stopped grinning. Charlie's pipe drooped. The sun beat down on the valley, the town, the yard, the outhouse, the fat woman. Her brow was shiny with perspiration. She stood there turned her cold blue glare on one man after another, like you'd sweep a gatling against enemy ranks. Luke said uncomfortably, Howdy, ma'am. You old lechers, said the fat woman tightly. Charlie and Luke and Sam exchanged dismayed looks. Now, ma'am, Charlie began. Don't say anything, you old lechers, the fat woman spat. I don't want to hear your gloating, oily voices. Of all the lecherous, salacious, lascivious things to do. I, Charlie said doubtfully, I guess we're a little old to be all those things. You're never too old to be evil-minded, she snapped. Even if your bodies are too old for ungodliness, her positive and indicating gaze rake them up and down and she saw the cards which Charlie held in his lap. Playing cards, too, she said, her lips curling. Well, I guess that follows. Follows what, ma'am? Luke asked, puzzledly. She saw the brown beer bottle resting on the box beside Charlie's chair. Alcohol, she hissed. She stood glaring up at them her breath coming fast and shallow, in a half-crouch that led Charlie Mason to wonder if she planned to climb right over the porch rail and lace into them physically. Then, as they watched in wary silence, her anger seemed to abate a little. Over a period of five seconds, her fist slowly unclenched. Her breath slowed. She straightened. 
she said in a low voice, It's the work of the devil. Anger is not the answer. The devil, ma'am? Charlie asked. He has made you do this. It is a device to keep lewd and licentious thoughts uppermost in your minds and corrupt your immortal souls. I suppose I shouldn't blame you for listening to him. So few of us are able to resist his honeyed mouthings. Ma'am, Luke said, I don't think you should get so excited on a hot day like this. Maybe a cold Coke? I'll pray, the fat lady said. I'll pray for the Lord to undo this devil's work. I'll pray that your souls be cleansed of the evil thoughts the Dark One has put there. Her pale blue eyes seemed a trifle fixed, and now she smiled, looking through the men who watched her worriedly. I, I'm almost proud that I should have suffered this humiliation in order to help him in his work. It is a small price to pay, to have been the object of your lustful thoughts. If I can save your souls by telling the Lord what you are doing and seeing to it that he stops you. She gave them a pitying, sympathetic look. You hate me now, she said, but when you are pure, you will thank me. She turned away and walked toward her car, head bowed. After a moment, Luke got up from the steps and sank into a chair on the porch. Does lust mean what I think it means? He asked. Guess it does, Charlie said. Well... Back when I could lust, I wouldn't ever have lusted her. They watched her get in and drive off, head still down in an attitude of prayer, eyes up so she could drive. The car reached the other end of the main street, followed the road into the trees, and vanished. Charlie stared contemplatively across the yard at his outhouse. Work of the devil, huh? He mused. Well, now doesn't that beat all? I bet heaven would kick that prayer right out of court. No, said a firm voice. It was heard. The three old men turned and saw a tall, handsome, blonde young man dressed in a neat and utterly clean white suit standing in the center of the yard. His face wore an expression of perfect peace and abounding love. Actually, he wasn't quite standing in the yard yet. When they turned, his feet were about four feet above the ground. As they watched, he floated slowly down until he was standing straight and tall and smiling a little. At that moment, timelessness descended upon the scene, upon Charlie Mason's store, the yard, the outhouse. Timelessness bounded the area from one edge of Charlie's yard to the other and from the road cleared of the woods out back, and that timelessness extended downward to a perfect point at the very center of the earth and extended upward in a perfect cone to heaven, and within its boundaries nothing that happened was visible to the outside world or indeed even happened as far as the outside world was concerned, for it all happened in timelessness in one of those particles of time substance which exists between microseconds on Earth's time continuum. Particles so small that they are of use only to angels, who in their work must often get between people in their intended deeds faster than seems possible. The young man's calm eyes looked into the minds of the three old men on the porch, and saw no evidence there of lewd or lascivious thoughts of the magnitude reported by the fat lady in her prayer. This did not surprise him, for exaggeration is the backbone of prayer, and the heavenly workers are used to it. In particular, are they used to nuisances like the fat lady, who continually turn in false alarms. Closing his eyes, the young man contacted his secretary cherubim in his office in heaven. The cherubim immediately returned the dossiers of Luke and Sam and Charlie Mason to the heavenly files, with no additional notations on the debit side. That done, for nothing is so urgent in the eyes of heaven as the latest data on souls, the young man turned his attention to the outhouse. 
he saw the cowbell and his lips pursed. He left the porch, walking lightly, and crossed the yard to the outhouse. The three old men watched him dreamily, unmoving, comprehending, gripped by timelessness and a sense of wonder. The young man opened the crescented door and went in. The chain yanked. The cowbell went blongle, blongle, block. The young man reappeared in the door and looked at the old man on the porch. He pursed his lips again and shook his head reprimandingly. He disappeared again. A second later, the cowbell and chain and angle iron disappeared too. The young man came out, dusting his hands with a white handkerchief. He came back across the yard and mounted the steps. He seated himself on the porch railing where he could face the three old men. Shame on you, he said. The men cast their eyes downward. The lady's accusations were somewhat excessive, the young man said. Your motives seem not to have been primarily lascivious, and I have so informed heaven, but still. Don't you think you should be ashamed of yourselves? He paused. You may nod if you wish. The men nodded eyes dreamy. After all, the young man said, isn't that rather a snide trick to play on tired travelers who seek your hospitality? Charlie Mason's mouth worked. His Adam's apple bobbed. Speak, said the young man. Gosh, Charlie said in a low voice. It was just a little joke. We never had nothing else in mind. I know, the young man said. I have discounted that element. I am speaking of the unkindness of the prank, the discomfiture which you impose on its victims. Oh, said Charlie. I, gosh, it just embarrassed him a little bit. That's all. I mean, that's all, isn't it? No, said the young man sternly. There is more. Think a moment, humans, upon that common structure in the yard. Think deeply, and you will realize that there is much more to it than meets the eye. Guess so, mumbled Charlie. It is a haven, a place of wondrous solitude, a refuge for those who would contemplate without interruption, as many a weary traveler yearns for. Guess so. In what other situation can you be so completely alone? In a perfect isolation not only permitted but sanctioned by your society. Why, humans, I could tell you of the most extraordinary moments of piety, a philosophical reflection of artistic conception, which we have recorded as occurring under such circumstances. I never thought of it that way, I guess, Charlie said slowly. I always did sort of think it leveled you off, though. The young man eyed them soberly. In late afternoon, he said, in the confines of the rustic outhouse, settled happily, hearing the quaint and natural sounds of the insects in the field, the fluttering of birds from branch to branch, do you know that in this day it is the only waking place where one may flee for the inner life? The old man looked down guiltily. It is ever a reminder of one's mortality, the young man said. It is man in his true aristocratic state, he said. And yet, at his most humble, he said. And now I will leave, he said. I hope you have seen the light and will no longer impose your crude, cruel joke on those who trust you for a moment's peace. He stood up. I hardly think that it was the work of the devil, however, as the lady seemed to think. A cloud seemed to come over the sun, but there were no clouds, so perhaps the sun dimmed. The birds and the trees were suddenly silent. Even the rustling leaves seemed to pause. It grew still darker, and a chill breeze sprang up. A head, whose face was dark and sharp and saturnine, 
appeared in the center of the yard. As the young man and the three old men watched, a tall, dark, gaunt man in a neatly tailored black suit rose from the ground and stood eyeing them mockingly. Wasn't it? he said in a thin, dry voice and laughed. The young man's lips tightened. He said nothing. The three old men were shrunken back in their chairs, staring. The devil, or perhaps the man in black was only part of the devil, for mysterious and complex are the ways he influences from his bronze throne in the exact center of Midwestern Gehenna, turned and sauntered to the outhouse. He entered. A moment later, the cowbell and chain and angle iron reappeared, though not quite as they had been. The chain seemed a little heavier, the cowbell a little larger and more shiny. The chain was yanked. The cowbell went blungle, blungle, block, block, a metallic sound of triumph. The man in black came out smirking. He made his way across the yard and mounted the porch steps. The young man frowned and lifted a shoulder so the fabrics of their clothing would not touch. The man in black went to the opposite end of the porch and sat down in a chair there. He looked out over the bridge and the murmuring creek and the trees beyond and took a pipe from a pocket. From another pocket, he took a live coal, which he dropped into the pipe. He puffed, and sulfur smell filled the air. The young man got up, sighing and bracing his hands on his knees. He stood for a moment regarding the man in black levelly. Then he went down the steps and across the yard and into the outhouse. Chain, cowbell, and mounting vanished. The man in black rose, still smiling. He passed the three old men, trailing sulfur smoke from his pipe. They shrank back, eyes wide. He went down into the yard and toward the outhouse. When he was halfway there, the young man emerged. They locked eyes. The young man's cool and determined, the other's hot and mocking and quite as determined. They passed each other, saying not a word. As the young man reached the porch steps, there came from the outhouse a loud, blongle, 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 block, block. And he paused, one foot on the steps, lips thinned. He seated himself deliberately, and only then did he look around. The new bell was twice as large as the former. The chain was heavier. It hung from a heavy cast iron mounting. The man in black came out. He sauntered back to the porch and seated himself. Half a non-existent hour passed. Non-existent because it passed in timelessness. The young man sat quietly, seeming to ponder. The man in black sat as quietly, smoking his sulfur. The three old men sat like mice, their eyes shuttling back and forth between the two antagonists. At last, the young man got up and walked slowly to the outhouse. The cowbell and its paraphernalia vanished, this time with a flash of white light. The man in black dropped a new lump of smoking sulfur into his pipe and tamped it down with his thumb. He walked to the outhouse and replaced the bell with a still bigger one. He yanked at the chain, and raucous bell sound filled the yard. He came back, and they sat around a while longer. The young man went out. The new bell vanished with a flash like diamond-blue lightning. The man in black sauntered out. In an enormous mounting atop the outhouse appeared a three-foot church bell. Its chain yanked down. Bung, bung, bung. The young man hurried across the yard, shoulders stiff, so quickly that the man in black, eyes mocking, was forced to stand aside at the very door of the outhouse to permit him to enter. 
the church bell and mounting vanished with a clap of indignant thunder. The man in black resumed his chair on the porch. The young man came slowly back across the yard and sat on the steps. After a few minutes, the young man said, That wasn't very funny. I hardly expected you to think so. This can go on for an awfully long time, you know. I have, said the man in black, an awfully long time. So do you. I think it's rather a silly thing for you to be concerning yourself with, the young man said. After all, it failed to incite these humans to any thoughts which could really be called sinful. Then it is an equally silly thing for you to concern yourself with, isn't it? I do so because it disturbs humans at a time when they may be nearest to God. I concern myself for the same reason. A non-existent half hour passed. The young man sat on the steps, his white suit impeccable, face thoughtful. The man in black sat and smoked and smirked. The three old men waited. Out in the yard, the outhouse stood, a battleground of good and evil. Its coat of white paint gleamed in the sun, which still stood high as a result of timelessness. Its red roof was a challenge. To the young man, staring moodily, the crescent in the door seemed a mocking, lopsided smile. On the roof stood a new and larger mounting containing a new and larger cowbell from which hung a new and heavier chain. Once the young man looked upward as if for guidance. Once he sighed and shook his head as if discouraged. One of us must win, he said finally. Always, the man in black nodded. If I destroy that bell, you will replace it. With a bigger one? If you replace it, I shall destroy it and then I shall replace it again. Do you really feel, asked the young man, that so small a purpose is worth such an effort? I might ask you the same question. Tiny building blocks may build a great edifice. The removal of one may contribute to its ruin. The creek murmured. Out in back of the store, the bird and the elm sang a hesitant note and then was silent. Charlie Mason cleared his throat. The man in black turned his hot, mocking glaze on Charlie. Charlie closed his mouth so hard his teeth clicked. The young man said, You need not fear him, mortal, only his temptations. Mister, Charlie said hesitantly, Yes, something sort of has me wondering. Yes. Well, I've been watching you two go at it, and, well, it sort of looks like this other feller has the edge on you right down the line. I mean, like he was all confident, and you just don't know how to get around him. The young man nodded somberly. I have been waiting for you to make that observation, human. It is true. Evil only has to be has only to exist for its work to be half done. It is a pit. You only have to fall into it. While to be good, you must exert yourself to climb out of the pit. He looks sadly at the smirking man in black. He walks confidently, for he requires no more than your acceptance of him, your tolerance, your passivity, your apathy. How can such a dynamic imbalance threaten him? He must only be to be strong. You must act to make him weak. The young man got up and stretched his arms. He looked upward at the sky again and seemed to be listening. He shrugged a little. It has been pointed out to me, he said, that I have demonstrated sufficiently. Now there are other matters to be attended to. I will destroy the bell once again. But mark these words well, humans. The dark one will create another, and it, like all his creations, will be a potential for evil. Not a large evil, perhaps, in this case, nor an evil in itself by the simple fact of its existence. 
Rather, his creations represent the potential of evil within yourselves. After he goes, I urge that you take down the bell and throw it away, destroy it, for as you have seen, he is powerless to prevent that. If he creates another, cast it aside also, keep doing so. The bell is but the symbol, the temptation. The conquest of evil can take place only in your own souls. You must act in the face of that temptation. The battleground is not this town, nor this yard, nor that structure, but in yourselves. In you is the pit. In you must be the strength and will to escape it. Do you understand? Three nods. The young man looked into their minds for the last time to assure himself of their purity. And in Charlie Mason's mind, he saw a tiny, half-hidden thought that struck him so forcibly that he almost smiled. Deep in Charlie's mind, beneath all his awe and wonder at the present situation, almost on a subconscious level, Charlie's sense of humor was still working. The sense of humor that had come up with the cowbell joke in the first place. Now, in Charlie's mind, was a solution for the present difficulty. Not a solution, actually, for the realities of the problem were already solved. Solved in the minds of the three old men in their firm resolve to do nothing ever again that would precipitate this kind of heavenly and satanic tug-of-war in the arena of their souls. But it would end this business of bell no bell very nicely. And not inappropriately, the young man thought. He would arrange the situation just as Charlie was mentally picturing it. And seeing what Charlie had in mind, finally brought a smile to the young man's face. He walked across the yard and entered the outhouse. The bell and chain and mounting vanished. This time, the young man was gone from sight just a little longer than any time previously. And when he came out, he looked just a tiny bit expectant. He waved in friendly fashion at the three men on the porch and rose into the sky faster and faster until he disappeared into the sun. The man in black got up from his chair and knocked out his pipe on a heel, or rather where a heel should have been, for it was now evident for the first time that he had black hooves instead of feet. The wad of sulfur fell to the boards and smoked and stank. He was right, you know, he said. The battle was in yourselves. And I suppose I've lost. I seem to be losing more and more these days, though I'm by no means through. I suppose if I put up another bell, you'll just take it down? He sighed and stretched out his long, black-clad arms wide as the young man had done. Well, it's been diverting. I think I will put up another bell just for the hell of it. He went down the steps, across the yard, into the outhouse. An enormous cowbell appeared on the roof. A prince of cowbells, a cowbell fit for the neck of Babe, the giant blue ox of Paul Bunyan. From it hung an inch-thick chain. The chain yanked down, the cowbell went blongle, blongle, block, block, block. And Charlie's plan, which the young man had arranged before leaving the confines of the outhouse, became evident. There was a loud flushing sound, a Herculean flush. The walls collapsed inward with a giant roar and an enormous swoosh and a gargantuan gurgle. A moment later, there was only a deep hole in the ground where the outhouse had stood and then the sides of the hole crumbled in to form a shallow pit. Timelessness ended. Luke scratched his head and stared from Sam over to Charlie. Did you two dream the same thing I did? His voice was odd. Sam pointed over to where the pit made a raw scar in the ground. Weren't no dream, 
Or if it was, we're still asleep. Charlie had a laughing glint in his eye. We're not asleep, and it wasn't any dream, especially the ending. Luke and Sam looked at him puzzled for a moment. Then they both laughed, and Charlie joined them. Bet that flush was the damnedest joke Satan ever had played on him. Luke gasped, holding his sides. One hell of a joke, Charlie, Sam choked. What I wouldn't give to have seen his face. Charlie agreed. He began to laugh even harder as he wondered if there was any soap and water down in Ghana. He had an idea Satan might be praying for some. End of Battle of the Bells by Jerome Bixby Read by Paul Hampton Brain Transference by Robert Duncan Milne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker Brain Transference How it resulted in changing the natures of its subjects by Robert Duncan Milne There is a certain private asylum in the vicinity of Oakland, the location of which it is not necessary for me to mention, as I am dealing not with names or places, but with facts. However, its identity will be apparent to many when I say that it is presided over by a gentleman who, besides being a physician and surgeon of acknowledged skill in his profession, holds a high rank not only in our local philosophic and scientific circles, but also in those of the world at large. Some might term Dr. G an enthusiast, and upon certain questions no doubt he is. Others might term him an empiric, and in the best acceptation of that term, that is to say, in so far as empirician deals with the endeavor to demonstrate the truth of theory by experiment, he is certainly open to the charge. The patients of Dr. G are of the better class. They pay well for their accommodation, and in turn receive the best attention which medical skill can afford. The number of cures which the doctor has effected in acute cases of hypochondria and mania, as well as in graver ones of almost hopeless insanity, attest alike the accuracy of his diagnosis and the wisdom of his treatment. That is one reason why his name as a man of science is as high as it is, and also explains why his establishment is patronized by the elite of the state. There is nothing about the appearance of Dr. G.'s residence in consonance with the conventional idea of the private asylum, sanitarium, or maison de sainte. On the contrary, it looks like the mansion of an affluent gentleman, situated within its own ample grounds, which are set out with lawns, flower beds, and shrubbery in the usual fashion. Only the initiated would understand the significance of the more than ordinarily high and strong iron railing which surrounds the grounds and the apparent needlessness of the lodgekeeper who opens the gates to visitors. I have had the honor of Dr. G.'s acquaintance for several years past, and frequently take the advantage of a standing invitation to visit him on Sunday. Some six weeks ago I paid him one of my accustomed visits, and was ushered as usual into the doctor's private study. While I waited, my eye ran over the multitudinous and heterogeneous details of the apartment, with which I was already so familiar. Cabinets filled with curious surgical instruments, other cabinets, the shelves of which contained numberless bottles of drugs and chemicals, others again reserved for chemical apparatus, mineralogical and botanical specimens, and what not. The walls covered with physiological and anatomical plates, the tables littered with the latest scientific magazines in all languages. In short, just such a study as is characteristic of a specialist and man of science combined. Presently the door opened and the doctor entered. He greeted me warmly as usual, but I thought I could detect a peculiar glitter of the eye, an unwanted flush of the cheek, and a certain preoccupation of manner which seemed to indicate that something unusual was engaging his attention, or ideas. "'I am glad you have come,' he said, after the customary greetings. "'I am about to perform a peculiarly interesting and novel experiment, and though it is not particularly hazardous to the patient, Still, I prefer to have the presence of a witness on whose discretion I can rely, and who also knows how to appreciate the 
true nature of such an experiment, in case... Here the doctor paused, as if at a loss for an expression. In case what? I remarked interrogatively. Well, in case, resumed the doctor slowly, the matter should become the subject of an official or judicial investigation. Mind you, he proceeded with greater emphasis, you are perfectly irresponsible for whatever may occur. You are merely an onlooker, that is all. But, said I, not feeling altogether reassured by the doctor's language, you have not told me the nature of this experiment. The doctor paused again, as if studying the best way to reply. You have read, I presume, he said at length, of a very beautiful piece of surgical work performed the other day in New York, in which the cranium of a cat and that of a dog were simultaneously opened, and a portion of the brain matter of each having been extracted, an interchange was effected? Yes, said I. I recollect reading about some such operation. Well, continued the doctor, no evil results followed, no inflammation set in, the brain matter thus interchanged, settled quite naturally into place, a complete junction was effected, a successful graft was made. I assented. Now, continued the doctor, what is good of one animal is good of another, is it not? If this interchange of cerebral matter can be effectually accomplished on the higher species of mammalia, such as the cat and dog unquestionably are, why not equally so in the case of the human mammal? Pardon me, doctor, I interpolated. Are we right in drawing such absolute conclusions from one, or even from a few scattered instances? Dr. Koch? Dr. Koch be... That is to say, interrupted the doctor, Dr. Koch is not the only practitioner who is an experimenter also. I wouldn't give a fig for one who couldn't use big chances if he had them. What though a few worthless elements are sacrificed in the pursuit of knowledge, are these at all comparable to the benefit that may spring from their sacrifice to the race in general? Do you mean, then, I interjected, but before I could proceed, the doctor, he is a very powerful man, brought his right fist down on the table before him, or before us, I should say, as we happened to be seated vis-a-vis -vis at the round center table of the study, with such emphasis as to momentarily rob me of the power of speech. I mean this, he said to the accompaniment of the blow on the table, I mean that you shall witness, whether you will or not, the experiment I am about to perform. The first thought that struck me when I heard these words was, can the doctor be mad? Is it possible that his mental faculties can have become impaired, contaminated, so to speak, by long association with those under his charge? The peculiar dilation and brilliancy of his eye, a feature which I had never before noticed, led me to think that such might indeed be the case. Then again, I had heard of mad doctors going mad through association. My train of thought was, however, very summarily interrupted by the doctor eyeing me as he lay back in his easy chair in, as I thought, a highly supercilious manner, and remarking in the calmest possible voice, "'Calm yourself, my dear friend. No harm can possibly befall you. You are simply hypnotized, that is all.' As the words fell from his lips, I at last directly realized my position. I could write a volume on my sensations, but they can be succinctly summed up in the statements that I had not the will to leave the easy chair in which I was seated. There was the most thorough and accurate perception of all that was going on around me. But it was of a passive character. The power of volition was gone. I thoroughly realized the humiliating and dependent position in which I was placed, robbed of my personality, robbed of my individuality, robbed of all that goes to make up responsibility and identity, yet the sensation was rather pleasing than otherwise. Now, observed the doctor as he rose from his seat with a triumphant glare and walked toward one of the bookcases, now that I have secured you for a witness, I will explain still further the drift of my meaning as to the experiment we were talking about. Stepping to the bookcase, he took down one of the books, turned over its leaves, and said, Hem. In order that you may fully realize the purport of the momentous experiments I am about to make, an experiment, my dear sir, before which Dr. Koch's victory over the microbes and bacilli will pale its ineffectual fires, 
I must make you thoroughly aware of what the science of phrenology drives at and teaches. Ah, here it is. What is phrenology but a theory of mental philosophy, founded on the observation and discovery of the functions of the brain, in so far as it is concerned in intellectual and emotional phenomena? Dr. Gall, for instance, was at last led to conclude first that the brain is the aggregate of many parts each serving for the manifestation of a particular mental faculty, and second, that all other conditions being equal, the size of each of these cerebral organs is a measure of the power of its function. There, went on the doctor triumphantly, what do you think of that? The size, mark you, the size of each of these cerebral organs is a measure of the power of its functions. Now suppose we reduce or increase the size of these organs. What then? We shall see. Here the doctor got up from his seat, walked over to one of the cabinets, that in which the surgical instruments were kept, opened it, and took thence one that looked like that known to carpenters as a bit stock or brace, only that instead of the ordinary boring bit at its lower extremity, there was what seemed to be a small hollow cylinder, about an inch in diameter, the lower rim of which was serrated with extremely fine teeth like a saw. The doctor held it up and examined it with an eye of critical approval, and ran his forefinger along the points of the saw teeth to test their sharpness. This, said he, tapping the instrument, is a trephine, and it is used for trepanning, otherwise boring holes in skulls, just the thing to get at the brain, he added absently. A hideous thought flashed across my brain. Did he mean to experiment on me? I felt that if he did, I was in his power. He seemed to divine what was passing in my mind. "'Don't be alarmed,' he remarked. "'I could have no object in practicing upon you when I have infinitely better material at hand. You are simply here as a witness.' So saying, he touched a handbell, which was presently answered by a servant. "'Go and tell Mr. Wyatt and Mr. Andrews that I would like to see them in my study.' said the doctor. The servants withdrew, and returned presently, accompanied by two gentlemen. One past middle age, the other still a young man. The bearing of the former was meek, almost to subservience, while the young man carried himself with an air of inflated dignity and pride, indicating at once from what peculiar form of monomania he suffered. "'Will your imperial majesty please be seated?' said the doctor to the younger man with a low bow, at the same time pointing to a seat. Mr. Wyatt, he added parenthetically to myself, merely imagines himself to be the Tsar of Russia. Perfectly harmless hallucination. Mr. Andrews, on the other hand, is afflicted with exactly the opposite delusion. He is the essence of humility and veneration. Imagines himself a medieval saint, St. Simeon Stylites, by preference. He rarely assumes any but a kneeling or standing position. On this occasion, however, he will take a seat. St. Simeon, addressing the older gentleman, as a mortification of the flesh, for the nonce, it behooveth thee to sit. The old gentleman, crossing his hands upon his breast, dropped into a chair, which the doctor set close beside that of his companion. There are several of my patients, went on the doctor, over whom I exert a habitual hypnotic influence, which it only requires a word to bring into action. We shall now proceed to business. So saying, the doctor wheeled a small table close to the seated men, and arranged upon it several shallow porcelain dishes, together with some surgical instruments, besides sponges, lint, plaster, a razor, and a lathing pot. Taking up the scissors, he stepped close to the younger man, and began clipping the hair close upon a knob or protuberance, which jutted abnormally from the top of the back of his head. After cropping the hair as short as he could with the scissors, he next lathered and shaved the spot over a circular area about the size of a dollar, the subject meanwhile giving no external evidence that he knew what was going on. The same operation was then gone through with the older man, though in his case the spot shaved was exactly on the top of the head, which towered upward like a miniature dome. He too remained perfectly passive. "'Now perhaps you may begin to understand what I am about,' observed the doctor. "'This gentleman,' indicating the younger man, has an abnormal development of brain in the region of the organ of self-esteem. St. Simeon, on the other hand, suffers from an excess of brain matter where the bump of veneration is located. I am simply going to equalize matters, that is all. The doctor now took up the instrument described as 
looking like a carpenter's brace, terminating in a small cylindrical saw, which I saw was pivoted upon a central pointed pin. This he carefully adjusted to the center of the shaven space at the back of the head of the younger man. We shall now proceed to take the conceit out of the Tsar of Russia, he said with a grim smile, as the brace turned swiftly in his practiced hand, and the keen teeth of the trephine ground their way through the crunching skull, the subject or patient, meanwhile, betraying no symptom of uneasiness or even appreciation of the matter. In a very few seconds the doctor desisted, laid down the trephine, and took up a silver forceps, with which he deftly removed a circular disc of bone, about the size of half a dollar, which he placed upon one of the porcelain capsules on the table. Turning quickly to his other patient, he performed the same operation upon him. Then, putting down the trephine, he took up a metal spatula, which he proceeded to insert first into the one cavity, then into the other, extracting from each a small portion of brain matter of the same size and shape, which he deposited side by side upon another capsule, letting them remain there. However, only for a moment, the interchange of Mr. Wyatt's brain to Mr. Andrew's skull, and vice versa being affected with all possible speed. The discs of skull were then carefully replaced, each in its respective cavity, with the usual adjustment of antiseptics, bandages, etc. All this I watched with a critical eye, as if it was the most natural operation in the world. Now, said the doctor coolly, as he adjusted the last bandage, we can congratulate ourselves that the operation has been most successfully performed. These gentlemen will never know what has happened unless they are told, and even then they would not be able to appreciate its significance. They can stay where they are for an hour or two yet, till the brains get settled. Let us go to dinner. This incident, as well as the peculiar circumstances under which I witnessed it, made a very deep impression upon my mind, but it was not till nearly a month afterward that I again visited the establishment of my friend the doctor. I found him in an unusual state of elation. Not only had a perfect junction of the brain matter thus transferred and interchanged from the one patient to the other been affected, but a most marvelous result had also taken place in their moral natures. The younger man, Mr. Wyatt, whose peculiar hallucination had arisen from his abnormal bump of self-esteem, and who had imagined himself the Tsar of Russia, was becoming quite rational, and bearing himself like an ordinary mortal, while Mr. Andrews, on the other hand, was no longer posing as St. Simeon Stylites but was beginning to exhibit decided symptoms of a healthy accretion of self-esteem. The doctor, however, is not going to give the result of his experience to the world as yet, but will wait till time shall have proved it, in either case, beyond the possibility of a relapse. End of Brain Transference by Robert Duncan Milne The Chasm by Bryce Walton this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman It was a war of survival, children against old men, and not a chance in the world to bridge the chasm by Bryce Walton. The old man's face was turning gray with fatigue under the wrinkled brown. He was beginning to get that deadly catching pain in his left chest, but he forced himself to move again, his ragged, dusty uniform of the old home guard blending into the rubble the way a lizard merges with sand. He hobbled behind a pile of masonry and peered through the crack. He angled his bald head, listening. His hands never really stopped quivering these days, and the automatic rifle barrel made a fluttering crackle on the concrete. He lowered the barrel, then wiped his face with a bandana. He would thought he heard a creeping rustle over there, but he didn't see any sign of the children. He'd been picked to reconnoiter because his eyes were only comparatively good. The truth was, he couldn't see too well especially when the sun, reflecting on the flat, naked angles of the ruined town, made his eyes smart and water, and now his head was beginning to throb. A dust devil danced away, whirling a funnel of dust. Sal Lemon looked at it, and then he slid from behind the rubble 
and moved along down the shattered block, keeping to the wall of jagged holes and broken walls that had once been the main street of town. He remembered with a wry expression on his face that he had passed his ninety-fourth birthday eight days back. He had never thought he could be concerned with whether he'd lived to see his ninety-fifth, because there had always been a feeling that by the time he was ninety-four he would have made his peace with himself and with whatever was outside. He moved warily like a dusty rabbit, in and out of the ruins, sinking through the sun's dead noon glare. He stopped and crouched in the shade behind a pile of slag that had once been an iron statue of some important historical figure. He contacted Captain Murphy on the walkie-talkie. Don't see any signs of children. Max says he saw some around there, Murphy yelled. Max is getting too old. Guess he's seeing things. He saw them right around there somewhere. Haven't seen him either. We haven't heard another word from Max here, Sal. The old man shrugged. How could the children have gotten through our post defenses? He looked away down the white glare of the street. You're supposed to be finding out, Murphy yelled. He had a good voice for a man too much short of being a hundred. He liked to show it off. Then Sal thought he saw an odd fluttering movement down the block. I'll report in a few minutes, he said, and then he edged along next to the angled wall. A disturbed stream of plaster whispered down and ran off his shoulder. Near the corner he stopped. Max, he said. He whispered it several times. Max? That you, Max? He moved nearer to the blob on the concrete. Heat waves radiated up around it, and it seemed to quiver and dance. He dropped the walkie-talkie. There wasn't even enough left of Max to take back in or put under the ground. He heard a metallic clank, and the manhole cover moved, and then he saw them, coming up over the edge. He ran, and behind him he could hear their screams and cries, and their feet striking hard over the blisters, cracks, and dried-out holes in the dead town's skin. He dodged into the rubble, and fell, and got up, and kept on running. The pain was like something squeezing in his belly, and he kept on running because he wanted to live and because he had to tell others that the children were indeed inside the post defenses. He knew now how they had come in, through the sewers, under the defenses. He began to feel and hear them crawling, digging, moving, all over beneath the ruins, waiting to come out in a filthy, screaming stream. Sal was still resting at the corner of the old warehouse by the river. The lantern hung on a beam, and the dark floor was covered with deep, moving shadows. Captain Murphy was pacing in a circle, looking like something sewn together by a nervous seamstress. Dr. Cartley sat on a canvas chair, elbows on knees, chin in his hands. He kept looking at the floor. He was in his early eighties, and sometimes seemed like a young man to Sal. His ideas, maybe. He thought differently about the children, and where things were going. "'We're going to get out tonight,' Captain Murphy said again. "'We'll get the barge loaded, and we'll get out.' Saul sat up a bit. The pills had made his heart settle down a bit, and his hands were comparatively calm. Is the barge almost loaded now? It better be, Saul said. They'll attack any minute now. I know that much. Another hour's all we need. If they attack before then, we can hold them off long enough to get that barge into the river. Once we get into the river with it, we'll be safe. We can float her down and into the sea. Somewhere along the coast we'll land, and whatever it is will be fine for us. We'll have licked the children. They know we've got the only edible food stores in God knows how many thousands of miles 
in this goddamn wasteland. They can't live another month without this stuff, and we're taking it all down the river. That's right, isn't it, Doc? Cartley looked up. But as I said before, squeezing a little more life out of ourselves doesn't mean anything to me. What do we want to get away and live a little longer for? It doesn't make sense, except in a ridiculous, selfish way. So we live another month, maybe six months, or a year longer. What for? Saul glanced at Murphy, who finally sat down. We want to live, Murphy said thickly, and he gripped his hands together. Survival, it's a natural law. What about the survival of the species? Cartley asked. By running out and taking the food, we're killing ourselves anyway. So I don't think I'll be with you, Murphy. What are you going to do, stay here? They'll torture you to death. They'll do to you what they did to Donaldson and all the others they've caught. You want to stay for that kind of treatment? We ought to try. Running off, taking all this food that means they're sure to die inside a few weeks. They might catch a few rats or birds, but there aren't even enough of those around to sustain life beyond a few days. So we kill the future, just so we can go on living a little longer. We've got no reason to live, when we know the race will die. My wife refused to fight them. They killed her, that's true, but I still think she was right. We've got to make one more attempt to establish some kind of truce with the children. If we have that, then we might be able to start building up some kind of relationship. The only way they can survive, even if they had food, is to absorb our knowledge. You know that. Without our knowledge and experience, they'll die anyway, even if they had a thousand years of food supplies. It can't be done, Murphy said. Cartley looked at the shadows for a long time. Finally, he shook his head. I don't have any idea how to do it, but we should try. We can't use discipline and power because we're too weak and too outnumbered. We'd have to do that first in order to teach them, and we can't. So there has to be some other way. Faith, Sal said. He shook his head. They don't believe in anything. You can't make any appeal to them through faith or ethics or any kind of code of honor. Nothing like that. They're worse than animals. Cartley stood up wearily and started to walk away. They hate us he said. That's the only thing we're sure of. We're the means, and they're the ends. We made them what they are. They're brutalized and motivated almost completely by hatred. And what's underneath hatred? He fumed back toward Murphy. Fear. Sal stood up. I never thought of them as being afraid, he said. That doesn't matter, Murphy said. It's the hate and the vicious brutality we have to deal with. You do whatever you want to do, Cartley. We have voted, and we voted to move the stuff out tonight on the barge. The world we help make is dead, Cartley. The children grew up in a world we killed. We've all got bad consciences, but we can't do anything about it. The chasm between them and us is too wide. It was wide even before the bombs fell, and the bombs made it a hell of a lot wider. Too wide to put any kind of bridge across now. Just the same, we ought to die trying, Cartley said. When he went outside, Sal followed him. The barge was about loaded. All outer defense units had been pulled in and were concentrating on the head of the pier behind the walls of sandbags. Burp guns and machine guns were ready, and the barge lay alongside the pier in the moonlight, like a dead whale. There were several sewer openings near the head of the pier. Men were stationed around these sewers with automatic rifles, hand grenades, and flamethrowers. 
Sal walked to where Cartley stood leaning against the partly closed door of the rotting warehouse. Jagged splitters of steel and wood angled out against the sky. After a while, Sal said softly, Well, what would we try to do, Doc? Cartley turned quickly. Some of the anguish in his eyes had gone away, and he gripped Sal's shoulders in hands surprisingly strong for so old a man. You want to help me try? I guess I do. Like you said, we only have a little time left anyway. If we can't help the children, what's the good of it? They stood there in the shadows a while, not saying anything. This way, Cartley said. He led Sal down away from the pier and along the water's edge. Dry reeds rustled, and mud squished under their shoes. Here, Cartley said. There was a small, flat-bottomed rowboat, and in it were several cartons of food supplies, all in cans. There were also several large tins of water. We'll need a little time, Cartley said. We'll have to wait. I figure we'll row upstream maybe a few hundred yards and hole up in one of those caves. We can watch, Sal. We can watch and wait and try to figure it out. Sure, Sal said. That seems the only way to start. Cartley sat down on the bank near the boat, and Sal sat down too. The children, said Cartley, never had a chance to be any other way. But we're the oldsters, and we've got this obligation, Sal. Man's a cultural animal. He isn't born with any inherent concepts of right or wrong, or good or bad, or even an ability to survive on an animal level. We have to be taught to survive by the elders, Sal. And we're the elders. He hesitated. We're the only ones left. A flare of horrid light exploded over the warehouse, downriver, and it lit up Cartley's face and turned it a shimmering crimson. His hands widened to a perfect roundness, and he raised his hands in a voiceless scream to stop the sudden explosions of burp guns, grenades, machine guns, and rifles. Looking downriver then, Saul could see the flames eating up through the warehouse. The pier, the barge, everything for a hundred square yards was lit up as bright as day and the flare spread out over the river and made a black, ominous shadow of the opposite bank. They're getting away, Cartley said. Saul watched the barge move out. The children came screaming out of the blazing warehouse, over and the pier, streamed into the water. But a steady blast of fire from the barge drove them back, and in a few minutes the barge dissolved downriver into darkness. Cartley's hands were shaking as he gripped Saul's arm. Let's go now. We need time. Time may help us a lot, Sal. We have to wait and watch. We can figure something out. Saul heard the screams and mocking, savage cries coming up over the water, and then the jagged cries of some oldsters who hadn't managed to get away. Still looking downstream toward the blazing pier, Sal pushed Cartley into the rowboat, and they shoved off. Sal started rowing, but he kept looking back. They should have put them in the same shelter with us, Sal said. That would have made a difference. But they put us in separate shelters. Only the oldsters and the youngsters had been saved. The old out of pity because they were helpless and had been granted the safety of shelters. The young because they were symbols of hope and had been granted shelters, too. No, said Cartley. It started long before that. The chasm was built up long before the war. This alienation between the youth and the old, between the sun and the seed, that's what we have to bring back, Sal. Between us we have stored up a hundred and seventy-nine years of human culture. There isn't a kid back there, Sal, that's more than twelve years old. We'll find a way, Sal said. The rowboat was about fifteen feet from the thick reeds 
growing in the marshy ooze of the bank. Cartley heard the sound first and turned, his face white. When Sal looked toward the bank, he saw a girl. She came on out from the curtain of reeds and looked at them. She was perfectly clear in the moonlight, standing there. She wore a short, ragged print dress, and she had long hair that seemed silken and soft and golden in the moonlight, even though it, her dress, her little legs and her face, were streaked with mud. Sal hesitated, then pulled heavily on his left oar, and the boat nosed toward her. Up close Sal could see her face, the clear blue eyes wet, and the tears running down her cheeks. The girl reached out and asked in a sobbing breath, Grandpa? Is that you, Grandpa? Oh, God! Oh, God! Cartley said. He was crying as he picked her up and got her into the boat. He was rocking her in his arms, and half crying and half laughing, as Sal rowed the boat upstream. Yes, yes, honey, Sal heard Cartley say over and over. I'm your grandpa, honey. Don't cry. Go to sleep now. I'm your grandpa, and I've been looking for you, honey. And now everything's going to be all right. It's funny, Sal thought, as he kept rowing upstream. It's a funny thing how one little girl remembered her grandpa, and now maybe that was the beginning of the bridge across the chasm. The End of The Chasm by Bryce Walton Contamination Crew by Alan E. Norse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Glenn Carruthers Contamination Crew by Alan E. Norse The following is taken from the files of the Medical Disciplinary Board, Hospital Earth, from the preliminary hearings read The Profession vs. Samuel B. Jenkins, Physician, First Court, Medical Affairs, Final Action, Pending. Comcod S221VB73, Voroshilov Sector, 4th Galactic Period 22-23-41, General Survey Ship Mercy to Hospital Earth, Fire, Fastest possible routing, priority unassigned. To Lucius Darby, Physician Grade 1, Black Service Director of Galactic Periphery Surfaces, Hospital Earth. From Samuel B. Jenkins, Physician Grade 6, Red Service General Practice Patrol Ship Lancet, attached GSS Mercy Pro Tem. Sir, the following communication is directed to your attention in hopes that it may anticipate various charges which are certain to be placed against me as a physician of the Red Service, upon the return of the General Survey Ship Mercy to Hospital Earth, expected arrival four months from above date. These charges will undoubtedly be preferred by one Tervold Nielsen, Physician Grade 2 of the Black Service and Commander of the Mercy on its current survey mission into the Voroshilov Sector. Exactly what the charges will be, I cannot say, since the Black Doctor in question refuses either audience or communication with me at the present time. However, it seems likely that treason, incompetence, and mutinous insubordination will be among the milder complaints registered. It is possible that even malpractice might be added, so you can readily understand the reasons for this statement. The following will also clarify my attached request that the GSS Mercy, upon arrival in orbit around Hospital Earth, be met immediately by a decontamination ship carrying a vat of hydrochloric acid, concentration 3.7%, measuring no less than 20 by 30 by 50 feet, and that quarantine officials be prepared to place the entire crew of the Mercy under physical and psychiatric observation for a period of no less than six weeks upon disembarkation. The facts in brief are as follows. Three months ago, as crew of the General Practice Patrol Ship Lancet, my colleague Green Dr Wallace Stone and myself began investigating certain peculiar conditions existing on the fourth planet of Morkai, Voroshilov Sector, Class 1, Medical Service Contract. The entire population of that planet was found to be suffering from a mass psychotic delusion of rather spectacular proportions, namely that they and their entire planet were in imminent danger of being devoured in toto by an indestructible non-humanoid creature 
which they called a hlog. The Morakivi were insistent that a hlog had already totally consumed a non-existent outer planet in their system and was now hard at work on neighbouring Morkai 5. It was their morbid fear that Morkai 4 was next on its list. No amount of reassurance could convince them of the foolishness of these fears, although we exhausted our energy, our patients, and our food and medical supplies in the effort. Ultimately, we referred the matter to the Grey Service, feeling confident that it was a psychiatric problem rather than medical or surgical. We applied to the GSS Mercy to take us aboard to replenish the ship's supplies and provide us a much-needed recovery period. The Black Doctor in command approved our request and brought us aboard. The trouble began two days later. There were three classes of dirty words in use by the men who travelled the spaceways back and forth from Hospital Earth. There were the words you seldom used in public, but which were colourful and descriptive in private use. Then there were the words which you seldom used even in private, but which effectively relieved feelings when directed at mirrors, inanimate objects, and people who had just left the room. Finally, there were those words that you just didn't use, period. You knew they existed, you'd heard them used at one time or another, but to hear them spoken out in plain Earth English was enough to rock the most space-hardened of the galactic pill peddlers back on his well-worn heels. Black Dr. Tervold Nielsen's Earth English was spotty at best, but the word came through without any possibility of misinterpretation. Red Dr. Sam Jenkins stared at the little man and felt his face turning as scarlet as the lining of his uniform cape. But that's ridiculous, he finally stammered, quite aside from the language you used to suggest it. Ah, so the word still has some punch left, eh? <laughs> at least you puppies bring something away from your medical training, even if it's only to booze. The black doctor scowled across the desk at Jenkins' lanky figure, but sometimes, my good doctor, it is better to face a fact than to wait for that fact to face you. Sometimes we have to crawl out of our ivory towers for a minute or two, you know? Jenkins reddened again. He had never had any great love for physicians of the black service, who did, but he found himself disliking this short, blunt-spoken man even more cordially than most. Why implicate the Lancet? he burst out. You've landed the Mercy on plenty of planets before we brought the Lancet aboard her but we did not have it with us before the Lancet came aboard, and now we do have it. The implication is obvious. You have brought aboard a contaminant. He said it again. Red Dr. Jenkins' face darkened. The Green Doctor and I have maintained the Lancet in perfect conformity with the sterility code. We've taken every precaution on both landing and disembarking procedures. What's more, we spent the last three months on a planet with no mutually compatible flora or fauna. From Hospital Earth's viewpoint, Morkai 4 is sterile. You made only the briefest check stop on Morkai 5 before joining you. It was a barren rock, but we did contaminate it again after leaving. If you have a contaminant on board your ship, sir, it didn't come from the Lancet, and I won't be held responsible. It was strong language to use to a black doctor, and Sam Jenkins knew it. There were doctors of the Green and Red Service who had spent their professional lives on some God-forsaken planetoid at the edge of the galaxy for saying less. Red Dr. Sam Jenkins was too near the end of his internship, too nearly ready for his permanent planetary appointment with the rank, honour and responsibility it carried to lightly risk throwing it to the wind at this stage. But a Red Doctor does not bring a contaminant aboard a survey ship, he thought doggedly, no matter what the Black Doctor says. Nielsen looked at the young man slowly. Then he shrugged. Of course, I'm merely a pathologist. I realise that we know nothing of medicine, nor of disease, nor of the manner in which disease is spread. All this is beyond our scope. But perhaps you'll permit one simple question from a dull old man just to humour him? Jenkins looked at the floor. I'm sorry, sir. Just so. You've had a very successful cruise this year with the Lancet, I understand. Jenkins nodded. A most successful cruise, four planets elevated from Class 4 to Class 2 contracts. They all tell me, more or two elevated from Class 6 to Class 1, with certain special riders. A plague panic averted on Setman 1, and a very complex virus bacteria symbiosis unravelled on Orb 3. 
an illustrious record. You and your colleague from the Green Service are hoping for a year's exemption from training. I imagine... The Black Doctor looked up sharply. You searched your holes after leaving Morkai planets, I presume? Jenkins blinked. Why, no, sir. That is, we decontaminated according to... I see. You didn't search your holds. I suppose you didn't notice your food supplies dwindling at an alarming rate? No. The Red Doctor hesitated. Not really. Ah. The Black Doctor closed his eyes wearily and flipped an activator switch. The scanner on the far wall buzzed into activity. It focused on the rear storage hold of the Mercy, where the little lancet was resting on its landing rack. Look closely, Doctor. At first Jenkins saw nothing, then his eyes caught a long, pink, glistening strand lying across the floor of the hold. The scanner picked up the strand, followed it to the place where it emerged from a neat pencil-sized hole in the hole of the lancet. The strand snaked completely across the room and disappeared through another neat hole in the wall into the next storage hold. Jenkins shook his head as the scanner flipped back to the hole in the lancet's hole. Even as he watched, the hole enlarged and a pink blob began to emerge. The blob kept coming and coming until it rested soggily on the edge of the hole. Then it teetered and fell splat on the floor. Friend of yours? The black doctor asked casually. It was a pink heap of jelly just big enough to fill a scrub bucket. It sat on the floor quivering noxiously. Then it sent out pseudopods in several directions, probing the metal floor. After a few moments it began oozing along the strand of itself that lay on the floor and squeezed through the hole into the next hold. Ugh, said Sam Jenkins, feeling suddenly sick. The hydroponic tanks are in there, the black doctor said. You seen one of those before? Not in person, Jenkins shook his head weakly, only in pictures. It's a log. We thought it was only a Morkovi persecution fantasy. This thing is growing fast for a persecution fantasy. We spotted it eight hours ago, demolishing what was left of your food supply. It's twice as big now as it was then. Well, we've got to get rid of it, said Jenkins, suddenly coming to life. Amen, Doctor. I'll get the survey crew alerted right away. We won't waste a minute, and my apologies. Jenkins was hurrying to the door. I'll get it cleared out of here fast. I do hope so, said the Black Doctor. The thing makes me ill just to think about it. I'll give you a clean ship report in 24 hours, the Red Doctor said confidently as he could, and beat a hasty retreat down the corridor. He was wishing fervently that he felt as confident as he sounded. The Morkivy had described the log in excruciating detail. Here and Green Doctor Stone had listened and smiled sadly at each other day after day marvelling at the fanciful delusion. Flogs, indeed. And such creatures to dream up, eating, growing, devouring plant, animal, and mineral without discrimination. And the Morkivy had stoutly maintained that this log of theirs was indestructible. Green Doctor, Wally Stone, true to his surgical calling, was a man of action. You mean there is such a thing? He exploded when his partner confronted him with the news. For real? Not just somebody's pipe dream? There is, said Jenkins, and we've got it, here, on board the Mercy. It's eating like hell and gone, and doubling its size every eight hours. Well, what are you waiting for? Toss it overboard. Fine. And what happens to the next party it happens to land on? We're supposed to be altruists, remember? We're supposed to worry about the health of the galaxy? Jenkins shook his head. Whatever we do with it, We have to find out just what we're tossing before we toss. The creature had made itself at home aboard the Mercy. In the spirit of uninvited guests since time immemorial, it had established a toehold with remarkable asperity, and now was digging in for the long winter. Drawn to the hydroponic tanks like a flea to a dog, the Thorg had settled its bulbous pink body down in their murky depths with a contented gurgle. As it grew larger, the tank levels grew lower, the broth clearer. The fact that the 25 crewmen of the Mercy depended on those tanks for their food supply on the four-month run back to Hospital Earth didn't seem to bother the Thorg a bit. 
it just sank down wetly and began to eat. Under Jenkins' whip hand and with Green Doctor Stone's assistance, the survey crew snapped into action. Survey was the soul and lifeblood of the medical services supplied by Hospital Earth to the inhabited planets of the galaxy. Centuries before, during the era of exploration, every Earth ship had carried a rudimentary survey crew, a physiologist, a biochemist, an immunologist, a physician, to determine the safety of landings on unknown planets. Other races were more advanced in technological and physical sciences, in sales, in merchandising, but in the biological sciences, men of Earth stood unexcelled in the galaxy. It was not surprising that their casual offerings of medical services, wherever their ships touched, had led to a growing demand for those services, until the first medical services contract with Daneb 3 had formalised the planetary specialty. Earth had become hospital Earth, physician to a galaxy, surgeon to a thousand worlds, midwife to those susceptible to midwifery, and psychiatrist to those whose inner lives zigged when their outer lives zagged. In the early days, it had been a haphazard arrangement, but gradually district services appeared to handle problems in medicine, surgery, radiology, psychiatry, and all the other functions of a well-appointed medical service. Under the direction of the Black Service of Pathology, hospital ships and survey ships were dispatched to serve as bases for the tiny general practice patrol ships that answered the calls of planets under contract. But it was the survey ships that did the basic dirty work on any new planet taken under contract, outlining the physiological and biochemical aspects of the races involved, studying their disease patterns, their immunological types, their susceptibility to medical, surgical or psychiatric treatment. It was an exacting service to perform, and the survey did an exacting job. Now, with their own home base invaded by a hungry pink jelly blob, the survey crew of the Mercy dug in with all fours to find a way to exercise it. The early returns were not encouraging. Bowman, the anatomist, spent six hours with the creature. He'd go after the functional anatomy first, he thought as he approached the task with gusto, special organs, vital organ systems. After all, every Achilles had its heel. Functional would spot it if anything would. Six hours later, he rendered a preliminary report. It consisted of a blank sheet of paper and an expression of wild frustration. What's this supposed to mean? Jenkins asked. Just what it says. But it says nothing. That's exactly what it means. Bowman was thin, wistful-looking man, with a hawk nose and a little brown moustache. He subbed as ship's cook when things were slow in his specialty. He wasn't a very good cook, but what could anyone do with the sludge from the harvest shelf of a hydroponic tank? Now, with the log incumbent, there wasn't even any sludge. I drained off a tank and got a good look at it before it crawled over into the next one, Bowman said. Ugly bastard. But from a strictly anatomical standpoint, I can't help you a bit. Green Dr. Stone glowed over Jenkins' shoulder at the man. But surely you can give us something. Bowman shrugged. You want it technical? Any way you like. Your Thlorg is an ideal anamorph. A nothing. Protoplasm. Just protoplasm. Jenkins looked up sharply. What about his cellular organisation? No cells, said Bowman. Unless they're submicroscopic. And I'd need an electron peaker to tell you that. No organ system? Not even an integument. You saw how slippery he looked? That's why. There's nothing holding him in but energy. Now look, said Stone. He eats, doesn't he? He must have waste materials of some sort. Bowman shook his head unhappily. Sorry. No urates. No nitrates. No CO2. Anyway, he doesn't eat because he has nothing to eat with. He absorbs. And that includes the lining of the tanks, which he seems to like as much as the contents. He doesn't bore those holes he makes. He dissolves them. They sent Bowman back to quarters for a hot bath and a shot of Happy-O, and looked up Frunter, the biochemist. Frunter was glaring at a paper of electrophoretic patterns and pulling out chunks of hair around his bald spot. He gave them a snarl and shoved a sheaf of papers into their hands. Metabolic survey? Jenkins asked. Plus, said Frunter, you're not going to like it either. Why not? If it grows, it metabolizes. If it metabolizes, we can kill it. Axiom number 17, paragraph number 4. Oh, it metabolizes all right. But you'd better find yourself another axiom pretty quick. 
Why? Because it not only metabolizes, it consumes. There's no sign of the usual protein, carbohydrate, fat metabolism going on here. This baby has an enzyme system that's straight from hell. It bypasses the usual metabolic activities that produce heat and energy and gets right down to basic, basic. Jenkins swallowed. What do you mean? It attacks the nuclear structure of whatever matter the creature comes in contact with. There's a partial mass energy conversion in its rawest form. The creature goes after carbon bearing substances first, since the sea seems to break down more easily than anything else. Hence its preference for plant and animal material over non sea stuff, but it can use anything if it has to. Jenkins stared at the little biochemist. An image in his mind of the pink creature in the hole growing larger by the minute as it ate its way through the hydroponics, through the dry stores, through. Is there anything it can't use? If there is, I haven't found it, Runcher said sadly. In fact, I can't see any reason why it couldn't consume this ship and everything in it, right down to the last rivet. They walked down to the hold for another look at their uninvited guest, and most wished they hadn't. It had reached the size of a small hippopotamus, although the resemblance ended there. Twenty hours had elapsed since the survey had begun. The Thlorg had used every minute of it, draining the tanks, engulfing dry stores, devouring walls and floors as it spread out in search of food, leaving trails of eroded metal wherever it went. It was ugly, ugly in its pink shapelessness, ugly in its slimy, half-sentient movements in its very purposefulness, but its ugliness went even deeper, stirring primordial feelings of revulsion and loathing in their minds as they watched it oozing implacably across the hold to another dry storage bin. Wally Stone shuddered, it's grown, too fast, Bowman charts it as a geometric progression. Stone scratched his jaw as a lone pink pseudopod pushed out of the floor toward him. Then he leaped forward and stamped on it, severing the strand from the body. The seven member quivered and lay still for a moment. Then it flowed back to rejoin the body with a wet gurgle. Stone looked at his half-dissolved shoe. Egotropism, Jenkins said. Bowman played around with that too. A severed piece will rejoin if it can. If it can't, it just takes up independent residence, and we have two hlogs. What happens to it outside the ship? Stone wanted to know. Falls dormant for several hours, and then splits into a thousand independent chunks. One of the boys spent half of yesterday out there gathering them up. I tell you, this thing is equipped to survive. So are we, said Dr. Stone grimly. If we can't outwit this free-floating glob of obscenity, we deserve anything we get. Let's have a conference. They met in the pilot room. The black doctor was there, so were Bowman and Hunter. Chambers, the physiologist, was glumly clasping and unclasping his hands in the corner. The geneticist, Pitchione, drew symbols on a scratch pad and stared blankly at the wall. Jenkins was saying, Of course, these are only preliminary reports, but they serve to outline the problem. That's not just an annoyance any longer. It's a crisis. We'd all better understand that. The black doctor cut him off with a wave of his hand and glowered at the papers as he read through them minutely. As he sat hunched at the desk with the black cowl of his office hanging down from his shoulders, he looked like a squat black judge, Jenkins thought, a shadow from the Inquisition, a passer of spells. But there was no medievalism in black Dr. Nielsen. In fact, it was for that reason, and only that reason, that the black service had come to be the leaders and the whips the executors and directors of all the manifold operations of Hospital Earth. The physicians of the General Practice Patrol were fledglings, newly trained in their specialties, inexperienced in the rigorous discipline of medicine that was required of the directors of permanent planetary dispensaries in the heavily populated systems of the galaxy. On outlying worlds, where little was known of the ways of medicine, the temptation was great to substitute faith for knowledge, Kant for investigation, nonsense rituals for hard work. But the physicians of the black service were always waiting to jerk wandering neophytes back to the scientific disciplines that made the service of hospital earth so effective. 
The black doctors would not tolerate sloppiness. Show me the tissue, doctor, they would say. Prove to me that what you say is so. Prove that what you did was valid medicine. Their laboratories were the morgues and autopsy rooms of a thousand planets, the temples of truth from which no physician since the days of Pasteur and Lister could escape for long and retain his position. The black doctors were the pragmatists, the gadflies of hospital earth. For this reason, it was surprising to hear Black Dr. Nielsen saying, Perhaps we are being too scientific just now. When the creature has exhausted our food stores, it will look elsewhere for food. Perhaps we must cut at the tree and not at the root. A frontal attack, said Jenkins. Just so. Its enzyme system is its vulnerability. Enzyme systems operate under specific optimum conditions, right? And every known enzyme system can be inactivated by adverse conditions of one sort or another. A physical approach may tell us how in this case. Meanwhile, we will be on emergency rations and hope that we don't starve to death finding out. The black doctor paused, looking at the men around him. And in case you are thinking of enlisting help from outside, forget it. We have this thing isolated, and we're going to keep it that way as long as I command this ship. They went gloomily back to their laboratories to plan their frontal attack. That was the night that Hunter disappeared. He was gone when they came to wake him from his sleep period. His bunk had been slept in, but he wasn't in it. In fact, he wasn't anywhere on the ship. But he couldn't just vanish, the black doctor burst out when they told him the news. Maybe he's hiding somewhere. Maybe this business was working on his mind. Green Dr. Stone took a crew of men to search the ship again, even though he considered it a waste of precious time. He had his private convictions about where Hunter had gone. So did every other man on the ship, including Jenkins. The log had stopped eating, huge and round and wet and ugly. It squatted in the afterhold, quivering gently without any other sign of life. Surfeited, like a fat man after a turkey dinner. Jenkins reviewed progress with the others. No stone had been left unturned. They had sliced the hog and squeezed it. They had boiled it and frozen it. They had dropped chunks of it in acid vats and covered other chunks with desiccants and alkalis. Nothing seemed to bother it. A cold environment slowed down its activity, true, but it also stimulated the process of fission. Warmed up again, the portions sucked back together again and resumed eating. Heat was a little more effective, but not much. It stunned the creature for a brief period, but it would not burn. It hissed frightfully and gave off an overpowering stench and curled up at the edges, but as soon as the heat was turned off, it began to recover. In Frunter's lab, Chunks of the hog sat in a dozen vats on tables and in sinks. Some contained antibiotics, some concentrated acids, some desiccants. In each vat, a blob of pink protoplasm wriggled happily, showing no sign of discomfiture. On another table were the remains of Hunter's unsuccessful attempt to prepare an anti hog serum. But no Hunter. He was down there with the thing all day, Bowman said sadly. He felt it was his responsibility, really. Hunter thought biochemistry was the answer to all things, of course. Very conscientious man. But he was in bed. He claimed he did his best thinking in bed. Maybe he had a brainstorm and went down to try it out, and... Yes, Jenkins nodded sourly, and... He walked down the row of vats. You'd think that at least concentrated sulfuric would desiccate it a little, but it's just formed a crust of coagulated protein around itself and sits there. Bowman peered over his shoulder, his moustache twitching. But it does desiccate. If you use enough long enough. How about that concentrated hydrochloric? Same thing, maybe a little more effective, but not enough to count. Okay, next we try combinations. There's got to be something the wretched beast can't tolerate. There was, of course. Green Dr. Stone brought it to Jenkins as he was getting ready to turn in for a sleep period. Jenkins had checked to make sure double guards were posted in the hawk's vicinity, 
and jolted them with sleep knot to keep them on their toes. All the same, he tied a length of stout cord around his ankle just to make sure he didn't do any sleepwalking. He was tying it to the bunk when Stone came in with a pan in his hand and a peculiar look on his face. Take a look at this, he said. Jenkins looked at the sticky brown mass in the tray, and then up at Stone. Where did you find it? Down in the hold. Our hog has broken precedent. It's rejected something that it ate. Yeah, what is it? I don't know. I'm taking it to Nielsen for paraffin sections, but I know what it looks like to me. Hmm, I know. Jenkins felt sick. Stone headed up the path lab, leaving the Red Doctor settled in his bunk. Ten minutes later, Jenkins sat bolt upright in the darkness. Frantically, he untied himself and slid into his clothes. Idiot, he growled to himself. Seventh son of a seventh son. Five minutes later, he was staring at the vats in Hunter's laboratory. He found the one he was looking for. A pink blob of log wiggled slowly around the bottom. Jenkins drew a beaker of distilled water and added it to the fluid in the vat. It hissed and spluttered and sent up quantities of acrid steam. When the steam had cleared away, Jenkins peered in eagerly. The pink thing in the bottom was turning a sickly violet. It had quit wiggling as Jenkins watched. The violet colour changed to mud grey, then to black. He prodded it with a stirring rod. There was no response. With a whoop, Jenkins buzzed Bowman and Stone. We've got it, he shouted to them when they appeared. Look, look at it. Bowman poked and probed and broke into a wide grin. The piece of log was truly and sincerely dead. It inactivates the enzyme system and renders the base protoplasm vulnerable to anything that normally attacks it. What are we waiting for? They began tearing the laboratory apart searching for the right bottles. The supply was discouragingly small, but there was some in stock. The three of them raced down the corridor for the hold where the hawk was. It took them three hours of angry work to exhaust the supply. They whittled chunks off the hawk, tossed them in pans of the deadly fluid. With each slice they stopped momentarily to watch it turn violet, then black as it died. The hog, dwindling in size, sensed the attack and slapped frantically at their ankles, sending out angry plumes of wet jelly, but they ducked and dodged and whittled some more. The hog quivered and gurgled and wet pinkish goo all over the floor, but it grew smaller and weaker with every whack. Hunter must have spotted it and come down here alone. Jenkins panted between slices. Maybe he slipped, lost his footing, I don't know. They continued to work until the supply was exhausted. They had reduced the hog to a quarter of its previous size. Check the other labs. See if they have some more, said Stone. I already have, Bowman said. They don't. This is it. But we haven't got it killed. There's still... He pointed to the thing quailing in the corner. I know. We're licked. That's all. There isn't any more of the stuff on the ship. They stopped and looked at each other suddenly. Then Jenkins said, oh, Yes, there is. There was silence. Bowman looked at Stone, and Stone looked at Bowman. They both looked at Jenkins. Oh, no. Sorry. I decline. Stone shook his head slowly. But we have to. There's no other way. If the enzyme system is inactivated, it's just protoplasm. There's no physiological or biochemical reason. You know what you can do with your physiology and biochemistry, Bowman said succinctly. You can also count me out. He left them, and the hatchway clanged after him. Wally? Yeah. It'll be months before we get back to Hospital Earth. We know how we can hold it in check until we get there. Yeah. Well, Green Dr. Wally Stone sighed. Greater love hath no man, he said wearily. We'd better tell Nielsen, I guess. Black Dr. Turvold Nielsen's answer was a flat, unequivocal no. It's monstrous and preposterous. I won't stand for it. Nobody will stand for it. But you have the proof in your own hands, Jenkins said. You saw the specimen that the Green Doctor brought you. Nielsen hunched back angrily. I saw it. And your impression of it as a pathologist? I fail to see how my impression applies one way or the other. Doctor, sometimes we have to face facts, remember. All right. Nielsen seemed to curl up into himself still further. The specimen was stomach. Human stomach. Human 
stomach. But the only human on this ship that doesn't have a stomach is Frunta, said Jenkins. So the log ate him. Most of him, not quite all. It threw out the one part of him it couldn't eat, the part containing a substance that inactivated its enzyme system. Dilute hydrochloric acid, to be specific. We used the entire ship's supply and cut the log down to three-quarter size but we need a continuous supply to keep it whittled down until we get home. There's only one good, permanent, reliable source of dilute hydrochloric acid on board this ship. The black doctor's face was purple. I said no, he choked. My answer stands. The red doctor sighed and turned to green Dr. Stone. All right, Wally, he said. From the files of the Medical Disciplinary Board, Hospital Earth, Opsit. I am certain that you can see from the foregoing that a reasonable effort was made by Green Dr. Stone and myself to put the plan in effect peaceably and with full approval of our commander. It was our conviction, however, that the emergency nature of the circumstances required that it be done with or without his approval. A subsequent success in containing the log to at least reasonable and manageable proportions should bear out the wisdom of our decision. Actually, it had not been as bad as one might think. It had been necessary to confine the crew to their quarters and to restrain the Black Doctor forcibly, but with liberal use of Happio, we can occasionally convince ourselves that it is rare beefsteak, and the Green Doctor, our pro tem cook, has concocted several very tasty sauces such as mushroom, onion, etc. We reduce the log to half its size each day, and if thoroughly heated, the chunks lie still on the plate for quite some time. No physical ill effects have been noted, and the period of quarantine is recommended solely to allow the men an adequate period for psychological recovery. I have only one further recommendation, that the work team from the Grey Service be recalled at once from their assignment on Morkai 4. The problem is decidedly not psychiatric, and it would be one of the tragedies of the ages if our excellent psychiatric service were to succeed in persuading the Morkavi out of their delusion. After all, Hospital Earth cannot afford to jeopardise a contract. Samuel B. Jenkins Physician, Grade 6, Red Service, GPP Ship Lancet, Attached GSS Mercy Pro Tem End of Contamination Crew by Alan E. Norse Read by Glenn Carruthers, Ghana Country The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick. It was quite by accident I discovered this incredible invasion of Earth by life forms from another planet. As yet, I haven't done anything about it. I can't think of anything to do. I wrote to the government, and they sent back a pamphlet on the repair and maintenance of frame houses. Anyhow, the whole thing is known. I'm not the first to discover it. Maybe it's even under control. I was sitting in my easy chair, idly turning the pages of a paper-bagged book someone had left on the bus, when I came across the reference that first put me on the trail. For a moment I didn't respond. It took some time for the full import to sink in. After I'd comprehended... It seemed odd I hadn't noticed it right away. The reference was clearly to a non-human species of incredible properties, not indigenous to Earth. A species, I hasten to point out, customarily masquerading as ordinary human beings. Their disguise, however, became transparent. In the face of the following observations by the author, it was at once obvious the author knew everything, knew everything, and was taking it in his stride. The line, and I tremble, remembering it even now, read, His eyes slowly roved about the room. Vague chills assailed me. I tried to picture the eyes. Did they roll like dimes? The passage indicated not. They seemed to move through the air, not over the surface. Rather rapidly, apparently. No one in the story was surprised. That's what tipped me off. No sign of amazement at such an outrageous thing. Later, the matter was amplified. His eyes moved from person 
to person. There it was in a nutshell. The eyes had clearly come apart from the rest of him and were on their own. My heart pounded, and my breath choked in my windpipe. I had stumbled on an accidental mention of a totally unfamiliar race, obviously non-terrestrial, yet to the characters in the book it was perfectly natural, which suggested they belonged to the same species. And the author? A slow suspicion burned in my mind. The author was taking it rather too easily in his stride. Evidently, he felt this was quite a usual thing. He made absolutely no attempt to conceal this knowledge. The story continued. Presently, his eyes fastened on Julia. Julia, being a lady, had at least the breeding to feel indignant. She is described as blushing and knitting her brows angrily. At this, I sighed with relief. They weren't all non-terrestrials. The narrative continues. Slowly, calmly, his eyes examined every inch of her. Great Scott! But here the girl turned and stomped off, and the matter ended. I lay back in my chair, gasping with horror. My wife and family regarded me in wonder. What's wrong, dear? my wife asked. I couldn't tell her. Knowledge like this was too much for the ordinary run-of-the-mill person. I had to keep it to myself. Nothing! I gasped. I leaped up, snatched the book, and hurried out of the room. In the garage I continued reading. There was more. Trembling, I read the next revealing passage. He put his arm around Julia. Presently she asked him if he would remove his arm. He immediately did so, with a smile. It's not said what was done with the arm after the fellow had removed it. Maybe it was left standing upright in the corner. Maybe it was thrown away. I don't care. In any case, the full meaning was there, staring me right in the face. Here was a race of creatures capable of removing portions of their anatomy at will, eyes, arms, and maybe more, without batting an eyelash. My knowledge of biology came in handy at this point. Obviously, they were simple beings, unicellular, some sort of primitive, single-celled things, beings no more developed than starfish. Starfish can do the same thing, you know. I read on, and came to this incredible revelation, tossed off coolly by the author, without the faintest tremor. Outside the movie theater, we split up. Part of us went inside, part over to the cafe for dinner. Binary fission, obviously, splitting in half and forming two entities. Probably each lower half went to the cafe, it being farther, and the upper halves to the movies. I read on, hands shaking. I had really stumbled onto something here. My mind reeled as I made out this passage. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. Poor Bibney has lost his head again, which was followed by, and Bob says he has utterly no guts. Yet Bibney got around as well as the next person. The next person, however, was just as strange. He was soon described as totally lacking in brains. There was no doubt of the thing in the next passage. Julia, whom I had thought to be the one normal person, reveals herself as also being an alien life form similar to the rest. Quite deliberately, Julia had given her heart to the young man. It didn't relate what the final disposition of the organ was, but I didn't really care. It was evident Julia had gone right on living in her usual manner, like all the others in the book, without heart, arms, eyes, brains, viscera, dividing up in two when the occasion demanded, without a qualm. Thereupon she gave him her hand. I sickened. The rascal now had her hand as well as her heart. I shudder to think what he's done with them by this time. He took her arm. Not content to wait, he had to start dismantling her on his own. Flushing crimson, I slammed the book shut and leaped to my feet, but not in time to escape one last reference to those carefree bits of anatomy whose travels had originally thrown me on the track. Her eyes followed him all the way down the road and across the meadow. I rushed from the garage and back inside the warm house, as if the accursed things were following me. 
My wife and children were playing Monopoly in the kitchen. I joined them and played with frantic fervor, brow feverish, teeth chattering. I had had enough of the thing. I want to hear no more about it. Let them come on. Let them invade Earth. I don't want to get mixed up in it. I have absolutely no stomach for it. End of The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick Recording by John S. Whitman Moving target jsw.blogspot.com The Incredible Aliens by William Bender, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Incredible Aliens by William Bender, Jr. Read by Quartertone It was only a tiny dot on the view screen when the military lookout on the armed cruiser identified it as an alien spaceship and sounded the general alert. Technicist 9th Class Narat, chief psychanalyst aboard, studied its approach with a rebellious, almost passionate hope that the impossible was at last going to happen. Or was it impossible? They were the first men to visit this planetary system. Why couldn't they expect to encounter a truly superior race for a change? Intently, Narant examined the course of the alien craft. Rather mischievously, he hoped the stranger would suddenly adopt evasion tactics showing it had detected their presence in the black void between the sixth and seventh planets of the star Restus. That would certainly be a sign of superiority. And what a blow to Central Scientific Headquarters back home. The anti-detection shield was one of their proudest accomplishments. And yet, though still wishful, Nurant realized deep in his heart that such hopes were blighted. Illogical and improbable. No people in the universe could even compare with them. Explorers and merchants and military ships and privateers had prowled all the great planetary systems of the galaxy. They and their technology reigned supreme everywhere. Indeed, the accumulated evidence of their supremacy even formed the irrefutable foundation of Central Scientific's dogma on selective breeding. I must ask you to leave the bridge now, Doctor. The voice, crisp and authoritative, crackled over Narant's shoulder. Commander Carcine had entered the control room during Narant's brief reverie in front of the viewing screen. An able and successful combat officer still in his early thirties, Carcine wore the lightweight space armor the regulations prescribed for moments of impending action. Even if the enemy blasted a hole in the control room itself, that armor could protect Carcine long enough to save or disintegrate the cruiser, as the case might be. Commander, Narat suddenly blurted, one request. I should like to remain this one time and observe your tactics right here. Denied. Carcine explained brusquely that only combat personnel were allowed in the central control room during contact with a strange vessel. But, he ended, patronizingly, you can watch from the observation room. When we have made the capture, I'll be happy to review my operations with you. When we had made the capture. The commander's abundant self-confidence only served to further depress Narant. Out there in the void rode a space vessel of an altogether unknown race, and there was no question in Carcine's mind but that their cruiser would take the alien. Not if we make the capture, simply when. It was a small solace for Narant to recall that he himself had firmly established self-confidence as one of the highest rated mental traits for military command. It had been one of his major projects as a psychanalyst fourth class. As he left the bridge, the airlock rumbled shut behind him, sealing off the control room from the rest of the ship. Narat climbed the spiral staircase into the observation room. One entire wall was a thick quartzite pane overlooking the control center. You could see as much from up here as down below, but somehow it wasn't the same. Other technicists with non-combat specialties were already strapped to seats in the room, prepared to watch the show on which their very lives might depend. The VM lamp winked slowly on and off, its orange glow warning against possible violent maneuvers. 
Narant found a seat and obediently fastened the safety harness. He studied the view screen on the bridge below. The alien ship, seemingly unaware of the danger that now threatened it, still followed its initial course. Narant tried to concentrate on the scrambling activity in the control center, but his rebellious mind would have none of it. Unwanted memories rose up to haunt him. He had been assigned to this trip mainly to purge those thoughts from his mind with work and action, but the cure appeared no cure at all. Three months ago, his final request for the marriage permit had returned disapproved. The accompanying explanation had been a masterpiece of scientific doggerel. It analyzed the genetic composition of Norant and technicist third-class Melda. It presented carefully worked out tables of probability regarding the nature and potential achievement of the offspring of such a union. It called attention to the low probability rate of Melda and Narant begetting a genius. Therefore, it had concluded, it is not in the best interest of the intended participants, nor will it serve to build a race if the aforementioned are joined in matrimony. There followed a rare bit of sterilized philosophy. It is to be hoped that each party mentioned in the above will readily find another individual in whom to repose his and her natural emotional interest. Nurant felt, with a startling sense of the primeval, that if he should find the person who phrased that report, he would delightfully club him to death. But of course, emotionalism was absurd. The whole thing had been handled dispassionately. Certain basic factors had been fed into the banks of electronic calculators, and, a few microseconds later, the resultant statistical data came out. It simply failed to measure up. There was no arguing or quibbling about the results, for the calculators were mechanically infallible. However, Narant had taken one more step, an application for random mating. But the retention drums of the master calculators had accumulated a far too overwhelming amount of information about the advantage of scientific breeding. So that application, too, had been refused. And shortly after, Narant found himself assigned to this cruiser bound for Restus. A report that the inhabitants had begun spaceflight. A distant but conceivable threat to the security of the home planet. He knew the assignment resulted from some scientific effort to mollify his disappointment. So he left home. But he took with him the forlorn hope that on this voyage, or the next, or the one after that, he would find somewhere in the vast reaches of space an advanced people who still practiced random mating that he might find them, analyze them, and feed that information back to the master calculators. For only by placing hard new facts into the brain could there be any chance of changing the decision. In the sealed combat control center, Commander Carcine finished strapping himself into the anthropometric chair in front of the view screen. A subordinate lowered the master control panel into position. Neurant perked up with new interest. A specialist of Carcine's class, he realized, could manipulate that control panel with the consummate skill of a master musician at a great organ. The battery of keys, buttons, and switches built into the panel gave Carcine complete domination over the thousands of small engines and servo mechanisms, tens of thousands of electric tubes, and the millions of electrical synapses that comprise the fighting apparatus of the space cruiser. Abruptly, the VM signal began flashing more rapidly, its color changing from orange to red. A siren whooped through the ship. Carcine's voice, somewhat metallic over the speakers, gave the imminent combat alert. The ship was going into action. Narant felt the straps pull at his chest. In the view screen below, the alien vessel began to swell rapidly. A low hum permeated the observation room. Narant glanced out the nearest port. Glistening metallic spines were expanding outward from the body of the cruiser. At the tip of each bulged the glowing cone of the force and detection heads, the cruiser's most potent tools of attack and defense. Engine room! Carcine's peremptory voice snapped through the speakers. Engine room standing by. For ten seconds only, do not, repeat, do not act on manual signal control. This is a test only. Read them off. Yes, sir. Reading test signals. Fire 8. Fire 6. Fire 9. 
Fire one. Fire main. The voice paused. Is that all, sir? The ten seconds are up, reproached Carcine. Henceforth, his every command would have to be acted upon instantly. Divert seventy percent of main power supply into the armament system. Yes, sir. Check spinal extension. Extended and locked. All force heads burning, Commander. Another voice had answered this time. Good. Carcine's brief acknowledgement for an efficient crew. Activate the combat calculator. In action, sir. There, Narant realized, was another dehumanizing achievement of Central Scientific. Years ago, in the war with the repulsive exoskeletal inhabitants of Sirius XIII, Earth's military commanders had gone into battle with terrible ardor. To destroy the Syrians, they had taken frequent, unnecessary risks, and in doing so had sacrificed dozens of brand new combat ships. So a special calculator had been designed for all craft except humble merchantmen. It kept a running check on the enemy's tactics, his power output, his course, speed, and relative aggressiveness. It measured the power consumption of its own ship in countering enemy weapons and a score of other factors. Once activated, the brain computed the mathematical probabilities of ultimate success at each instant of the battle. If the scale ever tipped in favor of the enemy craft, the calculator instantly selected the best evasion course, fired auxiliary rockets, and broke off the engagement. Nurant unconsciously shook his head in disapproval. He wondered if he was getting old. Such efficiency disturbed him more than he cared to admit. Only in the histories, it seemed, could you find those thrilling battles where human ingenuity played the decisive role where a handful of courageous men could face outrageous odds and win through to victory by wit and resourcefulness. Yes, only in the histories. Nowadays, warfare, like love, revolved about mathematics and probability curves and trillions of electrons chasing themselves through a maze of wires and throwing switches and making decisions that once had been the prerogative of man alone. Nurant yearned for man's lost freedom to make an honest error. Suddenly, Carcine's harsh voice came blasting over the loudspeaker. Prepare to grapple! Nurant glanced quickly out through the port into the black sky. The alien ship, its bright metal reflecting the light of the distant sun, floated a mile away, motionless, or so it seemed, against the unchanging stellar background. It possessed hard, sleek lines pointed nose, flaring tail veins. Its designers, he guessed, must still be thinking in terms of atmospheric flight. It hardly seemed the type of craft that could cross the broad interstellar reaches. Probably had been built simply to plot about its neighboring planets. It must be an early development, for spaceships had never before been detected in the Restus system. More than likely, the ship had not even become aware of their presence. Small wonder Carcine had decided to grapple. The force heads on Nurant's side of the cruiser began to shimmer under the surge of power being fed to them. They grew red-hot, almost translucent. They would hold fire until the beam became powerful enough to withstand tremendous forces. Sometimes in grappling, an enemy craft had been known to discharge its main rocket batteries in an effort to wrench loose. But any second now... Execute grapple! Carcine ordered. The cruiser shuddered. Lights dimmed as the force heads sucked at every available bit of power. With a blinding flash, a blue-white ribbon of energy streaked across the mile-wide void to the alien ship. It flicked the nose of the restless craft, gripped, and swept over the entire hull like a glittering cocoon. Tension indicator 98.8 .8 reported a too-casual voice over the speaker. Enemy ship secured. Opposing force? Negative. Carcine cautiously studied his dials, alert for the first sign of a counterblow. Nothing happened. A minute dragged by. The tension indicators remained constant. Detection heads zero. And then, bring it alongside. The grappling beam slowly began to contract, bringing the alien ship closer. As it passed through the invisibility screen, multicolored de-action rays focused upon it, nullifying virtually every weapon known to man. 
Narant's hopes dissolved. The emptiness left only an aching futility. As usual, the capture had been simple and complete. Advanced parties prepare to go aboard, commanded the loudspeaker. A man behind Narant unbuckled his straps, got up, and stretched. Here we go again, he said, and then to nobody in particular. I used to get a kick out of investigating strange creatures. Now it's work. Just work. Narant looked over his shoulder at the cruiser's anthropometrist. He would have to board the ship right behind the combat team, analyze the tools, controls, living conditions of the crew. Perhaps he too experienced this ennui of persistent success. Narant had ended his preparations in the psych examination chamber by the time they brought the first of the alien people to him. Narant stared in sudden amazement. The creature was humanoid. It had a well-formed head with a squat shrunken nose and steep brows. There were prehensile arms and hands with five fingers. But the man was hairy and, Narant winced, immodestly naked. The humanoid was still in the grip of the paralytic when they took him into the examination chamber and strapped him to the table. Narant judged the alien a little taller, give or take a few inches, than a normal human being. His interest began to perk up. It always did, when he could study another creature that had learned to conquer space. For perhaps the first time in three months, thoughts of Melda were overshadowed by the immediate prospect of exploring the mysteries of an alien mind. As the attendant came back out of the chamber, Narant secured the door. How many of them? he asked. The attendant shook his head in evident amazement. Four! I don't know how they do it, but that ship had only a four-man crew. Impossible! Narant exclaimed. That's all there are! the man insisted. We've covered the whole ship. But how could they? The engineers are working on that now. I heard one of them remark about the great number of automatic controls, but even so, isn't that one for the book? That, Narant agreed, was one for the book. Four men. The space vessels he knew usually held scores of crewmen and specialists to handle the manifold emergencies that arose in flight. His imagination soaring, Narant turned rapidly to begin his experiments. He started the automatic recorder that would code his findings on a thin strip of tape and then, more excited than usual, began the examination. Inside the chamber, a giant multifaceted crystal began to rotate slowly in the gimbals which held it suspended from the ceiling. Sharp individual beams of light swept over the face of the alien being on the table. One by one the lights flickered over him and passed on, each one probing, measuring, comparing with universal norms, and then recording its findings on both dial and tape. Long before the five-hour examination was over, the hopes of technicist ninth-class Neurant far transcended any he had experienced in the past three months. The aliens had almost human potential. They were fun-loving, kindly, clannish. Their resourcefulness and their ingenuity were literally unsurpassed. But then the most amazing fact of all revealed itself. The time lapse, since this race had been entirely primitive, was fantastically short. In one brief, almost abrupt transition, they had gone from jungle to the conquest of space. The mind, the racial background, and the obvious achievements of these creatures presented such a picture of rapid advancement as to stagger the imagination. Once he had transmitted the coded tapes to Central Scientific, Narant sought out the anthropometrist. His lingering doubts vanished when the two compared findings. Everything inside the spaceship had been designed expressly for these strange creatures with the five fingers and the prehensile hands and arms. As the cruiser finally pointed toward home, Narant was a new man. Of course, their information would set the scientific world spinning on its collective ear. But more important, it would have vast personal significance. According to the crystal, the mating pattern of these surprisingly progressive beings was entirely one of random selection. Already, that data would be digesting inside the master calculators. The knowledge would become a part of all future decisions. Probability rates would change strikingly, 
especially those that govern the issuance of random mating licenses. For Narant, the voyage had been a tremendous success. However, in the space experimental laboratories near the Nevada desert on the third planet of the Sun Restus, no such optimism existed. Twenty-four hours had passed since the SX-2 had vanished. They had had a precise fix on it as it blistered through the void on an elliptic course that would return it automatically to Earth. Everything had seemed to be going perfectly. All the bugs of the first space rocket experimental had evidently been straightened out in making the two. And then, some 250,000 miles beyond Saturn, it had disappeared. Just like that. Dr. Gordon Bassett glanced distastefully at the telephone on his desk. Then he began thumbing through the Metropolitan Directory for a number. The hands that held the directory were strong, supple. They would have been a revelation to Technicist 9th Class Narant if he had seen them. But then Technicist 9th Class Narant himself would have been something of a revelation to Dr. Gordon Bassett, what with his twenty claw-like extensors. Bassett found the number, dialed, and waited for the connection. Hello, Dr. Farrell? Bassett here. I've got bad news on the SX-2. No details yet, but the ship has broken contact. Yes, I must presume it's lost. I'll file a complete report as soon as possible. What's that? I suppose you're right. We'll have the SPCA on our necks for sacrificing four more test animals. What the hell? They can't expect us to send men on these experimental flights. Bassett talked for a moment longer, and then replaced the phone. He sighed. Another report. Another failure. Another requiem to be written for a lost ship and four chimpanzees. End of The Incredible Aliens by William Bender, Jr. Jack of No Trades by Evelyn E. Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jack of No Trades by Evelyn E. Smith I walked into the dining room and collided with a floating mass of fabric which promptly draped itself over me like a sentient shroud. Oh, for God's sakes, Kevin, my middle brother's voice came muffled through the folds. If you can't help, at least don't hinder. I managed to struggle out of the tablecloth, even though it seemed to be trying to wrap itself around me. When Danny got excited, he lost his mental grip. I could help, I yelled as soon as I got my head free. If anybody would let me, and what's more, I could set the table a damn sight faster by hand than you do with kinesis. Just then, Father appeared at the head of the table. He could as easily have walked downstairs as teleported, but I belonged to a family of exhibitionists, and Father tended to show off as if he were still a kid. Not that he looked his age. He was big and blonde like Danny and Tim and me, and could have passed for our older brother. Boys, boys, he reproved us. Danny, you ought to be ashamed of yourself picking on poor Kev. Even if it hadn't been Danny's fault, he still would have been blamed. Nobody was ever supposed to raise a voice or a hand or a thought to poor afflicted Kev, because nature had picked on me enough, and the nicer everybody was to me, the nastier I became, since only when they lost their tempers could I get, or so I believed, their true attitude toward me. How else could I tell? Sorry, fella, Dan apologized to me. The tablecloth spread itself out on the table. Wrinkles, he grumbled to himself, wrinkles. And I had it so nice and smooth before. Mother will be furious. If she were going to be furious, she'd be furious already, Father reminded him sadly. It must be tough to be married to a deep probe telepath, I thought, and I felt a sudden wave of sympathy for him. 
It was so seldom I got the chance to feel sorry for anyone except myself. But I think you'll find she understands. She knows, all right, Danny remarked as he went on into the kitchen. But I'm not so sure she always understands. I was surprised to find him so perceptive on the abstract level, because he wasn't what you might call an understanding person either. There are tensions in this room, my sister announced as she slouched in, not quite awake yet. And hatred. I could feel them all the way upstairs. And today I'm working on the Sleep Sweet mattress copy, so I must feel absolutely tranquil. Everyone will think beautiful thoughts, please. She sat down just as a glass of orange juice was arriving at her place. Danny apparently didn't know she'd come in already. The glass bumped into the back of her neck, tilted, and poured its contents over her shoulder and down her very considerable decolletage. Being a mere primitive, I couldn't help laughing. Danny, you fumbler! She screamed. Danny erupted from the kitchen. How many times have I asked all of you not to sit down until I've got everything on the table? Always a lot of interfering busybodies getting in the way. I don't see why you have to set the table at all, she retorted. A robot could do it better than faster than you. Even Kev could. She turned quickly toward me. Oh, I am sorry, Kevin. I didn't say anything. I was too busy pressing my hands down on the back of my chair to make my knuckles turn white. Sylvia's face turned even whiter. Father, stop him. Stop him. He's hating again. I can't stand it. Father looked at me, then at her. I don't think he can help it, Sylvia. I grinned. That's right. I'm just a poor atavism with no control over myself at all. Finally, my mother came in from the kitchen. She was an old-fashioned woman and didn't hold with robo-cooks. One quick glance at me gave her the complete details, even though I quickly protested. It's illegal to probe anyone without permission. I used to probe you to find out when you needed your diapers changed, she said tartly, and I'll probe you now. You should watch yourself, Sylvia. Poor Kevin isn't responsible. She didn't need to probe to get the blast of naked emotion that spurted out from me. My sister screamed, and even father looked uncomfortable. Danny stomped back into the kitchen, muttering to himself. Mother's lips tightened. Sylvia. Go back upstairs and change your dress. Kevin, do I have to make an appointment for you at the clinic again? A psychiatrist never diagnosed members of his own family. That is, not officially. They couldn't help offering thumbnail diagnoses any more than they could help having thumbnails. No use, I said, deciding it was safe to drop into my chair. Who can adjust me to an environment to which I'm fundamentally unsuited? Maybe there is something physically wrong with him, Amy, my father suggested hopefully. Maybe you should make an appointment for him at the cure-all. Mother shook her neatly coiffed head. He's been to it dozens of times, and he always checks out in splendid shape. None of us can spare the time to go with him again, just on an off chance, and he could hardly be allowed to make such a long trip all by himself. Pity there isn't a machine in every community. But then, we don't really need them. Now that the virus diseases had been licked, people hardly ever got sick anymore, and when they did, it was mostly psychosomatic. Life was so well organized that there weren't even many accidents these days. It was a safe, orderly existence for those who fitted into it, which accounted for more than 95% of the population. The only ones who didn't adjust were those who couldn't, like me, sigh deficients, throwbacks to an earlier era. There were no physical cripples because anybody could have a new arm or a new leg grafted on. But you couldn't graft psi powers onto an atavism or, if you could, the technique hadn't been developed yet. I feel a sense of impending doom brooding over this household, my youngest brother remarked cheerfully as he vaulted into his chair. You always do, Timothy, my mother said, unfolding her napkin. 
And I must say, it's not in good taste, especially at breakfast. He reached for his juice. Guess this is a doomed household. And what was all that emotional uproar about? The usual, Sylvia said from the doorway before anyone else could answer. She slid warily into her chair. Hey, Dan, I'm here, she called. If anything else comes in, it comes in manually, understand? Oh, all right. Dan emerged from the kitchen with a tray of food floating ahead of him. The usual, trouble with Kev? Tim looked at me narrowly. Somehow my sense of ominousness is connected with him. Well, that's perfectly natural, Sylvia began, then stopped as mother caught her eye. I didn't mean that, Tim said. I still say Kev's got something we can't figure out. You've been saying that for years, Danny protested, and he's been tested for every faculty under the sun. He can't telepath or teleport or telekinesthesize or even teletype. He can't precognize or prefix or prepossess. He can't. Strictly a bundle of no talent. That's me, I interrupted, trying to keep my animal feelings from getting the better of me. That was how my family thought of me, I knew, as an animal and not a very lovable one either. No, Tim said. He's just got something we haven't developed a test for. It'll come out someday, you'll see. He smiled at me. I smiled at him gratefully. He was the only member of my family who really seemed to like me in spite of my handicap. It won't work, Tim. I know you're just trying to be kind, but... He's not saying it just to be kind, my mother put in. He means it. Not that I want to arouse false hopes, Kevin she added with grim scrupulousness. Tim's awfully young yet, and I wouldn't trust his extracurricular prognostications too far. Nonetheless, I couldn't help feeling a feeble renewal of old hopes. After all, young or not, Tim was a hell of a good prognosticator. He wouldn't have risen so rapidly to the position he held in the Weather Bureau if he hadn't been pretty near tops in foreboding. Mother smiled sadly at my thoughts, but I didn't let that discourage me. As Danny had said, she knew, but she didn't really understand. Nobody, for all of his or her psi power, really understood me. Breakfast was finally over, and the rest of my family dispersed to their various jobs. Father simply took his briefcase and disappeared, he was a traveling salesman, and he had a morning appointment clear across the continent. The others, not having his particular gift, had to take the halibus to their various destinations. Mother, as I said, was a psychiatrist. Sylvia wrote advertising copy. Tim was a meteorologist. Dan was a junior executive in a furniture moving company and expected a promotion to senior rank soon as he achieved a better mental grip on pianos. Only I had no job, no profession, no place in life. Of course, there were certain menial tasks a sign negative could perform, but my parents would have none of them. Partly for my sake, but mostly for the sake of their own community standing. We don't need what little money Kev could bring in, my father always said. I can afford to support my family. He can stay home and take care of the house. And that's what I did. Not that there was much to do except call a techno whenever one of the servo mechanisms missed a beat. True enough, these things had to be watched mighty carefully because, if they broke down, it sometimes took days before the repair and or replacement robots could come. There were never enough of them because ours was a constructive society. Still, being a machine sitter isn't very much of a career. And every function that wasn't the prerogative of a machine could be done ten times more quickly and efficiently by some member of my family than I could do it. If I went ahead and did something anyway, they would just do it all over again when they got home. So I had nothing to do all day. I had a special dispensation to take books out of the local archives 
because I was a deficient and couldn't receive the tele programs. Almost everybody on Earth was telepathic to some degree and could get the amplified projections even if he couldn't transmit or receive with his natural powers. But I got nothing. I had to derive all my recreation from reading, and you can get awfully tired of books, especially when they're all at least a 100 years old and written by primitives. I could borrow sound tapes, but they also bored me after a while. I thought maybe I could develop a talent for composing or painting, which would classify me as a telesensitive, artistic ability being considered as the oldest, if least important, psi power. But I couldn't even do anything like that. About all there was left for me was to take long walks. Athletics were out of the question. I couldn't compete with Psy Boys, and they didn't want to compete with me. All the people in the neighborhood knew me and were nice to me, but I didn't need to be a path to tell what they were saying to one another when I hove into sight. There's that oldest Faraday boy. Pity, such a talented family, to have a defective. I didn't have a girl either. Although some of them were sort of attracted to me, I could see that. They could hardly go out with me without exposing themselves to ridicule. In their sandals, I would have done the same thing. But that didn't stop me from hating them. I wished I'd been born a couple of hundred years ago, before people started playing around with nuclear energy and filling the air with radiations that they were afraid would turn human beings into hideous monsters. Instead, they developed the psi powers that had always been latent in the species until we developed into a race of supermen. I don't know why I say we. In 1960 or so, I might have been considered superior, but in 2102, I was just the Faraday's idiot boy. Exploring space should have been my hope. If there had been anything useful or interesting on any of the other planets, I might have found a niche for myself there. In totally new surroundings, the psi powers geared to another environment might not be an advantage. But by the time I was ten, it was discovered that the other planets were just barren hunks of rock, with pressures and climates and atmospheres drastically unsuited to human life. A year or so before, the hyperdrive had been developed on Earth, and ships had been sent out to explore the stars. But I had no hope left in that direction anymore. I was an atavism in a world of peace and plenty. Peace, because people couldn't indulge in war or even crime with so many telepaths running around. Not because, I told myself, the capacity for primitive behavior wasn't just as latent in everybody else as the psi talent seemed latent in me. Tim must be right, I thought. I must have some undreamed of power that only the right circumstances would bring out. But what was that power? For years, I had speculated on what my potential talent might be, explored every wild possibility I could conceive of, and found none productive of even an ambiguous result with which I could fool myself. As I approached adulthood, I began to conceive that I was probably nothing more than what I seemed to be, a simple sigh negative. Yet, from time to time, hope surged up again, as it had today, in spite of my knowledge that my hope was an impossibility. Who ever heard of latent psi powers showing themselves an individual as old as 26? I was almost alone in the parks where I used to walk because people liked to commune with one another those days rather than with nature. Even gardening had very little popularity but I found myself most at home in those woodland, or rather pseudo-woodland, surroundings, able to identify more readily with the trees and flowers than I could with my own kind. A fallen tree or a broken blossom would excite more sympathy from me than the minor catastrophes that will beset any household, no matter how gifted, and I would shy away from bloody noses or cut fingers thus giving myself a reputation for callousness as well as extrasensory imbecility. However, 
I was no more callous in steering clear of human breakdowns than I was in not shedding tears over the household machines when they broke down. For I felt no more closely akin to my parents and siblings than I did to the mechanisms that served and, sometimes, failed us. On that day, I walked farther than I had intended, and by the time I got back home, I found the rest of my family had returned before me. They seemed to be excited about something and were surprised to see me so calm. Aren't you even interested in anything outside your own immediate concerns, Kev? Sylvia demanded, despite Father's efforts to shush her. Can't you remember that Kev isn't able to receive the tellies? Tim shot back at her. He probably doesn't even know what happened. Well, what did happen? I asked, trying not to snap. One starship got back from Alpha Centauri, Danny said excitedly. There are two inhabited Earth-type planets there. This was for me. This was it at last. I tried not to show my enthusiasm, even though I knew that was futile. My relatives could keep their thoughts and emotions from me. I couldn't keep mine from them. What kind of life inhabits them? Humanoid? Uh-uh. Danny shook his head. And hostile. The crew of the starship says they were attacked immediately on landing. When they turned and left, they were followed here by one of the alien ships. Must be a pretty advanced race to have spaceships. Anyhow, the extraterrestrial ship headed back as soon as it got a fix on where ours was going. But if they're hostile, I said thoughtfully, it might mean war. Of course, that's why everyone's so wrought up. We hope it's peace, but we'll have to prepare for war just in case. There hadn't been a war on Earth for well over a hundred years, but we hadn't been so foolish as to obliterate all knowledge of military techniques and weapons. The alien ship wouldn't be able to come back with reinforcements, if such were its intention, in less than six months. This meant time to get together a stockpile of weapons though we had no idea of how effective our defenses would be against the aliens' armament. They might have strange and terrible weapons against which we would be powerless. On the other hand, our side would have the benefits of telekinetically guided missiles, teleported saboteurs, telepaths to pick up the alien strategy, and prognosticators to determine the outcome of each battle and see whether it was worth fighting in the first place. Everybody on Earth hoped for peace. Everybody, that is, except me. I'd been unable to achieve any sense of identity with the world in which I lived, and it was almost worth the loss of personal survival to know that my own smug species could look silly against a still more talented race. It isn't so much our defense that worries me, my mother muttered, as lack of adequate medical machinery. War is bound to mean casualties, and there aren't enough cure-alls on the planet to take care of them. It's useless to expect the government to build more right now. They'll be too busy producing weapons. Sylvia, you had better take a leave of absence from your job and come down to Psycho Center to learn first aid techniques. And you too, Kevin, she added, obviously a little surprised herself at what she was saying. Probably you'd be even better at it than Sylvia since you aren't sensitive to other people's pain. I looked at her. It is an ill wind, she agreed, smiling wryly. But don't let me catch you thinking that way, Kevin. Can't you see it would be better that there should be no war and you should remain useless? I couldn't see it, of course, and she knew that with her wretched talent for stripping away my feeble attempts at privacy. Psy powers usually included some ability to form a mental shield. Being without one, I was necessarily devoid of the other. My attitude didn't matter, though, because it was definitely war. The aliens came back with a fleet clearly bent on our annihilation. Even the paths couldn't figure out their motives, for the thought pattern was entirely different from ours. And the war was on. I had enjoyed learning first aid. It was the first time I had ever worked with people as an equal. And I was good at it, because psi powers aren't much of an advantage there. Telekinesis, maybe a little, 
But I was big enough to lift anybody without needing any superhuman abilities. Normal human abilities, rather. Gee, Mr. Faraday, one of the other students breathed, you're so strong and without kinesis or anything. I looked at her and liked what I saw. She was blonde and pretty. My name's not Mr. Faraday, I said. It's Kevin. My name's Lucy, she giggled. No girl had ever giggled at me in that way before. Immediately, I started to envision a beautiful future for the two of us, then flushed when I realized that she might be a telepath. But she was winding a tourniquet around the arm of another member of the class with apparent unconcern. Hey, quit that, the windy yelled. You're making it too tight. I'll be mortified. So Lucy was obviously not a telepath. Later, I found out she was only a low-grade telesensitive, just a poetess, so I had nothing to worry about as far as having my thoughts read went. I was a little afraid of Sylvia's kidding me about my first romance, but as it happened, she got interested in one of the guys who was taking the class with us, and she was not only too busy to be bothered with me, but in too vulnerable a position herself. However, when the actual bombs, or their alien equivalent, struck near our town, I wasn't nearly so happy, especially after they started carrying the wounded into the psycho center, which had been turned into a hospital for the duration. I took one look at the gory scene. I'd never seen anybody really injured before. Few people had, as a matter of fact. And started for the door. But Mother was already blocking the way. It was easy to see from which side of the family Tim got his talent for prognostication. If the telepaths who can pick up all the pain can stand this, Kevin, she said, you certainly can. And there was no kindness at all in the you. She gave me a shove toward the nearest stretcher. Go on, now's your chance to show you're of some use in this world. Gritting my teeth, I turned to the man on the stretcher. Something had pretty near torn half his face away. It was all there, but not in the right place, and it wasn't pretty. I turned away, caught my mother's eye, and then I didn't even dare to throw up. I looked at that smashed face again, and all the first aid lessons I had flew out of my head as if some super sigh had plucked them from me. The man was bleeding terribly. I'd never seen blood pouring out like that before. The first thing to do, I figured sickly, was mop it up. I wet a sponge and dabbed gingerly at the face, but my hands were shaking so hard that the sponge slipped and my fingers were on the raw, gaping wound. I could feel the warm viscosity of the blood and nothing, not even my mother, could keep my meal down this time, I thought. Mother had uttered a sound of exasperation as I dropped the sponge. I could hear her coming toward me. Then I heard her gasp. I looked at my patient, and my mouth dropped open. For suddenly there was no wound, no wound at all, just a little blood, and the fellow's face was whole again, not even a scar. What, what happened? He asked. It doesn't hurt anymore. He touched his cheek and looked up at me with frightened eyes. And I was frightened too, too frightened to be sick, too frightened to do anything but stare witlessly at him. Touch some of the others, quick, my mother commanded, pushing astounded attendants away from stretchers. I touched broken limbs and torn bodies and shattered heads, and they were whole again right away. Everybody in the room was looking at me in the way I had always dreamed of being looked at. Lucy was opening and shutting her beautiful mouth like a beautiful fish. In fact, the whole thing was just like a dream, except that I was awake. I couldn't have imagined all those horrors. But the horrors soon weren't horrors anymore. I began to find them almost pleasing. The worse a wound was the more I appreciated it. There was so much more satisfaction, virtually an aesthetic thrill, in seeing a horrible, jagged tear smooth away, heal, 
not in days as it would have done under the cure-all, but in seconds. Timothy was right, my mother said, her eyes filled with tears. And I was wrong ever to have doubted. You have a gift, son. And she said the word son loud and clear so that everybody could hear it. The greatest gift of all, that of healing. She looked at me proudly. And Lucy and the others looked at me as if I were a god or something. I felt, well, good. I wonder why we never thought of healing as a potential psi power, my mother said to me later, when I was catching a snatch of rest and she was lighting cigarettes and offering me cups of coffee in an attempt to make up 26 years of indifference, perhaps dislike, all at once. The ability to heal is recorded in history, only we never paid much attention to it. Recorded? I asked, a little jealously. Of course, she smiled. Remember the king's evil? I should have known without her reminding me after all the old books I had read. Scrofula, wasn't it? They called it that because a touch of certain kings was supposed to cure it, and other diseases too, I guess. She nodded. Certain people must have had the healing power, and that's probably why they originally got to be the rulers. In a very short time, I became a pretty important person. All the other deficients in the world were tested for the healing power, and all of them turned out negative. I proved to be the only human healer alive. And not only that, I could work a thousand times more efficiently and effectively than any of the machines. The government built a hospital just for my work. Wounded people were ferried there from all over the world, and I cured them. I could do practically everything except raise the dead and sometimes I wondered whether, with a little practice, I wouldn't be able to do even that. When I came to my new office, whom did I find waiting there for me but Lucy, her trim figure enhanced by a snug blue and white uniform? I'm your assistant, Kev, she said shyly. I looked at her. You are? I, I hope you want me, she went on, Coyness now mixing with apprehension. I gave her shoulder a squeeze. I do want you, Lucy, more than I can tell you now. After all this is over, there's something more I want to say, but right now, I clapped her arm. There's a job to be done. Yes, Kevin, she said, glaring at me for some reason I didn't have time to investigate or interpret at the moment. My patients were waiting for me. They gave me everything else I could possibly need except enough sleep, and I myself didn't want that. I wanted to heal. I wanted to show my fellow human beings that, though I couldn't receive or transmit thoughts or foretell the future or move things with my mind, all those powers were useless without life, and that was what I could give. I took pride in my work. It was good to stop pain and ugliness, to know that, if it weren't for me, these people would be dead or permanently disfigured. In a sense, they were, well, my children. I felt a warm glow of affection toward them. They felt the same way toward me. I knew because the secret of the hospital soon leaked out. During all those years of peace, the government had lost whatever facility it had for keeping secrets, and people used to come in droves, hoping for a glimpse of me. The government pointed out that such crowds outside the building might attract the enemy's attention. I was the most important individual on earth, they told my followers, and my safety couldn't be risked. The human race at this stage was pretty docile. The crowds went away. And it was right that they should. I didn't want to be risked any more than they wanted to risk me. Plenty of people did come to see me officially. The president, generals, all kinds of big wheels bring in citations, medals, and other obsolete honors they'd revive primarily for me. It was wonderful. I began to love everybody. Don't you think you're putting too much of yourself into this, Kev? Lucy asked me one day. I gave her an incredulous glance. 
You mean I shouldn't help people? Of course you should help them. I didn't mean anything like that. Just, well, you're getting too bound up in your work. Why shouldn't I be? Then the truth, as I thought, dawned on me. Are you jealous, Lucy? She lowered her eyes. Not only that, but the war is bound to come to an end, you know, and it was the first part of her sentence that interested me. Why, do you mean... And just then, a fresh batch of casualties arrived, and I had to tend to them. For the next few days, I was so busy, I didn't get the chance to have the long talk with Lucy I'd wanted. Then, after only four months, the war suddenly stopped. It seemed that the aliens' weapons, despite their undeniable mysteriousness, were not equal to ours. And they had the added disadvantage of being light years away from home base. So the remnant of their fleet took off and blew itself up just outside of Mars, which we understood to be the equivalent of unconditional surrender. And it was. We never heard from the Centaurians again. Peace once more. I had a little mopping up to do at the hospital. Then I collected my possessions and went back home after a dignitary, only the vice president this time, had thanked me on behalf of a grateful country. I wasn't needed anymore. For a while, I was glad to be back home. I was a celebrity. People dropped in from all around to see me and talk to me. And my family, basking in the reflection of glory, was nice to me. For a while. I don't have any troubles making appointments with any firm, my father boasted. When I tell him I'm the father of Kevin Faraday... Mother smiled approvingly, Tim a little sadly. He was the only one who didn't seem pleased by what had happened to me, even though he had prophesied it. Sylvia slipped her arm through mine. The agency wondered whether you wouldn't give them a testimonial for panocratic pills, Kev, she said, squeezing my arm. They'd pay a lot, and the rest of the family sure could use the money if you're too high-minded to accept it. I couldn't do a thing like that, Sylvia. It wouldn't be ethical. Why wouldn't it be? She dropped my arm. The pills couldn't possibly hurt anybody. Maybe take a little business away from Mother. But Mother doesn't mind, do you, dear? Mother frowned. But people would think the pills had my healing powers, I explained. I would be breaking faith with myself if I shilled for them. Sylvia snorted. Breaking faith with himself. Look who's talking. Sylvia, my mother said. Please. But Sylvia went on. She was in an overwrought state because her guy hadn't called her, though that was no reason to take it out on me. Who needs healing power now? The machines can cope with all peacetime ailments. Better take your loot while the getting's good, Kev. Nevertheless, Kevin is right, Sylvia, my mother said. He mustn't prostitute his talent. And we don't actually need the money the testimonial could bring in, no matter how much it is, my father said, a little wistfully. I can support my family. Him sighed. The months went on. Once again, there was nothing for me to do, only it was worse for me now because I had tasted usefulness and fame. People did come for a while with their headaches and cut fingers for me to heal, and I was happy healing them until I realized they were just coming to make me feel good. They didn't really need me. Anybody who had anything seriously wrong with him went to a psychiatrist or a machine, same as always. I healed them too quickly for them to have time to take pleasure in it. They couldn't talk for days about a three-second operation. By and by, even the cut fingers didn't come. Maybe I hadn't been exactly gracious toward the end. Maybe the whole thing was my fault. Even the Lucy business. My mother said it was, anyhow. You see, Lucy lived quite a distance away, and we couldn't call each other up because of my not being able to use the tellies. We rode, and I went to see her a few times, and then she came to meet my family once. It was a ghastly evening. 
We all sat around stiffly, my family being excessively polite to her, thinking I knew that this was my only chance to get myself a wife, and so they'd better be nice to the girl, no matter what she was like. And seeing her with what I fancied to be their eyes, I realized that she wasn't outstandingly pretty, particularly bright, or even very talented. And what was she thinking? That she had got herself virtually engaged to a useless half-sense because he had a brief moment of glory as a war hero? Trapped with this imbecile and his dull, stuffy family and not being able to get out of it without being cruel? What were they actually thinking? I didn't know. But they did. Mother knew what everybody was thinking right down to the last convolution of the subconscious mind. And Sylvie knew what everyone else was feeling. And the others, they knew or at least sensed part of what was going on. But I was impercipient. I couldn't tell anything. I was excluded, out in the cold. And being unable ever really to know, was forced to draw the worst conclusions. I took Lucy home that evening. They had to trust me that far alone because it would have looked absurd for Danny or Tim to come along as chaperone. And anyway, I had been there alone before when I had gone to see her. Lucy, I said as we stood awkwardly before her door, I don't want you to feel, just because of what might have happened in a burst of, of patriotic fervor, that you're bound or... No, Kevin, she murmured without looking at me. I understand. I don't feel bound or committed in any way. And you mustn't feel bound either. That's good. I felt a deep sense of sorrow working its way down to settle in my viscera. And if she had had much perceptiveness, things might have been different then. But she hadn't. I took a deep breath, determined to carry my heartbreak off with dignity. Well, goodbye, Lucy. Although she had never really been close to me, in fact, I'd never so much as kissed her, I felt lonelier now without even the hope of her than I ever had before. I began to take my long walks in the park again, brooding over the power that might have been mine if only I hadn't been such a damn fool as to give freely without asking anything in return. During the war, I could have got anything I wanted in exchange for what I had done, or rather, for what I could do. But I had been too busy healing. Now it was too late for asking. Nature, being all I had left, became closer to me than ever before. And one morning, after a violent storm the night before, I mourned over the fallen trees and smashed flowers, as I had never mourned over fallen and smashed men. First, because I hadn't cared and then because I'd known I could help. Come to think of it, how did I know it was only people I could help? Mother, I said eagerly when I came home that evening, I can heal other things besides people, trees and shrubs and... That's nice, dear. Perhaps we can get you a job with the park department if you're tired of sitting home. And in the meantime, you'd better comb those leaves out of your hair. Sylvia, did you call that techno? Yes, mother, Sylvia said gloomily. Her guy still hadn't called. Knowing now how she must feel, I could feel sorry for her. It said it'd be over as soon as it can, but it might take days. We'll have to eat synthetics for dinner if that stove isn't fixed soon, my mother said fretfully, and went off into the kitchen to mess around with the machinery and thus make certain the techno had a real hard job on its hands when it finally did show up. Oh, the devil with it, I thought. No use hoping to interest the family in any extension of my gift that had no practical value except for nature lovers. I might as well seize such meager chances as were still open to me. I wasn't going to be an idealistic idiot any longer. Sylvie, I said to my sister, I've changed my mind about that testimonial. She looked blankly at me out of her reverie. What testimonial? The, you know... The Panocratic Pills. She laughed and patted me on the shoulder, not unkindly, 
because she could probably feel a sympathy in me now that she never could before. Too late for that, honey. Your name wouldn't mean a thing anymore. So many of them owed their lives to me, and yet they had forgotten me. Tim looked at me. Be careful, Kev, he said anxiously. Careful of what? I don't know exactly. He ran his fingers through his hair. But be careful, won't you? Just at that moment, an easy chair floated in from the next room, banged into me, swerved, and crashed into a table. Danny, who had been thinking of going into interior decoration as a sideline to his business, had been making the furniture leap without looking first. I gave Tim a reproachful glance as I used my gift to heal my bruised shin. You might have been a little more explicit, I complained. I'm no path. I didn't mean, but Danny caromed into Tim on his way to inspect the damage. My whole family was so used to relying on their psi powers that they were pretty clumsy when it came to using the merely physical ones. Danny looked sadly at the wreckage. The chair was only nicked, but the table was pretty well smashed. Gee, Kev, he said mournfully, if only you could fix furniture the way you fix up people. I can heal trees, I said, and there would. So try the table, Sylvia proposed. It's going to cost you anything? Danny looked at me hopefully. I went over and touched the table. At first, nothing happened. And then the shattered bits of wood sort of shimmered together and it was whole again. Danny and Sylvia's eyes bugged out. So did mine, as a matter of fact. Only Tim didn't look surprised, just a little sadder. Mother appeared from the kitchen so fast you'd think she'd caught teleportation from father. Kevin, she cried, her eyes shining with an enthusiasm that my healing of people had never evoked in her. She was a conscientious psychiatrist, but a passionate cook. Come in here and see what you can do with the stove. My siblings treading on my heels, I went in and fixed it like that. She looked at me with genuine mother love in her eyes. My boy, she breathed adoringly. Pianos, Danny yelped suddenly. Everyone looked at him. If you worked along with me, Kev, he explained, nobody would ever have to know if I dropped them. I could be a senior executive and no questions asked. But that wouldn't be ethical, Sylvia suggested with a sidelong glance at me. My ethical values have come down to earth, I said. Be glad to help you out, Dan. And the same goes for you, Sylvie. Use Kevin Faraday, a million times more efficient than glue. Nothing for nothing anymore, though. I have to be as professional as everybody, and I've got a career to get started. Sylvia sighed. I wish there were other things you could fix besides people and furniture, intangibles, like broken hearts, maybe. She smiled. Maybe. I'll try. I said, and I concentrated. Just then, the tally bell rang, and Tim, being youngest, went to answer it. When he came back, he was smiling. For you, Sylvie, Lenny. Lenny? Sylvia yelped joyously. She ran toward the tally, dashed back, planted a wet kiss on my cheek, and scurried off to the booth. Well, gosh, Danny said. Maybe it's going to be all right. Tim said, precognizing hard. Power doesn't necessarily corrupt. You could make that part of your service, Kev, Danny suggested. Mending broken hearts, I mean, not corrupting. Hey, where are you going? To catch a hell of us, I said. There's a broken heart that needs fixing immediately, and it's for me. So nothing for nothing still goes. End of Jack of No Trades by Evelyn E. Smith Read by Paul Hampton Memory by Theodore Sturgeon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker 
Memory by Theodore Sturgeon Chapter 1. Trouble on Mars Jeremy Jed stood in the igneous dust of the spaceport margin, staring into the sky and shading his eyes with his arm. Occasionally he checked the time by his wrist cron, shaking it to make sure it was wound, craning back toward the hunched customs house and the great clock. The sign there announced placidly that the pinnacle had reported was overdue and would discharge passengers at gate three. Jeremy shook his head and took the letter from Mars out of his pocket again. Slowly he unfolded it and read, in the manner of a man checking his mnemonics. He was certainly familiar enough with it, after so much re-reading. The letter said, You must have heard by this time that General Export has installed a fabricating plant here just outside Fort Wargod. It cost them plenty in time and money to get it set up. Actually, most of it was shipped as hand luggage because of the shipping space situation. Like a lot of other people, I thought it was a foolish move, because the finished piping they could have shipped in the space is at such a premium on Mars, and because their plant is going to require power, a hard thing to get here. I didn't worry too much, though. Why should we care what our competitors do with their money? But here's the joker. In spite of the fact that the plant is small and comparatively crude, it will fabricate pipe. And the material is plastic, chum, and they can now ship it in sheets. I don't have to tell you what this means to us. We only got our cargo space contracts from General Export because the government okayed our shipping system, nesting the smaller diameters of pipe inside the larger ones. Gen X's own pipe is shipped that way now, too. The idea isn't patentable. So unless we find a patentable way to ship pipe in less space, finished, than Gen X is taking for their sheet stock, we're done, brother. Wiped out. Gen X means to get everything in the colonial system. You know that. They have all the ships now and most of the goods and services. I'm afraid we're going on the long list of small operators who have tried to buck them. Jeremy lowered the letter and rubbed his eyes again. They ached. Since he had received it a week ago, he hadn't slept much. Supplying pipe for the Mars project was work enough without these long nights in the laboratory trying to find a way out of this spot. Everything he and Hal had in the world was in this deal. They had worked together ever since they left school, right up until the time Hal went up to handle the Mars end. Fervently, he wished it were the other way around. If Hal were here, he'd dope out something. He had always been the real brains of Jed and Jed. And as a matter of fact, Hal already had doped out something. What an irony. Whatever his process or system was, he couldn't write it or wire it. General Export carried the mails, too, and if they wanted to find something out, it would be only too easy. Jeremy looked up again. There was a growing, gleaming dot in the sky. He glanced at the building. Near it, men were manning the heat-proof launch. He turned back to the letter to read the cryptic part about Phyllis Exeter. I know a way to whip this, bud. I'm not telling you about it in a letter. You know why. I'm hoping and praying that you'll figure it out yourself. The new hauling contracts are coming up and priorities for shipping space go to the pipe company that can pack the most in. My process is very simple, really. It's nothing that Budgie couldn't have told you. You have three weeks to figure it out after you get this note. And don't forget, it takes ten days to file a patent application. And in connection with this idea, Phyllis Exeter is due to arrive on the Pinnacle. I'd like you to meet her when the rocket ship docks. She really has what it takes. I got quite chummy with her while she was out here in Thor City. She'll probably have a lot to say about it. She'll have a lot to say, period. She talks more than Budgie. Be good, little man. Jeremy's brows matted together as he folded the note and put it away. There was more than met the eye in those last two paragraphs. Much more. He got some of it. Be good, little man. And the references to Budgie. He wasn't too sure, but he had the idea they weren't in there for the purpose of using up ink. And the specific mention of Phyllis Exeter and her arrival. No, that was something. If Hal wanted to be absolutely positive Phyllis Exeter would see him, he'd sure picked the right way. Just that line in the letter would be enough to have Phyllis hunt him up anywhere on Earth, even if he hid. General Export carried the mails. But why Phyllis? After all, Hal and Phyllis had been... He shrugged. If Hal wanted to throw them together again, all right. He began to get the old familiar feeling just thinking about it. From overhead came the blowtorch susurus of the pinnacles breaking and hovering jets. Down she came on her bed of fire until she hesitated at 5,000 feet. He distinctly heard the sudden shift to cold jets, and in another minute the dust cloud was piled up to receive her. Jeremy stepped into the waiting room of number three gate, just avoiding the sudden angry gusts of dust-laden air. He shouldered past the chattering crowd inside and got to port, 
which was covered with a disk of transparent plastic whirling at high speed to afford clear vision through the mucky dust which hurtled so violently about the building. From the spaceport central, the little heatproof drifted toward the grounding liner, waiting its chance to settle on the huge hull and sink its extensible airlock into the monster like an ovipositor. Fifteen minutes later, the heatproof wickered slowly to the roof of the gate building. The crowd pressed toward the elevators and was shunted back to the page boys and officials. Jeremy stood on the fringes, trying to look indifferent and doing a very poor job of it. The first load came down, a heavy-set man with a dark, rocky face, a quick, slender, cold-eyed man. These two stood aside and let a woman with two children and an aged couple pass them, and then Phyllis stepped out. He wondered again, looking at her, what a man would have to do to ruffle that sleekness, to crumple the brilliant mask she seemed to wear, throw a kiss or a fist in that face, and there would be little difference. Her hair was soft and iridescent green now. She smoked with a long holder, and the smoke matched her hair. Her voice was as lustrous, as colorful as ever when she saw him. Jeremy, she said. Jeremy Jed, how are you, darling? Don't call me darling, he said. Oh, these people won't think anything of me that they don't think already, she said. They might think it of me, he said grimly. He took her arm while she laughed as if trying to find out whether she could. She could. Come on, he said. I need a drink. Before, I just wanted one. She hung back and pouted. You seem quite sure I'll come. You've been reading my mail, he quipped grimly. She stopped hanging back. They moved toward the door and down the short path to the customs house. Jeremy glanced back. The two men he had noticed at the elevators were following them. He gestured slightly with his head. Yours? She shrugged. Oh, you know how it is. No, he said. I don't. Not altogether. But I'll learn the rest of it. She laughed again and hugged his elbow close to her body. Jeremy, she said cozily, do you still feel the same way about me? He glanced down into her wide gray-green eyes. Yep, always will, I guess. Worse luck. Worse luck? It gets in my hair, he grumbled. When I think of all the time I've spent thinking about you when I could have been making pipe. That's what I like about you, she flashed. You make a person feel so welcome. She released his arm. What makes you think you can treat me like that? Several things. They all add up to the fact that you won't walk away from me until you find out what you think I know about stowing pipe. No matter what I say or do to you, you'll tag right along. All right, she said in a quite new matter-of-fact voice. I'd just as soon play that way, then. All the cards face up, and such sordidness. It could have been pleasant, too. Not with me. Not with you and me. That's what I meant. Inside the building, they turned to the right elevator bank and dropped to the cafeteria two levels below. There was no conversation in the elevator due to the silent presence of two men who had followed them from the gatehouse. Jeremy glared at them, but the younger man refused to catch his eye and stared at the ceiling, whistling softly. The other man gazed at Phyllis's feet. I think, Jeremy said as they emerged, that you have hired these pugs just to bolster your ego. You'll have men following you whatever you have to do. It isn't necessary to hire them for that, she said coldly. I'm sorry you find this unpleasant, Jeremy, but please don't make it any more so than you have to. Strangely enough, there are lots of places I'd rather be than with you. Alone, for example. You know, he said, as he politely pulled out a chair for her. I like you like this. I mean, I could if I tried. This is the first time I have ever seen you when you weren't swinging the figurative female lasso round and round. Compliments from you are more unpleasant than anything else could be. Light the menu, will you? He touched the stud that illuminated the menu screen. She studied it for a moment and then dialed the code numbers of the items she wanted. Jeremy studied her as she did so. She was an amazing girl, he admitted grudgingly. How she looked, what she did, what she was. Amazing. Her smooth brow was crinkled a bit now, between the eyes. She used to look like that in college once in a while. It generally signified that she was out of her depth, and it also meant that she was about to do something about it, like flapping her eyelids at a vulnerable professor or cribbing from someone else's paper. Chapter 2. Bulldozer Treatment Frowning, Jeremy studied Phyllis for several minutes more. 
Then he spoke. Tell me something, he said. Exactly how was this thing supposed to go? I don't know what you mean. Her voice tuned itself to a strained patience. I mean what was supposed to happen here. You would meet me at the gate, or you would hunt me up, and then what? You seem to know everything. Answer your own questions. All right. You were going to overcome my time-honored distaste of you and give me the business. Most likely the remorse angle. The time you pulled that factory lease out from under us for the benefit of a cosmetic factory, and General Export, who was starting in the pipe business, you are sorry about that. The time Hal fell for Dolly Hollison, and you told her so many lies about him that she up and married somebody else. You're sorry about that, too. The time you, his voice got thick, accepted my ring, all my grand old forgive-and-forget attitude, and a third of our company's stock only to turn the stock over to Gen X and tell me to go fly it? That was an awful misunderstanding. You know, Phil, if I had known when I gave you the stock that Hal had phonied up the stock certificate, I'd have killed him, I think. He took the chance, felt that if you were on the up and up, he could straighten out the stock later. If you weren't, well, nothing would be lost but a little peace of mind. Mine. He breathed very deeply once. Anyhow, Hal thinks you're a poison, and I think you're poison, and I don't know what in the universe you think you are, but certainly it isn't anything that will get a new pipe stowage process out of me. You really slug when you start, don't you? She whispered. He had never seen her eyes so big, nor her face so white. And you don't mind lowering your sights to mix a metaphor. I adjust to the most obvious target, he said bluntly. Why don't you get sore? Why don't you leave? Slowly, with a small, tragic smile, she rose. Watch, she said. She turned toward the door. At a far table, a man rose and sauntered toward the exit. Behind Jeremy, there was a scraping of chairs on the glossy flooring, and the two men who had followed her from the ship went past. The man at the door, a suave-looking individual, lean and white-templed, folded his arms and leaned against the wall just out of range of the photo cell which opened the door. When Phyllis drew abreast, he spoke softly to her. She stopped and shook her head. He smiled then and shook his. She bit her lip, lowered her head a little, and moved toward the door again. So smoothly that it did not seem swift at all, he blocked her. The other two men reached them, greeted her effusively, took an arm each, and led her back toward their table, talking and laughing. When they neared Jeremy's place, they released her and went back to their own table, leaving her standing alone, staring at Jeremy with angry and terrified eyes. The whole thing was done so smoothly that no occupant of the restaurant seemed to notice. "'I have just seen something very lovely,' said Jeremy happily. A "'Pushing around with you involved where you are getting pushed for a change. Now come and sit down and tell me all about it in a sisterly fashion.' She came. Again he was struck with the difference in her the air of being out of her depth. She sank into her chair, her eyes averted from his. She put her hands tightly together on the table, but they would not stop shaking. She volunteered nothing. He reached over the centerpiece of the table and opened the cold chamber on her side, removing the drink she had ordered. Pushing it across to her, he said gently, Gulp some of that, and for once in your life give me a straight story. Whose side are you on besides your own? How did it happen? And why do these Dawn men take such an interest in leaving you alone, providing it's with me? Everything's gone wrong. You... you know too much, Jeremy. And you don't know enough. All right, I'll tell you. Telling you won't help me. I mean, you won't help me, no matter what. I thought I could get what I wanted out of you without your ever knowing that they... that I... That they have the heat on you? Supplemented Jeremy. Source, Gen X. Temperature, high. He shook his head wonderingly. That's always been the trouble with you, Phil. So self-sufficient. Never asked anyone for help in your life. There was always a way out, generally paved with someone's face. I gather that Gen X is as wise to you as I am. She nodded, with a submissiveness which wrung something within him. His hand went out to her. He drew it back without touching her. He said, Talk. Now. I was doing all right, she said in a low voice. I pulled lots of deals for general export. They want everything. They want the entire colonial trade. Ships, supplies, personnel, everything. They're getting it, too, any and every way they can. 
They'll have Mars when they're through. Then what? They're still under government authority. Oh, it's long range, Jeremy. You remember your history. There's a colonial phase after discovery and exploration. Colonizing is a job in itself. Development doesn't really set in for quite a while. Nowadays, of course, the whole process is enormously speeded up. You know, the potentialities of Mars. Uranium, iron, diamond, coal, and drugs. Why, it's an unlimited opportunity for whoever controls it. For perhaps two generations, Mars will look to Earth for government and guidance. But then there will be patriots, Jeremy. Earth will find herself with a competitor instead of a dominion. And the way that competitor will be run will gradually swing the direction of control the other way. Or else. Gen X isn't out after a world. Gen X wants two worlds. The system. The galaxy, if you like. But it will be for Gen X and its heirs. It won't be for the little guy. Jeremy sat back and stared at her, amazed. You figured all that out yourself? I can't believe it. No, by heaven, I don't believe it. Whom are you quoting? How, Jed, she said with an effort. Well, well, well. He took out Hal's letter and opened it. Her eyes darted to it, to his face, and down again. Don't play, Jeremy said grimly. I know you've seen this. You and every stooge Gen X could put on it. He glanced through the letter, speared a sentence with his finger, and read aloud. Phyllis Exeter do. I got quite chummy with her while she was out here in Thor City. That's what put me in this spot, she said with sudden bitterness. Yes, I saw him. Lots. The word got around that he had developed something radical in the line of pipe stowage. He has a suitcase-sized lab back of his office, you know. Well, I was put on it. You volunteered, isn't that more like it? You said, let me at the sucker. I've been able to wind him and his dopey brother around my fingers since we were kids. And besides, I have a little score to settle. They're one up on me. That right? She almost laughed. I didn't call him a sucker, she said faintly. She took a swallow of her drink. Take care of the steak, will you, Jeremy? I'm hungry. Jeremy took the raw steak out of the cold compartment. It was tenderized and seasoned. He slid it into the induction heater. How do you like it? he asked. Seared and rare, she answered. He adjusted the controls and closed the drawer while she continued. I saw a lot of Hal. He got under my skin, Jeremy. Not anything about him personally. I don't go for his type. These scholarly boys leave me cold. I like big men with blonde hair, strong enough to smack a gal down when she deserves it, or even to keep their hands off her, and maybe with a little cleft and a square jaw. Unconsciously fingering just such a concavity on his chin, Jeremy threw back his blonde head and snapped. Baloney to you and your shopping lists. Go on with the yarn. What did get under your skin? What he had to say about Gen X. I don't know. Maybe I never bothered to take it apart before. Maybe my paychecks and bonuses kept me from thinking. Whatever it was that happened, it happened so gradually that I didn't notice it. But the things he said about long-range thinking. Well... Here I was on the inside and knowing even more about what went with Gen X than he did. The more I looked at it, the less I liked it. Maybe I should have left Hal alone. Maybe I should have turned him out while he talked. But as I said before, he had me before I knew what was happening. Jeremy smiled. Hal's like that. He has a theory that a quiet voice in a noisy room is louder than a shout. He thinks quietly and loud that way, too. The centerpiece chimed softly and the drawer slid out. Jeremy took the plate tongs from the rack and lifted the steak and its perfectly cooked side dishes over to Phyllis. Thanks. Well, I met a boy at Fort Wargod, a blue-eyed innocent of a cadet. Maybe it was Moonlight. Moonlight's twice as tricky on Mars, you know. Maybe it's because I'm a little crazy and can't resist trying things out on people. Well, this kid needed to be impressed worse than anyone I ever met. Before I knew it, we were on the parapet looking at Earth hanging out there so bright and blue, and I was spilling all this stuff about colonies, dominions, and the patriotism of the second-generation Martian. Loose talk. Really, I don't know how much of it I believe myself. She shook her head suddenly, all over, as if trying to wriggle out of something tight and hot. Pulling herself together with an effort, she cut into her steak busily. Well, she said after she had swallowed the first bite, my blue-eyed babe in the woods turned out to be a Gen X man put there for the specific purpose of finding out where my indoctrination stood. Jeremy roared with laughter, a great cruel burst of it. He cut it off instantly and leaned forward. So it happened to you, 
he said viciously. I'm mighty glad to hear it. Some sweet and gentle character made you open up your heart, did he? Tell me something, Slicker. Did you try to give him some of your company stock? This hit home. In a sudden anger, she stopped eating and cursed Jeremy. Then all at once, she smiled and shrugged. It was an odd little gesture, and the resignation in it made that something within him flinch again. Phyllis had tried so hard for so long to cover up that soft, lost part of her. She had succeeded so well until now. She was such a magnificent product of her own determinations, and it hurt him to see such a product spoiled, even though he hated everything it represented. So he said, I'm sorry, and to his surprise the words tasted good in his mouth. So, here I am, she said in a low voice. I failed with Hal, as I should have expected. I got quite a carpeting for it, and for that business with the cadet. And then Hal wrote that letter, Gen X carries the mails, Every big brain in the place, and a lot of little ones, has been racking over it ever since. And they put me on to you. This is supposed to be my last chance, my double-or-nothing play. If I get that process from you, I get back where I was. On the probation, of course. But I'll string along with Gen X. If I fail, I'm done. Outside of Gen X, there isn't much doing. And I don't doubt that I'm pretty thoroughly blacklisted. You are, he said flatly. I get the score now. These plugs around here are supposed to keep you with me until you get the info. Hmm. Suppose I leave. I go with you. I keep after you. I catch up with you some way. I keep trying. How long is this supposed to go on? Until I get the process. Or until Gen X gets the pipe hauling contract from the government, in which case I'm automatically out. Suppose you quit trying. Then I'm out as of that moment. In other words, your fate is in my hands, to coin a phrase. I guess it is, Jeremy. And to his utter astonishment, she began to cry with her mouth open. For such an accomplished actress, she did it very badly indeed. Her heart was in it. Jeremy sat back and watched her, his brain racing. Hal's letter had taken on a few new meanings, but not enough. Be good, little man. The rest of that old routine was, and if you can't be good, be careful. Well... Maybe he could have been more careful, but Phyllis seemed to have responded well enough to the bulldozer treatment. Jeremy knew what was the matter with her. She was scared. She had lived by her not inconsiderable wits for a long time, and the clear picture of the end of the line she was facing was a frightening one. But what about the process? Now it was up to Jeremy to figure it out. Chapter 3. Plastic Compact Hal had done his astute best to explain the process to Jeremy Jed in that letter. Somewhere in that letter, somewhere in the odd fact of Phyllis's being here, in these three places, were components of the process. She was quieter now. Sorry, she sniffled. I'm in a bad way, I guess. Do you know why I was crying? It was because you didn't get up and leave when I told you all of this. You will help me, Jeremy. You will? Help you? How can I? Tell me the process. She leaned closer excitedly. Or tell me something almost as good as your process, but better than what Gen X has. You're very flattering. She really thought he had the process then. Be good, little man. He'd have to be. But good. I gather Gen X has set up a welding plant on Mars. Why are they worried? Power, she answered. There are only two power piles on Mars, and they're worked to the limit. They're so heavy with the shielding and all. Shipping space is so scarce with foodstuffs, development equipment, and so on that piles aren't set up until they are absolutely essential. Power is rationed, and it is costing Gen X a fortune for the piddling amount they need to process sheet stock into pipe. Their advantage, of course, is to procure the space for themselves and get rid of one more independent outfit. Uh-huh. The fight is really over a much bigger thing than pipe. Hmm. And the outfit that finds a way to ship pipe in less space than sheet stock gets the contract and for once has a solid footing against the corporation's expansion. But how can you do it, Jeremy? How can you possibly ship pipe in less space than stacks of plastic sheet? He smiled. You really think I'll tell you, don't you? I have no reason to trust you. You've thrown yourself on my mercy, more or less, and given me the choice of saving your skin, your career anyway, I suppose you call it that, at the risk of having you hand the process to Gen X and not only kill off Jed and Jed, but also kill the brightest chance in 50 years of checking the Monopoly. 
Nope, I'm telling you nothing. I wish someone would tell me, he added to himself. But you'll still stick around, she said thoughtfully. You met me at the spaceport. You don't throw me to the wolves when you have a chance. You, why, you don't know the process yourself. On the contrary, I'm just sitting here cruelly amusing myself. I've waited years to see you crawl. I'm not going to listen to you, she said tightly. I think I'm right. The only thing I can do is to help you figure it out. That letter, you, me, the process is right here at this table. If we can only find out how to put it together. <laughs> this is going to be very entertaining, said Jeremy, far more jovially than he felt. How could this girl, who in the long run operated so stupidly, be so incredibly sharp in detail? Where would you start? With the letter, she said promptly. She closed her eyes and her lips moved. It dawned on him that she had thoroughly memorized the letter. She opened her eyes wide and asked, Who is Budgie? A childhood companion, he said, a little taken aback. That's a lie. Every fairly close associate you have ever had in your life has been checked. Jeremy's mouth slowly opened. Then he brought a hand crashing down on the table and bellowed with the laughter. Do you mean to tell me, he gasped, that Gen X's investigators have been gravely looking through the lists of my schoolmates, cousins, bartenders, and dates looking for Budgie? We... They tried everything, she said and added. Stop that silly cackling. Who was it? He held up an irritating forefinger. Uh-uh, manners now. Let us act like ladies and gentlemen, chicken, or I send you to the salt mines. I'm sorry, she said angrily. He set his mouth. I'm sorry, she said with a great deal more sincerity. Better, he said. Now then, I don't think it'll hurt to tell you. Budgie was a parakeet we used to have. He was around very nearly twenty years. We gave him a fine funeral. The girl stared at him, her eyes glittering with disbelief. And yet, according to that letter, the process is nothing Budgie couldn't have told you. Jeremy, I don't believe you. Who was Budgie? So help me. The only Budgie I ever knew was that bird. He swore like a soybean farmer in a urea factory he did. We called him Budgie because he was a... Budgerigar, or to you, a zebra parakeet. A uh, budgerigar is the talkingest bird that ever lived. What? She said in disgust. A creature with memory and no brains could tell you what the process is? Jeremy started, and she asked, What's the matter? Have a rush of brains to the head? While he fumbled for an answer, she leaned back with narrowed eyes. I came awfully close to it that time, didn't I? Come clean, Jeremy. You've known about the process ever since you were a kid now, haven't you? You've got it, he mumbled. She's got it? Who got what? He clapped his hand to his head. Memory without brains. That's me. They stared at each other. If only I knew a little more about plastics, she breathed. Or even about your brother. I'll bet if I knew as much about the way Hal's mind works as you do, I could sit right down and write that process out. Jeremy stared at her and knew she told the truth. His was a quick mind as well as an encyclopedic one, but she was his master at quick, intuitive reasoning. A wild plan flitted through his mind, to leap up and rush out, to draw an attack from one of the Gen X men who waited patiently for Phyllis to do her work, to prefer charges against the corporation, perhaps. But he rejected it instantly. They were too clever for that. They would let him go. One of their plastics engineers would work with Phyllis until some hunch she had gotten made sense to him. Then what? Well, either he would figure it out in time, or he wouldn't. If not, he was sunk. If so, Gen X would so radically underbid his pipe to drive him out that he would be sunk anyway. Hal. The name slipped from his lips. So profound was his sudden wish for his brother. Hal could set him straight with a word. If only he could send the word. Me too, whispered Phyllis. If only I could see Hal once. Only for a minute. I'll bet I could... Suddenly she dived into her handbag, clawing out a potpourri of feminine conglomerata. Where is it? Where is... Oh, here. She held a rectangular piece of plastic in her hand. It was blue, smooth, heavy. What's that? Just a compact. A lighter. A torch. One of those things. But Hal gave it to me. And I'm just mystic enough to think it'll help me think. He had his hands on it. Didn't you know that all women, even... Modern women are witches? She closed her eyes, clutching the compact, frowning in concentration. 
Staring at her, Jeremy frowned too and thought harder than ever in his life before. Something about memory without brains. Something. And then a line in the letter swam before his mind's eye. I'd like you to meet her when the rocket ship docks. She really has what it takes. Give me that, he spat, and snatched it roughly out of her grasp. Instinctively, she reached for it. He batted her hand out of the way, hard. She sat on the edge of her chair, her nostrils dilated, rubbing her hand and watching him like a cat. He turned it over and over, shook it, smelled it, felt it. He opened it, shook out the tinted powders, cracked the mirror retainer with his thumb and slid the glass out. There was nothing unusual about the compact. A little expensive, perhaps, but not unique at all. There was no trademark. Where did Hal get this? He didn't say. Bought it, perhaps. Maybe he made it. He has a little outfit. Give it back to me. I will not. Jeremy fell to studying it again. Jerry, she said sweetly. He looked up. She was her old self. She was erect and beautiful, and the color was back in her cheeks. Somewhere in a side corner of his mind, he deeply regretted the fact that he admired her so much. She put out her hand. Give. Nope. She glanced around. It's evidence. I've been robbed. The property was forcibly taken from me by that man, officer, she said, mimicking a sweet, wronged young thing. There we were, sitting peacefully over a drink and a snack, when he went berserk and took it away from me and began tearing it apart. Her face went cold and direct again. Would you tell the nice policeman exactly why you wanted to keep it, Jeremy? Not while Gen X and the police get along so nicely, he said grudgingly. Okay, I'm open to compromise. You don't know the significance of this piece of plastic. You just might be wrong. If Gen X's plastics division can't find out anything about it, you're way out of luck. Oh, she said. She glanced around at the Gen X watchdogs and shivered. What's your proposition? I have to find out something more. Just what? I'm not sure. Now, think carefully. Exactly what do you remember Hal's saying about this compact? Why, he never said anything much. Just some philosophical quip about women, about me and plastics. I don't remember it exactly. Try. It was... It was something like this. She paused, and he knew she was running over and over it in her mind, poking and prodding at it for hidden meanings. Finally, she shrugged and quoted, I like giving you plastics, Phil. Plastics are an analogical approach to women, and some of them come pretty close. Someday, maybe we'll all be familiar with a plastic that will react differently under the same stimulus the way you do. Laughter this time, tears the next, whichever seems to be expected. I didn't think it was very flattering. Jeremy stared at her, comprehension sparking, flaming, coruscating in his brain. He said hoarsely, Give me the compact. I've got to get it to a lab. No, she said firmly. She took it out of his unwilling hands. Frankly, I don't know what you figured out, but I will if I kick it around long enough. If I can't, I know those who can. Well, she purred, arching her body. I'd better run along, Jerry darling. Thank you so much for everything. The hand that closed on her wrist seemed to be made of barrel steel. Don't you move, Jeremy said. He said it in a way which kept her from moving. You can't take that chance. You don't know enough. If you take that away, I'll never know either, and I'd see both of us dead first. I'll make a bargain. Once more, I must make a test on that compact. I can do it right here. Let me do it. You can watch. Whatever happens, your description will be enough for a plastics engineer. It will give us both a break. And if there really is a secret there, you'll have a chance of getting what you want. You'll know. You don't know now. You only guess. It was a long time before she nodded her head. When she did, he took the compact and, with his knife, scraped off a shaving and dropped it into the ashtray. He took a plate handler from the warm rack and touched the shaving. Then he put his cigarette to it. Then he held it with the plate handler and held it in the flame of his cigarette lighter. Part of it burned. He sniffed the smoke, nodded, and set the temperature regulator on the induction heater. He dropped the compact in and closed the drawer. No! She shouted, You're burning it! You've got the process and you're destroying it, so I won't have a chance! She lunged for the drawer. He caught her wrists, transferred them both to one of his powerful hands, and shook his head. Sit tight, he snapped. 
The centerpiece chimed and the drawer popped open. Their heads cracked together painfully as they bent to look inside. Neither noticed the pain. In the bottom of the pan lay a twisted piece of blue plastic. It spread almost all the way across the roomy drawer. It was flat and followed a series of regular convolutions. It dawned on both of them at the same moment what it was. Script. As if the plastic itself were the track of a writing brush, it spelled the two words. I remember. That's for me, breathed Phyllis. And I'm a dope. The memory without brains. Even I know about that phenomenon. Now that I see it done, I remember a demonstration in school where a cube was compression molded into a spool shape. When it was heated again, it slumped together and formed the original cube. A little sloppy, but a cube nevertheless. With a little refinement, I don't see why extruded pipe shouldn't be compression molded into rods, bricks, or bookends and still come out pipe when it's heated. Beats sheet stock welding a mile. Jeremy, my boy, you may have my melted up old compact with my blessings. You may frame it and hang it over your lab bench when you come to work for Gen X, as you must, or starve. I remember. I like that. You don't remember how badly you needed my help, Phyllis, he said hoarsely. My help. Plastics and women, my boy. Remember? She rose like a queen, gathered up her belongings and drifted doorward, beckoning imperiously to the watchdogs. Ignoring Jeremy Jed completely, they followed her out. Chapter 4 Surprise for Gen X Abruptly, Jeremy came to his senses with an inarticulate animal noise and raced to the door. The lithe man with white hair at his temples stepped in front of him. "'Want something, chum?' he asked softly. Jeremy raised a hand to sweep the man aside, but his eye fell on what the man was holding in his hand. It was a rectangular leatherette needle case. Jeremy had seen them before. A touch of the case, a little pressure on the stud, and you were needled and the variety of hypos used was peculiarly horrible. They stood there, frozen for a long instant. Then someone passed. A spaceport guard. Guard! Jeremy rapped, leaping backward. This man's threatening me! Needle! The guard bobbled a remarkable Adam's apple at them and strode toward the white-templed man. Give it here, bud! The man smiled, raised the case, snapped it open, and extracted a cigarette. A joke, guard. Perfectly harmless. Ha ha! said the guard with his mouth only. He clicked his lips shut and looked at Jeremy with one eyebrow raised. "'You sure are jumpy, blondie,' he remarked and strode off. Jeremy controlled himself with a prodigious effort and swung on the older man. "'Listen, you.' The man blew smoke at Jeremy. "'Better cool it down, son,' he said kindly. "'We joke often, but not always. Hold it,' he snapped, watching Jeremy's darkening face. You can butter me up and down these walls, but I'm only one of a couple thousand that you'd have to whip afterward. Better go on back now and have another drink. And before Jeremy could move so much as a lip, the man was striding up the corridor in that way which did not seem to be swift. Balked, frustrated, furious, Jeremy stood for a while and then turned back into the restaurant. He slouched back to his table, kicked the chair out, and dropped into it. He could use that plastic memory stunt to stow pipe. Sure and when he thought of the low bid that Gen X would put up against him, his stomach turned over. He glowered into the heater drawer, where the blue plastic script told him placidly what he would never forget. I remember. And then he thought of Hal's words to Phyllis. The demonstrations supporting registered bids were made in a public hearing in the vast offices of the Shipping Space Priority Board. The Space Commissioner, an oldster with a snowy lion's mane and the eyes of an eight-year-old child had his wattles in his palms and his elbows on his desk. He was flanked by the featureless protocoloids of his well-peopled bureau. In the wide area before him were three groups of people, each hovering over a tangle of apparatus. Behind them were the rows of seats for the interested public, one-third of the seats occupied. The second demonstration was in progress. The first demonstrator and his helpers were dismantling their bulky machine. Part brake, part automatic welder, it had produced several hundred feet of inch-and-a-half pipe out of a long and compact bale of sheet stock. The galleries had regarded the performance as quite impressive, whether or not they knew that Winfield and Shock, who presented the process, was a general export affiliate, brought in to establish a figment of competition. General Exports Management had shrewdly chosen a presentable demonstration by a more-than-presentable demonstrator. She was slender, poised, clear-eyed, 
clear-voiced, and her hair was green, she was saying. And in spite of the question of simultaneous patent application, General Export will offer this pipe at a lower price per unit shipped than any competitor could conceivably meet, due to a secret treatment of the original plastic. Due to the secret mistreatment of competition, growled a man in the gallery who had once owned a space line. The demonstrator walked gracefully to a stack of long, slender plastic rods beside her machine and lifted one. Mr. Commissioner, this rod is twelve feet long and one-sixteenth of an inch square. As you will observe, the rod is extremely flexible. Stowage of these rods will therefore be compact and economical, since rectangular holds are not necessary. Bundles of these rods will follow the curves, if any, of the retaining bulkheads, and therefore use every cubic inch of space economically. I shall now demonstrate the creation of usable, seamless pipe from these rods. She stepped over to her machine, slid the rod in at one end, and threw a lever. This is a very simple heater. On Earth or Mars, particularly on Mars, it may be adequately operated by sun mirrors, thereby tapping no local power source. There was a faint hiss, a small motor whined, and a twelve-foot length of pipe shot out with a dry clatter. She repeated the performance twice more and then bowed respectfully to the commissioner, who said, Thank you very much, Miss Exeter. Next. A clerk, saying, Master Jeremy Judd of Judd and Judd. Process pipe stowage. Interplanetary. Jeremy stood up, ran off the customary courtesies of the applicant, and then said, I am deeply grateful to Miss Exeter for many things. One of these is her concise and well-presented description of the advantages of General Export's plastic memory process. She has saved me much explanation for my process is precisely the same. The difference lies in the plastic treatment before and after the processing you see here. I will say at the start that, as regards price of the rods I am demonstrating, they cost at least five times as much as those shown by Miss Exeter. I am, apparently, drastically underbid. Jeremy had to pause then to duck under the wave of comment that swept over the huge room. The commissioner cleared his throat and raised a forefinger without moving his hand from his chin. A clerk raised a gavel without moving anything but his arm and brought it down with a crash. "'Get on with it,' growled the commissioner. His tone said, "'If you can't compete with the other bids, you idiot, why waste my time or even that of these thousand-odd other people?' Jeremy stepped to his machine, which was almost a duplicate of the one Phyllis Exeter had used, and lifted an end of one of his rods. He did not attempt to lift it all at once. Apparently it was quite heavy. What followed was the same as the previous showing, with one noticeable exception. The pipe came out in a twenty-foot length. Again the room buzzed. This time Jeremy held up his hand. The greater length of the pipe is an advantage over these other methods, but not the greatest, he said calmly. He threw the heater control over again, without loading in another rod. A twenty-foot length of pipe joined its predecessor. Again he pulled the control, and again. Each time a twenty-foot pipe was produced until six of them lay side by side on the floor, the air above them shimmered very slightly. They were uniform and perfect. Mr. Commissioner, I ask that space for shipment of pipe to Mars be allotted to my company because the stowage is as compact as any product on the market, because I can ship approximately 9.3 times as much pipe per cube unit as my nearest competitor, and because I can deliver pipe per unit length at 11% cheaper than anyone else on Earth and that, in spite of the apparently prohibitively low bid of Miss Exeter's most altruistic firm. Thank you, gentlemen. Just a minute, young man, said the commissioner. You have a most remarkable process. I uh, hear comments to the effect that the pipe was concealed in the machine. Can you give some layman's explanation of this extraordinary effect? Jeremy smiled as he glanced at the machine in front of him. Certainly, sir. My company, you may remember, secured a portion of the space allotted to pipe shipments during your last session by devising the present method of nesting the smaller diameters of pipe inside the larger ones, a method which was not patentable, which my competitors were slow to discover but quick to copy. In the present case, I very much fear that they have repeated their lack of, if I may say it, logical thoroughness. You see, my pipe is still nested one inside the other six taking the space of one, and the hole compressed into the rods you see here. "'You nest pipe of the same diameter?' said the commissioner incredulously, and that odd, mad, detached part of Jeremy's mind noticed hilariously that the oldster's bright eyes blinked with repressed anger. "'Yes, sir, I do, in effect, but it is a question of density. The inner pipe is a condensed plastic, a patented process, by the way. 
this plastic while undergoing the memorizing phenomenon so beautifully explained by Miss Exeter restores its original density as well as its original form. The inner pipe, then, is simply condensed more than the one which surrounds it, and so on until the six are nested. Then the whole is compression molded into rods of precisely the dimensions of those admirably compact ones produced by general export. Now, when heat is treated, the outer pipe returns to its original form and is automatically ejected from the machine. It has, of course, preheated the next pipe, which preheats the one after. It takes, actually, far less heat per unit length to restore my pipe than it does to restore the pipe of, uh, any of my competitors. A small advantage, however, in merely hair-splitting under the circumstances. I feel you deserve many congratulations, Mr. Jed. Purely as a matter of personal interest, might I ask how you came to discover such a remarkable effect. Indeed you may, Mr. Commissioner. The process was developed by my brother on Mars. He enlisted the courtesy and kindness of a messenger to send me a sample. It was in the form of a compact, a ladies' compact, and when heat treated it, separated into a plastic sheet which formed and script the words I remember. Jeremy grinned broadly. It was some time before I realized that there was anything more to be learned from the sample, for the words covered the rest of it. When I put this, this message, into my pocket, I saw the rest of the plastic, and, guided by a hint in a rather cryptic verbal message concerning women and plastics, I again treated the sample. I got more script. It read, Density 2. Then I knew what he was driving at. I treated it again and got Density 3, and still again, and got, he smiled, a length of pipe. After that, it was a little trouble for me to analyze the plastic and develop the condensing treatment. I beg your pardon. I think somebody had better get Miss Exeter a glass of water. They met that evening, and perhaps it was by accident. She was standing in the shadows near his apartment building when he came home from the lab. Jerry? Phyllis, I, I'm sorry. Sorry? That's what you say when you realize you did a wrong. I don't think you mean that. Isn't it more a kind of pity? He did not deny it. He said, What can I do for you? I I need a job now. He took her hand and drew her into the pale light. Her hand lay in his like something asleep. I couldn't give you a job, Phil. Yes, I know, I know. I've never been faithful. Jerry, I, I haven't been faithful to myself. I don't understand. You've always, always thought I could take him or leave him alone. Not so, Jeremy. Oh, he said. Oh, that. He squeezed her hand a little. Your hands are soft. Maybe that's part of the trouble, Phil. I think I know what you mean. There are jobs for me, but not jobs for your wit or your wits. I see. I think I can get there, Jerry. I know you can. Goodbye, Phyllis. Goodbye, Jeremy. There is one job which centuries of human progress has not done away with. No one has developed a self-washing window. When one of mankind's monuments to himself reaches a thousand feet into the air, and its windows must be washed, that washing is a job for a rare type of human. He must be strong, steady, and brave. He must live away from his job in ways which do not unfit him for it. Jeremy was glad when he heard Phyllis was doing this work. He knew then what he had always guessed, that some day she would get there. He knew in his heart. End of Memory by Theodore Sturgeon The Miniature Menace by Frank Belknap Long. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Miniature Menace, a thrilling novelette by Frank Belknap Long. Condemned without trial for his refusal to open fire on an alien spacecraft, Ralph Langford had to be free to investigate the strange menace from beyond the stars. For if the alien were an enemy, then it would be the most terrible enemy man had ever encountered. The sky was harsh with the flare of rocket jets when Captain Ralph Langford emerged from his deep space cruiser on the Mars City landing field. There was a girl standing alone at the far end of the field, and for a moment Langford thought it might be Joan, irrational as the thought was. Of course Joan couldn't be here. He was to see her at the hospital. He started across the field, blinking in the glare, his eyes shining with a warm gratefulness to be home again. 
As he approached the solitary figure, he could see it was not Joan, though there was a resemblance. He was so engrossed that he didn't notice the tall, eagle-eyed young patrol officer that came striding toward him until he heard the man's voice. "'You're under arrest, sir,' the youth said, his hand whipping to his visor. "'Commander Gurney's orders!' Langford looked up suddenly, then stiffened in belligerent protest. "'Hold on, Lieutenant. You can't arrest me and march me off to jail like a common criminal. Commission regulations. How long have you worn those stripes, youngster?' The youth's eyes were respectful, sympathetic. He did not appear to be offended. "'I'm sorry, sir,' he said firmly. "'Commander Gurney went before the commission and had you certified as irresponsible.' Langford flushed angrily. "'So that's it,' he grunted. The patrol officer hesitated. He had prepared what he intended to say, but the fame of the big man facing him had reached sunward to Mercury and outward to Pluto's frozen tundras. Langford's fist lashed out suddenly, catching the youth flush on the jaw and crumpling him to his knees. The girl, who had been a silent witness up to now, gasped, then turned and ran like a frightened rabbit. Langford did not stop to apologize. Rumor had it that deep space officers bore charmed lives, but Langford knew as he broke into a run that his life hung by a thread that might at any moment turn crimson. No part of the field was unguarded. If the guards had orders to withhold their fire, he saw a desperate chance of outwitting them. But if they had orders to blast, his fate was already sealed. As he ran, he had a vision of himself sinking down in a welter of blood and blackness, his ears deafened by the hollow chant of concussion weapons. He saw himself lying spread out on the landing field, the taste of death in his mouth, the air above him filled with a harsh, eerie crackling. He ran faster, like a man bemazed, his eyes filled with dancing motes that kept cascading down both sides of his oxygen mask. He was a hundred feet from the ship when he became aware that a dozen armed guards had emerged from shadows at the edge of the field and were converging upon him. Angry curses whipped through the night and the field seemed to tilt as the guards came racing toward him. Far off in the darkness a siren wailed. Langford suddenly realized that he was becoming light-headed from too much oxygen intake. His head was filled with a dull roaring and seemed to be expanding. It was filled with flashing lights as well as sound and was leaving his shoulders as he ran. He had a sudden impulse to laugh and shout, to whoop at how ridiculous it was. His head had left his shoulders and was spinning about in the air. But before he could grasp the tube which was flooding his brain with hilarity, Armed guards were all about him, raising their weapons to cover him and shouting at him to raise his arms. Unfortunately, he couldn't seem to move his arms. When he made the effort, he went plunging and skidding over the ramp with running figures on both sides of him. He was skating, cutting capers on ice. Fantastic and incredible capers. Then the ice was inside his skull, swelling up thick, his heels were together when the lights in his head went out. When the lights came on again, Langford found himself stumbling forward into a blank-walled room with a steady pressure at his back. At first he thought the room was a cell, but when his vision adjusted itself to the glare, he saw that he was facing a seated man whose head seemed to be dancing in the air. "'Here he is, Commander,' a harsh voice said. "'He blacked out.' but that didn't stop him from putting up a terrific fight. Langford had no recollection of putting up a fight, but the guard's jaw was bruised and swollen, which seemed to indicate that a struggle had taken place. A massive desk swam into view, and the head of the seated man settled down on his shoulders. Langford blinked. Facing him in the cold light was a supreme commander of the Solar Patrol, a thin, hollow-cheeked man of fifty whose eyes behind narrow lids glittered as cold as glass. Commander Gurney's immobility was not unlike the roll of thunder in a vacuum. There was sound and fury to it, and yet not a muscle of his face moved as he dismissed the guard with a curt nod and waited for the massive door behind Langford to clang shut. 
The instant silence settled down over the room, Commander Gurney came to life. "'You're under arrest, Langford,' he said quietly. "'If you've anything to say in your own defense, you'd better start talking. I can spare you.' The patrol commander glanced at his wristwatch. "'Exactly twenty minutes.' "'Good enough,' Langford grunted. All the muscles of his gaunt face seemed to pull together as he seated himself. For an instant he remained motionless, his eyes troubled and angry, as if he could not quite accept the fact that he had been deprived of his command by the irate man opposite him. The two men who sat facing each other in the cold light were sharply divergent types. Langford was a man of enormous strength and a temper that was just a little dangerous when it got out of control. He had never once failed in his duty, and the inner discipline which he had imposed on himself showed in his features, which were as tight as a drum. But beneath his rough exterior, Langford concealed the sensitive imagination of a poet, and an immense kindliness which sometimes overflowed in strange ways, embarrassing him more than he cared to admit. Commander Gurney had never experienced such embarrassment. He had imposed his will on the Solar Patrol by becoming an absolute slave to efficiency at considerable detriment to his health. There was something rapacious and hornet-like about him, something ceaselessly alert. Now he sat regarding Langford with a stinging contempt in his stare, poised for the attack, his harsh features mirroring his thoughts like an encephalograph. "'Well,' he prodded. Langford wet his dry lips. Reaching inside his resplendent uniform, he removed a small shining object, which he set down at the edge of his superior's desk. They shot this out at us when I ordered them to stand by for boarding, he said. It was contained in a small translucent capsule which I picked up with a magnetic trawl. It's just a model in miniature, but take a good look at it, sir. Would you care to make the acquaintance of a creature like that in the flesh? Commander Gurney's eyes widened, and his mouth twitched slightly. In the name of all that is unholy, Langford. What is it? he muttered. Langford shook his head. I wish I knew, sir. It looks quite a bit like a praying mantis, a little metallic praying mantis six inches tall, but it doesn't behave like one. The statuette on Gurney's desk seemed chillingly lifelike in the cold light. It had been fashioned with flawless craftsmanship. Its upraised floor limbs were leaf green, its abdomen salmon pink, and its gauzy wings shone with a dull metallic luster as Langford turned it carefully about. Gurney couldn't help noticing, with a little shudder, that its mouth parts consisted of a cutting mandible and a long coiled membrane like the ligula of a honeybee. Huge compound eyes occupied the upper half of the metal insect's face. Gurney's hand had gone out and was about to close on the little statue, but something in Langford's stare made him change his mind. As his hand whipped back, he fastened his gaze on Langford's face with the ire of a peevish child denied access to a jam pot. "'What in blazes has that to do with your failure to obey orders?' he demanded with explosive vehemence. "'That ship must have used an interstellar space warp drive to appear out of nowhere in the middle of the asteroid belt, and you deliberately let it slip away from you.' Langford shut his eyes before replying. He saw again the myriad stars of space, the dull red disk of Mars, and the far-off gleam of the great outer planets. He saw the luminous hull of the alien ship looming up out of the void. An instant before, the viewpane had been filled with the sprinkling of very distant stars with a faint nebulosity behind them. The ship had appeared with the suddenness of an image forming on a screen, out of the dark matrix of empty space. Langford leaned forward, a desperate urgency in his stare. "'Mere alienage doesn't justify the crime of murder, sir,' he said. "'Attacking an alien race without weighing the outcome would have been an act of criminal folly, charged with great danger to ourselves.' Commander Gurney shook his head in angry disagreement. "'Just how would you define murder, Langford?' he demanded. "'If a highly intelligent buzzsaw came at you, would you bare your throat?' Langford ignored the question. "'Violence breeds violence, sir,' he said with patient insistence. "'Suppose the shoe were on the other foot. 
Suppose the inhabitants of another planet attacked you without giving you a chance to prove your friendliness. Langford's eyes held a dogged conviction. Remember, sir, to issue a warning is an act of forbearance. No reasonable man could mistake a warning for an aggressive act. If their weapons are superior to ours, or they are superior to us in other truly terrifying ways, they would prove their friendliness by warning us. Would you have had me attack their ship without studying that warning? Gurney's eyes had returned to the statue. He seemed fascinated by the glitter of its folding wings. He had a sudden vision of the metal insect spreading its wings and taking off with a low, horrible droning. Suddenly there was a dull throbbing in the patrol commander's temples. A frightful dread look possessed him, so that he could hardly breathe. In his mind's gaze he saw a vast, stationary plane that seemed to hang suspended in mid-air above a fiery sea. Sweeping straight toward him, dark against the glow, were hundreds of flying mantis shapes with their arms upraised in the glow. Gurney shuddered and gripped the arms of his chair. He transfixed Langford with an accusing stare. "'Man, if you'd engage them in open combat, we'd at least know where we stand.' We could have put the entire patrol on alert. Now they've given us the slip and may show up anywhere, armed with weapons that could wipe out civilization overnight. I chose what I believe to be the lesser of the two evils, sir, Langford said, stepping closer to the desk. His eyes rested briefly on the metal insect. Then they returned to Gurney's face. There were two metal insects in that capsule, sir. I'm going to show you exactly what happened to the one I experimented with. Langford's forefinger whipped out as he spoke, striking the little statue sharply on its folded wing membranes. For an instant, nothing happened. Then, with appalling suddenness, the metal insect came to life. It spread its wings and ascended straight up into the air. Gurney leapt to his feet with a startled cry. As he did so, the flying insect's wings blurred, and another pair of wings came into view behind them. The wings were shadowy at first, but they quickly solidified, taking on a glittering sheen. Praying arms sprouted from them. Then, even more quickly, a big-eyed head and a writhing salmon-pink abdomen. The instant the second shape became a complete insect, it whipped away from its parent image with a furious buzzing. As Gurney stared up in horror, the original insect gave off eight more buzzing replicas of itself. They darted swiftly up toward the ceiling and circled furiously about, their wings gleaming in the cold light. Suddenly there was a blinding flash of light, the flying replicas vanished, and the original insect thudded to the floor. For an instant the little horror squirmed, then lay motionless. "'It's playing possum,' Langford said. Langford advanced as he spoke and raised his foot. The instant he started to bring his heel down, the metal insect shivered convulsively, lifted its huge eyes, and stared up at him. Then an incredible thing happened. There was no need for him to crush the insect. Methodically and with cold deliberation, it began to dismember itself, tearing off its wings with its own sharp claws and ripping its abdomen to shreds. After a moment, it lay still. Langford turned and stared soberly at Gurney. If we want to warn them, we could send them a little mechanical man complete in every detail armed with miniature weapons. They simply sent us a replica of themselves, a model in miniature. It's so unbelievably complex that we could learn nothing by subjecting it to mechanical tests. But we don't have to know what makes it tick. They've warned us that they can multiply by fission so rapidly that they could overrun the earth in a few hours. They've also warned us that if they find themselves facing impossible odds, they won't hesitate to destroy themselves. Commander Gurney had returned to his desk and stood facing Langford, his face as grim as death. I quite agree, he said. That was an ugly warning. Langford? Letting that ship get away was worse than treasonable. Your twenty minutes are up. He was reaching for the communication disc on the far side of his desk when Langford reached inside his uniform for the second time. When the big man withdrew his hand, he was clasping an automatic pistol. 
Gurney took a swift step backwards, his eyes widening in alarm. "'So the guards forgot to search you?' "'I'm afraid they did, sir,' Langford said quietly. "'Sit down. I'm going to ask a small favor. A port clearance permit, signed and sealed by you. If you give me your word you won't move until I've cleared the port, I won't tie you up.' Gurney sat down and stared at the young space officer in scornful mockery. "'Suppose I refuse to promise anything. Would you blast me down in cold blood?' Langford hesitated. His jaw tightened, and a candid defiance came to his stare. "'No,' he said. "'Then if you're not prepared to murder me, you haven't got what it takes to exact a promise,' Gurney said. Langford shook his head. "'That's sheer sophistry.' he pointed out. I've just laid my cards on the table. If you take advantage of my good faith, you'll be hitting below the belt. You see, sir, there's something I've got to do. If I fail, I'll come back and give myself up. For a moment, not a muscle of Gurney's face moved. Then he shrugged and glanced at his wristwatch. I'll sit perfectly still for exactly fifteen minutes, Langford, he said. That should give you sufficient time to clear the port. His eyes narrowed to steely slits. But heaven help you when I move. Fair enough, Langford said. Ten minutes later, the patrol captain was climbing into a small jet plane at the edge of the spaceport. Far to the east, the skyline of Mars City rose above the horizon like a glittering copper penny, swimming in a nebulous haze. A penny flipped in desperation that had miraculously come heads. Part of the wonder he felt was due to his knowledge that he would soon be flying straight through the penny toward a tall white building he would have braved the sun to scale. Chapter 2 A gray-faced physician met Langford at the end of the corridor and beckoned him into a small white-walled room. The physician was not talkative. He didn't need to be. The girl who sat under the bright lamps, with her eyes swathed in bandages, told Langford all he cared to know. Her lips were smiling, and she held out her arms as her husband came into the room. Langford went up to her and kissed her tenderly on the cheek, his big awkward hands caressing her hair that lay in a tumbled dark mass on her shoulders. She had tried to keep back the tears, but they came now, so that her body quivered with the intensity of her emotion. I'm going to see, darling, she whispered. I know I'm going to see again. I wouldn't let them remove the bandages until you came. Sure you are, Langford said gruffly, and you'll have better sight than ever before, both kinds of sight, just as you had before. I was afraid you might be hurt, darling, Joan Langford whispered, running her forefingers down his wet cheek as she held his head close. I use the other sight that makes me so different and terrifies people much more than it should. You should not have done that, Langford said, scowling. I was in no real danger. You were being hunted like a criminal. She turned her head toward Dr. Crendon as she spoke. The physician looked away, feeling her gaze on him through the bandages. The law of compensation, child, he said gently. Mutants are clairvoyant. Their vision is piercingly sharp where vision matters most. When nature confers a priceless gift, she sometimes withdraws a lesser one. No one knows why, not even the biologists, he smiled. There I go, personifying the impersonal again. Perhaps ordinary sight will some day be vestigial in all of us. Langford glanced up. The physician was pressing his finger to his lips and gesturing toward the door. Langford got quickly to his feet. A chill wind seemed to blow into the room, driving all the warmth from his mind. Just outside the door, Dr. Crendon turned and spoke in a cautious whisper. "'I haven't given up hope,' he said, "'but the chances are not too good. We don't know why, but mutants have a defective vision from birth when their eyes are normal.' Langford nodded. "'I know that, doctor.' The physician's voice became gentler. "'We know so little about mutants. Fifty thousand of them in the world, perhaps, born too early or too late. 
an inward vision that can pierce barriers of sense and see to the heart of things, and an outward vision that's defective, faltering, almost a blind man's vision. Clairvoyance and failing sight, it just doesn't make sense. Joan makes sense, Langford said. If she were stone blind, I'd still worship her. Dr. Crendon held his hands straight out before him and looked down at them. I did my best, he said simply. There were slight peculiarities of structure in the choroid, but I'm sure that the new cornea will adjust. It's the retina itself, the innermost nervous tunic of the eye, that I'm worried about. He paused, then went on quickly. A mutant's retina is hypersensitive. It responds to light in a peculiar way and has a tendency to distort images. But that distortion vanishes when the mind becomes really active. Langford looked at him. Just what are you trying to tell me? I'm not sure I know. There were little puckers between Crendon's eyes. Put it this way. If she doesn't brood too much, if she leads an active life and has complete confidence in her inner vision, her sight may improve. I think the failure of a mutant sight may be partly due to, well, a kind of fear. Mutants feel cut off from normal humanity, whatever that may be, and are tempted to use their inner vision as a means of escape. And when they do that, the outer vision dims to the vanishing point. Then you think, make her feel that she can be of assistance to you in every moment of your waking life. Give her some important task to perform. Keep her with you, lad, as much as you can. She's missed you these many months. Make her realize that you can't get along without her. Langford's eyes held a dawning wonder. He seemed like a man from whom an immense weight had been lifted. I was just about to tell you that I needed her inward vision, he said. Not only the eyes you've done your best to restore, but her powers of clairvoyance. You mean that? Why should I lie to you, doctor? For the second time, Crendon smiled. No reason, I suppose. But I thought you might be deceiving yourself by pretending you needed her when you didn't. You've been under something of a strain. It was Langford's turn to smile. You don't know the half of it. Oh, yes, I do. She saw you crossing the skyport with scanner beams trained on you. She saw you playing hide-and-seek with annihilation. I had to give her a sedative injection to quiet her. Langford did not move. Something in Crendon's face told him he was not expected to say anything. So that makes me an accessory, Crendon said, the smile still on his lips. Her vision went blank when I decided she'd seen enough for her own peace of mind. He nodded. I didn't know whether you managed to escape or not. It kept me on the tether hooks until you showed up in my office twenty minutes ago. I've always liked you, Langford, and I flatter myself I know an honest man when I see one. His hand went out and tightened on Langford's palm. Come now, we've got to remove those bandages before she reads my thoughts and knows how scared I get when I operate. Mutants know what humbugs we all are, Langford. They can see all the flaws in us, and if they can still trust us and believe in us despite that, they must be the forerunners of a new humanity in more ways than we dream. If Joan Langford had eavesdropped, using her strange sight, she gave no sign when her husband returned to her side. The conversation in the corridor had taken him from her for the barest instant, but that instant had seemed like an eternity to Langford and the inner vision of his wife. For how could time be measured in minutes or hours by a woman wearing a blindfold, shut away in the dark and waiting a verdict that could cause the future to slow away into chill gulfs? And how could time have any meaning when the stars faded out of the sky and a sunset gun boomed farewell to the joys of the physical world? And to one who loved and hoped, could time be measured by the moving hands of a clock? Quickly Langford's fingers interlocked with those of his wife. 
This is it, darling, he said. Crendon's fingers fumbled a little as he turned Joan's head gently from the light and began to unwind the bandages. Don't open your eyes until I've removed the gauze pads, he warned, and don't look directly at the light. At first you may not see at all. You must be prepared for that. Crendon hated himself for his sternness, but experience had taught him that it was best to arouse a faint antagonism in his patients. It prevented them from regarding him as a miracle worker. He wanted them to face reality with courage, for healing depended on many things and was often a matter of blind, fanatical trust. Now then, he said. As he spoke, he raised the last fold of the bandage and carefully removed the small moist pads beneath, one from each eye. He straightened, his back to the light. Langford looked away quickly, as though from a great distance he heard Crendon say, "'Now you may open your eyes. Remember, you may not see at all for five full minutes.' Mentally he added, "'Or ever. I shouldn't be discouraged. A man does what he can. Ten years of it, ten years of trying to save human sight. And every day I learn something.' and every day I envy men who endure merely the loneliness of space. Why pretend? I have never felt compassion for humanity in the abstract. It is only when I look into eyes that I have failed to heal and realize that I can do nothing at all. Dr. Crendon, I can see. Everything. Clearly. And so it was that Dr. Crendon, moody, skeptical Dr. Crendon, received the greatest shock of his life. He had anticipated an agonized outcry, or a joyous one. But Joan had spoken hardly above a whisper, in a tone of quiet assurance, as if she had known all along that she would see. And suddenly Crendon realized that she had known, for mutants can see into the most probable future, not too clearly, but clearly enough. How could he have been so blind? As Crendon turned, he saw that Langford had fallen to his knees beside his wife and was sobbing convulsively, his head cradled in her arms. He tiptoed softly out of the room. He felt curiously hollow inside, as though all capacity for emotion had been burned out of him by the corroding acid of his own skepticism. Chapter 3 Five minutes later, Langford was replacing the bandages on Joan's eyes. He felt like a man who was playing a game with a deadly unseen antagonist in a room full of crouching shadows. No, not a room. As he bent above his wife, his hand on her tumbled hair, the space about him seemed to fall away into darkness. And now he was gazing straight down the interplanetary deeps at a green world swimming in a nebulous haze. The haze dissolved, drifted away, and he saw the green hills of his native land. He saw the earth, and crouching shadows covered the face of the land. The crouching shadows of enormous insects. He could not escape from them, because they were everywhere. When he broke into a run, the mantis shapes followed him. They towered above him, sinister, horrible. He felt like a man caught in an invisible trap, the sky hemming him in, the ground beneath his feet a dissolving quagmire. He shook the illusion off, for he did not want Joan to see the shadows as he saw them. What was it Crendon had said? She must be made to feel that you need her. Well, he did. He knew now that more than his own honor was at stake— if the alien ship could not be located, his fears would not remain subjective. The fate of humanity hung in the balance. His imagination had been stimulated abnormally by the events of the past few days. Now it was leaping ahead of developments. For all he knew to the contrary, the alien ship had foundered in the void or crashed on one of the inner planets in a red swirl of destruction. Interstellar exploration was not without its risks, and those risks would mount steadily to an alien intelligence as unfamiliar landmarks loomed up out of the void. "'You do not need the bandages,' Langford said, a deep solicitude in his voice. "'If you simply shut your eyes, you would see the ship clearly. 
My thoughts would guide you to it. My vision is sharper when my eyes are bandaged, Joan replied. You must trust me, darling. I know. When my eyes are sealed, there is no emotional block and my inner vision has free play. I am prevented from using my eyes by an actual physical impediment. So I strain all of my faculties to see as far as I can in the dark. Call it a psychological quirk if you wish. I only know that it helps. If it helps, that's all that matters, Langford assured her. Forget I put my oar in. Don't think about the ship for a minute, Joan said. Make your mind a blank. Then visualize yourself standing before the viewport staring out, just as you stood when you first saw the alien ship. Visualize the ship coming toward you through the void. If you do visualize it clearly, I'll be able to locate it no matter where it is now. Joan paused as though she didn't quite know how to make the complexity of the problem clear to her husband. I can't explain the power, she said. I know so little about time, far less than the physicists think they know. Mutants, they tell us, can visualize time as a stationary dimension, freezing all event objects in the past and in the probable future. They can travel along time in either direction at will. But you do not think of it as an actual journey? Langford asked. You merely shut your eyes and see? Joan shook her head. It isn't quite as simple as that. Clairvoyance is never simple. It's complicated by an intense inward illumination. It's a little like staring at something through a long vista of converging prisms. Objects get in the way, and there's doubt, uncertainty. Sometimes it's sheer torment. Sometimes I can't see at all, and even when I can see, there's a curious, almost terrifying sense of wrongness about it. You mean you feel guilty? Joan smiled slightly. Did Alice feel guilty when she went through the looking glass? Perhaps she did, but I didn't mean that kind of wrongness, not moral wrongness. It's as though the strange tensions will get you if you don't watch out, rush in upon you and project you forcibly into another place, as though you were a jet of steam imprisoned in a bottle much too tight and forced in the wrong direction by a power you can't begin to understand. You keep fearing that you'll get caught in the neck of the bottle and wake up screaming. Good Lord, Langford muttered. I've never got caught, Joan said. Now make your mind a blank, darling. We're going to find that ship. A moment later, Langford stood holding his wife's hand, a sharp apprehension in his stare. Joan seemed slightly agitated. She sat gripping the arms of her chair, her bandaged eyes turned from the light. Suddenly her lips moved. Ralph, I can see the ship. It's coming straight toward the viewport. You didn't tell me it was so beautiful, so... so huge. I was waiting for you to tell me, Langford said quickly. Well, I'm telling you, darling. I'm glad you didn't completely visualize it. Now I'm sure I'm not just reading your mind. It must be three hundred feet long. It's hard to tell where the illumination comes from. Joan straightened suddenly. It's no longer just a ship, she said. I'm still outside, but I've moved closer to it, and I can sense a rustling deep inside the hull, a vague stir of activity that's not entirely physical. While Langford held his breath, Joan pressed her palms to her temples. The rustling is becoming clear. There are swift, abrupt movements accompanied by thoughts. But I'm not sure whether the thoughts come from one mind or many minds. The thoughts are swift, piercing, darting thoughts. That's the only way I can describe them. Her voice rose slightly. I can sense a living presence deep inside the ship— more than one, I think. There's a kind of swarming. A swarming? I'm not sure about that, Joan said quickly. I don't think they're moving about much. The thoughts seem to come from one direction. I can just make out a shape now. It's tall and very slender. Winged? Langford whispered. No, no, don't prompt me, 
Joan was excited. The important thing is that I can see it. I may never see it clearly. Gauzy, yes. It is winged. It has gauzy shining wings folded on its chest, two claw-like appendages raised in a praying attitude. Perhaps I saw that in your mind. You mustn't interrupt again. I won't, Langford promised. The creature is horribly agitated, Joan said. It looks upon your ship as a menace. Its brain is humming with fear. It is preparing to contact you, warn you. It's getting ready to warn you in a strange way. It has prepared something for just such an emergency, something small, glistening. I can't make it out, but it's putting the object into a luminous shell. That's right, Langford said, forgetting his promise. They shot the shell into the void. We picked it up with a magnetic trawl. There was a brief silence as Joan thought that out. Then her lips twisted in a strained smile. If you say another word... Sorry. It's bad. It hinders. She raised her arms in a gesture of grim urgency. Now the ship is moving swiftly away from your ship. I can dimly sense vast distances rushing past, and there's a feeling of loneliness, of utter desolation. No despair, exactly. It's as though I were sensing the utter desolation of deep space through a mind filled with a bitter nostalgia. If the feeling wasn't so intense, so strange and bewildering, I'd say it was a carry-me-back-to-old-Virginia feeling. Does that make sense to you? It's like someone thrumming a guitar a billion miles from home, whistling to keep up his courage, remembering something very precious and beautiful lost forever. I can't explain it in any other way. She was silent for a moment. Then she said, now a planet is taking shape in the darkness. It's pale green and crossed by a long wavering streamer of light. I can make out continents and seas. Joan stiffened. Ralph, there's only one planet in the solar system that catches the sunlight through great swarms of meteors in the plane of its elliptic. The lights of the zodiac. It must be the Earth. Langford dared not speak for fear of breaking the spell. Joan was trembling now, as though thoughts from the past were impinging with a tormenting intensity on her inner vision. The ship's out of control, came suddenly. It's plunging down through the lower atmosphere toward a vast expanse of jungle, a tropical rainforest. A mist is rising over the trees and a burst of flame is coming from the ship. It's zigzagging as it descends. Emotion seemed to quiver through her. For a moment, she remained silent, her lips slightly parted. Then more words came in a rush. The ship lies on an island in a forking river. Above it, the foliage is charred, blackened. There are three rivers, and just below the island, the water is white with foam. There's a tremendous cataract about five miles below the island. It's the largest cataract I've ever seen. There was an eagerness on Langford's face, but he remained silent. There's a man swimming in the river above the cataract, Joan went on. A brown-skinned man with straggly hair, his shoulders gleaming in the sunlight. I'm going to try to read his mind. Langford did not move. For a moment there was no sound in the room save Joan's harsh breathing. Then suddenly she straightened and ripped the bandage from her eyes. Brazil! she exclaimed exultantly. Darling, I've located the ship for you. That island is in the interior of Brazil, in the deep jungle, close to the headwaters of the Amazon. Langford stood very still, scarcely daring to breathe. In his mind's gaze he saw a slender space cruiser lying unguarded in a suburban hangar close to the dark waters of the great northwestern canal. Commander Gurney's own private cruiser the White Hawk. How much of his mental audacity was inspired by sheer desperation Langford could not guess, but he suddenly saw himself climbing out of a thrumming jet plane in deep shadows and running straight toward the cruiser with Joan at his side. He saw the cruiser ascending, saw himself at the controls with the red disk of Mars dwindling beyond the viewport. He saw the myriad of stars of space and the rapidly expanding disk of the earth pierced by wavering banners of light. 
and then it dawned on him that in one strange way Joan had seen the vision first and was sharing it with him. He knew then that he could not fail. Chapter 4 Beneath the descending cruiser, the roof of the forest gleamed in russet and emerald splendor above a labyrinth of wooded archipelagos. It still seemed a little like a dream to Langford, but he knew that it wasn't. The vision that he had experienced three days before, standing beside his wife in a white-walled room, had taken on the bright, firm texture of reality. He stood before the controls with a thrumming deck under him, and studied the shifting landscape through the White Hawk's viewport. He had never before flown directly over the Amazon basin, and a river of shining wonder seemed to flow into his mind as he stared. It was Joan who broke the spell. She tugged gently at his arm, her face anxious. "'I don't see any sign of the three rivers,' she exclaimed. "'Do you?' Langford swung about. We haven't passed the great cataract of Inner Morocco yet, he said. It rushes straight along for five or six miles, then it becomes the most impressive waterfall in South America. A few miles below the falls, the river spreads out into a lake. Langford turned back to the viewport. When we see the lake, we can look for another branching in the island. The island is right in the middle of the three rivers you saw in your vision. But it's just a dot on the electrograph. Are you sure it is a distinctive shape? It has a high rocky shoreline, Joan assured him. The central tributary cuts it in half and the other rivers flow around it. It's heavily forested, but the rent in the foliage where the ship came down is so wide you should be able to see it from ten thousand feet. The treetops are charred over a half-mile radius. Langford smiled and squeezed her arm. I'd bet you'd be happy mapping the Amazon in a bark canoe like a twentieth-century explorer, he said. He grinned wryly. A big rock island, mysterious as a cave of vampire bats, bisects the largest tributary west of the Tocantins, and it's just a dot on electrograph to us. We've explored every crevice of every world in the system, but sometimes I envy our ancestors. They had elaborate pictorial maps to guide them. After a moment, the ship leveled off and the great cataract swept into view. It was a shining whiteness between two towering walls of foliage festooned with hanging vines and flame-tongued flowers upon which the red sunlight seemed to dance. It foamed and cascaded over jagged rocks, swept around little clumps of submerged vegetation, and tore at sloping mud banks glimmering in the sunlight. Then the cataract became a receding blur, and the wide river split up. Langford heard Joan cry out. The island which loomed below was about eight miles in circumference, and so heavily forested that it resembled a single shrub of wilderness proportions growing from a cyclopean stone flower-pot. Its high banks were almost vertical, its summit a charred mass of foliage cleft by an enormous rent which funneled the sunlight downward to a circular patch of bare scorched earth. Something glittered on the forest floor far below the blackened foliage, but whether it was the alien ship or merely the glint of sunlight on the river which flowed completely through the island, Langford could not determine from his aerial vantage point. A divided island was really two islands, but Langford was in no mood for geological hair-splitting. Erosion had failed to efface that original hoary uniqueness of that towering mass of jungle, and for all practical purposes it was one island still, its high banks and far-flung aerial traceries hemming it in, and sealing its teeming life in eternal solitude. Langford turned and looked at Joan with eyes that were meshed in little wrinkles of confidence. "'I'm going to gun her down through that gap,' he said. "'We could crash through anywhere, but the best way to locate a wreck is to hew close to the cinder line.' He bent grimly over the controls, in his mind a vision of a great host of alien creatures rushing toward him through the forest, swarming over the ship, refusing to let him emerge.' He feared their weapons, which he had never seen. He remembered the little statue with its suicidal impulses and its ability to shed force shell replicas of itself. The ship thrummed as it swept downward, the lights in the control room blinking on and off. 
Lower it swept, and lower. The blood was pounding in Langford's temples when a black-rimmed funnel of swirling brightness yawned suddenly before the viewport. The same instant the cushioning pressure of the anti-gravity jets made itself felt, holding the ship suspended above the roof of the forest until its atom motors ceased to throb. The ship descended under its own weight amidst a slowly dissolving pressure field. Sweeping down between the fire-blackened trees, it circled slowly about and settled to rest on the soggy forest floor. When Langford and Joan emerged, a warm breeze laden with jungle scents swept toward them. They stood for an instant close to the airlock, staring about them. No sound broke the stillness except the insistent hum of insects and the rustling of the vegetation on both sides of the ship. A few yards from where they were standing, the ground sloped to the brown waters of a swift-running river, its surface flecked with white foam and studded with little whirlpools that swirled with a darkly writhing turmoil as dry leaves fluttered down, twisting and turning in the breeze. Twisting and turning above a limp form that lay sprawled on the riverbank, its bare shoulders horribly hunched, its head immersed in the muddy brown water. Joan screamed when she saw it. She broke from Langford's restraining clasp and went stumbling forward until she was knee-deep in the swirling current. She was stooping and tugging in desperation at the half-submerged figure when Langford's hand closed on her shoulder. "'Let me handle this,' he said firmly. It's no job for a woman. On the bank, Joan swung about to face him. It's a job for a mutant, she protested, her lips shaking. You don't know how close he is to death. He's still breathing. But if we don't get him out... She broke off abruptly when she saw that Langford needed no urging. He was already on his knees, tugging at the sprawled form. For a moment, he tried to succeed from the bank, his knees sunk deep into the mud, his neck cords swelling. Then, with a gesture of fierce impatience, he waded deep into the water and lifted the unconscious man on his shoulders. Langford carried the man up the sloping bank, eased him to the ground and rolled him over. A small, wiry man, darkly bearded, his mouth hanging open. Staring down at the familiar face, Langford experienced a sense of irony so sharp and overwhelming it interfered with his breathing. He leaned forward and started working the man's arms slowly up and down. He knelt in the soft mud, a murk of depth and shadow looming behind him, a grim anticipation in his stare. Suddenly the man on the riverbank stirred, groaned, and opened his eyes. "'Hey, cut that out,' he grunted. "'What in blazes are you trying to do, you devil? Wrench my arms from their sockets?' "'Good morning to you, Commander,' Langford said, chuckling." Langford, Commander Gurney's eyes began to shine, as though lit by fires from unfathomable depths of space. A convulsive shudder shook him. Digging his fists into the mud, he sat up straight. You stole my ship, he rasped, staring at Langford accusingly. What made you think I couldn't trace my own cruiser? You can't rip out infraradiant alarm installations unless you know where to look. Didn't you know I'd follow you in a fast auxiliary cruiser and get here ahead of you? I was afraid you might, sir, Langford smiled ruefully. But it was a chance I had to take. Gurney's eyes narrowed. Your ship was sending out more automatic alarm rays than a chunk of radium. My men had orders to close in the instant you brought her down. Just where are your men now, sir? Langford asked. Something happened to Gurney's face. His features twitched, and the strange intensity of his stare increased so sharply he seemed to be staring right through Langford into space. "'Those devilish things attacked us,' he muttered. "'Exactly as that little statue did. There were dozens of them, ten feet tall, and they kept coming. We blasted, but the charges went right through them. They lifted my lads up in their devilish praying arms and dumped them in the river.' Sweat gleamed on Gurney's brow. It was ghastly, Langford, in the river, like pieces of dead timber. The current carried them downstream. I was helpless. I, I kept blasting, but I couldn't save them. How did you save yourself? Langford asked. Gurney passed a dripping hand over his brow. 
I was struggling with one of them when everything went blank. That's all I remember. Langford stood up. I don't understand it. Why did that creature go away and leave you with your face submerged? Why didn't it make sure you would drift downstream, too? I'm sure I don't know, Langford. Gurney jerked a tremulous hand toward the wall of foliage on the opposite bank. Why don't you swim over to their ship and ask them? You'll find the ship in a clearing about three hundred yards from the bank. They've cleared a path to it. It's just what I intend to do, Langford said. Joan paled and moved swiftly to his side, her eyes wide with alarm. Ralph, you're not going alone, Langford nodded. I'm a pretty good swimmer, he said. Jones stared at him. But why? It's a little hard to explain, Langford said. You've got a picture in your mind of something pretty horrible happening to me. Somehow I feel that everything about that picture is wrong. I've got to cross that stream, darling. I'd be a pretty poor specimen of a man if I turned back now when we're so close to the answer. Joan said nothing. She would have argued and pleaded, but she knew that it would have been of no use. Five minutes later, Langford was stripping on the river bank. He slipped into the water quietly and struck out with powerful, even strokes. On the opposite bank, he turned an instant to flick a wet strand from his forehead and wave to his wife. Then he struck off into the forest. He was a hundred feet from the bank, walking with his shoulders squared, when something bright and incredible swirled up from the forest floor directly in his path. For your forbearance, your kindliness, thank you, Langford, a voice said. It was not a spoken voice. It was still and small and remote, and it seemed to come from deep inside Langford's head. Langford stopped advancing. He stood utterly rigid, his temples pounding, his eyes riveted in a darting shape of flame. Don't be alarmed, Langford, the voice said. I'm not a shape of flame, but I can wrap myself in blinding flame so that the human eye cannot see me as I am. Who are you? Langford heard himself asking. A traveler blown from his course by ill cosmic winds, the voice said. A lone and bewildered stranger from a universe so remote its light has not yet reached you. A genuine, frightened stranger. And... A telepath, Langford. The voice paused, then it went on. I made you come to me just now. A promise of medals could not have done it, but I got inside your mind and drew you to me. Medals, rewards, promotions, you prize them, don't you? What a pity that I cannot stay until your tunic gleams with ribbons. Another pause, then the voice said, it is difficult to get the intimate feel of your language. You must forgive me if my speech seems a little strained. Your speech, you... You're not afraid of me, Langford. No, you mustn't be. You're the kindest of men. How can I convince you that I am... Have you a phrase for it? Letting down my hair. I shall leave you soon, my friend. I have repaired my ship, and I must try to return to my own people. But before I go, I will tell you the truth. Another pause while the brightness pulsed. You could have destroyed my ship when we met in the asteroid belt with a single blast. But you refused to do so. And I, not knowing you as I do now, tried to frighten you. There are so many worlds where intelligent life is cold and merciless that I was prepared for any emergency. I am rather proud of that little multiplying creature I shot out into the void. It was a child's bauble in my world, Langford, a toy. I am alone, my friend, alone in a ship that utterly dwarfs me. But you like large ships, too— we're curiously alike in some respects. We'd never be satisfied with mechanical mastery on a puny scale. Mechanical mastery? Langford's lips had gone cold. Just what kind of mastery? Why did you attack Commander Gurney and his men? The shape of flame seemed to pulse with a curious inward merriment. 
Langford could feel the merriment beating into his brain, waves upon waves of it. I didn't attack them. I can no more divide my fission than you can. But when I saw them crouching by the river, their faces merciless, waiting to seize you, I got inside their minds and drove them into the river. Like chattering monkeys, they fled from the terrifying images I planted in their minds. They were prepared to believe I was not one, but many a swarming multitude. They floundered and swam until their strength gave out. When they could no longer swim, they dragged themselves from the river and went floundering through the jungle, fleeing from shapes that had no real existence. "'Good Lord!' Langford muttered. "'Their weapons are now at the bottom of the river. "'That stern and silly little man, "'who is nothing more than a jumble of bones, "'fell face down in the river. "'Before I could reach his side, you were lifting him up. "'You have won his undying gratitude. "'He will grumble and fume, "'but when he sees my ship disappearing into deep space, "'you will wear ribbons, my friend. "'You will become—' Yes, a senior commander. A senior? Perhaps you'd like to see me as I really am, Langford, my friend. You'll promise not to laugh. I may look a little ridiculous to you. Langford's eyes were suddenly moist. You couldn't possibly look ridiculous to me, he said. Well, I wouldn't like to show myself to just anybody— certainly not to skin and bones, but it's terribly important that you know how completely I trust you. How else can I prove my gratitude? Slowly the shape of flame began to contract. Its edges became brighter, sweeping inward to become a small, dazzling circle of radiance that hovered in the air like a blazing signet ring. In the middle of the ring a tiny form appeared— Amidst Langford's rioting thoughts, one thing stood out with mind-numbing clarity. The form was minute, so tiny that the mantis shape it had shot into the void would have utterly dwarfed it. The form was minute, and yet it did resemble a mantis. Its arms were upraised, and its pinpoint eyes fastened on Langford with a blazing intensity that seemed to bore deep into his brain but there was no enmity in that stare, only complete gratitude, trust, and friendship. Yes, and a certain greatness. Now you see me as I really am, the voice said. I am so small that you could crush me between your thumb and forefinger, but I would not hesitate to alight on your thumb, my friend. A strange wonder throbbed in Langford's brain, and suddenly he found himself thinking, Jimmy Cricket! Yes, that was it. The tiny shape was as friendly, as puckish, and noble in essence as that little nursery rhyme, Will-o'-the-Wisp, Jimmy Cricket. And it did look like a cricket, a chirping, gleeful, truly great cricket. Suddenly, down the long sweep of the years, Langford saw two small human figures advancing over a path of golden bricks toward a glittering distant palace. One of the forms was himself, the other his sister. They moved in awe and terror because the palace was inhabited by a mighty wizard with truly terrifying powers. But when they reached the palace, they met a human, likable little man who wasn't terrible at all and they knew then that the mighty wizard was a humbug. But somehow, in his simple humanness, the wizard seemed even greater than he had been. Greater, but no longer terrifying. Jimmy Cricket was the Wizard of Oz, and he was something more, a lonely wayfaring stranger blown from his course by ill cosmic winds, taking reasonable precautions but seeking only a responsive friendliness in the gulfs between the stars. For a moment Langford felt a swirl of energy brush his fingertips, like the clasp of an intangible hand. Then the mental voice said, "'Good heavens, Langford, you're dripping wet!' See how the dry leaves of the forest cling to your feet? Startled, Langford lowered his eyes. 
When he looked up, the circle of radiance was gone. Forgive me, Langford, a faint diminishing voice said, but partings would not be prolonged. Goodbye, my friend. When Langford emerged on the river bank, sunlight struck down over his tall, straight body, giving him the aspect of a Greek god emerging from a forest glade in the morning of the world. He paused for an instant on the sloping bank to wave to his wife. Then he plunged into the river and swam straight toward her. End of the Miniature Menace by Frank Belknap Long Recorded by Scotty Smith The Monster Maker by Ray Bradbury This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker The Monster Maker by Ray Bradbury Suddenly, it was there. There wasn't time to blink or speak or get scared. Click Hathaway's camera was loaded, and he stood there listening to it rack-spin film between his fingers, and he knew he was getting a damn sweet picture of everything that was happening. The picture of Marnigan, hunched huge over the control console, wrenching levers, jamming studs with freckled fists. And out in the dark of the forepart, there was space, and a star sprinkling in this meteor coming like blazing fury. Click Hathaway felt the ship move under him like a sensitive animal's skin. And then the meteor hit. It made a spiked fist and knocked the rear jets flat, and the ship spun like a cosmic merry-go-round. There was plenty of noise. Too damn much. Hathaway only knew he was picked up and hurled against a lever bank, and that Marnigan wasn't long in following, swearing loud words. Click remembered hanging onto his camera and gritting to keep holding it. What a sweet shot that had been of the meteor. A sweeter one still of Marnigan beating hell out of the controls and keeping his words to himself until just now. It got quiet. It got so quiet you could almost hear the asteroids rushing up cold, blue, and hard. You could hear your heart kicking a tom-tom between your sick stomach and your empty lungs. Stars, asteroids, revolved. Click grabbed Marnigan because he was the nearest thing and held on. You came hunting for a space raider and you ended up cradled in a slab-sized Irishman's arms, diving at a hunk of metal death. What a fade-out. Irish, he heard himself say. Is this it? Is this what? Yelled Marnigan inside his helmet. Is this where the big producer yells cut? Marnigan fumed. I'll die when I'm damn good and ready. And when I'm ready, I'll inform you and you can picture me profile for cosmic films. They both waited thrust against the ship's side and held by a hand of gravity, listening to each other's breathing hard in the earphones. The ship struck once. Bouncing, it struck again. It turned end over and stopped. Hathaway felt himself grabbed. He and Marnigan rattled round, human dice in a croupier's cup. The shell of a ship burst, air and energy flung out. Hathaway screamed the air out of his lungs, but his brain was thinking quick, crazy, unimportant things. The best scenes in life never reach film, or an audience. Like this one, damn it! Like this one! His brain spun, racketing like the instantaneous flicking motions of his camera. Silence came and engulfed all the noise, ate it up and swallowed it. Hathaway shook his head, instinctively grabbed at the camera locked to his mid-belt. There was nothing but stars, twisted wreckage, cold, that pierced through his vac suit, and silence. He wriggled out of the wreckage into that silence. He didn't know what he was doing until he found the camera in his fingers, as if it had grown there when he was born. He stood there, thinking. Well, at least I'll have a few good scenes on film. I'll... A hunk of metal teetered, fell with a crash. Marnigan elevated seven feet of bellowing manhood from the wreck. Hold it! cracked Hathaway's high voice. Marnigan froze. The camera whirred. Low angle shot! Interplanetary patrolman emerges unscathed from asteroid crack-up. Swell stuff. I'll get a raise for this. From the toe of me boot, snarled Marnigan brusquely. Oxen's shoulders flexed inside his vac suit. I might have died in there, and you nursing that film contraption. Hathaway felt funny inside suddenly. I never thought of that. Marnigan, die? I just took it for granted you'd come through. 
You always have. Funny, but you don't think about dying. You try not to. Hathaway stared at his gloved hand, but the gloving was so thick and heavy he couldn't tell if it was shaking. Muscles in his bony face went down, pale. Where are we? A million miles from nobody. They stood in the middle of a pocked time-eroded meteor plain that stretched off, dipping down into silent indigo and a rash of stars. Overhead, the sun poised, black and stars all around it, making it look sick. If we walk in opposite directions, click Hathaway, we'd be shaking hands the other side of this rock in two hours. Marnigan shook his mop of dusty red hair. And I promised the boys at Luna Base this time I'd capture that Gunther lad. His voice stopped and the silence spoke. Hathaway felt his heart pumping slow, hot pumps of blood. I checked my oxygen, Irish. Sixty minutes of breathing left. The silence punctuated that sentence, too. Upon the sharp meteoric rocks, Hathaway saw the tangled insides of the radio, the food supply mashed and scattered. They were lucky to have escaped. Or was suffocation a better death? Sixty minutes. They stood and looked at one another. Damn that meteor, said Marnigan hotly. Hathaway got hold of an idea, remembering something. He said it out. Somebody tossed that meteor, Irish. I took a picture of it, looked it right in the eye when it rolled at us, and it was poker hot. Space meteors are never hot and glowing. If it's proof you want, I've got it here on film. Marnigan winced his freckled square face. It's not proof we need now, click. Oxygen, and then food, and then some way back to Earth. Hathaway went on saying his thoughts. This is Gunther's work. He's here somewhere, probably laughing his guts out at the job he did us. Oh, God, this would make great news release stuff if we ever get back to Earth. IPs, Irish Marnigan, temporarily indisposed by a pirate whose dirty face has never been seen. Gunther, by name, finally wins through to a triumphant finish. Photographed on the spot, in color, by yours truly click Hathaway. Cosmic Films, please notice. They started walking fast over the pocked, rubbled plain toward a bony ridge of metal. They kept their eyes wide and awake. There wasn't much to see, but it was better than standing still waiting. Marnigan said, We're working on margin, and we got nothing to sweat with except your suspicions about this not being an accident. We got fifty minutes to prove you're right. After that, right or wrong, you'll be Cosmic Film's prettiest, unmoving, unbreathing genius. But talk all you like, Click. It's times like this when we all need words. Any words on our tongues. You got your camera and your scoop. Talk about it. As for me, he twisted his glossy red face. Keeping alive is me hobby. And this sort of two-bit death I did not order. Click nodded. Gunther knows how you'd hate dying this way, Irish. It's irony clean through. That's probably why he planned the meteor and the crash this way. Marnigan said nothing, but his thick lips went down at the corners, far down, and the green eyes blazed. They stopped together. Oops, Click said. Hey, Marnigan blinked. Did you feel that? Hathaway's body felt feathery, light as a whisper, boneless and limbless suddenly. Irish, we lost weight coming over that ridge. They ran back. Let's try it again. They tried it. They scowled at each other. The same thing happened. Gravity should not act this way, Click. Are you telling me? It's man-made. Better than that. It's Gunther. No wonder we fell so fast. We were dragged down by a super-gravity setup. Gunther would do anything to... Did I say anything? Hathaway leaped backward in reaction. His eyes widened and his hand came up, jabbing. Over a hill ridge swarmed a brew of unbelievable horrors. Progeny from Frankenstein's Ark. Immense crimson beasts with numerous legs and gnashing mandibles, brown-black creatures, some tubular and fat, others like thin white poisonous whips slashing along in the air. Fangs caught starlight white on them. Hathaway yelled and ran, Marnigan at his heels lumbering. Sweat broke cold on his body. The immense things rolled, slithered and squirmed after him. A blast of light, Marnigan, firing his proton gun. Then, in Click's ears, the Irishman's incredulous bellow, the gun didn't hurt the creatures at all. Irish! Hathaway flung himself over the ridge, slid down an incline toward the mouth of a small cave. This way, fella! Hathaway made it first, Marnigan bellowing just behind him. They're too big! They can't get us in here! Click's voice gasped it out, as Marnigan squeezed his 250 pounds beside him. 
Instinctively, Hathaway added, Asteroid monsters. My camera. What a scene. Damn your damn camera, yelled Marnigan. They might come in. Use your gun. They got impervious hides. No use. Ah, that was a pretty chase, eh, Click? Yeah, sure. You enjoyed it every moment of it. I did that. Irish grinned, showing white, uneven teeth. Now, what will we be doing with these uninvited guests at our door? Let me think. Lots of time, little man. Forty more minutes of air, to be exact. They sat staring at the monsters for about a minute. Hathaway felt funny about something. Didn't know what. Something about these monsters and Gunther and... Which one will you be having? Asked Irish, casually. A red one or a blue one? Hathaway laughed nervously. A pink one with yellow ruffles. Good God, now you've got me doing it. Joking in the face of death. My father taught me. Keep laughing and you'll have Irish luck. That didn't please the photographer. I'm Anglo-Swede, he pointed out. Marnigan shifted uneasily. There now, you're doing nothing but sitting, looking like a little boy locked in a bedroom closet. So take me a profile shot of the beasties and myself. Hathaway petted his camera reluctantly. What in hell's the use? All this swell film shot? Nobody will ever see it. Then, retorted Marnigan, we'll develop it for our own benefit, while waiting for the U.S. Cavalry to come riding over the hill to our rescue. Hathaway snorted. <laughs> U.S. Cavalry. Marnigan raised his proton gun dramatically. Snap me this pose, he said. I paid your salary to trot along, photographing, we hoped, my capture of Gunther. Now the least you can do is record peace negotiations betwixt me and these pixies. Marnigan wasn't fooling anybody. Hathaway knew the superficial palaver for nothing but a covering over the fast, furious thinking running around in that red-cropped skull. Hathaway played the palaver too, but his mind was whirring faster than his camera as he spun a picture of Marnigan standing there with a useless gun pointed at the animals. Montage. Marnigan sitting, chatting at the monsters. Marnigan smiling for the camera. Marnigan in profile. Marnigan looking grim without much effort for the camera. And then a close-up of the thrashing death wall that hold them in. Click took them all. Those shots not saying anything. Nobody fooled nobody with this act. Death was near and they had sweaty faces, dry mouths, and frozen guts. When Click finished filming, Irish sat down to save oxygen and used it up arguing about Gunther. Click came back at him. Gunther drew us down here. Sure as Ceres. That gravity change we felt back on the ridge, Irish, that proves it. Gunther's short on men. So what's he do? He builds an asteroid base and drags ships down. Space war isn't perfect yet. Guns don't prime true in space. Trajectories lousy over long distances. So what's the best weapon, which dispenses with losing valuable rare ships and a small bunch of men? Super gravity and a couple of well-tossed meteors. Saves all around. It's a good front. This damn iron pebble? From it, Gunther strikes unseen. Ships simply crash, that's all. A subtle hand with all aces. Marnigan rumbled. Where is the dirty son, then? He didn't have to appear, Irish. He sent them. Hathaway nodded at the beasts. People crashing here die from air lack, no food, or from wounds caused at the crack-up. If they survive all that, the animals tend to them. It all looks like nature was responsible. See how subtle his attack is? Looks like accidental death instead of murder. If the patrol happens to land and finds us, no reason for undue investigation then. Uh, I don't see no base around. Click shrugged. Still doubt it? Okay, look. He tapped his camera and a spool popped out onto his gloved palm. Holding it up, he stripped it out to its full 20-inch length, held it to the light while it developed, smiling. It was one of his best inventions. Self-developing film. The first light struck film surface, destroyed one chemical, leaving imprints. The second exposure simply hardened, secured the impressions. Quick stuff. Inserting the film tongue into a micro viewer in the camera's base, Click handed the whole thing over. Look? Marnigan put the viewer up against the helmet glass, squinted. Ah, Click. Now, now, this is one lousy film you invented. Huh? It's a strange process. It'll develop my picture and ignore the asteroid monsters complete. What? Hathaway grabbed the camera, gasped, squinted, and gasped again. Pictures in montage. Marnigan sitting down, chatting conversationally with nothing. 
Marnigan shooting his gun at nothing. Marnigan pretending to be happy in front of nothing. Then close up of nothing. The monsters had failed to image the film. Marnigan was there, his hair like a red banner, his freckled face with the blue eyes bright in it. Maybe. Hathaway said it loud. Irish. Irish. I think I see a way out of this mess. Here. He elucidated it over and over again to the patrolman about the film, the beasts, and how the film couldn't be wrong. If the film said the monsters weren't there, they weren't there. Yeah, said Marnigan, but step outside this cave. If my theory is correct, I'll do it. Unafraid, said Click. Marnigan scowled. You sure them beasts don't radiate ultraviolet or infrared or something that won't come out on film? Nuts. Any color we see, the camera sees. We've been fooled. Hey, where are you going? Marnigan blocked Hathaway as the smaller man tried pushing past him. Get out of the way, said Hathaway. Marnigan put his big fists on his hips. If anyone is going anywhere, it'll be me does the going. I can't let you do that, Irish. Why not? You'd be going on my say-so. Ain't your say-so good enough for me? Yes, sure, of course, I guess. If you say them animals ain't there, that's all I need. Now stand aside, you film-developing flea, and let an Irishman settle their bones. He took an unnecessary hitch in trousers that didn't exist except under an inch of porous metal plate. Your express purpose on this voyage, Hathaway, is taking films to be used by the patrol later for teaching junior patrolmen how to act in tough spots. First-hand education. Poke another spool of film in that contraption and give him a profile a scan. This is lesson number seven. Daniel walks into the lion's den. Irish, I... Shut up and load up. Hathaway nervously loaded the film slot, raised it. Ready, click? I, I guess so, said Hathaway. And remember... Think it hard, Irish. Think it hard. There aren't any animals. Keep me in focus, lad. All the way, Irish. What do they say? Oh, yeah. Action. Lights. Camera. Marnigan held his gun out in front of him and, still smiling, took one, two, three, four steps out into the open world. The monsters were waiting for him at the fifth step. Marnigan kept walking right out into the middle of them. That was the sweetest shot Hathaway ever took. Marnigan and the monsters. Only now, it was only Marnigan. No more monsters. Marnigan smiled a smile broader than his shoulders. Hey, Click, look at me. I'm in one piece. Why hell, the damn things turned tail and ran away. Ran hell, cried Hathaway, rushing out, his face flushed and animated. They just plain vanished. They were only imaginative figments. And to think we let them hole us in that way. Click, Hathaway, you coward. Smile when you say that, Irish. Sure. And ain't I always smiling? Ah, click, boy. Are them tears in your sweet gray eyes? Damn, swore the photographer embarrassedly. Why don't they put window wipers in these helmets? I'll take it up with the board, lad. Forget it. I was so blamed glad to see your homely carcass in one hunk. I couldn't help. Look, now about Gunther. Those animals are part of his setup. Explorers who land here inadvertently are chased back into their ships, forced to take off. Tourists and the like. Nothing suspicious about animals, and if the tourists don't leave, the animals kill them. Shaw, now, those animals can't kill. Think not, Mr. Marnigan? As long as we believed in them, they could have frightened us to death, forced us maybe to commit suicide, if that isn't being dangerous. The Irishman whistled. But well, we've got to move, Irish. We've got twenty minutes of oxygen. In that time, we've got to trace those monsters to their source, Gunther's base. Fight our way in and get fresh oxy canisters. Click attached his camera to his mid-belt. Gunther probably thinks we're dead by now. Everyone else has been fooled by his playmates. They never had a chance to disbelieve them. If it hadn't been for you taking them pictures, Click. Coupled with your damn stubborn attitude about the accident. Click stopped and felt his insides turning to water. He shook his head and felt a film slip down over his eyes. He spread his legs out to steady himself and swayed. I don't think my oxygen is as full as yours. This excitement had me double breathing and I feel sick. Marnigan's homely face grimaced in sympathy. Hold tight, Click. The guy that invented these fish bowls didn't provide for a sick stomach. Hold tight, hell, let's move. We've got to find where those animals came from. And the only way to do that is to get the animals to come back. Come back? How? 
They're waiting, just outside the aura of our thoughts, and if we believe in them again, they'll return. Marnigan didn't like it. Well, won't they kill us if they come, if we believe in them? Hathaway shook a head that was tons, heavy and wary. Not if we believe in them to a certain point. Psychologically, they can both be seen and felt. We only want to see them coming at us again. Do we, now? With twenty minutes left, maybe less? All right, Click, let's bring him back. How do we do it? Hathaway fought against the mist in his eyes. Just think, I will see the monsters again. I will see them again, and I will not feel them. Think it over and over. Marnigan's hulk stirred uneasily. And what if I forget to remember all that? What if I get excited? Hathaway didn't answer, but his eyes told the story by just looking at Irish. Marnigan cursed. All right, lad, let's have at it. The monsters returned. A soundless deluge of them pouring over the rubbled horizon, swarming in malevolent anticipation about the two men. This way, Irish. They come from this way. There's a focal point, a sending station for these telepathic brutes. Come on. Hathaway sludged into the pressing tide of color, mouths, contorted faces, silvery fat bodies, misting as he plowed through them. Marnigan was making good progress ahead of Hathaway, but he stopped and raised his gun and made quick moves with it. Click! This one here, it's real! He fell back and something struck him down. His immense frame slammed against rock noiselessly. Hathaway darted forward, flung his body over Marnigan's, covered the helmet glass with his hands, shouting, Marnigan! Get a grip, damn it! It's not real! Don't let it force into your mind! It's not real, I tell you! Click! Marnigan's face was a bitter, tortured movement behind glass. Click! He was fighting hard. I, I, sure now, sure. He smiled. It, it's only a shanty fake. Keep saying it, Irish. Keep it up! Marnigan's thick lips opened. It's only a fake, he said, and then irritated. Get the hell off me, Hathaway. Let me up to my feet. Hathaway got up shakily. The air in his helmet smelled stale and the little bubbles danced in his eyes. Irish, you forgot the monsters. Let me handle them. I know how. They might fool you again. You might forget. Marnigan showed his teeth. Gah! Let a flea have all the fun. And besides, click, I'd like to look at them. They're pretty. The outpour of animals came from a low-lying mound a mile farther on. Evidently, the telepathic source lay there. They approached it warily. We'll be taking our chances on guard, hissed Irish. I'll go ahead, draw their attention, maybe get captured. Then you show up with your gun. I haven't got one. Well, chance it then. You stick here until I see what's ahead. They probably got scanners out. Let them see me. And before Hathaway could object, Marnigan walked off. He walked about 500 yards, bent down, applied his fingers to something, heaved up, and there was a door opening in the rock. His voice came back across the distance into Click's earphones. A door! An airlock, Click! A tunnel leading down inside! Then Marnigan dropped into the tunnel, disappearing. Click heard the thud of his feet hitting the metal flooring. Click sucked in his breath, hard and fast. All right, put him up! A new harsh voice cried over a different radio, one of Gunther's guards. Three shots sizzled out and Marnigan bellowed. The strange, harsh voice said, That's better. Don't try and pick that gun up now. Oh, so it's you. I thought Gunther had finished you off. How'd you get past the animals? Click started running. He switched off his sending audio, kept his receiving on. Marnigan, weaponless. One guard. Click gasped. Things were getting dark. Had to have air. 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 He ran and kept running and listening to Marnigan's lying voice. I tied them pink elephants of Gunther's in neat alphabetical bundles and stacked them up to dry, you louse, Marnigan said. But damn you, they killed my partner before he had a chance. The guard laughed. The airlock door was still wide open when Click reached it, his head swimming darkly, his lungs crammed with pain fire and hell rockets. He let himself down in, quiet and soft. He didn't have a weapon. He didn't have a weapon. Oh, damn, damn. A tunnel curved, ending in light, and two men silhouetted in that yellow glare. Marnigan backed against a wall, his helmet cracked, air hissing slowly out of it, his face turning blue, and the guard, a proton gun extended stiffly before him, also in a vac suit. The guard had his profile toward Hathaway, his lips twisting. 
I think I'll let you stand right there and die, he said quietly. Not what Gunther wanted, anyway. A nice sordid death. Hathaway took three strides, his hands out in front of him. Don't move, he snapped. I've got a weapon stronger than yours. One twitch and I'll blast you in the whole damn wall out from behind you. Freeze! The guard whirled. He widened his sharp eyes and reluctantly dropped his gun to the floor. Get his gun, Irish! Marnigan made as if to move, crumpled clumsily forward. Hathaway ran in, snatched up the gun, smirked at the guard. Thanks for posing, he said. That shot will go down in film history for candid acting. What? Ah, uh -uh, keep your place. I've got a real gun now. Where's the door leading into the base? The guard moved his head sullenly over his left shoulder. Click was afraid he would show his weak dizziness. He needed air. Okay, drag Marnigan with you. Open the door and we'll have air. Double time, double. Ten minutes later, Marnigan and Hathaway, fresh tanks of oxygen on their backs, Marnigan, in a fresh bulger and helmet, trussed the guard, hid him in a huge trash receptacle. Where he belongs, observed Irish tersely. They found themselves in a complete inner world, an asteroid nothing more than a honeycomb fortress sliding through the void unchallenged. Perfect front for a raider who had little equipment and was short-handed of men. Gunther simply waited for specific cargo ships to rocket by, pulled them or knocked them down and swarmed over them for cargo. The animals served simply to ensure against suspicion and the swarms of tourists that filled the void these days. Small fry weren't wanted. They were scared off. The telepathic sending station for the animals was a great bank of intricate glittering machine, through which strips of colored film with images slid into slots and machine mouths that translated them into thought emanations. A damn neat piece of genius. So here we are, still not much better off than we were, growled Irish. We haven't a ship or a space radio, and more guards will turn up at any moment. You think we could refocus this doohingy? Project the monsters inside the asteroid to fool the pirates themselves? What good would that do? Hathaway gnawed his lip. They wouldn't fool the engineers who created them, you nut. Marnigan exhaled disgustedly. Uh, if only the U.S. cavalry would come riding over the hill. Irish! Hathaway snapped that, his face lighting up. Irish, the U.S. cavalry it is. His eyes darted over the machines. Here, help me. We'll stage everything on the most colossal raid of the century. Marnigan winced. You breathe in oxygen or whiskey? There's only one stipulation I make, Irish. I want a complete picture of Marnigan capturing Raider's base. I want a picture of Gunther's face when you do it. Snap it now. We've got rush work to do. How good an actor are you? That's a silly question. You only have to do three things. Walk with your gun out in front of you, firing. That's number one. Number two is to clutch at your heart and fall down dead. Number three is to clutch at your side, fall down, and twitch on the ground. Is that clear? Clear as the coal sack nebula. An hour later, Hathaway trudged down a passageway that led out into a sort of city street inside the asteroid. There were about six streets, lined with cube houses and yellow metal, ending near Hathaway in a wide green lawned plaza. Hathaway, weaponless, idly carrying his camera in one hand, walked across the plaza as if he owned it. He was heading for a building that was pretentious enough to be Gunther's quarters. He got halfway there when he felt a gun in his back. He didn't resist. They took him straight ahead to his destination and pushed him into a room where Gunther sat. Hathaway looked at him. So you're Gunther, he said calmly. The pirate was incredibly old. His bulging forehead stood out over sunken, questioningly dark eyes, and his scrawny body was lost in folds of metal link cloth. He glanced up from a paper file, surprised. Before he could speak, Hathaway said, Everything's over with, Mr. Gunther. The patrol is in the city now, and we're capturing your base. Don't try to fight. We have a thousand men against your eighty-five. Gunther sat there, blinking at Hathaway, not moving. His thin hands twitched in his lap. You are bluffing, he said finally with a firm directness. A ship hasn't landed here for an hour. Your ship was the last. Two people were on it. The last I saw of them, they were being pursued to the death by the beasts. One of you escaped, it seemed. Both. The other guy went after the patrol. Impossible. I can't respect your opinion, Mr. Gunther. A shouting rose from the plaza. About fifty of Gunther's men, lounging on carved benches during their time off, stirred to their feet and started yelling. 
Gunther turned slowly to the huge window in one side of his office. He stared hard. The patrol was coming. Across the plaza, marching quietly and decisively, came the patrol. Five hundred patrolmen in one long, incredible line, carrying paralysis guns with them in their tight hands. Gunther babbled like a child, his voice a shrill dagger in the air. Get out there, you men! Throw them back! We're outnumbered! Guns flared, but the patrol came on. Gunther's men didn't run. Hathaway had to credit them on that. They took it, standing. Hathaway chuckled and sighed, deep. What a sweet, sweet shot this was. His camera whirred, clicked, and whirred again. Nobody stopped him from filming it. Everything was too wild, hot, and angry. Gunther was throwing a fit, still seated at his desk, unable to move because of his fragile, bony legs and their atrophied state. Some of the patrol were killed. Hathaway chuckled again as he saw three of the patrolmen clutch at their hearts, crumple, lie on the ground, and twitch. God, what photography! Gunther raged and swept a small pistol from his linked corslet. He fired wildly until Hathaway hit him over the head with a paperweight. Then Hathaway took a picture of Gunther, slumped at his desk, the chaos taking place immediately outside his window. The pirates broke and fled, those that were left a mere handful, and out of the chaos came Marnigan's voice. Here! One of the patrolmen stopped firing and ran toward Click in the building. He got inside. Did you see them run, Click boy? What an idea. How do we do? Fine, Irish, fine. So here's Gunther, the spalpeen. Gunther is a little dried-up pirate, eh? Marnigan whacked Hathaway on the back. I'll have to hand it to you. This is your best plan of battle ever laid out. And proud I was to fight with such splendid men as these. He gestured toward the plaza. Click laughed with him. You should be proud. Five hundred patrolmen with hair like red banners flying, with thick Irish brogues and broad shoulders and freckles and blue eyes and a body as tall as your stories. Marnigan roared. I always said, I said, if there ever could be an army of Marnigans, we could lick the whole damn universe. Did you photograph it, Click? I did. Hathaway tapped his camera happily. Ah, uh, then, won't that be a scoop for you, boy? Money from the patrol so they can use the film as instruction in classes, and money from cosmic films for the newsreel headlines. And what a scene, what acting! Five hundred duplicates of Steve Marnigan, broadcast telepathically into the minds of the pirates, walking across the plaza, capturing the whole shebang. How'd you like my death scenes? You're a ham. And anyway, five hundred duplicates, nothing, said Click. He ripped the film spool from the camera, spread it in the air to develop inserted it into the microviewer. Have a look. Marnigan looked. Ah, now, ah, now, he said over and over. There's the plaza, and there's Gunther's men fighting, and then they're turning and running, and what are they running from? One man, me, Irish Marnigan, walking all by myself across the lawn, paralyzing them, one against a hundred, and the cowards running from me. Sure, Click, this is better than I thought. I forgot that the film wouldn't register telepathic emanations, them other Marnigans. It makes it look like I'm a mighty brave man, does it not? It does. Ah, oh, look. Look at me, Hathaway. I'm enjoying every minute of it, I am. Hathaway swatted him on the backside. Look here, you egocentric son of Aaron. There's more work to be done, more pirates to be captured. The patrol is still marching around, and someone might be suspicious if they looked too close and saw all that red hair. All right, Click, we'll clean up the rest of them now. We're a combination, we two, we are. I take it all back about your pictures, Click. If you hadn't thought of taking pictures of me and inserting it into those telepath machines, we'd be dead ducks now. Well, here I go. Hathaway stopped him. Hold it, till I load my camera again. Irish grinned. Hurry it up, here come three guards. They're unarmed. I think I'll handle them with me fists for a change. The gentle art of uppercuts. Are you ready, Hathaway? Ready. Marnigan lifted his big ham fists. The camera whirred. Hathaway chuckled to himself. What a sweet fate out this was. End of The Monster Maker by Ray Bradbury Nobody Saw the Ship by Murray Leinster This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. It was only a tiny scout ship from somewhere beyond the stars. Only one alien creature occupied it. 
but the ship's mission spelled life to its fellow creatures, and death to all living creatures on earth. And against the super-science of the raider stood one terrified old man and his dog. Nobody Saw the Ship by Murray Leinster The landing of the qual End ship, a tiny craft no more than fifteen feet in diameter, went completely unnoticed, as its operator intended. It was armed, of course, but its purpose was not destruction. If this ship, whose entire crew consisted of one individual, were successful in its mission, then a great ship would come, wiping out the entire population of cities before anyone suspected the danger. But this lone qual N was seeking a complex hormone substance which qual N medical science said theoretically must exist, but the molecule of which even the qual N could not synthesize directly. Yet it had to be found in great quantity. Once discovered, the problem of obtaining it would be taken up with the resources of the whole race behind it. But first it had to be found. The tiny ship, assigned to explore the solar system for the hormone, wished to pass unnoticed. Its mission of discovery should be accomplished in secrecy, if possible. For one thing, the desired hormone would be destroyed by contact with the typical qual N ray gun beam, so that normal method of securing zoological specimens could not be used. The ship winked into being in empty space, not far from Neptune. It drove for that chilly planet, hovering about it, and decided not to land. It sped inward toward the sun, and touched briefly on Io, but found no life there. It dropped into the atmosphere of Mars, and did not rise again for a full week. But the vegetation on Mars is thin and the animals mere degenerate survivors of once specialized forms. The ship came to Earth, hovered lightly at the atmosphere's very edge for a long time, and doubtless chose its point of descent for reasons that seemed good to its occupant. Then it landed. It actually touched Earth at night. There was no rocket drive to call attention, and by dawn it was well concealed. Only one living creature had seen it land, a mountain lion. Even so, by midday the skeleton of the lion was picked clean by buzzards, with ants tidying up after them, and the qual N in the ship was enormously pleased. The carcass, before being abandoned to the buzzards, had been studied with an incredible competence. The lion's nervous system, particularly the mass of tissue in the skull, unquestionably contained either the desired hormone itself or something so close to it that it could be modified and the hormone produced. It remained only to discover how large a supply of the precious material could be found on earth. It was not feasible to destroy a group of animals, say, of a local civilized race and examine their bodies because the hormone would be broken down by the weapon which allowed for the search of it. So, an estimate of the available sources would have to be made by sampling. The qual N in the ship prepared to take samples. The ship had landed in a tumbled-down country some forty miles south of Ensenada Springs, National Forest Territory, on which grazing rights were allocated to sheep ranchers after illimitable red tape. Within ten miles of the hidden ship there were rabbits, birds, deer, coyotes, a lobo wolf or two, assorted chipmunks, field mice, perhaps as many as three or four mountain lions, one flock of two thousand sheep, one man and one dog. The man was Antonio Mendez. He was ancient, unwashed, and ignorant, and the official shepherd of the sheep. The dog was Salazar, of dubious ancestry, but sound worth, who actually took care of the sheep, and knew it. 
He was scarred from battles done in their defense. He was unweariedly solicitous of the woolly half-wits in his charge. There were whole hours when he could not find time to scratch himself because of his duties. He was reasonably fond of Antonio, and knew that the man did not really understand sheep. Besides these creatures, among whom the qual Ann expected to find its samples, there were insects. These, however, the tiny alien began discarding. It would not be practical to get any great quantity of the substance it sought from such small organisms. By nightfall of the day after its landing, the door of the ship opened, and the explorer came out in a vehicle designed expressly for sampling on its planet. The vehicle came out, stood on its hind legs, closed the door, and piled brush back to hide it. Then it moved away with the easy feline gait of a mountain lion. At a distance of two feet, it was a mountain lion. It was a magnificent job of adapting qual N engineering to the production of a device which would carry a small-bodied explorer about in a strange world without causing remark. The explorer nested in the small cabin occupying the space, in the facsimile lion, that had been occupied by the real lion's lungs. The fur of the duplicate was convincing. Its eyes were excellent, housing scanning cells which could make use of anything from ultraviolet far down into the infrared. Its claws were retractable and of plastic much stronger and keener than the original lion's claws. It had other equipment, including a weapon against which nothing on this planet could stand. And for zoological sampling, it had one remarkable advantage. It had no animal smell. It was all metal and plastic. On the first night of its roaming, nothing in particular happened. The explorer became completely familiar with the way the controls of the machine worked. As a machine, of course, it was vastly more powerful than an animal. It could make leaps no mere creature of flesh and blood could duplicate. Its balancing devices were admirable. It was, naturally, immune to fatigue. The qual N inside was pleased with the job. That night, Antonio and Salazar bedded down their sheep in a natural amphitheater, and Antonio slept, heavily snoring. He was a highly superstitious ancient, so he wore various charms of a quasi-religious nature. Salazar merely turned around three times and went to sleep. But while the man slept soundly, Salazar woke often. Once he waked sharply at a startled squawking among the lambs. He got up and trotted over to make sure that everything was all right, sniffing the air suspiciously. Then he went back, scratched where a flea had bitten him, bit, nibbling, at a place his paws could not reach, and went back to sleep. At midnight he made a clear circle around the flock, and went back to slumber with satisfaction. Toward dawn he raised his head suspiciously at the sound of a coyote's howl, but the howl was far away. Salazar dozed until daybreak. Then he rose, shook himself, stretched himself elaborately, scratched thoroughly, and was ready for a new day. The man waked, wheezing, and cooked breakfast. It appeared that the normal order of things would go undisturbed. For a time it did. There was certainly no disturbance at the ship. The small, silvery vessel was safely hidden. There was a tiny, flickering light inside, the size of a pinpoint, which wavered and changed color constantly, where a sort of tape unrolled before it. It was a recording device, making note of everything the roaming pseudo-mountain lion's eyes saw, and everything its microphone ears listened to. There was a bank of air-purifying chemical that proceeded to regenerate itself by means of air entering through a small ventilating slot. It got rid of carbon dioxide 
and stored up oxygen in its place, in readiness for further voyaging. Of course, ants explored the whole outside of the space vessel, and some went inside through the ventilator opening. They began to cart off some interesting, if novel, foodstuff they found within. Some very tiny beetles came exploring, and one variety found the air-purifying chemical refreshing. Numbers of that sort of beetle moved in and began to raise large families. A minuscule moth, too, dropped eggs lavishly in the nest-like space in which the quail and explorer normally reposed during spaceflight. But nothing really happened. Not until late morning. It was two hours after breakfast time when Salazar found traces of the mountain lion, which was not a mountain lion. He found a rabbit that had been killed. Having been killed, it had been very carefully opened up, its various internal organs spread out for examination, and its nervous system traced in detail. Its brain tissue, particularly, had been most painstakingly dissected, so the amount of a certain complex hormone to be found in it could be calculated with precision. The qual N and the lion shape had been vastly pleased to find the sought-after hormone in another animal besides the mountain lion. The dissection job was a perfect anatomical demonstration. No instructor in anatomy could have done better, and few neurosurgeons could have done as well with the brain. It was, in fact, a perfect laboratory job done on a flat rock in the middle of a sheep range, and duly reproduced on tape by a flickering, color-changing light. The reproduction, however, was not as good as it should have been, because the tape was then covered with small ants, who had found its coating palatable, and were trying to clean it off. Salazar saw the rabbit. There were blowflies buzzing about, and a buzzard was reluctantly flying away, because of his approach. Salazar barked at the buzzard. Antonio heard the barking. He came. Antonio was ancient, superstitious, and unwashed. He came wheezing, accompanied by flies who had not finished breakfasting on the bits of his morning meal that he had dropped on his vest. Salazar wagged his tail and barked at the buzzard. The rabbit had been neatly dissected, but not eaten. The cuts which opened it up were those of a knife or scalpel. It was not, it was definitely not, the work of an animal. But there were mountain lion tracks and nothing else. More, every one of the tracks was that of a hind foot. A true mountain lion eats what he catches. He does not stand on his hind paws and dissect it with scientific precision. Nothing earthly had done this. Antonio's eyes bulged out. He thought instantly of magic. Black magic. He could not imagine dissection in the spirit of scientific inquiry. To him, anything that killed and then acted in this fashion could only come from the devil. He gasped and fled, squawking. When he had run a good hundred yards, Salazar caught up with him, very much astonished. He overtook his master and went on ahead to see what had scared the man so. He made casts to the right and left, then went in a conscientious circle all around the flock under his care. Presently he came back to Antonio, his tongue lolling out, to assure him that everything was all right. But Antonio was packing, with shaking hands and sweat-streaked brow. In no case is the neighborhood of a mountain lion desirable for a man with a flock of sheep. But this was no ordinary mountain lion. Why, Salazar, honest, stout-hearted Salazar, did not scent a mountain lion in those tracks. He would have mentioned it vociferously if he had. So this was beyond nature. The lion was un fantasmo, or worse. Antonio's mind ran to were-tigers, ghost lions, and sheer Indian devils. He packed while Salazar scratched fleas, and wondered what was the matter. 
they got the flock on the move. The sheep made idiotic efforts to disperse and feed placidly where they were. Salazar rounded them up and drove them on. It was hard work, but even Antonio helped in frantic energy, which was unusual. 2. Near noon, four miles from their former grazing ground, there were mountain peaks all around them. Some were snow-capped, and there were vistas of illimitable distance everywhere. It was very beautiful indeed, but Antonio did not notice. Salazar came upon buzzards again. He chased them with loud barkings from the meal they were reluctantly sharing with blowflies and ants. This time it wasn't a rabbit, it was a coyote. It had been killed and most painstakingly taken apart to provide at a glance all significant information about the genus Canis, species Latranus, in the person of an adult male coyote. It was a most enlightening exhibit. It proved conclusively that there was a third type of animal structurally different from both mountain lions and rabbits which had the same general type of nervous system, with a mass of nerve tissue in one large mass in the skull, which nerve tissue contained the same high percentage of the desired hormone as the previous specimens. It had been recorded by a tiny colored flame in the hidden ship. The flame was now being much admired by small red bugs and tiny spiders. It would have been proof that the qual N could find ample supplies on Earth of the complex hormone on which the welfare of their race now depended. Some members of the qual N race, indeed, would have looked no further, but sampling which involved only three separate species and gave no proof of their frequency was not quite enough. The being in the synthetic mountain lion was off in search of further evidence. Antonio was hardly equipped to guess at anything of this sort. Salazar led him to the coyote carcass. It had been neatly halved down the breastbone. One half of the carcass had been left intact. The other half was completely anatomized, and the brain had been beautifully dissected and spread out for measurement. Antonio realized that intelligence had been at work but again he saw only the pad tracks of the mountain lion, and he was literally paralyzed by horror. Antonio was scared enough to be galvanized into unbelievable energy. He would have fled gibbering to Ensenada Springs, some forty miles as the crow flies, but to flee would be doom itself. The devils who did this sort of work liked, he knew, to spring upon a man alone but they can be fooled. The qual N in the artificial mountain lion was elated. To the last quivering appendage on the least small tentacles of its body, the pilot of the facsimile animal was satisfied. It had found good evidence that the desired nervous system and concentration of the desired hormone in a single mass of nervous tissue was normal on this planet. The vast majority of animals should have it. Even the local civilized race might have skulls with brains in them, and, from the cities observed from the stratosphere, that race might be the most numerous, fair-sized animals on the planet. It was to be hoped for, because large quantities of the sought-for hormone were needed. Taking specimens from cities would be most convenient. Long continued existence under the artificial conditions of civilization, a hundred thousand years of it no less, had brought about exhaustion of the qual N's ability to create all their needed hormones in their own bodies. Tragedy awaited the race unless the most critically needed substance was found. But now it had been. Antonio saw it an hour later and wanted to shriek. It looked exactly like a mountain lion, but he knew it was not flesh and blood because it moved in impossible bounds. No natural creature could leap sixty feet. The mountain lion shape did. 
but it was convincingly like its prototype to the eye. It stopped and regarded the flock of sheep, made soaring progression to the front of the flock, and then came back. Salazar ignored it. Neither he nor the sheep scented carnivorous animal life. Antonio hysterically concluded that it was invisible to them. He began an elaborate, lunatic pattern of behavior to convince it that magic was at work against it, too. He began to babble to his sheep with infinite politeness, spoke to blank-eyed creatures as Senor Gomez and Senor Ornata. He chatted feverishly with the wicked-eyed ram, who he called Senor Gutierrez. A clumsy, waddling lamb almost upset him, and he scolded the infant sheep as Pepito. He lifted his hat with great gallantry to a swollen ewe, hailing her as Senora Garcia, and observing in a quavering voice that the flies were very bad today. He moved about in his flock, turning the direction of its march, and acting as if surrounded by a crowd of human beings. This should at least confuse the devil whom he saw, and while he chattered with seeming joviality, the sweat poured down his face in streams. Salazar took no part in this deception. The sheep were fairly docile once started. He was able to pause occasionally to scratch, and once even to do a luxurious, thorough job on a place in his back between his hind legs, which was so difficult to reach. There was only one time when he had any difficulty. That was when there was a sort of eddying of the sheep ahead. There were signs of panic. Salazar went trotting to the spot. He found sheep milling stupidly, and rams pawing at the ground, defying they knew not what. Salazar found a deer carcass on the ground, and the smell of fresh blood in the air, and the sheep upset because of it. He drove them on past, barking where barking would serve, and nipping flanks where necessary. Afterward, disgusted, tonguing bits of wool out of his mouth. The sheep went on, but Antonio, when he came to the deer carcass, went ice-cold in the most exquisite of terror. The deer had been killed by a mountain lion. There were tracks about. Then it, too, had been cut into as if by dissector's scalpel, but the job was incomplete. Actually, the pseudo-mountain lion had been interrupted by the approach of the flock. There were hardly blowflies on the spot yet. Antonio came to it as he chatted insanely with a sheep with sore eyes and a halo of midges about its head, whom he addressed as Senorita Carmen. But when he saw the deer, his throat clicked shut. He was speechless. To pass a creature laid out for magical ceremony was doom indubitably. But Antonio acted from pure desperation. He recited charms, which were stark paganisms, and would involve a heavy penance when next he went to confession. He performed other actions, equally deplorable, when he went on. The deer was quite spoiled, for the neat demonstration of the skeletal, circulatory, muscular, and especially of the nervous system, and brain structure of the genus Cervus, species Dama, specimen, an adult doe. Antonio had piled over the deer all the brush within reach, had poured over it the kerosene he had for his night lantern, and had set fire to the heap with incantations that made it a holy, impious sacrifice to quite non-existent heathen demons. Salazar trotted back to the front of the flock after checking on Antonio and the rear guard wrinkled his nose, and sneezed as he went past the blaze again. Antonio trotted on after him. But Antonio's impiety had done no good. The tawny shape bounded back into sight among the boulders on the hillside. It leapt with infinite grace for impossible distances. Naturally, no animal can be as powerful as a machine 
and the counterfeit mountain lion was a machine vastly better than man could make. The qual N now zestfully reached the flock of sheep. It looked upon Salazar and Antonio with no less interest. The qual N explorer was an anatomist, an organic chemist, rather than a zoologist proper, but it guessed that the dog was probably a scavenger, and that the man had some symbiotic relationship to the flock. Salazar, the dog, was done a grave injustice in that estimation. Even Antonio was given less than he deserved. Now he was gray with horror. The blood in his veins was turned to ice as he saw the false mountain lion bounding back into the hillside. No normal wild creature could display itself so openly. Antonio considered himself both doomed and damned. Stark despair filled him. But with shaking hands and no hope at all, he carved a deep cross on the point of the bullet for his ancient rifle. Licking his lips, he made similar incisions on other bullets in his reserve. The qual and vehicle halted. The flock had been counted, now to select specimens and get to work. There were six new animal types to be dissected for the nervous organ yielding the look-for hormone. Four kinds of sheep, male and female, an adult and immature of each kind, the biped, and the dog. Then a swift survey to estimate the probable total number of such animals available, and Antonio saw that the devil mountain lion was still. He got down on one knee fervently crossed himself, and fed the cross-marked bullet into the chamber of his rifle. He lined up the sights on the unearthly creature. The lion facsimile watched him, interestedly. The sight of the rifle meant nothing to the qual N, naturally. But the kneeling position of the man was strange. It was part, perhaps, of that pattern of conduct which had led him to start that oxidation process about the deer specimen. Antonio fired. His hands trembled and the rifle shook. Nothing happened. He fired again and again, gasping at his fear. And he missed every time. The cross-marked bullets crashed into the red earth and splashed from naked rock all about the qual end vehicle. The pilot of the mountain lion realized that there was actual danger here. It could have slaughtered man and dog and sheep by the quiver of a tentacle, but that would have ruined them as specimens. To avoid spoiling specimens it intended to take later, the qual N put the mountain lion shape into a single, magnificent leap. It soared more than a hundred feet uphill and over the crest of its top. Then it was gone. Salazar ran barking after the thing at which Antonio had fired, sniffing at the place from which it had taken off. There was no animal smell there at all. He sneezed, and then trotted down again. Antonio lay flat on the ground, his eyes hidden, babbling. He had seen irrefutable proof that the shape of the mountain lion was actually a fiend from hell. 3. Behind the hill crest, the qual N moved away. It had not given up its plan of selecting specimens from the flock, of course, nor of animatizing the man and dog. It was genuinely interested, too, in the biped's novel method of defense. It dictated its own version of the problems raised on a tight beam to the wavering, color-changing flame. Why did not the biped prey on the sheep, if it could kill them? What was the symbiotic relationship of the dog to the man and the sheep? The three varieties of animal associated freely. The qual N dictated absorbed speculations. Then it hunted for other specimens. It found a lobo wolf and killed it. 
verified that this creature also could be a source of hormones. It slaughtered a chipmunk and made a cursory examination. Its ray beam had pretty well destroyed the creature's brain tissue, but by analogy of structure, this would be a source also. In conclusion, the Qual N made a note via the wavering pinpoint of flame that the existence of a hormone-bearing nervous system centralized in a single mass of hormone-bearing nerve tissue inside a bony structure seemed universal among the animals of this planet. Therefore, it could merely examine the four other types of large animal it had discovered and take off to present its findings to the center of its race. With a modification of the ray beam to kill specimens without destroying the desired hormone, the Qual N could unquestionably secure as much as the race could possibly need. Concentrations of the local civilized race in cities should make large-scale collection of the hormone practical, unless that civilized race was an exception to the general nervous structure of all the animals so far observed. This was dictated to the pinpoint flame, and the flame faithfully wavered and changed colors to make the recording. But the tape did not record it. A rather large beetle had jammed the tape reel. It was squashed in the process, but it effectively messed up the recording apparatus. Even before the tape stopped moving, though, the recording had become defective. Tiny spiders had spun webs. Earwigs got themselves caught. The flame, actually, throbbed and pulsed restlessly in a cobwebbery coating of gossamer and tiny insects. Silverfish were established in the plastic lining of the Qual N ship. Beetles multiplied enormously in the air-refreshing chemical. Moth larvae already gorged themselves on the nest material of the intrepid explorer outside. Ants were busy on the food stores. Mites crawled into the ship to prey on their larger fellows, and a praying mantis or so had entered to eat their smaller ones. There was an infinite number of infinitesimal flying things dancing in the dark. Larger spiders busily spun webs to snare them, and flies of various sorts were attracted by odors coming out of the ventilator opening, and centipedes rippled sinuously inside. Night fell on the world. The pseudo-mountain lion roamed the wild, keeping in touch with the tide of buying sheep now headed for the lowlands. It captured a field mouse and verified the amazing variety of planetary forms containing brain tissue rich in hormones. But the sheep flock could not be driven at night. When the stars came out, to move them further became impossible. The Qual N returned to select its specimen in the dark. With due care, not to allow the man to use his strange means of defense. It found the flock bedded down. Salazar and Antonio rested. They had driven the sheep as far as it was possible to drive them that day. Though he was sick with fear and weak with horror, Antonio had struggled on until Salazar could do no more. But he did not leave the flock. The sheep were in some fashion a defense, if only a diversion, against the creature which so plainly was not flesh and blood. He made a fire, too, because he could not think of staying in the dark. Moths came and fluttered about the flames, but he did not notice. He tried to summon courage. After all, the unearthly thing had fled from bullets marked with a cross, even though they missed. With light to shoot by, he might make a bullseye. So Antonio sat shivering by his fire, cutting deep crosses into the points of his bullets, his throat dry, and his heart pounding while he listened to the small noises of the sheep and the faint, thin sounds of the wilderness. Salazar dozed by the fire. He had had a very hard day, but 
Even so, he slept lightly. When something howled very far away, instantly the dog's head went up, and he listened. But it was nowhere near. He scratched himself and relaxed. Once something hissed, and he opened his eyes. Then he heard a curious strangled, Baa! Instantly he was racing for the spot. Antonio stood up, his rifle clutched fast. Salazar vanished. Then the man heard an outburst of infuriated barking. Salazar was fighting something, and he was not afraid of it. He was enraged. Antonio moved toward the spot, his rifle ready. The barking raced for the slope beyond the flock. It grew more enraged, and more indignant still. Then it stopped. There was silence. Antonio called, trembling. Salazar came, padding up to him, whining and snarling angrily. He could not tell Antonio that he had come upon something in the shape of a mountain lion, but which was not, it didn't smell right, carrying a mangled sheep away from its fellows. He couldn't explain that he'd given chase, but the shape made such monstrous leaps that he was left behind, and pursuit was hopeless. Salazar made unhappy, disgusted, disgraced noises to himself. He bristled. He whined bitterly. He kept his ears pricked up, and he tried twice to dart off on a cast around the whole flock, but Antonio called him back. Antonio felt safer with the dog beside him. Off in the night, the qual N, operating the mountain lion shape, caused the vehicle to put down the sheep and start back toward the flock. It would want at least four specimens besides the biped and the dog, but the dog was already on the alert. The qual N had not been able to kill the dog because the mouth of the lion was closed on the sheep. It would probably be wisest to secure the dog and the biped first. The biped with due caution and then complete the choice of sheep for dissection. The mountain lion shape came noiselessly back toward the flock. The being inside it felt a little thrill of pleasure. Scientific exploration was satisfying, but rarely exciting. One naturally protected oneself adequately when gathering specimens, but it was exciting to have come upon a type of animal which would dare to offer battle. The qual N in the mountain lion shape reflected that this was a new source of pleasure, to do battle with the fauna of strange planets in the forms native to those planets. The padding vehicle went quietly in among the woolly sheep. It saw the tiny blossom of flame that was Antonio's campfire. Another high temperature oxidation process. It would be interesting to see if the biped was burning another carcass of its own killing. The shape was two hundred yards from the fire when Salazar scented it. It was upwind from the dog. Its own smell was purely that of metals and plastics. But the fur now was bedabbled with the blood of the sheep, which had been its first specimen of the night. Salazar growled. His hackles rose, every instinct for the defense of his flock. He had smelled that blood when the thing which wasn't a mountain lion left him behind with impossible leapings. He went stiff-legged toward the shape. Antonio followed in a sort of desperate calm, born of utter hopelessness. A sheep uttered a strangled noise. The qual N had come upon the second specimen, which was exactly what it wished. It left the dead sheep behind for a moment, while it went to look at the fire. It peered into the flames, trying to see if Antonio, the biped, had another carcass in the flames as seemed to be a habit. It looked. Salazar leaped for its blood-smeared throat in utter silence and absolute ferocity. It would not have dreamed of attacking a real mountain lion 
with such utter lack of caution. But this was not a mountain lion. His weight and the suddenness of his attack caught the operator by surprise. The shape toppled over. Then there was an uproar of scared bleatings of the sheep nearby, and bloodthirsty snarlings from Salazar. He had the salty taste of sheep blood in his mouth, and the yielding plastic throat between his teeth. The synthetic lion struggled absurdly. Its weapon, of course, was a ray gun, which was at once aimed and fired when the jaws opened wide. The being inside tried to clear and use that weapon. It would not bear on Salazar. The qual N would have to make this device lie down, double up its mechanical body, and claw Salazar loose from its mechanical throat with the mechanical claws on its mechanical hind legs. At first, the qual N inside concentrated on getting its steed back on its feet. That took time because whenever Salazar's legs touched ground, he used the purchase to shake the throat savagely. In fact, Antonio was within twenty yards when the being from the ship got its vehicle upright. It kept the mechanical head high, then, to keep Salazar dangling while it considered how to dislodge him. And it saw Antonio. For an instant, perhaps, the qual N was alarmed. But Antonio did not kneel. He made no notion which the pilot, seeing through infrared-sensitive photocells in the lion's eyeballs, could interpret as offensive. So the machine moved boldly toward him. The dog dangling from its throat could be disregarded for the moment. The killing ray was absolutely effective, but it did spread, and it did destroy the finer anatomical features of the tissues it hit. Especially, it destroyed nerve tissue outright. So, the closer a specimen was when killed, the smaller the damaged area. The being inside the mountain lion was pleasantly excited and very much elated. The biped stood stock still, frozen by the spectacle of a mountain lion moving toward it with a snarling dog hanging disregarded from its throat. The biped would be a most interesting subject for dissection, and its means of offense would be most fascinating to analyze. Antonio's fingers, contracting as the shape from the ship moved toward him, did an involuntary thing. Quite without intention, they pulled the trigger of the rifle. The deeply cross-cut bullet seared Salazar's flank, removing a quarter-inch patch of skin. It went on into the shape of plastic and metal, hit a foreleg. Although that leg was largely plastic, what metal it contained being mostly magnesium for lightness, there were steel wires embedded for magnetic purposes. The bullet smashed through plastic and magnesium, struck a spark upon the steel. There was a flaring, sun-bright flash of flame, a dense cloud of smoke. The mountain lion's shape leapt furiously, and the jerk dislodged the slightly singed Salazar and sent him rolling. The mountain lion vehicle landed and rolled over and over, one leg useless and spouting monstrous white actinic fire. The being inside knew an instant's panic. Then it felt yielding sheep bodies below it, thrashed about violently and crazily, and at last the qual N jammed the flame-spurted limb deep into the soft earth. The fire went out, but that leg of its vehicle was almost useless. For an instant, deadly rage filled the tiny occupant of the cabin, where the mountain lion's lungs should have been. Almost it turned and opened the mouth of its steed and poured out the killing bee. Almost. The flock would have died instantly, and the man, and the dog, and all things in the wild for miles. But that would not have been scientific. After all, this mission should be secret. And the biped. 4. 
The qual and ceased the thrashing of its vehicle. It thought coldly. Salazar raced up to it, barking with a shrillness that told of terror valoriously combated. He danced about, barking. The qual and found a solution. Its vehicle rose up on its hind legs and raced up the hillside. It was an emergency method of locomotion for which this particular vehicle was not designed, and it required almost inspired handling of the controls to achieve it. But the qual and inside was wholly competent. It guided the vehicle safely over the hilltop, while Salazar made only feigned dashes after it. Safely away, the qual end stopped and deliberately experimented until the process of running on three legs developed. Then the mountain lion, which was not a mountain lion, went bounding through the night toward its hidden ship. Within an hour it clawed away the brush from the exit port, crawled inside, and closed the port after it. As a matter of pure precaution it touched the takeoff control before it even came out of its vehicle. The ventilation opening closed, very nearly. The ship rose quietly and swiftly toward the skies. Its arrival had not been noted, its departure was quite unexpected. It wasn't until the qual end touched the switch for the ship's system of internal illumination to go on that anything appeared to be wrong. There was a momentary arc and blackness. There was no interior illumination. Ants had stripped insulation from essential wires. The lights were shorted. The qual N was bewildered. It climbed back into the mountain lion shape to use the infrared sensitive scanning cells. The interior of the ship was a crawling mass of insect life. There were ants and earwigs, silverfish and mites, spiders and centipedes, mantis and beetles. There were moths larvae, grubs, midges, gnats, and flies. The recording equipment was shrouded in cobweb and hooded in dust which was fragments of the bodies of the spider's tiny victims. The air refresher chemicals were riddled with the tunnels of beetles. Crickets devoured plastic parts of the ship and chirped loudly. And the controls. Ah, the controls. Insulation stripped off here, brackets riddled or weakened or turned to powder there. The ship could rise, and it did, but there was no control at all. The qual N wanted to rage deadly enough to destroy the insects of itself. The whole future of its race depended on the discovery of an adequate source of a certain hormone. That source had been found. Only the return of this one small ship, 15 feet in diameter, was needed to secure the future of a hundred thousand year old civilization, and it was impeded by the insect life of the planet left behind. Insect life so low in its nervous organization that the qual N had ignored it. The ship was 20,000 miles out from Earth when the occupant of the mountain lion used its ray beam gun to destroy all the miniature enemies of its race. The killing beam swept about the ship. Mites, spiders, beetles, larvae, silverfish, and flies. Everything died. Then the qual N crawled out and began to make repairs, furiously. The technical skill needed was not lacking. In hours this same being had made a perfect counterfeit of a mountain lion to serve as its vehicle. Tracing and replacing gnawed away insulation would be merely a tedious task. The ship would return to its home planet. The future of the qual and race would be secure. Great ships, many times the size of this, would flash through emptiness and come to this planet with instruments specifically designed for collecting specimens of the local fauna. The cities of the civilized race would be the simplest and most ample source of the so desperately needed hormone, no doubt. The inhabitants of even one city would furnish a stopgap supply. In time, why, it would become systematic. 
The hormone would be gathered from this continent at this time, and from that continent at that, allowing the animals and the civilized race to breed for a few years in between collections. Yes. The qual Ann worked feverishly. Presently, it felt a vague discomfort. It worked on. The discomfort increased. It could find no reason for it. It worked on feverishly. Back on Earth, morning came. The sun rose slowly, and the dew lay heavy on the mountain grasses. Far away peaks were just beginning to be visible through the clouds that had lain on them overnight. Antonio still trembled, but Salazar slept. When the sun was fully risen, he rose and shook himself. He stretched elaborately, scratching thoroughly, shook himself again, and was ready for a new day. When Antonio tremblingly insisted that they drive the flock on toward the lowland, Salazar assisted. He trotted after the flock and kept them moving. That was his business. Out in space, the silvery ship suddenly winked out of existence. Enough of its circuits had been repaired to put it in overdrive. The qual end was desperate by that time. It felt itself growing weaker, and it was utterly necessary to reach its own race and report the salvation it had found for them. The record of the flickering flame was ruined. The qual end felt that itself was dying. But if it could get near enough to any of the planetary systems inhabited by its race, it could signal them, and all would be well. Moving ever more feebly, the qual end managed to get lights on within the ship again. Then it found what it considered the cause of its increasing weakness and spasmodic, gasping breaths. In using the killing ray, it had swept all the interior of the ship, but not the mountain lion shape, naturally. And the mountain lion shape had killed specimens and carried them about. While its foreleg flamed, it had even rolled on startled, stupid sheep. It had acquired fleas, perhaps some from Salazar, and ticks. The fleas and ticks had not been killed. They now happily inhabited the Qual Inn. The Qual Inn tried desperately to remain alive until a message could be given to its people, but it was not possible. There was a slight matter the returning explorer was too much wrought up to perceive, and the instruments that would have reported it were out of action because of destroyed insulation. When the ventilation slit was closed as the ship took off, it did not close completely. A large beetle was in the way. There was a most tiny but continuous leakage of air past the crushed chitinous armor. The qual in in the ship died of oxygen starvation without realizing what had happened, just as human pilots sometimes black out from the same cause before they know what is the matter. So the little silvery ship never came out of overdrive. It went on forever, or until its source of power failed. Fleas and ticks, too, died in time. They died very happily, very full of qual and body fluid. And they never had a chance to report to their fellows that the qual N were very superior hosts. The only entity who could report told his story and was laughed at. Only his cronies, ignorant and superstitious men like himself, could believe in the existence of a thing not of earth, in the shape of a mountain lion that leapt hundreds of feet at a time, which dissected wild creatures and made magic over them but fled from bullets marked with a cross, and bled flame and smoke when such a bullet wounded it. Such a thing, of course, was absurd. The End of Nobody Saw the Ship by Murray Leinster Quarantine by George O. Smith This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Quarantine by George O. Smith Read by Quartertone Chapter 1. Temp Alloy Tony Morrill looked around the bench for a piece of brass and found a proper-sized chunk handy. That saved him a trip to the stockroom. He chucked it up in a vise, picked up a file, and set the teeth of the file against a chunk of brass to shape it. He pushed. The file slid across the bit of brass as though there were no teeth. The end of the file went past without resistance, and the vice jaws took a chunk of skin off Tony's knuckles. He made an appropriate and unprintable comment, inspected the file curiously, and tried again, but with restraint. This time he skinned another knuckle, but not so badly. He tried another file, and even more restraint. The result was the same. The file skidded across the bit of brass without touching it. It was like... Tony Morrow remembered his first day in the machine shop as a kid, like trying to file a wrist pin. He picked up a center punch and a hammer. He set the punch against the brass and belted the top a good whack with the hammer. The top fudged over a bit. That was intentionally soft. The point blunted. That was intentionally hard. The brass did not even show a bright spot beneath the point of contact. He tried a hacksaw with a new blade. No result. Swearing, Tony Morrow took the bit of brass and placed it between the jaws of a power shears. He pressed the button, and the shears came down, hard. The knife shattered. A huge chip sprang out of the cutting edge where it struck the bit of brass. The heavy motor ground to a shuddering halt, and the frame of the shears gave slightly. Murder, he breathed. Andy Cleave was watching this from the other side of his lathe. "'What have you got there, Tony?' he asked. Tony shook his head. "'Brass,' he said doubtfully. Andy grunted. If that bit had been brass, any of Tony's machinations would have been successful. Nothing could touch the bit of metal, ergo it could not be brass. Andy looked on, permissibly forgetting his lathe. The tool had run out beyond the work, coming inexorably toward the four-jawed chuck. Finally, it touched. The jaw came around as the tool moved to the left, and the area of contact was less than five one-thousandths of an inch. Normally, this would have produced a cut on the jaw of the chuck and a hoot of derision from any machinist who saw another scar lathe chuck. But the scant contact stopped the lathe. There was a foul screech from the series of belts that turned the lathe. The back gears complained. The motor grunted once and stalled. The lights went dim until a fuse blew, taking the power off the stalled motor. Andy looked at the hung-up chuck and saw the scant interference that had stopped the lathe. I've got it too, he said in an awed voice. Something has made this chuck harder than a pawnbroker's heart. Andy Cleave and Tony Morrill headed for the front office on a dead run. James Green held a match for the girl's cigarette, then applied the flame to his briar. He leaned back with a puzzled smile and started to tell the girl what he knew. I think we may have it licked, he said. We'll know later. Leona Holden smiled graciously. I hope so, she told him, though I know all too little of this sort of thing. Dad talks as though everybody knows all the answers, leaving out far too much of the uninteresting detail that tells the history of the thing. Mind going over the minutiae? Not at all, said Jim. You know what temp alloy is? A hard alloy, isn't it? Temp alloy is more than that. Temp alloy is, so far anyway, the ultimate in hard alloys. It is practical only because of its hardness characteristic. Temp alloy, when first processed, is about as soft as mild steel. With time, it grows very hard, a thousand times harder than tungsten carbide. That's due to the radioactivity. Radioactivity? asked Leona Holden. I'm more puzzled now than before. Temp alloy is an alloy composed mainly of chromium and cobalt. The remainder consists of two of the transuranic radioisotopes that are manufactured in the uranium pile. Alloying the stuff cold, a physicist's word for non-radioactive, results in an alloy metal that one can touch with any tool. We mix it with a metal, not the right one, but one which is radioactive. 
then the radioactivity caused the transmutation of the element into the one we want. In other words, the original alloy is soft, but the emission of the radioactive particle causes the alloying element to change so that it is a hard alloy. Follow? Vaguely, answered the girl with a slight smile. Well, temp alloy starts off soft and hardens swiftly in a matter of about eight hours. The trouble is, Miss Holden, that temp alloy as a fabricated material, for a gear it is made in a blank and machined into the final product, is fine, but it must be worked before it grows hard. Now, it is almost impossible to come out even, and there is either a huge wastage because the machinists run out of material before their workday is over and then can loaf the rest of the day, or the temp alloy stockpile is too great, and when the workmen are finished, there is still a quantity left that will harden and become waste. Understand? But surely that cannot be great, objected the girl. Not for any one day, agreed Jim. But take it for six months, then it becomes a problem. Also, what to do with a scrap? Nice paperweights, anchors, or something to crack nuts on? Anyway, he said with a grin, it is important enough for your father to award Green Metallurgical Laboratory a contract to develop an alloy that will cut temp alloy. And you think you have it? We have a very strange alloy, but I'm not too sure of it, said Green. And you can tell your father that. You see, we discovered an alloy that was the reverse of temp alloy. It starts off very hard, hard enough to cut temp alloy, but softens with time. Takes about eight hours. Now, that might be fine, but there is atomic interaction between tool and work as it is used to cut temp alloy. We give it a name, Miss Holden, and call it Fool's Alloy. We found that when it is used, everything goes to pieces. Just how? Well... Temp alloy approaches a stable hardness when left alone, just as fool's alloy approaches a stable softness. These curves are exponential curves. But when fool's alloy is used to cut temp alloy, the fool's alloy goes dead soft in about a half hour, and the temp alloy starts to harden linearly, even though it has been in a stable state of hardness for months. But how can that be? We're not too certain. But remember, Every time you cut anything, even butter with a knife, you leave some of the tool on the work and some of the work on the tool. And it takes only a few ten thousandths of a percent of element 97 to make temp alloy what it is. Ergo, a minute quantity of the important part of fool's alloy is all that is needed to make the temp alloy get much harder. Leona Holden nodded brightly. But look, she said, wouldn't using the super hard temp alloy serve as a tool edge for cutting normal temp alloy? Yes, for a time, admitted Green. But the trouble is, Miss Holden, that the hardness creep passes from the super hard temp alloy tool to the normal temp alloy work, and eventually the work is too hard to cut again. There is... The door opened violently, and Tony Morrow and Andrew Cleave came in on the dead run and skidded to a stop as they saw the girl. What's up? asked Green. Tony dropped the piece of brass on Jim's desk. This is supposed to be brass, he said and it is harder than the hinges of Hades. You can't cut it with a file. I wrecked the shear blade, and when I tried it on the stone, it made an excellent grinding wheel dresser. Brass? Unless someone has regained the secret of hard copper, said Tony Morrow uncertainly. Leona Holden looked interested. They claim there was such a secret, she observed. Jim Green laughed. Nope, he said. It wasn't that but just part of the search for a harder edge that has gone on for 20,000 years. 20,000 years? Green nodded. It started when Cain slew Abel and discovered that a hunk of flint was harder than a human skull. The next man wore a leather helmet. That was fine until someone discovered bronze which cut leather. Alexander carved himself an empire with bronze swords. Then someone got some carbon mixed with iron, and the age of chivalry was heralded in on the clangor of mild steel. The bronze sword turned its edge against the steel armor. The old-timers immediately claimed that their fathers had bronze swords that would cut anything, that these modern bronze swords weren't as hard as in the good old days. They forgot to mention that in the good old days, the ability to cut anything could not possibly have included the new alloy, steel. Well, people have been hunting for newer and harder alloys ever since. I see, she admitted uncertainly. 
But this piece of brass? I hope you'll pardon me, said Jim, but we've got work to do. There's something afoot that is far from good. Tell your father I'll let him know in a few days whether we can stabilize the super-hard temp alloy. I'll be back in a few days, she said. I'm interested enough to want to watch this. Chapter 2. Contagion According to law, any building that housed a self-reacting nuclear pile employing uranium or any other fissionable material must be not less than ten miles from the nearest dwelling. Green Metallurgical Laboratory was, therefore, ten miles by the best surveyor that the state of Indiana could supply away from the outward corner of the last house in Ramble, Indiana. Green Metals was connected to civilization by means of a road made of metal alloy paving locks, a third rail interurban trolley line that took workers to and from, a railroad spur, and a series of tall towers that carried high tension lines. The lines were used to carry power to three outlying cities. The power generated by the uranium pile was a byproduct. It was used to generate the radioisotopes and transuranic elements used to make special alloys for special jobs at a very special price. It was along the metal-surfaced road that Leona Holden drove her 16-cylinder Holden Special back to Ramble. Her story was none too clear. Yet she conveyed to Gregory Holden the one fact that somehow, strangely, green metals had discovered a means of making any metal super hard, whereupon Gregory Holden called in his legal staff. Dean Mars heard the tale again, produced the Holden contract with Green Metals, and ran through it with a practiced eye. He had written the contract himself, and he knew where to find what he was looking after. He nodded with self-satisfaction. Go on, beamed Holden. How does it tie in? It states in effect that any developments made under this contract shall belong completely to the Holden Enterprises, he said. Now, it is a fact that Green was attempting to find an alloy capable of cutting temp alloy. Therefore, if due to byproduct of this search, any other discoveries of a valuable nature are made, they shall also become the property of Holden Enterprises. Gregory Holden selected a large cigar and lit it with a flourish. If what my daughter says is true, he observed, I can see automobiles with super hard bodies. We'll give Green a week, then we'll close in. Leona looked puzzled. Will that be necessary? she asked. Mr. Green seems to be an honest man. Her father looked tolerantly at her. My dear, he said, when something like this is in the wind, no man is too honest. Green will be inspecting this contract with a microscope to see if there are any flaws that will permit him to keep his discovery. Well, I don't believe that of Jim Green. I do, and will prove it to you. Leona left the office. She did not think it of Jim Green, but there was no sense in arguing with her father on the subject. As she left, Dean Mars looked up. Can you squeeze him? he asked. I think so, replied Holden. Temp alloy is a Holden product, you know, and you should know. Mars nodded complacently. Then he said, Green has Tony Morrow working for him, you know. Morrow is a has-been, replied Holden roughly. All he can do is to stand in the way and make nasty remarks. I'm inclined to worry about Morrow. When he was head of the Morrow Alloy Company, he was no man's fool, as you very well know. He was our man's fool, though perhaps no other man's, laughed Holden. He developed temp alloy, and it was you that convinced the judge and jury that his act of shipping us the hard metal was a cover-up. That wasn't too hard smiled Morris. All I did was to show them that the cost seemed too high, after which I used Morrow's own figures to show that temp alloy was as easy to shape as mild steel. They assumed themselves that Morrow was shaping the stuff soft and charging us for the job of shaping the hard stuff. The kicker in the contract was the thing that gave us Morrow alloys and that's what put Tony Morrow out of a job. Well, find a kicker in the green contract. No kicker is needed. When and if it's needed, We've got Green where we want him. I wonder if there's any truth in this thing at all. It seems outrageous that a hardness factor could creep from metal to metal like that. Well, we'll find out, said Holden, relighting his cigar. And maybe we'll own Jim Green by his soul, too. Fact is, 
continued Holden after a moment of thought. I'd prefer that he does try to weasel out of it. Then we can really move in. Jim Green nodded at the electronic specialist. Sure, I've got a moment. What is it? Super hard temp alloy is a superconductor. Superconductor? Are you sure? I've never heard of one existing at normal temperatures. Edwin Wright produced figures and a multi-curve graph. These curves show the hardness creep of the super hard stuff, he said, pointing to one of two, versus normal temp alloy. You'll notice that the super hard curve is incomplete but extrapolated. The specific resistivity of both are shown too, and that's how I extrapolated the hardness curve. There is a definite mathematical relationship between the hardness of temp alloy and its ohmic resistance. Therefore, when the super hard stuff starts to get beyond the range of our high test Rockwell machines, I took the liberty of making the mathematical extrapolation. It approaches a perfect conductor. It is also non magnetic, which hasn't changed. Its heat conductivity is something terrific too, like liquid helium. I can see the development of high wattage microwave generators out of it. You can make the tube elements very small, and the radiating fins large and out of the circuit so long as you connect them with temp alloy. Then any heat generated in the elements themselves will also be communicated instantly to the fins. I've tried it with a long filament of this stuff. You take a temp alloy rod about six feet long and twenty thousandths in diameter and hit one end with an oxyhydrogen flame. It gets quite hot all along the wire at the same time, and you can cool the whole thing by sticking the far end in water. When you dangle one end in water and heat the other end with a torch, it's just like pointing the torch itself in the water. Oh, that's some metal then. Well, Wright, you go to work on it and see what you can do. Ed Wright nodded. I'm working with Otto. Green nodded. Otto was the theorist, the mathematician, the abstract thinker. Confronted by facts, Otto Lindstrom had an untrammeled mind with unlimited imagination. He had, however, no use for fiction. His world discounted any fiction until it became fact. Otto Lindstrom and Ed Wright made a good pair, for Ed was inclined to take any situation or sets of facts and extend them a bit beyond the fact so that he could build a fantasy about them. While Jim Green was considering this, the telephone rang, and he reached idly for it. Mr. Green, this is Joe down in the cafeteria. I thought you'd like to know that we're having trouble opening the cans. Hold it, said Jim, wondering. I'll be right down. He went at once. Joe handed Green a can and indicated the can opener on the wall. Jim Green slid the can under the knife and tried to clamp the handle down. It would not go, but stuck just as contact was made. That told Green volumes. He called Tony Morrow and Andrew Cleave and three other workmen and set them to checking the metal building with center punches and hammers. Within an hour, he knew all he needed to know. It had started with the lathe upon which the test cutting of the first temp alloy by the first fool's alloy had been done. Now it was spreading through the building. As he returned to his office, one of the girls called his attention to the fact that her stapling machine no longer worked. The staples came out, and they punctured the paper, but they did not fold over on the underside. Tony Morrow, tapping on the floor, lost his balance and fell against the stenographer's desk. The typewriter toppled, and the girl wasted no time in fading back out of the way. The typewriter hit the metal floor with a crash, and bounced unharmed. Now, muttered Green, if we could control this, we'd have that glorious post-war world. An hour later, Jim Green had every member of the plant assembled. He told them what was going on. Then he concluded, This must be stopped. You all can see the result if it is not. Contamination by a piece of treated metal will spread indefinitely so far as we know. It takes but a minute contact. Now, we cannot be responsible for the death of this civilization, and that is what it amounts to. Those of you who prefer to stay may do so. Those of you who prefer to leave may do so, providing you leave with absolutely no metal on you. All production work is suspended. All facilities will be put on the job of figuring out how to confine and control this contagion of metals. When we have it licked, we'll see to it that all of you are repaid for your discomfort. Okay? 
There was an uncertain roar that greeted this, but the result was gratifying. Chapter 3 Counter Move It was midnight when the special train came down the siding. It was laden with canned goods and jars and other foodstuffs packaged without metal. The men set to work with a will to remove a certain quantity, but the bulk of the stuff in the mechanical refrigerator cars seemed to be ignored. The engineer and train crew broached the subject to Jim Green. I am impounding the train, he said. You can't! I am. It is necessary. He explained the hardening of metals, and then said, Can you understand the decline of civilization that would take place if no metal could be worked? We had to order supplies because we couldn't open a tin can. We've unsealed your cars only because we couldn't break the metal seal once it got super hard. We've had to open all candies and other stuff wrapped with tinfoil because super hard tinfoil cannot even be bent. Every watch in the place has stopped because the hairspring has such a violent strength that there is not enough energy to flex it. The engineer thought for a moment. How about the tracks? he asked. It's creeping along them, too. We're cutting them. Right now. The engineer looked at the brakeman. We're stuck, he said. Let's help. At the edge of the plant yard, just inside the metal fence, a workman was plying an acetylene torch. Another man was sitting astride the rail, tapping it with a center punch. Better hurry, Tim, he said, moving along a few inches. He tapped again, nodded, and kept trying the rail. Three minutes later, he muttered something and moved again. The hardness was creeping along the rails swiftly. In fact, behind him, Otto Lindstrom was making calculations as he moved. Lindstrom turned to Jim Green as the latter arrived and said, The hardness is creeping swifter now. It is accelerating rapidly. Unless the man with the torch hurries, he will not be quick enough. The man testing the rails moved again. Better give up, Tim, he said. Tim grunted and watched the rail for a moment before shaking his head. He applied the torch again and the sparks flew. I can't beat it, Larry, he said confidently. Then as he spoke, the sparks died from the rail and Larry leaped from his seat with a cry of pain. The hardening creep had reached the cut before Tim was finished and the heat had swept along the rails, burning Larry. Look, said Green, calculate how far it travels before you can cut in and go out and do it without test. Darn it, Larry, you've got a contaminated punch there that's helping the spread along. A roar of sound and a belch of flame came from 500 feet away. Green's men had just cut the metal surface roadway with dynamite. Gregory Holden snorted angrily and flung the telephone back at its rest. No communication, he said. That means that Green has something. Trouble, perhaps, said Leona. Something must have happened. You're darn well right it happened, scowled Holden. What happened was that Green did turn up with a means of hardening metal. Now he's hiding behind a wall of secrecy until he can figure out an angle. I don't believe it. Maybe not, grunted Holden, but you can bet it's true. He... Yes, Alice? A Mr. Morrow to see you, his secretary told him. Morrow? Well, by all means, send him in. Tony Morrow, Leona. Green must think I'm guileless. Or he must be stupid. He should know that sending Tony Morrow in any cock and bull story wouldn't convince me of anything. Hello, Morrow. What's going on out at your place? It's bad, said Tony, and quite dangerous. Holden tossed a quick, what did I tell you, glance at Leona, and then selected a cigar from his humidor. Tell me, said Holden leisurely, did Jim Green really discover a way to harden all metals? In a sense, yes. And what does he intend to do with it? Try to keep it safe until we can figure out how to handle it. Morrow didn't know, of course, that he was almost echoing Holden's previous words. Morrow disliked Holden immensely and would have given years of his life for a chance to get back at the tycoon. Regardless of the opinions of jurors and judges who were misled by brilliant oratory glibly describing the machinations of a technically complex process, it was a fact that Holden's grab of the Morrow Alloy Company was more than 60% cold-blooded steel. Tell me, Morrow, why did you come here? 
because Jim wanted you to understand. You see, Jim Green is quite a reasonable person, Holden, far more honest than either you or myself. He knew you would expect his answer when he said he'd have one. Therefore, I am here to explain. I see. And Jim Green hopes to keep this affair a secret? Hardly a secret. That, I fear, is impossible. But at least we can keep the terrible truth out of the public hands until it is safe. Terrible truth, huh? asked Holden. Morrow grinned. You can have your hard metal, Holden, so soon as it is not dangerous to society. Meaning what? Meaning the so-called nuclear safety clause that is included in each and every contract dealing with any product or byproduct of the uranium pile. If it is not baldly stated in the contract, it is still in force by Act of Congress as of 1948. Just what is this danger? asked Holden. We cut the telephone lines, the high wires, and the railroad to prevent the spread of metal hardness, said Tony. Likewise, we blasted the metal surfaced road. We're impounding all incoming metal, whether it be automobile, railroad, or belt buckle. And you have not a stitch of metal on you? Morrow laughed. An excellent tribute to my dental equipment, he said, but I state proudly that there is not the trace of a filling in any of my teeth. I happen to be the only living soul at Green Metals that can step outside the fence without contaminating the rest of the world. Yeah, drawled Holden. How about the earth? This is Indiana. We're situated on a bed of Indiana limestone surrounded by a sea of alluvial sand and moraine, and there isn't a pocket of natural raw material within a good many miles of us. You actually claim that this hardening follows all metal? We had trouble cutting the railroad tracks, said Morrow. We had to abandon our cut three times before we got it cut through. Each time the hardening raced along the tracks and caught up with the torchbearer. Rather hard to believe, said Holden. Morrow smiled slightly. Inwardly, he was bubbling. Often he had heard it said that there is nothing so subject to doubt as the absolute truth. He had a fair idea that Holden was suspicious of any statements from Green, especially any coming through himself as spokesman. Putting himself in Holden's position, Morrow could see Holden's supposition that Green had made a monumental discovery and that Green was trying to employ the nuclear safety clause to suppress the discovery until he could develop some means of handling it himself. If Holden were really convinced of this, he would act. If he managed somehow to acquire a sample, the fat would really be in the fire. Morrow had a good witness to testify that he had warned Holden, and the chances were that Holden had this conversation recorded anyway. So Morrow was sticking to the truth. What does Green hope to do with all this? asked Holden. If it can be worked out, everything will be all right, replied Tony, picking his phrases carefully. If not, Green will call in the government. Government? The resources of the United States government are large enough to find the answer to this new feature. Accepting that Jim is afraid of it, we'd already be calling it the Green Effect. To Holden, visualizing the ramifications of a superhard metal, the word government meant armed forces. The Navy would leap gleefully to accept armor plates that could not be touched with anything up to and including oxyhydrogen. The Army would take it as quickly, and if it meant anything at all, the skies would be filled with superhard dural, magnesium, and aluminum metals. That was not too good. If Green offered it to the Navy, they would accept it as a sideline issue from the original contract, and Holden would lose. Holden might appeal to the courts, but if he did so, he would be condemned as one who would obstruct the security of the nation. Also, if Green did give it to the armed forces, Holden might consider the process a military secret. If that happened, he would not be permitted to speak himself. Okay, he said quietly. You tell Green that so soon as he figures out which angle to follow, we'll get together and work something out. I'll tell him that, Morrow said thoughtfully. Tony Morrow left, wondering just what course Holden would take. Also, how long it would be. Chapter 4 Atom Bomb the car that drove up to the breach in Jim's Metal Road paused only long enough for the driver to throw in the front-drive gears. Then it proceeded across the rough spot. 
It drove up to the front door and uniformed men got out, looked around, and then entered boldly, ignoring the weak protests of the guards at the portal. The leader identified himself to Jim Green. I am Major General Langley. Yes, General Langley. I'm sorry you came, at least so far in. Langley waved away the concern and came to the point of his visit. I'm given to understand that you have a process of making a super hard metal here. We have, but it is not that simple. Why? Because the process is in violation of the nuclear safety clause. It is not safe to permit its use in civilized places. The general nodded easily. We of the armed forces operate under the calculated risk in times of possible danger. Fact of the matter is, a bomber crew with a full load flying over friendly territory is operating under calculated risk, because anybody who handles dangerous explosives does. This is not a matter of personal risk, objected Green. No? It may mean the death of civilization itself. Come, come, Mr. Green. That's what they said about the atom bomb. That's what someone probably said about the bow and arrow. May I ask who put you on this trail? General Langley nodded. Gregory Holden, he said. As he explained it to me, you are holding secret one of his processes. In a sense, we are, admitted Green. But Holden should be aware of the possibilities of this. I sent Tony Morrow in to tell him everything. I was told there would be talk of danger, said the general quietly. Well, there is danger, snapped Green. Perhaps I should insist that the armed forces laboratories investigate. I'll ask you for a sample of your hard metal. Green stood up and banged the desk with a hard fist. No metal is leaving this plant, not even your car. Come now, Green. You cannot impound army equipment. No, it will not leave. May I point out that my men are armed? I'll ask you to have one armed man sent up here, said Green quietly. But tell me, meanwhile, just what did Holden tell you? The general looked at Green in puzzlement. He went to the window and called one of the armed soldiers before answering Jim's question. Holden says this hardening process is rightfully his by virtue of a legal contract. According to Holden, the value of this process is such that you would go to any lengths to void the contract, even to the point of offering it to the armed forces. However, Holden offered it to us first. Holden, then, is using the United States Army to pull what he thinks is a chestnut out of the fire, said Green bitterly. The fool. General Langley grunted. Holden knows that the Army will deal properly with those who help it. You are hindering, Green. Had you made the offer, we would have dealt with you. Green was shaking his head when the soldier came in. General, I'm going to demonstrate to you my super hard alloy, and then it's danger. May I ask your permission to direct the soldier? Corporal Hadley, this is James Green. He has my permission. Yes, sir. Hadley, said Green, fix your bayonet and lunge through that window screen over there. The corporal looked at Green as though the man were crazy. Shaking his head, Hadley fixed his bayonet and made a dilatory poke at the screen. The screen stopped the bayonet and did not even bend. Hadley rammed it hard, but the heavy rifle stopped cold. Putting his entire weight and muscle into it, Hadley stabbed at the screen and nearly lost his footing due to the complete and solid stoppage. You'll notice that the screen is not even deformed, said Green. Now quickly, soldier, fire a shot at the screen. Hadley raised his rifle and fired. The bullet hit the screen and would have ricocheted save for the screen itself. The cupro nickel jacket of the bullet parted under the fine wire mesh and strained or extruded itself through by almost a sixteenth of an inch. It hung there, hot. When that cools down, said Green, you'll find a crisscross thread on the bullet. Now, Hadley... I think it is time to fire once more. The soldier pulled the trigger. There was a sharp click, but no report. The soldier recocked his rifle and tried again. Then he levered the shell from the chamber and tried another. That, too, misfired. Green picked up the outcast shell and handed it to General Langley. Note the primer, he said to the general. 
The spread of this metal contagion is so swift that by now the corporal's rifle has become hardened from its contact against the screen. Obviously, the metal primer cannot be dented to fire the shell. We could put a plastic primer in, said Langley. And kill your own soldiers? How? snapped the general angrily. I doubt that you have the experience in firearms. Green held up a hand. When a shell is fired, it expands slightly. The holding ferrule widens to permit the bullet to leave. The bullet is deformed as it hits the rifling lands of the barrel. With super-hardened metal, General Langley, the shell would not expand, the holding ferrule would not permit the exit of the bullet, and if it did, the bullet would stop when it hit the rifling lands. The net result, in any case, is the fact that the exploding gases can only escape back through the primer hole, fighting their way through the gas closures, and finally ending up by hitting the soldier in the face. Green smiled. Of course, he said with the tolerant air of a man speaking to a child, you could design a rifle so that the escaping gases would blow out easily. The corporal blinked. Why, he said, this makes all rifles obsolete. He thought for a moment. In fact, all firearms. We're back to the knife. Green turned to the general. And if you want your army to be equipped with this super hard metal, do it quickly, General Langley because once all metal on Earth gets hard, you won't be able to machine any of it. Leona Holden bumped across the breach in the road and ran to Jim Green's office, but found him missing. The girl in the front of the office enclosure idly pointed out at the back door that led from the office room to the laboratory, and Leona went there. She found Jim Green working over an analytical balance measuring powders of metals. Leona, he said, you shouldn't have come here. I had to find out, she said simply. Find out? The truth of this. Dad says you're trying to steal his process. Tell me honestly, Jim, what is it? What Tony Morrow told you is the truth, he said. But what are you doing? Jim laughed bitterly. The obvious, he said. Whatever nuclear reaction caused this all-embracing total hardening of all metals, it was started by the contact of two radioactive alloys. We know why each of the alloys behaved as they did alone, but not why they should have touched off this contagious metal disease. Therefore, I am trying to develop another alloy that will reverse the process. Then it is bad, breathed the girl. I'm glad. Glad? exploded Green. Not glad for the trouble, of course she said quietly and sincerely. But definitely glad that my father is wrong. But Jim, just how bad is it? General Langley came from the window and faced the girl. Miss Holden, he said, it is bad enough to convince me that I must stay here because of the silver fillings in my teeth. Until Green gets his answer, we are stuck. And what are your chances? asked Leona. I don't know. This looks like a hopeless case. We don't know what to look for in the first place, and the permutations possible in making alloys out of a hundred-odd elements are approaching infinity. I— Hey, that's a plane! General Langley turned to the corporal, who was sitting near the portable radio removed from the general's command car. Contact them, he said. Yes, sir. The pilot called and was answered. This is General Langley. What are you doing here? Major Howes to General Langley. Your report by radio as of this morning has been considered by the Master Board of Strategy. It has been declared a first-class national emergency. We have orders for you to evacuate the premises. Don't be ridiculous. We can't. You must. I have orders to destroy the plant. Destroy it? snapped the general. You must not, and that is an official order from me. You outrank me, sir, came the reply. However, I am under formal order from the President of the United States and responsible only to him. You are also. You are to evacuate the premises. We cannot. Why? Because we carry with us the contaminated metal. There is no man or woman present who has a silver filling in his teeth that does not stand an excellent possibility of being contaminated. Then, if you leave, you may cause the spread of this contagion? Precisely. Then hold on a moment. I must contact my superiors. Minutes passed. Then Major Howes returned to the radio contact. His voice was very strained. 
since you are all contaminated, he said, I have orders to destroy you all. This is a matter of sacrificing you for the benefit of humanity. Can't you give us time to work this out? demanded the general. The National Board of Strategy fears that the contamination may spread if it is not taken care of instantly. The major's voice broke again as he said, I am sorry, sir, but I have orders. Green whirled from the window. What's he doing? He just dropped something. A bomb, grunted the general, to destroy us and save seven. No, screamed Green. The general faced Green sarcastically. You're not afraid to die, are you? he asked bitterly. No, said Green, but I am against dying for no good. Look, General, if the Eastman Kodak people had trouble with straw paper made from a field in Illinois that was contaminated by the explosion at Los Alamos, what chance do you think there is that this will really be destroyed? The General blinked, and at that moment the bomb landed on the ground below. Time fused, yelled the General. We have one chance, cried Green. He unsnapped the catches on the window screen with one hand and grabbed a handful of small super-hard temp alloy samples with the other. Then he leapt out the window, raced to the pit where the bomb lay ticking, and liberally sprinkled the monstrous bomb with the contaminating metal. Then he ran back to meet the others who were coming through the door. Get away! he screamed at them. If it works, said the general, we'll not need distance. If it doesn't, we can't run that far anyway. There was a sharp cracking report as the internal gun fired non-critical masses of plutonium together and fused them into a supercritical mass followed by a hard roar as fission took place and the expanding energy filled the cavities in the bomb. Trapped, the mad energy roared in confinement and dissipated as heat. The bomb, hidden by its own pit, flared incandescent instantly blasted a solid fan-wise beam of light into the sky that paled the sun and then sank out of sight as it melted the very ground beneath it. Sand, dirt, and rock flowed into the bubbling pit and were hurled into the sky in a mad geyser. The ground grew hot beneath their feet and the molten pit spread wider, its edges eroding into a bubbling mass. The spot in the center above the bomb gurgled and hurled spouts of molten earth into the air. Jim Green shook his head and mopped his brow. I am beat, he said weakly. General Langley was still staring at the molten pit. Licked, he gritted. And those who heard him knew he meant the atomic bomb. He turned to Green and said, Jim, this is an order. Lick this hardening disease somehow, but keep it handy. Then he turned to the still increasing puddle of molten earth and muttered, "'Tis truly an ill wind that blows no good." Chapter 5 Cost Plus Gregory Holden stopped his big car at the metal gate. Puzzled, he leaned out of the car and snapped, "'I'm Gregory Holden, soldier. I want in.' "'Mister,' said the soldier, snapping the bolt on his rifle. "'I don't care if you are Geronimo himself. No one goes in without General Langley's permission.' What's going on here anyway? The soldier smiled. No man who goes in can come out. That's why we're restricting the clientele to the cream of society. We want no overcrowding. Don't be insolent. Tell Langley I want in. Don't be hasty. General Langley is in command and he is a busy man. I'll enter anyway. I'm Gregory Holden. You enter without permission and that name will look well on your tombstone, gritted the soldier. Now be a good corpse intended, and I'll see if you have the proper qualifications for entry. Fuming in rage, Holden respected the rifle of the sentry and of the other guards that ringed the premises. He waited for a full half hour before the guard returned and opened the gate. Walk, he said. That's a full half mile, objected Holden. It'll take some of that pot off of you, suggested the soldier. No metal goes in that can't be stopped. Remove all coins, belt buckles, fountain pens, keys, and everything else of metal and you may enter. As soon as you're clean, we'll know it by the induction balance here. Fuming, Gregory Holden removed metal bits. He was amazed to find out just how many bits of hard metal he carried. As he started down the road, the officer smiled at him. Lucky you're wearing trousers with buttons instead of a zipper, he called. One guy went in wearing seven striped shorts.
Holden grunted angrily. When he reached the laboratory, he snapped, What's going on here? Langley turned. We are keeping the secret from society, he said in a scathing voice. We hope to keep it for ourselves. But... Stick around and watch. Mr. Green is making an experiment. Holden dropped into a chair. No one paid any attention to him, and he finally called Leona over and asked her what was going on. Quickly, and while watching the operations at the laboratory table, Leona brought him up to date, including the atom bombing. Holden blinked. I dare say we started something, he said in an awed voice. I never suspected that every metal would get hard. Idly, he picked up a cube of metal and hefted it. What's this? he asked. One of Jim's samples, Leona told him. But you shouldn't have moved it. It is supposed to stay in contact with that super hard temp alloy plate there. Sorry, said Holden. He dropped the cube of metal on the temp alloy plate again and then reached over to square it up. As he turned it, one corner scratched the plate below. The sound caused all of them to turn. What was that? demanded Green. Holden showed him. Then Green picked up the temp alloy plate and scratched it deliberately. He tried the plate against another temp alloy plate and scratched it easily. He tried a sample alloy against the other plate and scratched that. Lacking any means of measuring hardness at this level, he explained, we can arrive at this assumption. This is alloy 17 in this series of tests. 17, in contact with temp alloy, hardens. Temp alloy softens. 17 will scratch hard temp alloy, which will scratch the temp alloy softened by 17. He tried the bench beneath the samples. It scratched. Even with the end of a pick, it scratched. Then, like a geologist marking a contour map, Jim Green started to plot the spread of softening. Like a widening pool, it spread. Out across the bench it went spread to the legs, started across the floor. Out of here, he yelled suddenly. But why? asked Leona. Because the ground around the yard is filled with tiny metal scrap, he said, and I'm still worried about that A-bomb. From the edge of the ten-mile sterile area, they watched the terrible mushroom cap billow towards the sky. The thundering roar buffeted at them, and the ground shook beneath their feet. Upward went the cloud to be blown away by winds of the upper air. You see, said Jim Green, the confinement of the explosive was such that only enough plutonium exploded to provide restraining pressure for the rest. Then, when the casing returned to its sensible hardness, that restraining pressure permitted the rest of the explosion. He turned to Holden and handed him the notebook. Here, Gregory, he said, is the means to make superhard alloys, and the means to control them. I want no part of it. Holden smiled. The cost plus rider in the contract can be constructed to include the plant as an expenditure, he said. Green shook his head. I never want to see another alloy as long as I live. He was wrong. It took eight months to prove it, because it was eight months before they could rebuild the Green Metallurgical Laboratory on the plains ten miles from Ramble, Indiana. End of Quarantine by George O. Smith The Silver Key by H. P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski The Silver Key by H. P. Lovecraft when Randolph Carter was thirty, he lost the key to the gate of dreams. Prior to that, he had made up for the prosiness of life by nightly excursions to strange and ancient cities beyond space, and lovely, unbelievable garden lands across ethereal seas. But as middle age hardened upon him, he felt these liberties slipping away little by little until at last he was cut off altogether. No more could his galleys sail up the river Okranos, past the gilded spires of Thran, or his elephant caravans tramp through perfumed jungles and cled, where forgotten palaces with veined ivory columns sleep lovely and unbroken under the moon. 
He had read too much of things as they are and talked with too many people. Well-meaning philosophers had taught him to look into the logical relations of things and analyze the processes which shaped his thoughts and fancies. Wonder had gone away, and he had forgotten that all life is only a set of pictures in the brain, among which there is no difference betwixt those born of real things and those born of inward dreamings, and no cause to value the one above the other. Custom had dinned into his ears a superstitious reverence for that which tangibly and physically exists, and had made him secretly ashamed to dwell in visions. Wise men told him his simple fancies were inane and childish, and he believed it, because he could see that they might easily be so. What he failed to recall was that the deeds of reality are just as inane and childish, and even more absurd, because their actors persist in fancying them full of meaning and purpose, as the blind purpose grinds aimlessly on from nothing to something back to nothing again, neither heeding nor knowing the wishes or existence of the minds that flicker for a second now and then in the darkness. They had chained him down to things that are, and had then explained the workings of those things till mystery had gone out of the world when he complained and longed to escape into twilight realms where magic molded all the little vivid fragments and prized associations of his mind into vistas of breathless expectancy and unquestionable delight, they turned him instead toward the new-found prodigies of science, bidding him find wonder in the atom's vortex and mystery in the sky's dimensions. And when he had failed to find those boons in things whose laws are known and measurable, they told him he lacked imagination, and was immature because he preferred dream illusions to the illusions of our physical creation. So Carter had tried to do as others did, and pretended that the common events and emotions of earthly minds were more important than the fantasies of rare and delicate souls. He did not dissent when they told him that the animal pain of a stuck pig or dyspeptic plowman in real life is a greater thing than the peerless beauty of Narath with its hundred carven gates and domes of Chalcedony, which he dimly remembered from his dreams, and under their guidance he cultivated a painstaking sense of pity and tragedy. Once in a while, though, he could not help seeing how shallow, fickle, and meaningless all human aspirations are, and how emptily our real impulses contrast with those pompous ideals we profess to hold. Then he would have recourse to the polite laughter they had taught him to use against the extravagance and artificiality of dreams, for he saw that the daily life of our world is every inch as extravagant and artificial and far less worthy of respect, because of its poverty and beauty, and its silly reluctance to admit its own lack of reason and purpose. In this way he became a kind of humorist, for he did not see that even humor is empty in a mindless universe, devoid of any true standard of consistency or inconsistency. In the first days of his bondage, he had turned to the gentle churchly faith endeared to him by the naive trust of his fathers, for thence stretched mystic avenues which seemed to promise escape from life. Only on closer view did he mark the starved fancy and beauty, the stale and prosy triteness, and the owlish gravity and grotesque claims of solid truth, which reign boresomely and overwhelmingly among most of its professors, or feel to the full the awkwardness with which it sought to keep alive as literal fact the outgrown fears and guesses of a primal race confronting the unknown. It wearied Carter to see how solemnly people tried to make earthly reality out of old myths which every step of their boasted science confuted, and this misplaced seriousness killed the attachment he might have kept for the ancient creeds had they been content to offer the sonorous rites and emotional outlets in their true guise of ethereal fantasy. But when he came to study those who had thrown off the old myths, he found them even more ugly than those who had not. They did not know that beauty lies in harmony, and that loveliness of life has no standard amidst an aimless cosmos 
save only in its harmony with the dreams and the feelings which have gone before, and blindly molded our little spheres out of the rest of chaos. They did not see that good and evil and beauty and ugliness are only ornamental fruits of perspective, whose sole value lies in their linkage to what chance made our fathers think and feel, whose fine details are different for every race and culture. Instead, they either denied these things altogether or transferred them to the crude, vague instincts which they shared with the beasts and peasants, so that their lives were dragged melodorously out in pain, ugliness, and disproportion, yet filled with a ludicrous pride at having escaped from something no more unsound than that which still held them. They had traded the false gods of fear and blind piety for those of license and anarchy. Carter did not taste deeply of these modern freedoms, for their cheapness and squalor sickened his spirit-loving beauty alone, while his reason rebelled at the flimsy logic with which their champions tried to gild brute impulse, with a sacredness stripped from the idols they had discarded. He saw that most of them, in common with their cast-off priestcraft, could not escape from the delusion that life has a meaning apart from that which men dream into it, and could not lay aside the crude notion of ethics and obligations beyond those of beauty, even when all nature shrieked of its unconsciousness and impersonal unmorality in the light of their scientific discoveries. Warped and bigoted with preconceived illusions of justice, freedom, and consistency, they cast off the old lore and the old ways with the old beliefs, nor ever stopped to think that that lore and those ways were the sole makers of their present thoughts and judgments, and the sole guides and standards in a meaningless universe, without fixed aims or stable points of reference." Having lost these artificial settings, their lives grew void of direction and dramatic interest, till at length they strove to drown their ennui in bustle and pretended usefulness, noise and excitement, barbaric display and animal sensation. When these things palled, disappointed, or grew nauseous through revulsion, they cultivated irony and bitterness, and found fault with the social order. Never could they realize that their brute foundations were as shifting and contradictory as the gods of their elders, and that the satisfaction of one moment is the bane of the next. Calm, lasting beauty comes only in dream, and this solace the world had thrown away when its worship of the real it threw away the secrets of childhood and innocence. Amidst this chaos of hollowness and unrest, Carter tried to live as befitted a man of keen thought and good heritage. With his dreams fading under the ridicule of the age, he could not believe in anything, but the love of harmony kept him close to the ways of his race and station. He walked impassive through the cities of men and sighed, because no vista seemed fully real, because every flash of yellow sunlight on tall roofs and every glimpse of balustraded plazas in the first lamps of evening served only to remind him of dreams he had once known, and to make him homesick for ethereal lands he no longer knew how to find. Travel was only a mockery, and even the great war stirred him but little, though he served from the first in the Foreign Legion of France. For a while he sought friends, but soon grew weary of the crudeness of their emotions, and the sameness and earthiness of their visions. He felt vaguely glad that all his relatives were distant and out of touch with him, for they could not have understood his mental life. That is, none but his grandfather and great-uncle Christopher could, and they were long dead. Then he began once more the writing of books, which he had left off when dreams first failed him. But here, too, was there no satisfaction or fulfillment for the touch of earth was upon his mind, and he could not think of lovely things as he had done of yore. Ironic humor dragged down all the twilight minarets he reared, and the earthly fear of improbability blasted all the delicate and amazing flowers in his fairy gardens. The convention of assumed piety 
spilt mawkishness on his characters, while the myth of an important reality and significant human events and emotions debased all his high fantasy into thin-veiled allegory and cheap social satire. His new novels were successful as his old ones had never been, and because he knew how empty they must be to please an empty herd, he burned them and ceased his writing. They were very graceful novels, in which he urbanely laughed at the dreams he lightly sketched, but he saw that their sophistication had sapped all their life away. It was after this that he cultivated deliberate illusion, and dabbled in the notions of the bizarre and the eccentric as an antidote for the commonplace. Most of these, however, soon showed their poverty and barrenness and he saw that the popular doctrines of occultism are as dry and inflexible as those of science, yet without even the slender palliative of truth to redeem them. Gross stupidity, falsehood, and muddled thinking are not dream, and form no escape from life to a mind trained above their level. So Carter bought stranger books, and sought out deeper and more terrible men of fantastic erudition delving into arcana of consciousness that few have trod, and learning things about the secret pits of life, legend, and immemorial antiquity, which disturbed him ever afterward. He decided to live on a rarer plane, and furnished his Boston home to suit his changing moods, one room for each, hung in appropriate colors, furnished with befitting books and objects, and provided with sources of the proper sensations of light, heat, sound, taste, and odor. Once he heard of a man in the South who was shunned and feared for the blasphemous things he read in prehistoric books and clay tablets smuggled from India and Arabia. Him he visited, living with him and sharing his studies for seven years, till horror overtook them one midnight in an unknown and archaic graveyard, and only one emerged where two had entered. Then he went back to Arkham, the terrible witch-haunted old town of his forefathers in New England, and had experiences in the dark amidst the hoary willows and tottering gambrel roofs which made him seal forever certain pages in the diary of a wild-minded ancestor. But these horrors took him only to the edge of reality, and were not of the true dream country he had known in youth, so that at fifty he despaired of any rest or contentment in a world grown too busy for beauty and too shrewd for dream. Having perceived at last the hollowness and futility of real things, Carter spent his days in retirement, and in wistful, disjointed memories of his dream-filled youth. He thought it rather silly that he bothered to keep on living at all, and got from a South American acquaintance a very curious liquid to take him to oblivion without suffering. Inertia and force of habit, however, caused him to defer action, and he lingered indecisively among thoughts of old times, taking down the strange hangings from his walls and refitting the house as it was in his early boyhood, purple panes, Victorian furniture, and all. With the passage of time, he became almost glad he had lingered, for his relics of youth and his cleavage from the world made life and sophistication seem very distant and unreal. So much so that a touch of magic and expectancy stole back into his nightly slumbers. For years those slumbers had known only such twisted reflections of everyday things, as the commonest slumberers know. But now there returned a flicker of something stranger and wilder, something of vaguely awesome imminence, which took the form of tensely clear pictures from his childhood days, and made him think of little inconsequential things he had long forgotten. He would often awake, calling for his mother and grandfather, both in their graves a quarter of a century. Then one night his grandfather reminded him of the key. The gray old scholar, as vivid as in life, spoke long and earnestly of their ancient line, and of the strange visions of the delicate and sensitive men who composed it. He spoke of the flame-eyed crusader who learnt wild secrets of the Saracens that held him captive, and of the first Sir Randolph Carter, who studied magic when Elizabeth was queen. 
He spoke, too, of that Edmund Carter, who had just escaped hanging in the Salem witchcraft, and who had placed in an antique box a great silver key, handed down from his ancestors. Before Carter awaked, the gentle visitant had told him where to find that box, that carved oak box of archaic wonder, whose grotesque lid no hand had raised for two centuries. In the dust and shadows of the great attic he found it, remote and forgotten at the back of a drawer in a tall chest. It was about a foot square, and its Gothic carvings were so fearful that he did not marvel no person since Edmund Carter had dared open it. It gave forth no noise when shaken, but was mystic with the scent of unremembered spices. That it held a key was indeed only a dim legend, and Randolph Carter's father had never known such a box existed. It was bound in rusty iron, and no means was provided for working the formidable lock. Carter vaguely understood that he would find within it some key to the lost gate of dreams, but of where and how to use it his grandfather had told him nothing. An old servant forced the carven lid, shaking as he did so at the hideous faces leering from the blackened wood, and at some unplaced familiarity. Inside, wrapped in a discolored parchment, was a huge key of tarnished silver, covered with cryptical arabesques, but of any legible explanation there was none. The parchment was voluminous, and held only the strange hieroglyphs of an unknown tongue written with an antique reed. Carter recognized the characters as those he had seen on a certain papyrus scroll belonging to that terrible scholar of the South, who had vanished one midnight in a nameless cemetery. The man had always shivered when he read this scroll, and Carter shivered now. But he cleaned the key and kept it by him nightly in its aromatic box of ancient oak. His dreams were meanwhile increasing in vividness, and though showing him none of the strange cities and incredible gardens of the old days, were assuming a definite cast, whose purpose could not be mistaken. They were calling him back along the years, and with the mingled wills of all his fathers were pulling him towards some hidden and ancestral source. Then he knew he must go into the past, and merge himself with old things, and day after day he thought of the hills to the north, where haunted Arkham and the rushing Miskatonic, and the lonely rustic homestead of his people lay. In the brooding fire of autumn, Carter took the old remembered way past graceful lines of rolling hill and stone-walled meadow, distant vale and hanging woodland, curving road and nestling farmstead, and the crystal windings of the Miskatonic, crossed here and there by rustic bridges of wood or stone. At one bend he saw a group of giant elms among which an ancestor had oddly vanished a century and a half before, and shuddered as the wind blew meaningly through them. Then there was the crumbling farmhouse of old Goody Fowler the Witch, with its little evil windows and great roof sloping nearly to the ground on the north side. He speeded up his car as he passed it, and did not slacken until he had mounted the hill where his mother and her fathers before her were born, and where the old white house still looked proudly across the road at the breathlessly lovely panorama of Rocky Slope and Verdon Valley, with the distant spires of Kingsport on the horizon and hints of the archaic, dream-laden sea in the farthest background. Then came the steeper slope that held the old Carter place he had not seen in over forty years. Afternoon was far gone when he reached the foot, and at the bend halfway up he paused to scan the outspread countryside, golden and glorified in the slanting floods of magic, poured out by a western sun. All the strangeness and expectancy of his recent dreams seemed present in this hushed and unearthly landscape, and he thought of the unknown solitudes of other planets as his eyes traced out the velvet and deserted lawns, shining undulant between their tumbled walls, the clumps of fairy forest setting off far lines of purple hills beyond hills. 
and the spectral wooded valley, dipping down in shadow to dank hollows, where trickling waters crooned and gurgled among swollen and distorted roots. Something made him feel that motors did not belong in the realm he was seeking, so he left his car at the edge of the forest, and putting the great key in his coat pocket, walked up on the hill. Woods now engulfed him utterly, though he knew the house was on a high knoll that cleared the trees, except to the north. He wondered how it would look, for it had been left vacant and untended through his neglect since the death of his strange great-uncle Christopher thirty years before. In his boyhood he had reveled through long visits there, and had found weird marvels in the woods beyond the orchard. Shadows thickened around him, for the night was near. Once a gap in the trees opened up to the right, so that he saw off across leagues of twilight meadow and spied the old congregational steeple on Central Hill in Kingsport, pink with the last flush of day, the panes of the little round windows blazing with reflected fire. Then, when he was in deep shadow again, he recalled with a start that the glimpse must have come from childish memory alone, since the old white church had long been torn down to make room for the Congregational Hospital. He had read of it with interest, for the paper had told about some strange burrows or passages found in the rocky hill beneath. Through his puzzlement a voice piped, and he started again at its familiarity after long years. Old Benijah Corey had been his uncle Christopher's hired man, and was aged even in those far-off times of his boyhood visits. Now he must be well over a hundred, but that piping voice could come from no one else. He could distinguish no words, yet the tone was haunting and unmistakable. To think that old Benji should still be alive! Mr. Randy! Mr. Randy! Where be ye? Do you want to scare your Aunt Marthy plumb to death? Ain't she told you to keep nigh the place in the afternoon and get back of her dark? Randy! Randy! He's the beatenest boy for running off in the woods I ever see, half the time a settin' moon and round that snake den in the upper timber lot. Hey, you! Randy! Randolph Carter stopped in the pitch darkness and rubbed his hand across his eyes. Something was queer. He had been somewhere he ought not to be, had strayed very far away to places where he had not belonged, and was now inexcusably late. He had not noticed the time on the Kingsport steeple, though he could easily have made it out with his pocket telescope. But he knew his lateness was something very strange and unprecedented. He was not sure he had his little telescope with him, and put his hand in his blouse pocket to see. No, it was not there. But there was the big silver key he had found in a box somewhere. Uncle Chris had told him something odd once about an old, unopened box with a key in it, but Aunt Martha had stopped the story abruptly, saying it was no kind of a thing to tell a child whose head was already too full of queer fancies. He tried to recall just where he had found the key, but something seemed very confused. He guessed it was in the attic at home in Boston, and dimly remembered bribing Parks with half his week's allowance to help him open the box and keep quiet about it. But when he remembered this, the face of Parks came up very strangely, as if the wrinkles of long years had fallen upon the brisk little cockney. "'Randy! Randy!' Hi, hi, Randy! A swaying lantern came around the black bend, and old Benijah pounced on the silent and bewildered form of the pilgrim. Darn ye, boy! So there ye be! Ain't ye got a tongue in your head that ye can't answer a body? I been calling this half hour, and ye must have heard me long ago. Don't ye know your Aunt Marthy's all a fidget over ye being off after dark? Wait till I tell your Uncle Chris when he gets home. Ye'd order these round here woods. Ain't no fitting place to be traipsing this hour. These things abroad, what don't do nobody no good, as my grandsir knowed affirm me. 
Come, Mr. Randy, or Hannah won't keep supper no longer. So Randolph Carter was marched up the road, where wandering stars glimmered through high autumn boughs, and dogs barked as the yellow light of small paned windows shone out at the farther turn, and the Pleiades twinkled across the open knoll where a great gambrel roof stood black against the dim west. And Martha was in the doorway, and did not scold too hard when Benijah shoved the truant in. She knew Uncle Chris well enough to expect such things of the Carter blood. Randolph did not show his key, but ate his supper in silence and protested only when bedtime came. He sometimes dreamed better when awake, and he wanted to use that key. In the morning, Randolph was up early and would have run off to the upper timber lot if Uncle Chris had not caught him and forced him into his chair by the breakfast table. He looked impatiently around the low pitched room with the rag carpet and exposed beams and corner posts, and smiled only when the orchard boughs scratched at the little leaded panes of the rear window. The trees and the hills were close to him, and formed the gates of that timeless realm which was his true country. Then, when he was free, he felt in his blouse pocket for the key, and, being reassured, skipped off across the orchard to the rise beyond, where the wooded hill climbed again to heights above even the treeless knoll. The floor of the forest was mossy and mysterious, and great lichened rocks rose vaguely here and there in the dim light, like druid monoliths among the swollen and twisted trunks of a sacred grove. Once in his ascent, Randolph crossed a rushing stream, whose falls a little way off sang runic incantations to the lurking fauns and ajapans and dryads. Then he came to the strange cave in the forest slope, the dreaded snake den, which country folk shunned, and away from which Benijah had warned him again and again. It was deep, far deeper than anyone but Randolph suspected, for the boy had found a fissure in the farthermost black corner that led to a loftier grotto beyond, a haunting sepulchral place whose granite walls held a curious illusion of conscious artifice. On this occasion, he crawled in as usual, lighting his way with matches filched from the sitting room match safe, and edging through the final crevice with an eagerness hard to explain even to himself. He could not tell why he approached the farther wall so confidently, or why he instinctively drew forth the great silver key as he did so, but on he went, and when he danced back to the house that night he offered no excuses for his lateness, nor heeded in the least the reproofs he gained for ignoring the noontide dinner horn altogether. Now it is agreed by all the distant relatives of Randolph Carter that something occurred to heighten his imagination in his tenth year. His cousin, Ernest B. Aspinwall, Esquire of Chicago, is fully ten years his senior, and distinctly recalls a change in the boy after the autumn of 1883. Randolph had looked on scenes of fantasy that few others can ever have beheld, and stranger still were some of the qualities which he showed in relation to very mundane things. He seemed in fine to have picked up an odd gift of prophecy, and reacted unusually to things which, though at the time without meaning, were later found to justify the singular impressions. In subsequent decades, as new inventions, new names, and new events appeared, one by one in the book of history, people would now and then recall wonderingly how Carter had, years before, let fall some careless word of undoubted connection with what was then far in the future. He did not himself understand these words or know why certain things made him feel certain emotions, but fancied that some unremembered dream must be responsible. It was as early as 1897 that he turned pale when some traveler mentioned the French town of Beloy and Santerre, and friends remembered it when he was almost mortally wounded there in 1916 while serving with the Foreign Legion in the Great War. Carter's relatives talk much of these things because he has lately disappeared. 
his little old servant Parks, who for years bore patiently with his vagaries, last saw him on the morning he drove off alone in his car with a key he had recently found. Parks had helped him get the key from the old box containing it, and it felt strangely affected by the grotesque carvings on the box and by some other odd quality he could not name. When Carter left, he had said he was going to visit his old ancestral country around Arkham. Halfway up Elm Mountain, on the way to the ruins of the old Carter place, they found his motor set carefully by the roadside, and in it was a box of fragrant wood with carvings that frightened the countrymen who stumbled on it. The box held only a queer parchment whose characters no linguist or paleographer has been able to decipher or identify. Rain had long effaced any possible footprints. The Boston investigators had something to say about evidences of disturbances among the fallen timbers of the Carter place. It was, they averred, as though someone had groped about the ruins at no distant period. A common white handkerchief found among the forest rocks on the hillside beyond cannot be identified as belonging to the missing man. There is talk of apportioning Randolph Carter's estate among his heirs, but I shall stand firmly against this course, because I do not believe he is dead. There are twists of time and space, of vision and reality, which only a dreamer can divine, and from what I know of Carter, I think he has merely found a way to traverse these mazes. Whether or not he will ever come back, I cannot say. He wanted the lands of dreams he had lost and yearned for the days of his childhood. Then he found a key, and I somehow believe he was able to use it to strange advantage. I shall ask him when I see him, for I expect to meet him shortly in a certain dream city we both used to haunt. It is rumored in Ulthar beyond the river sky that a new king reigns on the opal throne of Ilikvad, that fabulous town of turrets, atop the hollow cliffs of glass, overlooking the twilight sea, wherein the Beard and Infininori build their singular labyrinths. And I believe I know how to interpret this rumor. Certainly, I look forward impatiently to the sight of that great silver key, for in its cryptical arabesques there may stand symbolized all the aims and mysteries of a blindly impersonal cosmos. End of The Silver Key Six Frightened Men by Randall Garrett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Yoganand Six Frightened Men It was an unexplored planet, and anything could happen. Yet none of us expected to face a creature impossible to fight, let alone kill. You put your life on the line when you join the exploratory wing of the space course. They tell you that when you sign up. The way they told it to me, it went like this. You will be out there on alien worlds where no human being has ever set foot. Worlds which may or may not have been inhabited by hostile alien creatures. You take your life in your hands every time you make a planet fall out there. Still interested? That's old stuff, I said. You don't think I'd join up if it was an old lady's tea party, do you? Which was how I happened to be crouching behind a fantastically sculptured spiraling rock out on the yellow wind-blasted desert of Polex 5 huddling there with a fierce sweep of sand against my faceplate, looking at the monster that barred my path. The thing was at least sixty feet tall, and all eyes and mouth. The mouth yawned, showing yellow daggers a foot long. As for the eyes, well, they burned with the cold luminosity of an intelligent and inimical being. I didn't know what the thing was. One minute I had been examining an interesting rock formation. A second later I was hiding behind it watching the ravening thing that had appeared out of nowhere. Other members of the expedition were sprawled here and there on the desert too. I could see Maxfeld, our paleontologist, curled in a tight, plump little ball under an outcropping of weathered limestone, and there was Roy Lawrence, the biochemist, flat on his stomach, peering at the thing incredulously. Back behind me were three others, Tom Foster, Leo Mickens, 
Clyde Hamner. That made six. The two remaining members of the team, medic Howard Graves and anthropologist Lyman Donaldson, were back at the ship. We always left a shift of two back there in case of trouble. And trouble had sure struck now. I saw Lawrence swivel in the sand and stare goggle-eyed at me. His lips moved and over my helmet radio came. What the hell is it, Phil? Where did it come from? I'm a morphologist. I'm supposed to know things like that. But I could only shrug and say, a thing like that could only come from the pits of hell. I've never seen anything like it before. I hadn't. We had been fine combing the broad windswept plain in front of the ship, looking for archaeological remains. The planet was uninhabited, or so we thought after running a quick check. But Maxfeld had discovered relics of a dead race, an exciting find, and we had all fanned out to help him in his search for more. We had been heading toward a flat mountain wall that rose abruptly from the desert about a mile from the ship, when from nowhere the creature appeared, towering above the desert like a dinosaur dropped from the skies. But no dinosaur ever looked like this one. Sixty feet high, its skin a loathsome grey-green quivering jelly with thick hairy cilia projecting its vat-like mouth gaping toothily, its cold hard eyes flicking back and forth, searching for us as we flattened ourselves out of sight. It was an utterly ghastly being. Evolution had gone wild on this planet. And we were cut off from the ship, hemmed between the mountain wall and the creature. What are we going to do? Clyde Hamner whispered. He's going to smell us out pretty soon. As he spoke, the monster began to move, flowing, it seemed, like some vast protozoan. I'm going to blast it, I said, as it oozed closer to us. Cautiously, I lifted my webley from its shoulder holster, turned the beam to full, began to squeeze the firing stud. A bright, white-hot beam of force leaped from the nozzle and speared the creature's eye. It howled, seemed to leap in the air, thrashed around, and changed. It became a boiling mass of amorphous protoplasm, writhing and billowing on the sand. I fired again into the mass, again and again, and the alien creature continued to shift its form. I was cold with horror, but I kept up the firing. My bolts seemed to be absorbed into the fluid mass without effect, but at least I had halted the oozing advance. It reached one final hideous stage, a giant mouth opening before us like the gate of hell. A mouth, nothing more. It yawned in front of us, then advanced. I felt noxious vapor shoot out, bathing my thermosuit, and I saw a gargling larynx feet across. I fired, again and again, into the monster's throat. My companions were firing too. We seemed to have halted the thing's advance. It paused some twenty feet from us, a wall of mouth. Then it disappeared. It blinked out of sight the way it had come, instantaneously. For a moment I didn't realize what had happened, and fired three useless charges into the space where the monster had been. It's gone, Hamna exclaimed. My hands were trembling. Me, who had stood up to Venusian mudworms without a whimper, who had fought the giant fleece of Rigel 9. I was shaking all over. Sweat was running down my entire body and the wipe off my face plate was going crazy trying to blot my forehead. Then I heard dull groans coming from up ahead. One final grunt, then silence. They had been coming from Max Felt. Looking around cautiously, I rose to my feet. There was no sign of the creature. I ran to where Max lay. The plump paleontologist was sprawled flat in the sand face down. I bent, yanked him over, peered in his face mask. His eyes were open, staring and lifeless. It was until we got back to the ship that we could open his spacesuit and confirm what I thought I saw on his face. Doc Graves pronounced it finally. He's dead. Heart attack. What the devil did you see out there anyway? Quickly, I described it. When I was finished, the medic shivered. Lord, no wonder Max had an attack. What a nightmare. Donaldson, the anthropologist, appeared from somewhere in the back of the ship. Seeing Max's body, he said, What happened? We were attacked in the desert. Max was the only casualty. The thing didn't touch us. It just stood there and changed shape. Max must have died of fright. Donaldson scowled. He was a wry, taciturn individual with a coldness about him that I didn't like. I could pretty well guess what he would say. No expression of grief or anything like that. It's going to look bad for you, Doc, when it is discovered we had a man with a weak heart in the crew. The medic stiffened. I checked Max's heart before we left. It was as good as anyone's. But the shock of seeing that thing? Yeah, Don Foster said angrily. 
you would have been shivering in your boots too if that thing had popped out of nowhere right over your left shoulder. Keep your remarks to yourself, Foster. I signed on for the exploratory team with the same understanding any of you did, that we are going into alien, uncharted worlds and could expect to meet up with anything, anything at all. Fright's a mere emotional reaction. Adults, as you supposedly are, should be able to control it. I felt like hitting him, but I restrained myself. That ordeal out on the desert had left me drained, nerves raw and shaken. I shrugged and looked away. Well, Hamlet said, what do we do? Go home? It was said half as a joke, but I saw from the look on young Leo Mickens' face that he was perfectly willing to take the suggestion seriously and get off Pollock's wife as fast as he could. To forestall any trouble, I said, it's a tempting idea, but I don't think it would look good on our records. You're right, Hamna agreed. We stay. We stay until we know what the thing is, where it came from and how we can lick it. We stayed. We spent the rest of the day aboard ship, having called off the day's explorations in memory of Max. The bright orb of Pollux set about 2,000 ship time and the sky was filled with a glorious sight. A horde of moons whirling above. The moons of Pollux 5 were incredible. There were 100 of them, ranging in size from a hunk of rock the size of Mars Deimos to one massive high albedo satellite almost a thousand miles in diameter. They marched across the sky in stately order, filling the Pollaxian night with brightness. Wally, we didn't feel much sense of wonder. We buried Max in a crude grave, laid him to rest under the light of a hundred moons, and then withdrew to the ship to consider a problem. Where had it come from? Doc Graves asked. Nowhere, I said. Just nowhere. One second it wasn't there. Next second it was. It vanished the same way. How could that be? Donaldson asked. Matter doesn't work that way. It's flatly impossible. Holding myself in check, I said, Maybe so, Donaldson, but the thing was there. How do you know? The anthropologist persisted, sneering a little. You sure it wasn't a mass illusion of some kind? Damn you, Foster shouted. You weren't there. We were, and we saw it. Max saw it. Ask Max if it was there. Evenly, Donaldson said, On the basis of a description, I am convinced it must have been an illusion. I am willing to go out there and have a look first thing in the morning, either alone or with any of you, if you can work up the courage. Fair enough? Fair enough, I said. I'll go with you. The next morning, we left the ship, clad in thermosuits, armed to the teeth. At least, I was. I carried a subforce gun and a neural disruptor. Donaldson scornfully packed only the prescribed blaster. We crossed the flat plane together without speaking. I led the way, looking back nervously every few paces, but there was nothing behind me but Donaldson. We made a complete reconnaissance of the area, picked up a few interesting outlying fossils. Donaldson thought they might be relics of the dead race of Polix 5 and reached the bare face of the mountain without any difficulties. Well? Donaldson asked, sneeringly. Where's your monster this time? He afraid of me? So he didn't show up, I snapped. That doesn't prove anything, for we all know it might jump us on the way back to the ship. So it might, but I doubt it. For one thing, I've been checking footprints in the sand. I've counted six tracks, one each for you, Feld, Hamner, Lawrence, Foster and Mickens. Unfortunately, that doesn't leave any for your monster. There's no sign of him anywhere. I was a little startled by that. I glanced around. You're right, I admitted, frowning. Licking dry lips, I said, There ought to be some trace, unless the wind's covered it. The wind hasn't fully covered the traces of U6 yet? Donaldson pointed out with obstinate logic. Why should it obliterate only those of your nemesis? I scowled but said nothing. Donaldson was right again. But I still found it hard to convince myself that what we had seen was only an illusion. On the way back to the ship, I formulated all sorts of theories to explain the creature. It was a monster out of subspace generated by etheric force. It was a radiation creature without tangible physical body. It was... I had half a dozen conjectures, each as unlikely as the next. But we returned to the ship safely, without any trouble whatever. I was sure of one thing. The creature was real, no matter what hell void had spawned it. When we returned, I saw the tense faces of the men in the ship ease. All right, Donaldson said. We have both been out there and come back. I say we ought to investigate this place fully. There has been a high-level civilization here at one time, and suppose it's this monster that killed off that civilization? Foster suggested. Then it is our duty to investigate it, I had to say. 
even at the cost of our lives. Here I agreed with Donaldson. Monster, no, it was our job to fathom the secrets of this dead world. We agreed to explore in twos rather than risk the customary compliment of six all at once. Two men would go out. Five remained with him. Three of them space-suited and ready to leave the ship to answer any emergency call. Mickens and Faster drew the first assignment. They suited up and left. Tensely, we proceeded about our shipside duties, cataloging information from our previous stops, performing routine tasks, busying ourselves desperately in unimportant work to take our minds off the men who were out on the desert together. An hour later, Foster returned, alone. His face was pale, his eyes bulging, and almost before he stepped from the airlock, we knew what must have happened. Where's Mickens? I asked, breaking the terrible hush in the cabin. Dead, he said hollowly. We, we got to the mountain. And God, it was awful. He sank down in an acceleration cradle and started to sob. Doc Grace fumbled at his belt, drew out a neurotype, forced it between the boy's quivering lips. He can't. Colour returned to his face. Tell us about it, Hamner urged gently. They reached the back end of the plane, and Leo suggested we try the mountain. He thought he saw a sort of cave somewhere back in there, and wanted to have a look. We had to go over that sharp rock shelf to get in there, so we started to scale the cliff. We were about a hundred feet up, and going along a path maybe four feet wide. When... when... he shuddered then forced himself to go on. The monster appeared. It popped out of nowhere right in front of Leo. He was taken by surprise and toppled over the edge. I managed to hang on. Were you attacked? I asked. No, it vanished right after Leo fell off. I went down to look at him. His face mask had broken. I left him there. I glanced around at the tight-jawed, hard faces of my crewmates. No one said a word, but we all knew the job that faced us now. We couldn't leave Pollux 5 until we had discovered the nature of the beast that menaced us, even if it cost us our lives. We couldn't go back to Earth and send some of the guys in to do the job. That wasn't the way the exploratory wing operated. We had a tradition to uphold. We drew lots, and Hamner and Donaldson went out there to recover Mickens body. They encountered no hazards and brought young Mickens' shattered body back. We buried it next to Max's. The monster had taken a toll of two already, without actually touching either. It was almost like some evil plan unfolding to wipe us out one by one. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. But I didn't have anything too concrete to base it on. Not till the fifth day. I was teamed with Donaldson again, and I felt strangely confident about our safety. So far, the monster had yet to materialize any time Donaldson was out on the plane. That fact had been in the back of my mind for quite a while. It was the only clue I had. We prowled over the plane which by now had been pretty well fine-toothed, and then I suggested we try the cave where Mickens had met his fate. I don't like the idea, Donaldson said, eyeing the narrow shelf of rock we would have to walk across. You remember what happened to Mickens and... I laughed harshly. Don't tell me you're beginning to believe in this monster of ours. Of course not. Mickens simply had an attack of vertigo and toppled off. Foster's active imagination supplied the monster. But that shelf looks treacherous. I'd just as soon not go up there. You're not talking like an exploratory wingman, Donaldson. But it's okay with me if you want to wait down here. That cave might be a goldmine of artifacts. We ought at least to have a look. His hard face dropped within his mask. No, I couldn't let you go alone. You win, he said. Let's try the cave. We began the climb. And it was, I saw, a deadly road. It narrowed dizzyingly, and while the drop was only a hundred feet, which a man could survive if he landed right, spacesuits weren't made to take falls of that sort. And without a suit, a man was instantly dead on this methane ammonia atmosphere world. We were about ten feet out on the ledge, I in the lead and Donaldson behind me when I heard him gasp. Great God! There it is! I felt him lurch against me in sudden terror, nearly heaving me into the abyss, but somehow I steadied myself, dropped to my knees, hung on. I turned. He had avoided a fall too, but I saw no monster. Where is it? I asked. It came out of the air right next to me, just popped out of the void and vanished again. I saw it though. His voice was hoarse. I apologize for everything I've said. The thing is real. If it weren't for your sure footing, we'd both have gone the way Mick instead. 
He seemed almost hysterical. There was no sign of the monster, but I wasn't going to take any chances out on this ribbon of rock with a hysterical man. Let's go back, I said. We'll try to get to the cave some other time. All right. Donaldson was shaken. We turned and inched away back along the shelf to safety and half ran to the sanctuary of the ship. But once we were inside and I was thinking clearly again, I began to sprout some suspicions. I reasoned it out very carefully. Every time Donaldson had gone out previously, the monster had failed to show. There wasn't another man aboard ship who hadn't had some encounter with the thing, and some of them were remarking about Donaldson's apparent luck. So this time we are out on the shelf and the monster does show up, but Donaldson's the only one who sees him after staunchly denying its existence all along. It seemed to me that it might only have been pretense, that he had faked seeing the monster for some reason of his own. I didn't know what that could be, but I had some ideas. Donaldson, after all, had been a member of the first party to explore Polex 5, the day before the exploration that killed Max. I had remained on ship while that group had been out. Suppose, I thought, Donaldson had found something on that first trip, something that he hadn't bothered to tell the rest of us about, something he might want badly enough to kill all of us for. It was pretty far-fetched, but it was worth a try. I decided to explore Donaldson's cabin. Ordinarily, we respected privacy to an extreme degree aboard the ship. I had never been in Donaldson's cabin before. He never invited anyone in, and naturally I never went uninvited. But this was a special case, I felt. The door was locked, but it is not hard to coerce a magnet plate into opening if you know how they work. Donaldson was in the ship's lab, and I hoped he'd stay out of my way till I had a good look around. The room was just like any of us, filled with the usual things. A shelf of reference books, a file of music tapes, some mini films, other things to help to pass away the long hours between planets. It seemed neat, precise, uncluttered, just as Donaldson himself was crisp and reserved. I moved around the room very carefully, looking for anything out of the ordinary. And then I found it. It was a black box, nothing more, about four inches square. It was sitting on one of his shelves. Just a bare black box, a little cube of metal. But what metal? Beyond the blackness was a strange, unearthly shimmer, an eye-teasing pattern of shifting molecules within the metal itself. The box had a sleek, alien appearance. I knew it hadn't been in the cabin when we left Earth. With a sudden rush of excitement, I realized my mad guess had been right. Donaldson had found something and kept news of it back from the rest of us. And perhaps it was linked to the deaths of Max Feld and Leo Mickens. Cautiously, I reached out to examine the box. I lifted it. It was oddly heavy and strange to touch. But no sooner did I have it in my hands when the door opened behind me. Donaldson had come back. What are you doing with that? He shouted. I... He crossed the cabin at top speed and seized the box from my hands. And suddenly the monster appeared. It materialized right in the cabin, between Donaldson and me, its vast bulk pressing against the walls. I felt its noise and breath on me, sensed its evil reek. Donaldson! But Donaldson was no longer there. I was alone in the cabin with the creature. I backed away into the far corner, my mouth working in terror. I tried to call for help, but couldn't get a word out. And the beast squirmed and changed like a vast amoeba, writhing and twisting from one grey oily shape to another. I sank to the floor, numb with horror, and then realized that the monster wasn't approaching. It was just staying there, making faces at me. Making faces, like a bogeyman. It was trying to scare me to death. That was how Max Feld had died, and that was how Leo Mickens had died. But I wasn't going to die that way. I rose and confronted the thing. It just remained in the middle of the cabin, blotting everything out behind it, stretching from wall to wall and floor to ceiling, changing from one hell shape to another, and hoping I'd curl up and die. I stepped forward. Cautiously, I touched the monster's writhing surface. It was like touching a cloud. I sank right in. The monster changed, took the dragon form again, much smaller, of course, to fit the cabin. Teeth gnashed to the air before my nose, but didn't bite into my throat as they promised to do. Nervelessly, I stood my ground. Then I wade into the heart of the monster, right into its middle, and the grey oiliness billowing out all around me. There seemed to be nothing material, nothing to grapple hold of. It was like fighting a dream. But then I hit something solid. My groping hands closed around warm flesh. 
I started to squeeze. I had a throat, a living core of flesh within the monster. It might be. I constricted my fingers, dug them in, heard strangled gasps coming from further in. I couldn't see, but I hung on. Then a human voice said, Damn you, you're choking me! And the monster thinned. Through the diminishing smoke of the dream creature, I saw Donaldson and I was clutching his throat. He still held the black box in his hand, but it was slipping from his grasp. Slipping. He dropped it. It clattered to the floor and I kicked it far across the cabin. The monster vanished completely. It was just the two of us there in the cabin. I heard fists pounding on the door from outside, but I ignored them. This was between me and Donaldson. What is that thing? I asked, facing him, tugging at his throat. I shook him. Where did you find that hell thing? Wouldn't you like to know? He wheezed. My fingers tightened. Suddenly he drew up his foot and lashed out at my stomach. I let go of his throat and fell back. The wind knocked out of me. As he staggered backward, he darted for the fallen box, but I recovered and brought my foot down hard on his outstretched hand. He snarled in pain. I felt his other fist crash into my stomach again. I was almost numb, sick, ready to curl up in a knot and close my eyes, but I forced myself to second breath and hit him. His head snapped back. I hit him again and he reeled soggily. His neat, precise lips swelled into a bloody mass. His fists moved hazily. I blackened one of his eyes and he groaned and slumped. Fury was in my fists. I was avenging the honor of the exploratory wing against the one man who had broken its oaths. Enough! Enough! But I hit him again and again till he sagged to the floor. I picked up the black metal box, fondled it in my hands. Then tentatively, I threw a thought at it. Monster. The monster appeared in all its ugliness. Vanish. It vanished. That's how it works, isn't it? I said. It's a thought projector. That monster never existed outside your mind, Donaldson. Don't hit me again, he whined. I didn't. He was beneath contempt. I threw open the door and saw the other crewmen huddled outside, their faces pale. It's all over, I said. Here's your monster. I held out the black box. We held court on Donaldson that night and he made full confession. That first day, he had stumbled over an alien treasure in the cave beyond the hill. That and the thought converter. The idea came to him that perhaps as sole survivor of the expedition, he could turn some of the treasure to his own uses. So he utilized the thought converter in a campaign to pick us off one by one without aiming suspicion at himself. Wally, his clumsy way of pretending to see the creature himself, had given him away. Else he might have killed us all. Our rule book gave no guide on what to do about him. But we reached a decision easily enough. When we left Polex 5, taking with us samples of the treasure and other specimens of the long dead race, including the thought converter, we left Donaldson behind on the bare, lifeless planet with about a week's supply of food and air. No one ever learned of his treachery. We listed him as a casualty along with Max and Leo when we returned to Earth. The exploratory wing had too noble a name to tarnish by revealing what Donaldson had done and none of us will ever speak the truth. The wing means too much to us for that, and I think they're going to award him a posthumous medal. The End of Six Frightened Men The Stilled Patter by James E. Gunn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The age-old battle of the sexes may yet be the deadliest of all. The Stilled Patter by James E. Gunn George Washington was the father of his country. I'm not George Washington. My name is Andrew Jones, and it is because of me there will be no more Joneses in the world. There will be, in fact, no more anybody. This is the end of the world. It did not come through fire or ice, with a bang or a whimper, from solar catastrophe, or man's suicidal misuse of atomic power, or any of the other fearful possibilities with which the Sunday supplement writers once terrified us. It came through the exposure of an age-old conspiracy. I did it. 
My excuse is the eternal excuse of scientists. I sought the truth. How it was used was not my concern, but that it should have led to the depopulation of the earth concerns me, as it must concern every man, and I have an unshakable feeling of guilt. Perhaps I write this now in the hope that I may some day purge myself. I know that it will never be read. The linen wick gutters in the saucer of melted tallow. It casts strange shadows on the cellar wall. Sometimes I think that they are ghosts of children come to haunt me. The ghosts of all the little children who will never be born. But this is not what I sat down to write while I waited for Lindsay to return. What is keeping Lindsay? He should be back by now. I will begin again. My name is Andrew Jones, and today, by my figures, is October 3, 1969. The weather is turning cold here, and soon we must go look for another hiding place. My joints are getting old. The damp has seeped into them. I long for the year-long warmth of California or Florida, but those areas are still crowded and deadly. Someone would recognize me. I think we will try a powerhouse again this winter. Often they have supplies of coal large enough to last us through the cold weather without extra foraging. Cataclysm began in 1954, June 13th to be exact. That was the day my second child was born, a boy we named Kevin. It is surprising that a man who was the father of two children should accuse himself of depopulating the earth. And yet, it is because I was the father of two children that it happened. Prenatal care of mothers and postnatal care of infants were the subject of compelling interest in those days, arriving monthly in the burgeoning women's magazines and annually in the proliferous child care manuals. Pediatricians and mothers besieged parents with advice, and we consumed everything with Catholic appetite. Logical, illogical, sensible, insensible, nonsensical, self-contradictory. They kept us on our toes, strung as taunt as Stradivarius violins, afraid to act for fear we would do the wrong thing, afraid not to act for fear inaction would be disastrous. Pediatricians and mothers, always the same authors. Never were there any articles on the care of mother and child by a father, only by what I came to think of as the vested interests. I was slow, I admit, but what father has not been slow? Who, if he had not been slow, would be a father? Books and articles would have been troublesome enough if the information they imparted had been accurate, but slowly I became aware that they were often subtly interwoven with misstatements. I raveled them out. I categorized them. I counted five different kinds before I convinced myself. A mother published this. One baby takes up all your time. Two can't take any more. The fallacy is obvious. A certain amount of housework is inescapable. If a mother was unable to do the work, what happened to it? Answer, somebody else did it. Who? Even in the abundance of those days, most of us couldn't afford nurses, maids, cooks, laundresses, or cleaning women. The era of the poor relation who came to help out for a few months was long past. Who did the work then? The father, that's who. I stared deep into the shocking chasm between the mental processes of men and women. I studied the statement again. There was no misstatement at all, if you granted the hidden premise and didn't boggle on the implications. It was perfectly valid. The hidden premise was that women did all the housework, but that hadn't been true for a generation. The husband-father had been drafted into home service and there was no discharge for him short of death or total disability. The latter was hard to prove. 
but the implication was a deadly thing. In the consideration of second child, a father's time and labor counted for nothing. I remember a shaggy little story about a farmer who held up his hog and let it eat the corn off the stalk. "'Doesn't it take a long time to fatten up a hog that way?' exclaimed the efficiency expert. "'Sure,' said the farmer. "'But what's time to a hog?' And what, in a woman's eyes, was time to a father? The second type of misstatement was pure omission. The thing the baby books didn't mention was that most women felt ten times worse during their second pregnancy. At this time in life became most unbearable for them, and it was, as a consequence, completely unbearable for their husbands. Not one baby book or article mentioned that fact. That it was a fact I proved by a personal survey. Every mother I questioned revealed that she felt horrible during her second pregnancy. She was surprised that my wife and I didn't know this. I was not surprised. Nobody ever mentioned it. That is why we didn't know. I think it was at this time I first asked myself, is there a subconscious conspiracy to keep this kind of information from leaking out? It wasn't important that women didn't know this. They had selective memories. Proof of this was that mankind lasted as long as it did. If they were maternally inclined, as most of them were at one time or another, the disadvantages of pregnancy faded into a sort of merciful blur. If there was a conspiracy, it was aimed at fathers. It was intended to lull them into the logical supposition that conditions usually improve, and that experience is the great teacher. Pure delusion. With women, things are always worse, and they are born with all the knowledge they will ever need. Babies could be divided into two kinds, most and occasional. Consider, for instance, the following quotation. Most babies in the early months sleep from feeding to feeding. An occasional baby won't fall into this pattern, but insists on being sociable after his meals. The first time I read that, I supposed that this business of most and occasional was a statistical matter. That was my fatal mistake. If there is any statistical backing to that statement, I never found it. In my experience, the chances are nine out of ten that try as you would, you would have an occasional baby. We did. We had two of them. The fourth type of misstatement was the false generalization. It was said, much too often, a full baby is a sleepy baby. That is a restatement of the quotation above. I sat down with a pencil and paper and figured it out. A small infant took half an hour to finish a bottle. If he ate five times a day, he would spend twenty-one and a half hours of sleep out of every twenty-four. A little further on I would read something like, If a baby wakes up early, he is not getting enough to eat. I drew up a schedule. Baby wakes up being hungry. Baby gets fed all he can hold. Baby is sleepy being fed. Baby goes to sleep, being sleepy. Baby sleeps until next feeding, being full. I didn't recognize the baby. Who could? He wasn't my child or anyone else's. He was a pediatrician's pipe dream child. I looked at it another way. If the baby slept except when being fed, when did it get the baths, orange juice, vitamins, cereal, and everything else the pediatricians prescribed. Hoist by their own petards. The fifth type of misstatement is the impossible ideal. I tried this one for logic. Baby should not be allowed to cry before feeding. Had those doctors ever tried to keep a hungry child from crying? Hungry children cry. It is their nature. Some of them, my kind, for instance, 
cry very hard, and children, even pipe-dream children, woke up hungry. Warming a bottle to a drinkable temperature took time, at least five minutes, and sometimes ten. Meanwhile, in spite of everything that everyone could do, the baby was crying. He would not be cajoled, walked, teased, pattered, jollied, scolded, or argued into accepting any substitute for his formula. With him, it was food or nothing. For horror, I had a favorite scene. A mother alone rushes from baby to bottle, from bottle to baby, one screaming, the other cold, frantic with the pediatrician's admonitions, and then both too hot. I would not have had it on my conscience for all the royalties in America. At least I have saved the world that. There are more misstatements, but those were enough. I did what any man, any scientist, would have done. I gave my findings to the world. They were published under the title, What the Baby Books Won't Tell You. The article stirred up immediate controversy. It was not enough to uncover a conspiracy. You must find a motive. I had discovered the motive behind the great conspiracy. Baby books were not written to teach parents how to care for their children. Baby books were written to sell baby books. The magazines published articles about babies to sell magazines to mothers. Valid reasons. If they had not existed, there would have been no baby books, no women's magazines. But this had far-reaching consequences. The market for baby books and women's magazines was the great proliferating population of new parents. If the awful truth about parenthood were published, if these hardy, ingenious souls were discouraged, something quite startling would happen to the market. It would disappear. There were attempts at suppression on all levels, but the truth was out and nothing could stop its spread. Secret printing presses turned out reprints by the millions. They were passed from hand to hand. Fathers whispered the word to husbands. Husbands passed it on to bachelor friends. The word raced around the world. It would not have been so disastrous if Lindsay McPherson had not simultaneously perfected his contraceptive pill out of a southwest plant named Lithospermum rudimale. For the first time, a contraceptive was safe, cheap, and convenient, and a hundred percent effective in reducing male fertility. Birth control was in the hands of men. Billions of the tiny pills were turned out. Enemy nations sowed them over each other's territory, in boxes containing translations of my article. Men cashed them away, carried them in money belts hollowed out hiding places in the heels of shoes. Births dropped suddenly. Almost overnight the maternity wards were depopulated. Hospitals went broke or began advertising for patrons, sick or well. The makers of baby food, baby apparel, and baby accessories went next. Then the women's magazines when they lost their advertising. In a few years the condition hit the schools. One by one they closed their doors. It was a creeping paralysis. Toy makers and sellers collapsed. The clothing industry couldn't survive long. The shoemakers were the hardest hit. Food consumption dropped. All over the country farmers went broke. By comparison, the Great Depression seemed like a boom. By 1965 the end was in sight. Society disintegrated. The cities were deserted. They burned for years. From a mechanical, agricultural civilization, the world returned to the Stone Age in one decade. People went in packs for protection. There were two kinds of them. Packs of men hunting for food, and packs of women hunting for men. Soon, as women grow too old for childbearing, the race of man will be doomed. I did it. 
I am guilty. Lindsay helped, but I am the one. But how was I to know that society, that human life itself, was founded on a basic deception? I wonder what is keeping Lindsay. He should be back by now. Editor's Note This manuscript was found in a cellar of a house in a Midwestern city. It is presented here partly for its historical interest, but chiefly for your amusement. Mr. Wilma Masters, the former Andrew Jones, was found in the same cellar. Our hunting party had taken Lindsay McPherson some time before, and he had directed us promptly to the cellar. Men are like that. As is the custom, the man was stripped, carefully searched, and sent to the premarital barracks to wait for some girl's proposal. Our readers will be happy to learn they are both back in service. Never underestimate the power of a woman. Wilma Masters The End of The Stilled Pattern by James E. Gunn Tea Tray in the Sky by Evelyn E. Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Visiting a society is tougher than being born into it. A 40-credit-hour tour is no substitute. The picture changed on the illuminated panel that filled the forward end of the shelf on which Michael lay. A haggard blonde woman sprawled apathetically in a chair. Run down, nervous, hypertensive? inquired a mellifluous voice. In need of mental therapy? By Grugis juice, it's not expensive, and they swear by it on Maropay. A disembodied pair of hands administered a spoonful of Grugis juice to the woman, whereupon her hair turned bright yellow, makeup bloomed on her face, her clothes grew briefer, and she burst into a fast Killiston clog. I see from your hair that you've been a member of one of the Brotherhoods. The passenger lying next to Michael on the shelf remarked inquisitively. He was a middle-aged man, his dust-brown hair thinning on top, his small blue eyes glittering preternaturally from the lenses fitted over his eyeballs. Michael rubbed his fingers ruefully over the blonde stubble on his scalp and wished he had waited until his tonsure were fully grown before he had ventured out into the world but he had been so impatient to leave the lodge, so impatient to exchange the flowing robes of the Brotherhood for the close-fitting breeches and tunic of the outer world that had seemed so glamorous and now proved so itchy. Yes, he replied courteously, for he knew the first rule of universal behavior. I have been a brother. Now why would a good-looking young fellow like you want to join a Brotherhood? His shelf companion wanted to know. Trouble over a female? Michael shook his head, smiling. No, I have been a member of the Angelino Brotherhood since I was an infant. My father brought me when he entered. The other man clucked sympathetically. No doubt he was grieved over the death of your mother. Michael closed his eyes to shut out the sight of a baby protruding its fat face at him three-dimensionally, but he could not shut out its lisping voice. Does your child refuse its food, grow wizened like a monkey? It'll grow plump with oh-so-good mealy mush from Nunky. No, sir, Michael replied. Father said that was one of the few blessings that brightened an otherwise benighted life. Horror contorted his fellow traveler's plump features. Be careful, young man, he warned. Lucky for you that you are talking to someone as broad-minded as I but others aren't. You might be reported for violating a taboo, an earth taboo, moreover. An earth taboo? Certainly. Motherhood is sacred here on earth, and so, of course, in the entire united universe. You should have known that. Michael blushed. He should indeed. 
For a year prior to his leaving the lodge, he had carefully studied the customs and taboos of the universe so that he should be able to enter the new life he'd planned for himself, with confidence and ease. Under the system of universal kinship, all the customs and all the taboos of all the planets were the law on all the other planets. For the wise ones had decided many years before that wars arose from not understanding one's fellows, not sympathizing with them. If every nation, every planet, every solar system had the same laws, customs, and habits, they reasoned, there would be no differences and hence no wars. Future events had proved them to be correct. For 500 years there had been no war in the United Universe, and there was peace and plenty for all. Only one crime was recognized throughout the solar systems, injuring a fellow creature by word or deed. And the telepaths of Aldebaran were still trying to add thought to the statute. Why then, Michael had questioned the Father Superior, was there any reason for the Lodge's existence? Any reason for a group of humans to retire from the world and live in the simple ways of their primitive forefathers? When there had been war, injustice, tyranny, there had perhaps been an understandable emotional reason for fleeing the world. But now why refuse to face a desirable reality? Why turn one's face upon the present and deliberately go back to the life of the past? The high collars, vests and trousers, the inefficient coal furnaces, the rude gasoline tractors of medieval days. The Father Superior had smiled. You are not yet a fully-fledged brother, Michael. You cannot enter your novitiate until you've achieved your majority, and you won't be 30 for another five years. Why don't you spend some time outside and see how you like it? Michael had agreed, but before leaving, he had spent months studying the ways of the United Universe. He had skimmed over Earth because he had been so sure he'd know its ways instinctively. Remembering his preparations, he was astonished by his smug self-confidence. A large scarlet pencil jumped merrily across the ad video screen. The face on the eraser opened its mouth and sang, Our pencils are finest from point up to rubber, for the lead is from yet while the wood comes from Deshaba. Is there any way of turning that thing off? Michael wanted to know. The other man smiled. If there were, my boy, do you think anybody would watch it? Furthermore, turning it off would violate the spirit of free enterprise. We wouldn't want that, would we? Oh, no, Michael agreed hastily. Certainly not. And it might hurt the advertiser's feelings, cause him ego injury. How could I ever have had such a ridiculous idea, Michael murmured, abashed. Allow me to introduce myself, said his companion, my name is Pierce B. Carpenter. Aphrodisiacs are my line. Here's my card. He handed Michael a transparent tab with a photograph of Mr. Carpenter suspended inside, together with his registration number, his name, his address, and the universal seal of approval. Clearly, he was a character of the utmost respectability. My name's Michael Frey, the young man responded, smiling awkwardly. I'm afraid I don't have any cards. Well, you wouldn't have had any use for them where you were. Now look here, son, Carpenter went on in a lowered voice. I know you've just come from the lodge, and the mistakes you'll make will be through ignorance rather than deliberate malice. But the police wouldn't understand. You know what the sacred writings say. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. I'd be glad to give you any little tips I can. For instance, your hands... Michael spread his hands out in front of him. They were perfectly good hands, he thought. Is there something wrong with them? Carpenter blushed and looked away. Didn't you know that on Electra it is forbidden for anyone to appear in public with his hands bare? Of course I know that, Michael said impatiently. But what's that got to do with me? The salesman was wide-eyed. But if it is forbidden on Electra... It becomes automatically prohibited here. But electrons have eight fingers on each hand, Michael protested, with two fingernails on each, all covered with green scales. 
Carpenter drew himself up as far as it was possible to do while lying down. Do eight fingers make one a lesser universal? Of course not, but is he inferior to you then because he has sixteen fingernails? Certainly not, but would you like to be called guilty of? Carpenter paused before the dreaded word. Intolerance? No, 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 Michael almost shrieked. It would be horrible for him to be arrested before he even had time to view Port York. I've lots of gloves in my pack, he babbled. Lots and lots. I'll put some on right away. With nervous haste, he pressed the lever which dropped his pack down from the storage compartment. It landed on his stomach. The device had been invented by one of the Teshubans who are, as everyone knows, hoop-shaped. Michael pressed the button marked Gloves A and a pair of yellow gauntlets slid out. Carpenter pressed his hands to his eyes. Yellow is the color of death on Saturn, and you know how morbid the Saturnians are about passing away. No one ever wears yellow. Sorry, Michael said humbly. The button marked Gloves B yielded a pair of rose-colored gloves which harmonized ill with his scarlet tunic and turquoise breeches, but he was past caring for aesthetic effects. The quality's high, sang a quartet of beautiful female humanoids, but the price is meager. You know when you buy plummy fruitcake from Vega. The salesman patted Michael's shoulder. You staying a while in Port York? Michael nodded. Then you'd better stick close to me for a while until you learn our ways. You can't run around loose by yourself until you've acquired civilized behavior patterns or you'll get into trouble. Thank you, sir, Michael said gratefully. It's very kind of you. He twisted himself around. It was boiling hot inside the jet bus and his damp clothes were clinging uncomfortably and struck his head against the bottom of the shelf above. Awfully inconvenient arrangement here, he commented. Wonder why they don't have seats. Because this arrangement, Carpenter said stiffly, is the one that has proven suitable for the greatest number of intelligent life forms. Oh, I see, Michael murmured. I didn't get a look at the other passengers. Are there many extraterrestrials on the bus? Dozens of them. Haven't you heard the Syrians singing? A low moaning noise had been pervading the bus, but Michael had thought it arose from defective jets. Oh, yes, he agreed, and very beautiful it is, too, but so sad. Syrians are always sad, the salesman told him. Listen. Michael strained his ears past the racket of the ad video. Sure enough, he could make out words. Our wings were unfurled in a far distant world. Our bodies are pain-racked, delirious. And never, it seems, will we see, save in dreams, the bright purple swamps of our Sirius. Carpenter brushed away a tear. Poignant, isn't it? Very, very touching, Michael agreed. Are they sick or something? Oh, no. They wouldn't have been permitted on the bus if they were. They're just homesick. Syrians love being homesick. That's why they leave Sirius in such great numbers. Fashion your suction discs, please, the stewardess, a pretty two-headed Denebian, ordered as she walked up and down the gangway. We're coming into Port York. I have an announcement to make to all passengers on behalf of the United Universe. Zosma was admitted into the Union early this morning. All the passengers cheered. Since it is considered immodest on Zosma, she continued, ever to appear with the heads bare, henceforward it will be taboo to be seen in public without some sort of head covering. Wild scrabbling sounds indicated that all the passengers were searching their packs for headgear. Michael unearthed a violet cap. The salesman unfolded what looked like a medieval opera hat in piercingly bright green. Always got to keep on your toes, he whispered to the younger man. The universe is expanding every minute. 
The bus settled softly on the landing field and the passengers flew, floated, crawled, undulated, or walked out. Michael looked around him curiously. The lodge had contained no extraterrestrials, for such as those as sought seclusion had brotherhoods on their own planets. Of course, even in Angeles, he had seen other worldlers, humanoids from Vega, scaly electrons, the wispy, ubiquitous Syrians, but nothing to compare with the crowds that surged here. Scarlet Meropians rubbed tentacles with bulging-eyed Talithans. Lumpish gray Jovians plodded along graceful spidery Nunkians. And there were countless others whom he had seen pictured in books, but never before in reality. The gaily colored costumes and bodies of those beings rendered kaleidoscopic a field already brilliant with red and green lights and banners. The effect was enhanced by Mr. Carpenter, whose emerald green cloak was drawn back to reveal a chartreuse tunic and olive green breeches, which had apparently been designed for a taller and somewhat less pudgy man. Carpenter rubbed modestly gloved hands together. I have no immediate business, so supposing I start showing you the sights. What would you like to see first, Mr. Frey, or would you prefer a nice restful move-in? Frankly, Michael admitted, the first thing I'd like to do is get myself something to eat. I didn't have any breakfast, and I'm famished. Two small creatures standing close to him giggled nervously and scuttled off on six legs apiece. Shh, not so loud. There are females present. Carpenter drew the youth to a secluded corner. Don't you know that on Themen, it's frightfully vulgar to so much as speak of eating in public? But why? Michael demanded in too loud a voice. What's wrong with eating in public here on Earth? Carpenter clapped a hand over the young man's mouth. Hush, he cautioned. After all, on Earth there are things we don't do or even mention in public, aren't there? Well, yes, but those are different. Not at all. Those rules might seem just as ridiculous to a Themimian, but the Themimians have accepted our customs just as we've accepted the Themimians. How would you like it if a Themimian violated one of our taboos in public? You must consider the feelings of the Themimians as equal to your own. Observe the golden rule. Do unto extraterrestrials as you would be done by. But I'm still hungry, Michael persisted, modulating his voice, however, to a decent whisper. Do the proprieties demand that I starve to death, or can I get something to eat somewhere? Naturally, the salesman whispered back. Port York provides for all bodily needs. Numerous feeding stations are conveniently located throughout the port, and there must be some on the field. After gazing furtively over his shoulder to see that no females were watching, Carpenter approached a large map of the landing field and pressed a button. A tiny red light winked demurely for an instant. That's the nearest one, Carpenter explained. Inside a small, white, functional-looking building unobtrusively marked feeding station, Carpenter showed Michael where to insert a two-credit piece in a slot. A door slid back and admitted Michael into a tiny, austere room furnished only with a table, a chair, a food compartment, and an ad video. The food consisted of tabloid synthetics and was tasteless. Michael knew that only primitive creatures waste time and energy in growing and preparing natural foods. It was all a matter of getting used to this stuff, he thought glumly, as he tried to chew food that was meant to be gulped. A ferret-eyed yedin appeared on the ad video. Do you suffer from gastric disorders? Does your viscera get in your hair? A horrid condition, but swift abolition is yours with Albrum from Altair. Michael finished his meal in 15 minutes and left the compartment to find Carpenter awaiting him in the lobby, impatiently glancing at the luminous time dial embedded in his wrist. Let's go to the old town, he suggested to Michael. It will be of great interest to a student and a newcomer like yourself. 
A few yards away from the feeding station, the travel agents were lined up in rows, each outside his spaceship, each shouting the advantage of the tour he offered. Better than a mustard plaster is a weekend spent on Castor. If you want to show you like her, take her for a week to spike her. Move it, stars. Go to Mars. Carpenter smiled politely at them. No space trips for us today, gentlemen. We're staying on Terra. He guided the bewildered young man through the crowds and to the gates of the field. Outside, a number of surface vehicles were lined up with the drivers loudly competing for business. Come, take a ride in my rocket car, suited to both gent and lady, lined with luxury huckafer brought from afar and perfumed with rare scents from al -Gedi. Whatever Movid film you choose to view will be yours in my fine cab from Mazar. Just press a button. It won't cost you nothing. See a passionate drama of long-vanished Moo or the bloodhounds pursuing Eliza. All honor to be laid at the feet of free trade, but whatever your race or your birth, each passenger curls up with two dancing girls who rides in the taxi from Earth. Couldn't we... couldn't we walk? At least part of the way? Michael faltered. Carpenter stared. Walk? Don't you know it's forbidden to walk more than 200 yards in any one direction? Fomohashians never walk. But they have no feet. That has nothing whatsoever to do with it. Carpenter gently urged the young man into the Algedian cab, which reeked. Michael held his nose, but his mentor shook his head. No, no. Tipiu number five is the most esteemed aroma on Al Getty. It would break the driver's heart if he thought you didn't like it. You wouldn't want to be had up for ego injury, would you? Of course not, Michael whispered weakly. Brunettes are darker and blondes are fairer, the ad video informed him, when they wash out their hair with shampoos made on Chara. After a time, Michael got more or less used to Tipiu number five and was able to take some interest in the passing landscape. Port York, the biggest spaceport in the United Universe, was, of course, the most cosmopolitan city. Cosmopolitan in its architecture as well as its inhabitants. Silver domes of Earth were crowded next to the tall helical edifices of the Venusians. You'll notice that the current medieval revival has even reached architecture, Carpenter pointed out. See those period houses in the Frank Lloyd Wright and Inigo Jones manor? Very quaint, Michael commented. Great floating red and green balls lit the streets, even though it was still daylight, and long scarlet and emerald streamers whipped out from the most unlikely places. As Michael opened his mouth to inquire about this, we now interrupt the commercials, the ad video said, to bring you a brand new version of one of the medieval ballads that are becoming so popular. I shall scream, stated Carpenter, if they play beautiful blue Deneb just once more. No, thank the wise ones, I've never heard this before. Thubin, Thubin, I've been thinking, sang a buxom Beetlejuzian. What a cosmos this could be if land masses were transported to replace the wasteful sea. I guess the first thing for me to do, Michael began in a businesslike manner, is to get myself a room at a hotel. What have I said now? The word hotel, Carpenter explained through pursed lips, is not used in polite society anymore. It has come to have unpleasant connotations. It means a place of dancing girls, I hardly think. Certainly not, Michael agreed austerely. I merely want a lodging. That word is also, well, you see, Carpenter told him. On Zania, it is unthinkable to go anywhere without one's family. They're a sort of ant, aren't they? The Zanians, I mean. More like bees. So those creatures who travel, Carpenter lowered his voice modestly, alone, hire a family for the duration of their stay. There are a number of families available, but the better types come rather high. 
There's been talk of reviving the old-fashioned price controls, but the wise ones say this would limit free enterprise as much as, if you'll excuse my use of the expression, tariffs would. The taxi let them off at a square meadow which was filled with transparent plastic domes housing clocks of all varieties, most of the antique type based on the old 24-hour day instead of the standard 30 hours. There were few extraterrestrial clocks because most non-humans had time sense, Michael knew, and needed no mechanical devices. This, said Carpenter, is Times Square. Once, it wasn't really a square, but it is contrary to Nakarian custom to do, say, imply, or permit the existence of anything that isn't true. So when Neckard entered the Union, we had to square off the place. And, of course, install the clocks. Finest clock museum in the Union, I understand. The pictures in my history books, Michael began. Did I hear you correctly, sir? The capes of a bright blue cloak trembled with the indignation of a scarlet, many-tentacled being. Did you use the word history? He pronounced it in terms of loathing. I have been grossly insulted, and I shall be forced to report you to the police, sir. Please don't, Carpenter begged. This youth has just come from one of the brotherhoods and is not yet accustomed to the ways of our universe. I know that, because of the great sophistication for which your race is noted, you will overlook this little gaucherie on his part. Well, the red one conceded, let it not be said that Meropians are not tolerant. But be careful, young man, he warned Michael. There are other beings less sophisticated than we. Guard your tongue, or you might find yourself in trouble. He indicated the stalwart constable who, splendid in gold helmet and gold-spangled pink tights, surveyed the terrain haughtily from his floating platform in the air. I should have told you, Carpenter reproached himself as the Meropian swirled off. Never mention the word history in front of a Meropian. They rose from barbarism in one generation, and so they haven't any history at all. Naturally, they're sensitive in the extreme about it. Naturally, Michael said. Tell me, Mr. Carter, is there some special reason for everything being decorated in red and green? I noticed it along the way, and it's all over here, too. Why, Christmas is coming, my boy, Carpenter answered, surprised. It's July already. About time they got started fixing things up. Some places are so slack, they haven't even got their Mother's Week shrines cleared away. A bevy of tiny, golden-haired winged creatures circled slowly over Times Square. Azarians, Carpenter explained. They're much in demand for Christmas displays. The small mouths opened, and clear soprano voices filled the air. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending near the earth to tune their harps of gold. Peace on earth, goodwill to men, from heaven's all celestial. Peace to the universe as well, and every extraterrestrial. Beat the drum and clash the cymbals, Buy your Christmas gifts at Nimbles. This beautiful walk you see before you, Carpenter said, waving an expository arm, shaded by boogle trees from Desheba, is called Broadway. To your left, you will be delighted to see... Listen, could we... Michael began. 42nd Street, which is now actually the 42nd. By the way, it is extremely rude and hence illegal, Carpenter glared to interrupt anyone who is speaking. But I would like, Michael whispered very earnestly, to get washed, if I might. The other man frowned. Let me see. I believe one of the old landmarks was converted into a lavatory. Only thing of suitable dimensions. Anyhow, it was absolutely useless for any other purpose. We have to take a taxi there. It's more than 200 yards. Custom, you know. A taxi? Isn't there one closer? Ah, impatient youth. There aren't too many altogether. The installations are extremely expensive. 
They hailed the nearest taxi, which happened to be one of the variety equipped with dancing girls. Fortunately, the ride was brief. Michael gazed at the Empire State Building with interest. It was in a remarkable state of preservation and looked just like the pictures in his history, in his books, except that none of them showed the huge golden sign, Public Washport, riding on its spire. Attendants directed traffic from a large circular desk in the lobby. Mercurians, 78th floor. A group vegans, 14th floor right. B group, 14th floor left. C group, 15th floor right. D group, 15th floor left. Syrians, 49th floor. Female humans, 50th floor right. Males, 50th floor left. Uranians, basement. Carpenter and Michael shared an elevator with a group of sad-eyed, translucent Syrians who were singing, as usual, and accompanying themselves on wimps, a cross between a harp and a flute. Foreign planets are strange and we're subject to mange. Foreign atmospheres prove deleterious. Only with our mind's eye can we sail through the sky to the bright purple swamps of our Sirius. The cost of the compartment was half that of the feeding station. One credit in the slot unlocked the door. There was an ad video here, too. Friend, do you clean yourself each day? Now, let's not be evasive, for each one has his favorite way. Some use an abrasive, and some use oil. Some shed their skins in a brand new hide emerging. Some rub with grease put up in tins. For others, there's detergent. Some lick themselves to take off grime. Some beat it off with rope. Some cook it away in boiling lime. Old-fashioned ones use soap. More ways there are than I recall. And each of these will differ. But the only one that works for all is OmniClean from Kiffa. And now, smiled Carpenter as the two humans left the building, we must see you registered for a nice family. Nothing too ostentatious, but on the other hand, you mustn't count credits and ally yourself beneath your station. Michael gazed pensively at two slender, snake-like diftons, writhing only 99 shopping days till Christmas across an aquamarine sky. They won't be permanent, he asked. The family, I mean? Certainly not. You merely hire them for whatever length of time you choose. But why are you so anxious? The young man blushed. Well, I'm thinking of having a family of my own someday. Pretty soon, as a matter of fact. Carpenter beamed. That's nice. You're being adopted. I do hope it's an Earth family that's chosen you. It's so awkward being adopted by extraterrestrials. Oh, no. I'm planning to have my own. That is, I've got a... a girl, you see. And I thought after I'd secured employment of some kind in Port York, I'd send for her, and we'd get married and... Married? Carpenter was now completely shocked. You mustn't use that word. Don't you know that marriage was outlawed years ago? Exclusive possession of a member of the opposite sex is slavery on Talitha. Furthermore, supposing somebody else saw your, uh, friend and wanted her also, you wouldn't wish him to endure the frustration of not having her, would you? Michael squared his jaw. You bet I would. Carpenter drew himself away slightly as if to avoid contamination. This is ununiversal. Young man, if I didn't have a kind heart, I would report you. Michael was too preoccupied to be disturbed by this threat. You mean if I bring my girl here, I'd have to share her? Certainly, and she'd have to share you, if someone wanted you, that is. Then I'm not staying here, Michael declared firmly ashamed to admit even to himself how much relief his decision was bringing him. I don't think I like it anyhow. I'm going back to the Brotherhood. There was a short, cold,
cold silence. You know, son, Carpenter finally said, I think you might be right. I don't want to hurt your feelings. You promise I won't hurt your feelings? He asked anxiously, afraid. Michael realized that he might call a policeman for ego injury. You won't hurt my feelings, Mr. Carpenter. Well, I believe that there are certain individuals who just cannot adapt themselves to civilized behavior patterns. It's much better for them to belong to a brotherhood such as yours than to be placed in one of the government incarceratoriums, comfortable and commodious though they are. Much better, Michael agreed. By the way, Carpenter went on, I realize that this is just vulgar curiosity on my part, and you have a right to refuse an answer without fear of hurting my feelings. But how do you happen to have a, a girl when you belong to a brotherhood? Michael laughed. Oh, Brotherhood is merely a generic term. Both sexes are represented in our society. On Talitha, Carpenter began. I know, Michael interrupted him, like the crude primitive he was and would always be. But our females don't mind being generic. A group of Syrians was traveling on the shelf above him on the slow, very slow jet bus that was flying Michael back to Angeles back to the lodge, back to the brotherhood, back to her. Their melancholy howling was getting on his nerves, but in a little while, he told himself, it would all be over. He would be back home, safe with his own kind. When our minds have grown tired, when our lives have expired, when our sorrows no longer can weary us, let our ashes return. Neatly packed in an urn To the bright purple swamps of our Syria The ad video crackled. The gown her fairy godmother once gave to Cinderella Was created by the hot couture of fashion-wise Capella. The ancient taxi was there. The one that Michael had taken from the lodge early that morning To the little Angelino landing field as if it had been waiting for his return. I see your back, son, the driver said without surprise. He set the noisy old rockets blasting. I've been to Port York once. It's not a bad place to live in, but I hate to visit it. I'm back. Michael sank into the moth-eaten sable cushions and gazed with pleasure at the familiar landmarks half seen in the darkness. I'm back and a loud sneer to civilization. Better be careful, son, the driver warned. I know this is a rural area, but civilization is spreading. There are secret police all over. How do you know I ain't a government spy? I could pull you in for insulting civilization. The elderly black and white ad video flickered, broke into purring sound. Do you find life continues to daze you? Do you find for a quick death you hanker? Why not try the new style euthanasia performed by a skilled workman from Anka? Not anymore, Michael thought contentedly. He was going home. End of Tea Tray in the Sky by Evelyn E. Smith Read by Paul Hampton Tube Monkey by Jerome Bixby This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tube Monkey by Jerome Bixby Radiations had shorted his brilliant pilot's brain, left him an aimless, childish hulk. Yet Rhiannon had his moments when he needed them. Echoed by the sloping, sun-drenched concrete walls booming above the high, bony clatter of monorail cranes, shaming the entire fuming metallic hub of Boat Bed 52, the sound might have been the cavernous indignation of some giant beast being dragged zooward from a bio-institute boat. It was, however, a 
a voice singing. Oh, the boats come in and the boats go out, and we clean them and screen them and preen them. We fix their fins and we polish their snouts with a five-second breather between them. If she comes in smash from a steer rocket lash, do we wait till they've counted the dead? Oh, never, tut-tut, we just played up her butt and fix up the rest in the... the... Mountainous Rhiannon couldn't remember the last word. The clouded crystal, that was Rhiannon. He killed his buffing ray and aimed a bellow that not only shivered the eardrums of its target, but woke up Sergeant Adams a hundred feet below, bringing him to his feet with an adoring bark. Hey, Stevie, what's the last word? Steve Podolsky swung his legs into view and slid carelessly down the dull metal roundness of tube 14, like a boy on a barrel. His magnetic boots thunked onto tube 13 and took hold. He gave Rhiannon a look compounded of acid and pity. Go to hell with your noise. Off at the other end of bed 52, a gong sounded its invitation to cease work and relax for a while. The twelve Navy space boats in 52, lined hip to hip like reclining madams on their slanting cradles, seemed suddenly to begin to shed their skins as a solid parasitica of outship workers melted in streams toward the upthrust frameworks of the lifts. I come in gout! A small, cabbage like asteroidal came out of the smudgy darkness of the tube, a scraping ray in each flat tentacle. I knock and goff! Without a break in its fluid motion, it climbed onto Rhiannon's arm and couched itself in the angle of his elbow. Yeah, me too. Coming, Stevie? Podolsky shook his head. He stood and watched Rhiannon and Tweedy. Tu Tui was its given name, but to pronounce it correctly always sounded a bit gay. Make their way toward the lift. He shook his head again. Once a pilot, he thought, not necessarily always a pilot. Space did rotten things to men who got careless with their radiation screens. It blotched their minds, tossed up fences around memory and intelligence. A most brilliant crystal. That's what Rhiannon had once been. Sixty feet away, and four stories above the concrete floor of Bed 52, a man stood by the curving window of Karin's office and watched Rhiannon descend in the lift. He was a small, padded man with a sly look of the lower Mars suburbs about him. Tube monkey, he said, curling his lips over the word. Karin raised his sober businessman's eyes from their inspection of the briefcase on the desk before him. He'll do perfectly, Lynn. He's just idiot enough to get us there and back and then forget all about it. He got a dose of cosmics. Sometimes he can't even remember his own name. Yes? Lynn Janice's cold gaze followed Rhiannon as the big man went through the distant playground gate. Rhiannon was carrying Tweety on his shoulder and bouncing every other step into the air, and Tweety had wrapped indignant tentacles around his steed's head. A mud-colored puppy went scooting after them, yanked by jealousy from the quilted lay his master had prepared for him beneath Cradle Nine. Can he still handle a boat? Not for combat. Karin leaned far back in his chair and locked his hands behind his head with a dignity that made the awkward position seem very right. He can still hit space, though. Janice turned away from the window. You'd better make certain that he forgets, he said. Karen shrugged. Another killing wouldn't matter much. Why do we need a pilot in the first place? You took me out last time, Janice said flatly, and I damn near died of fright. He tapped the briefcase. You're sure this is the right stuff? I can't tell from looking, you know. Hyperatomics are out of my line. Karen smiled slightly and brought his body forward in the chair. You're getting what you're paying me for. He took his time about lighting a cigarette and then laid it on the edge of the desk as he stood up. He took a leather folder from the briefcase, opened it to reveal a dozen closely printed and diagrammed sheets. These, he said, 
are Larne's defenses. Take my word for it. Unlike most wars, this one had started formally and in good military taste. From their headquarters on Larne's moon, the rebels had made their request for political autonomy, and denial had come promptly through Larne's council from the far-off Earth Federation. The rebels had announced their intent to revolt in force, and the first engagement had occurred that very day. A space battle, fought competently by both sides, and a draw. Larne, Earth's first extrasolar pioneer world, threw up hyperatomic shields, Larne's moon did likewise, and the matter rested there in a checkmate of technological perfection. Subsequent space battles had been fought, but these mattered very little. It had boiled down to a secret service war, a deadlock to be broken by the first side skillful enough to spy out the plans of the enemy's defense setup. Sabotage could then finish the job. The attendant looked at Rhiannon without enthusiasm. He gave the big man a time ticket and turned and went through an arched doorway. He had just pulled a fresh punching bag from the dwindling supply when a wham sound ran across the air of the playground outside. Surrounded by pained chuckles, Rhiannon looked unhappily at the dangling plastic ruin and allowed himself to be shoved aside by the bitter attendant. Then, when the damage was repaired, he drew back his huge right arm again. The attendant grabbed it. Hold on, Rhiannon. There's a rocket game over here, fella. Come on, and I'll show it to you. He pulled the reluctant giant over to a facsimile control board set against the wall, watched for and saw the huge smile break out. Every day was a new life for Rhiannon, and the presence of this mock control board, installed to keep him out of trouble, always came as a wonderful surprise. Sit down, Rhiannon. Tube set? A tense nod. Gravity okay? Green light from central? Blast off! Rhiannon zoomed his boat into outer space and began to chase a comet. It got away from him. After a while, he thought it would be nice if he could blast the whole rebel navy out of the void, and they appeared, tier upon tier of them, in gleaming battle shields. Sergeant Adams, he rumbled, make ready to fire. Adams rose up on his hind legs, compelled and controlled by the strange and inexplicable telepathic aftermath of Rhiannon's misfortune. The former pilot's cosmic brain cut and the brain cuts of the other few similar radiation cases had resulted in this sour blessing, had stepped up their mental broadcasting apparatus and left them very little to broadcast. Humans could often pick up random thoughts from these men, while animals reacted easily to their will. Thus it was that Sergeant Adams placed his paws on the dummy firing button, a temporarily selfless extension of Rhiannon's physical and psychical form. Together, they wiped out the rebel fleet in a matter of seconds. Rhiannon was exploring Polaris when a hand fell lightly upon his shoulder. He whirled up and around, snarling, a rebel spy on his boat, he'd kill the sun. Karin ducked, his face seeming to sag pallid from the front of his skull. Whoa, now, Rhiannon, it's Karin, it's Karin. Rebel spy. Rhiannon had Karin dangling off the floor at the end of his arm. He drew back his other fist, all the way to Polaris, for the blow that would end the war. Then reality registered behind those glazed, distancing pupils. Mr. Karin, I'm sorry, sir. He set his employer sandals back on the floor and began to shuffle uncomfortably. Karin looked about him, his fury artfully concealed beneath a rigid, we must be patient smirk. The other workers on the ground, some of them poised in mid-step after having started to the rescue, were looking embarrassed and quickly turned to resume their games. The sounds of bowling and fencing and tennis and swimming drove away the silence, and the odd patois of multi-species mechanics and technicians swelled up like jungle chatter. Karin put his hand on Rhiannon's sleeve and walked the big man into the vast quiet of Bed 52. 
Adams came after them, wagging almost everything but his head, which arrowed straight and true after the giant figure. When he was paid no attention, however, he sulked over to his box and lay down and was immediately asleep. Sergeant Adams would have been a poor choice to stand guard duty. He had been known to sleep the clock around, silent and unmoving. Great boats had been lifted from the cradles above him and others put into their place, and Adams had dreamed on and on and on. Rhiannon started to apologize again. That's perfectly all right, soldier, Karin said smoothly. Commendable attitude. He led the way past the cradles toward the rear of the bed. You want to help win the war, don't you? Yes, yes, Rhiannon groaned. Karin beamed his approval. Well, now, you may be able to do just that, my boy. How would you like to be? I was exploring Polaris, sir. Rhiannon's tones were suddenly vacant. The people there got three ahead, and the latter part of the word remained unspoken, forgotten. Karin's smile wavered. They had halted by a freight entrance opening onto the green-carpeted rear grounds. He drew the big man closer to him and snapped his words like a whip. Now listen, Rhiannon, how would you like to hit space again, to get your silver son back, to be reinstated as a commander? That tore through Rhiannon's fog, and he reacted. He straightened his 79 inches into the position of attention. I'd like nothing better, sir, he said. Karin made a great show of inspecting their immediate surroundings for eavesdroppers. He said, This is a very important, a top-secret mission. We, the Council, believe that you are the only man who can fly it. We selected you from among thousands, Rhiannon. Rhiannon stood ever more stiffly, his face incandescent. Yes, sir. I didn't know you were a council member, sir. Very few people do, Karin replied dryly. Now, soldier, a special boat is being tuned up at my private field. Do you know where that is? Outside and back, sir. I've worked on your boats. Karin nodded. Then go there immediately and wait. Talk to no one. I have to confer with President Nero before... President Nero, sir! Karin saluted theatrically, and Rhiannon responded with eyes of fire. The big man executed a neat about face and marched one-two through the door. And looking after the broad back, Karin speculated where to place the death shot when the time came. The nebula hung to starboard, seeming almost at arm's length from the ports, a silver pinwheel, a 30,000 light-year toy. Rhiannon jockeyed the boat closer and closer to the rebel craft, his big hand skipping over the board with consummate, unthinking skill. He shot out the hand line, and it snaked to the airlock of the other boat. Janus, holding the briefcase flat against his belly, stepped into the lower portions of the single spacesuit and ducked up and under into the top portion that hung from its rack. The muffled clicks as he turned the ceiling handles were the only sound in the cabin. Then his voice came metallic from the speaker. We'll contact you, Karin, if we need you again. Although I think this trip should be the last one. He inflated the suit and stamped several times, testing the suit's perfection by the ringing in his ears. Karin's reply was purposefully vague with an eye to Rhiannon. There should be use for the security chief of Federation Space Lines even after the war is over, Janice. Ah, uh, ah, uh, rebel underground will likely start up, and as you've already seen, a man with a briefcase will hardly doubt the purity of my kitchens or suspect one of my cabin boys of unwanted partisanship. I have some very cooperative men working for me. Putting a boot on the hatch ladder, Janus showed a sardonic grin through his faceplate. Every man's purse is a traitor. Karin sliced off the words with a quick gesture and shot a look at Rhiannon. The tube monkey was staring through the front port at the stars, his face a caricature of bliss. Janus shrugged, saying, I thought you said he was Nick, and swung himself clumsily up the ladder. 
Besides, he added, weren't you going to convince him of the necessity for silence? He disappeared into the airlock. There was an airy foot sound as he let himself into the void. Karen walked over to the front port and watched for Janice to become visible on the near length of the line. Watched, too, Rhiannon's reflection in the glass. The big man was gaping at the nebula and twitching the thick muscles of his neck in ecstasy. Karen felt an urge to snicker. Good to get back, eh? He asked. Rhiannon pointed. There's your friend, sir. Janice was bobbing hand over hand toward the unmarked rebel boat. His faceplate gleamed once as it caught the fire of the nebula. Then, before Karin's paling face, the silver cigar that was the other boat suddenly threw off into space a thin leafing of curved, misshapen plates. It grew whiskers that were ray guns, and the Nova sign of the patrol blinked into being on its nose. The transformation took just three seconds and on the tick of the fourth there was a honk from Karin's teleaudio to announce that the revealed law boat desired contact. Hissing between his clamped teeth, Karin leaned over Rannon's wide shoulder and speared a finger at the control board. The patrolman had made the mistake of judging his boat at its space yacht face value, but it was far more than that. The yacht's concealed atomic cannons blasted the other craft into radioactive dust. The frantically gesticulating figure of Janus was swallowed by the glare, and when space darkened again, there was only the fused cable end chewed off short near Karin's porthole. Jeez, cried Rhiannon. Why'd you do that? Didn't you see? Karin snapped. It was a rebel boat. Janus must have been a spy. But there was a patrol nova on... Rhiannon, you've done a magnificent job. Karin clapped a hand on the giant's arm and tightened it emotionally. He slipped the safety on his pocketed atom pistol with the other hand. That wasn't a nova. That was the rebel Tetra. Rhiannon looked up at him, his forehead plowed over with thought. Then gradually a wide grin spread his lips. We done it didn't we? We sure did. Karin's face was flattened at the cheeks. How the patrol had known of this meeting, he would never know, short of torturing each of his cooperative men. Janice was gone. The briefcase was gone. The real rebel boat was probably bright drifting dust somewhere between here and Larn's moon. Karin shivered. Would the patrol have his office covered? Had they known whom they were trapping? Or had the tip-off not mentioned names? One way to find out. Rhiannon looked up vaguely. What, sir? Get us back to Larn, Rhiannon. I've got to report this to the president. The swirling salt of the nebula moved out of the port and vanished as the big man tailed the boat round and sidestepped into hyperspace. Karin stood with wet hands clasped at his back. My papers. My money. I'll get them and make a run for a rebel HQ. Surely the tip had not implicated him, or he never would have gotten off Larn in the first place. The patrol would have seen to that. They knew that so many things could go wrong out in space. Such as, he thought with grim satisfaction, what had gone wrong. The government spaceport was emptied and darkened by the evening. Steve Podolsky and his brethren had gone to their homes. Tweedy had gone sailing up into the stratosphere to sleep. And the only living creature was Sergeant Adams, who lay twitching his paws in a dream chase. From the floor of Bed 52, Rhiannon watched Karin labor up the motionless escalator, saw the lights flicker on, saw his employer move about shoving things into a carry case. Rhiannon's affliction may be said to have been stroboscopic in character. That is, his brain functioned with an irregular alternation of clarity and fuddle. At this moment, the lights were on in that great skull, and his brain cells were skittering about, playing with a thought. It had been a patrol boat. He had seen the Nova. It had been a patrol boat. 
he'd seen that Nova. He shifted uneasily in his wrappings of two monkey suit and reflections. He looked up again at Karn's office. The man had moved back from the window, only his head was visible, seeming to roll like Tweety back and forth on the broad sill as he crossed from safe to desk, desk to safe. That distant face was sculptured in pure anxiety. Karn was obviously, was definitely not reporting to President Nero. He wasn't doing anything of the kind. Rhiannon put these observations one under the other, added them, and got the right answer. He'd been taken. Just as his fellow workers can play incredible jokes on him, when Stevie wasn't around, and have them pan out because of his brain cut, so had Spy Karin pulled a whopper. Having worked this out, the busy cells slowed down. The lights began to dim behind the giant's dulling eyes. He stood there in the darkness, having one grim determination and not knowing quite why he had it. Karin came out of his office and grunted down the escalator, unused to the knee action of climbing and descending. His shadowy figure came across the floor, gradually giving its details. His face was red. His eyes were feathered with red. He hugged the carry case like a mourning Apache mother. Ready? he asked. Rhiannon blocked the door. His face came puzzledly. I ain't going. The carry case thudded to the floor. It didn't bounce, but if it had, the appearance of Karin's atom pistol would have shaded the second thud. Rhiannon planted his legs like standards. I ain't going to fly you any place, he said. And I ain't going to let you go either. I don't know why. I can't, won't. At that moment, a door rolled open at the far end of 52, and the tall, wary shapes of patrolmen blinked through the rectangle of light into the dark pool of the bed. They made directly for the still-lighted office. Silently, silently, Karin had to reach to do it. He reached high, standing on tiptoe, and brought the butt of his gun down on Rhiannon's head. The giant made a sound like a baffled ape, and took a forward step. His outflinging legs struck the floor without sensation and buckled. The gun went up and came down twice again. Rhiannon felt a cloth ripping pain in his head. Static crackled and slammed into his brain. It swelled louder and more penetrating, then muffled down to lengthening drum rolls. The nebula beckoned him from a straight path back to Polaris. He circled it carefully, although there wasn't any sign of danger. It wasn't a very interesting nebula. He wheeled Karin's boat once again toward Polaris and his three-headed friends. Sergeant Adams sat alertly at his side. Then suddenly, terrifyingly, the boat pulled away from under their feet and left them cold and lonely in airlessness. The sweet stars began to blink out in clusters, the celestial static dimmed down into the silence of infinite sleep. Somewhere in this dying universe came a cold and wet nose. It sniffed anxiously at his face and red matted hair. A whine, another louder whine, and a scratch of claws on concrete. Rhiannon opened his eyes. There were walls and the concrete floor and the hovering shadowed cradles. There was a crouching figure of Karin seen from below and distorted, framed briefly in the door. There was a mud-colored shadow that sniffed and whined and gave its tail little hesitant twitches. Then Rhiannon's eyes blinded and closed. He found himself back in that fearful, dimming universe. The distant sparking of the spaceboat's jets a few stars to shape the emptiness. Rhiannon's last desperate melting thought was, Adams, Adams, we gotta catch up to that boat, come on. We gotta get back in that boat. The scratching claws went away. 
The last star was lost in the velvet blackness without entity was complete. Karin faded as quietly as a cat out the door and hurried into his boat, darted forward to the control cabin and slammed down a lever. With a rumble, the ground ramp folded in and the hatch sealed itself shut. He leaned against a port and shielded his eyes from the interior glare. The noise had attracted the patrolmen. They boiled through the far door and came streaking across the field, their guns spitting tight green flame. Karin thumbed his nose at them and laughed. A moment later, the boat was clawing its way toward Larn's stratosphere. He set the spectro for the tiny moon and turned away to relax on the bunk. His yacht embodied principles developed by his own technicians, armament and locomotive potentials unknown to the patrol, and he knew that he was safe from them. He regretted, however, that the hyperspace drive was useless for such short distances for with it he might have reached his destination in less than a second. But with it also, at such a range, came the danger of overshooting, nailing himself in the boat a mile into the ground, and so he used the regular blasts and was thankful for his advanced shields. The patrol might spot him, tail him, but that was all. Smiling, he stretched out on the bunk, reached for a book, and settled himself for the 20-hour trip. Beneath the bunk, curled in the warm darkness, Sergeant Adams had settled himself for the trip long ago, for his master's dying thought command had been an urgent and overpowering one, and this spaceboat had been pictured and pointed out as clearly from its fellows as had been the firing button among the myriad devices on the dummy control board. An obedient but sleepy Adams had entered the boat almost at Karn's heels. Unheard and unseen in the confusion of rumbling hatches and charging patrolmen, very eager to get back to his interrupted dream chase, with all his famous quiet and quiescence, he slept. After a while, Karin yawned. The cabin seemed stuffy. He looked up from his book and his eyes happened to fall on the oxygen cage. He felt a momentary chill. As there had been no time to recharge, it was very fortunate that there had been no need. Rhiannon wasn't coming along. Almost empty, he breathed. I'll barely make it. He put the book aside, turned over, and went to sleep. Hours later, when the oxy alarm clanged empty, he roused, sweat-soaked and gasping, to the realization that Rhiannon in a manner of speaking, had come along after all. Lieutenant Dean of the Rebels glanced out his office window, eyes resting puzzledly on the spaceboat that sat silently where it had been brought down by the landing field's tractor beams. He frowned, then continued writing his report. What would seem to have happened is this. Karin, with a depleted store of oxygen and unaware of the animal's presence, undertook to flee here to escape the patrol. See Report 151 and recordings of patrol broadcasts M16, 17, and 2. And in mid-passage discovered the dog which must have somehow contrived to remain out of sight until that time. By then it was too late, for the tanks were empty and the oxygen in the body of the boat was not sufficient to last the trip. He could not turn back, and that he knew we would not risk sending a boat to pick him up is evinced by the fact that he did not call upon us to do so. I believe it likely that Karin debated killing the dog as well as himself, but decided vengefully that the animal, indirectly the cause of his destruction, should suffer the agony of asphyxiation. Therefore, he shot only himself, see enclosed microshots showing interior of boat with corpse exactly as found after boat due to erratic behavior, was beamed onto field as a safety measure. The dog, however... Lieutenant Dean looked up and grinned at the stern-wagging Adams, working noisily over a garn stake beside the desk. The dog, being very small and somewhat addicted to inactivity, survived the trip and led us a merry chase before his final capture. I request that we be allowed to adopt him as a mascot. Dean chewed at his pencil, then laid it on the desk and clapped his hands. Here, boy, he growled. 
You've given me a crazy kind of report to write up. Come here and give us a hand. Come on, speak. What's the story? Sergeant Adams eyed him for a moment, growled softly, and returned to the stake. End of Tube Monkey by Jerome Bixby Read by Paul Hampton The Voice of Scarilliop by Hans Bach This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker The Voice of Scarilliop by Hans Bach Four pillars arising out of the stone like strange growing things of demoniac shape. These Redforth saw and comprehended, knowing full well that Tarath had always abounded in monstrosities. But what, he asked himself, will knowing of such as this be of use to me as I search for Giltharmy? For he had at last come to realize, to admit even to himself, that he was a lost thing. The Yulfog had taken his soul. They had exiled him to this lost land of dread. But they had hinted of escape, if he could find it. See Yamlan, he had told him, pointing to a writhing belt of suns, lifting and lowering at the horizon like the yellow crest of a flaming wave. And he had nodded his head. They had vanished, disintegrating, it seemed. He didn't then know that they were related to Topper's friends, and the jeep in one thing, that their Typonisif and Trogoifer was applicable to the atmosphere. The four pillars were bending from their own weight, strange colors, like an idiot's conception of a spectrum, spectrally rippled like irid waves across the columns, like music in color. Assailed by their complex harmonies, Redforth could only stand speechless, hands thrust defensively forward. It was then that he saw Irie. The pillars split, from each of them drifted a whiff of steam. They united in a wavering cloud which shimmered an instant in mid-air, then settled to the ground. And as it touched the metallic grass blades which stretched on and on like the upraised swords of a midget army, the vapor cloud condensed into a woman's body. Irie, queen of Scariliop. He recognized her at once, though he had only read of her. She was not human. Her body was like a snake's, and she had bat wings. From a cluster of writhing worm tentacles leered her face, like a mask in the heart of a seething flower. It was oval, and the scarlet mouth was like a velvet cushion, disproportionate, waiting for some priceless burden. Her nose was negligible, but her lone eye was vast and blue, like a doorway opening upon a sky too blue to belong to our world, like blue incarnate, and blue was the color of mystery. She opened her mouth, and her tongue unrolled, uncoiled toward Redforth. Three feet long, the tongue was filamental, like a strand of red cobweb, tipped by a touch of fluff like a dandelion seed. This member wandered lightly over Redforth's cheek, and for the first time Irie spoke. It comes to me that here is the man for whom we have been seeking, Yazgorfitov. Her voice was soft as clouds. Redforth in vain peered to behold her companion. Now shall we enlighten him as to the ways of escape, in return for a favor, of course. The air about her, for a fleeting instant, had turned blue. Then she nodded. She leaned forward to whisper, but suddenly there was a crackling. The rock! she cried. The rock! I must return before it is too late, and I too am trapped. She writhed, became coiling wreaths of smoke, and the smoke flowed back to the rocks, hovered over it. The four pillars quivered and joined into one, and then, in a twinkling, had crumbled to powder. But there was an uncanny blueness in the air about Redforth, and that night he had a dreadful dream, for he had become Earthacol, and Irie had been merely the bait. End of The Voice of Scariliop by Hans Bach